Book six, chapter thirty, part one of On War, volumes two and three, by Karl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Chapter thirty, part one, defence of a theatre of war continued, when no decision is sought for whether and how far a war is possible in which neither party acts on the offensive therefore in which neither combatant has a positive aim we shall consider in the last book here it is not necessary for us to occupy ourselves with the contradiction which this presents because on a single theatre of war we can easily suppose reasons for such a defensive on both sides consequent on the relations of each of these parts to the whole but in addition to the examples which history furnishes of particular campaigns that have taken place without the focus of a necessary solution history also tells us of many others in which there was no want of an assailant consequently no want of a positive will on one side but in which that will was so weak that instead of striving to obtain the object at any price and forcing the necessary decision it contented itself with such advantages as arose in a manner spontaneously out of circumstances or the assailant pursued no self-selected end at all but made his object depend on circumstances in the meanwhile gathering such fruits as presented themselves from time to time although such an offensive which deviates very much from the strict logical necessity of a direct march towards the object in which almost like a lounger sauntering through the campaign looking out right and left for cheap fruits of opportunity differs very little from the defence itself which allows the general to pick up what he can in this way still we shall give the closer philosophical consideration of this kind of warfare a place in the book on the attack here we shall confine ourselves to the conclusion that in such a campaign the settlement of the whole question is not looked for by either assailant or defender through a decisive battle and therefore the great battle is no longer the keystone of the arch towards which all the lines of the strategic superstructure are directed campaigns of this kind open bracket as the history of all times and all countries shows us close bracket are not only numerous but form such an overwhelming majority that the remainder only appear as exceptions even if this proportion should alter in the future still it is certain that there will always be many such campaigns and therefore in studying the theory of the defence of a theatre of war they must be brought into consideration we shall endeavour to describe the peculiarity by which they are characterised real war will generally be in a medium between the two different tendencies sometimes approaching nearer to one sometimes to the other and we can therefore only see the practical effect of all these peculiarities in the modification which is produced in the absolute form of war by their counteraction we have already said in the third chapter of this book that the state of expectation is one of the greatest advantages which the defensive has over the offensive as a general rule it seldom happens in life and least of all in war that all that the circumstances would lead us to expect does actually take place the imperfection of human insight the fear of evil results accidents which derange the development of designs in their execution are causes through which many of the transactions enjoined by circumstances are never realized in the execution in war where insufficiency of knowledge the danger of a catastrophe the number of accidents are incomparably greater than in any other branch of human activity the number of shortcomings if we may so call them must necessarily also be much greater this is then the rich field where the defensive gathers fruits which grow for it spontaneously if we had to this result of experience the substantial importance of possession of the surface of the ground in war then that maxim which has become a proverb beati sunt possidentes holds good here as well as in peace it is this maxim which here takes the place of the decision that focus of all action in every war directed to mutual destruction it is fruitful beyond measure not in actions which it calls forth but in motives for not acting and for all that action which is done in the interest of inaction when no decision is sought for or expected there is no reason for giving up anything for that could only be done to gain thereby some advantage in the decision the consequence is that the defender keeps all or at least as much as he can open bracket that is as much as he can cover close bracket and the assailant takes possession of so much as he can without involving himself in a decision 
open bracket, that is, he will extend himself laterally as much as possible, close bracket, we have only to deal with the first in this place. Wherever the defender is not present with his military forces, the assailant can take possession, and then the advantage of the state of expectation is on his side, hence the endeavour to cover the country everywhere directly, and to take the chance of the assailant attacking the troops posted for this purpose. Before we go further into the special properties of the defence, we must extract from the book on the attack those objects which the assailant usually aims at when the decision by battle is not sought. They are as follows. 1. The seizure of a considerable strip of territory, as far as that can be done without a decisive engagement. 2. The capture of an important magazine under the same condition. 3. The capture of a fortress not covered. No doubt a siege is more or less a great operation, often requiring great labour, but it is an undertaking which does not contain the elements of a catastrophe. If it comes to the worst, the siege can be raised without thereby suffering a great positive loss. 4. A successful combat of some importance, but in which there is not much risked, and consequently not much to be gained. A combat which takes place not as the cardinal knot of a whole strategic bond, but on its own account, for the sake of trophies or honour of the troops. For such an object, of course, a combat is not fought at any price. We either wait for the chance of a favourable opportunity, or seek to bring one about by skill. These four objects of attack give rise to the following efforts on the part of the defence. 1. To cover the fortresses by keeping them behind us. 2. To cover the country by extending the troops over it. 3. Where the extension is not sufficient, to throw the army rapidly in front of the enemy by a flank march. 4. To guard against disadvantageous combats. It is clear that the object of the first three measures is to force on the enemy the initiative, and to derive the utmost advantage from the state of expectation, and this object is so deeply rooted in the nature of the thing that it would be great folly to despise it prima facie. It must necessarily occupy a higher place the less a decision is expected, and it is the ruling principle in all such campaigns, even although apparently a considerable degree of activity may be manifested in small actions of an indecisive character. Hannibal, as well as Fabius, and both Frederick the Great and Down, have done homage to this principle wherever they did not either seek for or expect a decision. The fourth effort serves as a corrective to the three others. It is their condito sin qua non. We shall now proceed to examine these subjects a little more closely. At first sight, it appears somewhat preposterous to protect a fortress from the enemy's attack by placing an army in front of it. Such a measure looks like a kind of pleonasm as fortifications are built to resist a hostile attack of themselves. Yet it is a measure which we see resorted to thousands and thousands of times. But thus it is in the conduct of war. The most common things often seem the most incomprehensible. Who would presume to pronounce these thousands of instances to be so many blunders on the ground of this seeming inconsistency? The constant repetition of the measure shows that it must proceed from some deep-seated motive. This reason is, however, no other than that pointed out above, emanating from moral sluggishness and inactivity. If the defender places himself in front of his fortress, the enemy cannot attack it unless he first beats the army in front of it. But a battle is not a decision. If that is not the enemy's object, then there will be no battle, and the defender will remain in possession of his fortress without striking a blow. Consequently, whenever we do not believe the enemy intends to fight a battle, we should venture on the chance of his not making up his mind to do so especially as in most cases, we still retain the power of withdrawing behind the fortress in a moment, if contrary to our expectation, the enemy should march to attack us. The position before the fortress is in this way free from danger, and the probability of maintaining the status quo without any sacrifice is not even attended with the slightest risk. If the defender places himself behind the fortress, he offers the assailant an object which is exactly suited to the circumstances in which the latter is placed. If the fortress is not of great strength, and he is not quite unprepared, he will commence the siege. In order that this may not end in the fall of the place, the defender must march to its relief. The positive action, the initiative, is now laid on him, and the adversary, who, by his siege, is to be regarded as advancing towards his object, is in the situation of occupier. Experience teaches that the matter always takes this turn, and it does so naturally. A catastrophe, as we have before said, is not necessarily bound up with a siege. Even a general, devoid of either the spirit of enterprise or energy, who would never make up his mind to a battle, 
will proceed to undertake a siege with perhaps nothing but field artillery when he can approach a fortress without risk at the worst he can abandon his undertaking without any positive loss there always remains to be considered the danger to which most fortresses are more or less exposed that of being taken by assault or in some other irregular manner and this circumstance should certainly not be overlooked by the defender in his calculation of probabilities in weighing and considering the different chances it seems natural that the defender should look upon the probability of not having to fight at all as more for his advantage than the probability of fighting even under favourable circumstances and thus it appears to us that the practice of placing an army in the field before its fortress is both natural and fully explained frederick the great for instance at glogu against the russians at schwednitz nice and dresden against the austrians almost always adopted it this measure however brought misfortune on the duke of Bavern at breslau behind breslau he could not have been attacked the superiority of the austrians in the king's absence would soon cease as he was approaching and therefore by a position behind breslau a battle might have been avoided until frederick's arrival no doubt the duke would have preferred that course if it had not been that it would have exposed that important place to a bombardment at which the king who was anything but tolerant on such occasions would have been highly displeased the attempt made by the duke to protect breslau by an entrenched position taken up for the purpose cannot after all be disapproved for it was very possible that prince charles of lorraine contented with the capture of schwednitz and threatened by the march of the king would by that position have been prevented from advancing farther the best thing he could have done would have been to refuse the battle at the last by withdrawing through breslau at the moment that the austrians advanced to the attack in this way he would have got all the advantages of the state of expectation without paying for them by a great danger if we have here traced the position before a fortress to reasons of a superior and absolute order and defended its adoption on these grounds we still have to observe that there is a motive of a secondary class which though a more obvious one is not sufficient of itself alone not being absolute we refer to the use which is made by armies of the nearest fortress as a depot of provisions and munitions of war this is so convenient and presents so many advantages that a general will not easily make up his mind to draw his supplies of all kinds from more distant places or to lodge them in open towns but if a fortress is the great magazine of an army then the position before it is frequently a matter of absolute necessity and in most cases is very natural but it is easy to see that this obvious motive which is easily overvalued by those who are not in the habit of looking far before them is neither sufficient to explain all cases nor are the circumstances connected with it of sufficient importance to entitle it to give a final decision the capture of one or more fortresses without risking a battle is such a very natural object of all attacks which do not aim at a decision on the field of battle that the defender makes it his principal business to thwart this design thus it is that on theatres of war containing a number of fortresses we find these places made pivots of almost all movements we find the assailant seeking to approach one of them unexpectedly and employing various feints to aid his purpose and the defender immediately seeking to stop him by well-prepared movements such is the general character of almost all the campaigns of louis the fourteenth in the netherlands up to the time of marshal saxe so much for the covering of fortresses the covering of a country by an extended disposition of forces is only conceivable in combination with very considerable obstacles of ground the great and small posts which must be formed for the purpose can only get a certain capability of resistance through strength of position and as natural obstacles are seldom found sufficient therefore field fortification is made use of as an assistance but now it is to be observed that the power of resistance which is thus obtained at any one point is always only relative open bracket see the chapter on the signification of the combat close bracket and never to be regarded as absolute it may certainly happen that one such post may remain proof against all attacks made upon it and that therefore in a single instance there may be an absolute result but from the greater number of posts a single one in comparison to the whole appears weak and exposed to the possible attack of an overwhelming force and consequently it would be unreasonable to place one's dependence for safety on the resistance of any one single post in such an extended position we can therefore only count on resistance of relative length and not upon a victory properly speaking this value of single posts at the same time is also sufficient for the object and for a general calculation 
in campaigns in which no great decision no irresistible march towards the complete subjugation of the whole force is to be feared there is little risk in a combat of posts even if it ends in the loss of a post there is seldom any further result in connection with it than the loss of the post and a few trophies the influence of victory penetrates no further into the situation of affairs it does not tear down any part of the foundation to be followed by a mass of building in ruin in the worst case if for instance the whole defensive system is disorganized by the loss of a single post the defender has always time to concentrate his cause and with his whole force to offer battle which the assailant according to our supposition does not desire therefore also it usually happens that with this concentration of force the act closes and the further advance of the assailant is stopped a strip of land a few men and guns are the losses of the defender and with these results the assailant is satisfied to such a risk we say the defender may very well expose himself if he has on the other hand the possibility or rather the probability in his favour that the assailant from excessive caution will halt before his posts without attacking them only in regard to this we must not lose sight of the fact that we are now supposing an assailant who will not venture upon any great stroke a moderate sized but strong post will very well serve to stop such an adversary for although he can undoubtedly make himself master of it still the question arises as to the price it will cost and whether that price is not too high for any use that he can make of the victory in this way we may see how the powerful relative resistance which the defender can obtain from an extended disposition consisting of a number of posts in juxtaposition with each other may constitute a satisfactory result in the calculation of his whole campaign in order to direct at once to the right point the glance which the reader with his mind's eye will here cast upon military history we must observe that these extended positions appear most frequently in the latter half of a campaign because by that time the defender has become thoroughly acquainted with his adversary with his projects and his situation and the little quantity of the spirit of enterprise with which the assailant started is usually exhausted in this defensive in an extended position by which the country the supplies and the fortresses are to be covered all great natural obstacles such as streams rivers mountains woods morasses must naturally play a part and acquire a predominant importance upon their use we refer to what has already been said on these subjects it is through this predominant importance of the topographical element that the knowledge and activity which are looked upon as the specialty of the general staff of an army are more particularly called into requisition now as the staff of the army is usually that branch which writes and publishes most it follows that these parts of campaigns are recorded more fully in history and then again from that there follows a not unnatural tendency to systematize them and to frame out of the historical solution of one case a general solution for all succeeding cases but this endeavour is futile and therefore erroneous besides in this more passive kind of war in this form of it which is tied to localities each case is different to another and must be differently treated the ablest memoirs of a critical character respecting these subjects are therefore only suited to make one acquainted with facts but never to serve as dictates natural and at the same time meritorious as is this industry which according to the general view we have attributed to the staff in particular still we must raise a warning voice against usurpations which often spring from it to the prejudice of the whole the authority acquired by those who are at the head of and best acquainted with this branch of military service gives them often a sort of general dominion over people's minds beginning with the general himself and from this then springs a routine of ideas which causes an undue bias of the mind at last the general sees nothing but mountains and passes and that which should be a measure of free choice guided by circumstances becomes mannerism becomes second nature thus in the year seventeen ninety three and seventeen ninety four colonel gravert of the prussian army who was the animating spirit of the staff at that time and well known as a regular man for mountains and passes persuaded two generals of the most opposite personal characteristics the duke of brunswick and general mollendorf into exactly the same method of carrying on war that a defensive line parallel to the course of a formidable natural obstacle may lead to a cordon war is quite plain it must in most cases necessarily lead to that if really the whole extent of the theatre of war could be directly covered in that manner but most theatres of war have such an extent that the normal tactical disposition of the troops destined for its defence would be by no means commensurate with that object 
at the same time as the assailant by his own dispositions and other circumstances is confined to certain principal directions and great roads and any great deviations from these directions even if he is only opposed to a very inactive defender would be attended with great embarrassment and disadvantage therefore generally all that the defender has to do is to cover the country for a certain number of miles or marches right and left of these principal lines of direction of his adversary but again to effect this covering we may be contented with defensive posts on the principal roads and means of approach and merely watch the country between by small posts of observation the consequence of this is certainly that the assailant may then pass a column between two of these posts and thus make the attack which he has in view upon one post from several quarters at once now these posts are in some measure arranged to meet this partly by their having supports for their flanks partly by the formation of frank defences called crotchets partly by their being able to receive assistance from a reserve posted in rear or by troops detached from adjoining posts in this matter the number of posts is reduced still more and the result is that an army engaged in a defence of this kind usually divides itself into four or five principal posts for important points of approach beyond a certain distance and yet in some measure threatened special central points are established which in a certain measure form small theatres of war within the principal one in this manner the austrians during the seven years war generally placed the main body of their army in four or five posts in the mountains of lower silesia whilst a small almost independent corps organized for itself a similar system of defence in upper silesia now the further such a defensive system diverges from direct covering the more it must call to its assistance mobility open bracket active defence close bracket and even offensive means certain corps are considered reserves besides which one post hastens to send to the help of another all the troops it can spare this assistance may be rendered either by hastening up directly from the rear to reinforce and re-establish the passive defence or by attacking the enemy in flank or even by menacing his line of retreat if the assailant threatens the flank of a post not with direct attack but only by a position through which he can act upon the communications of this post then either the corps which has been advanced for this purpose must be attacked in earnest or the way of reprisal must be resorted to by acting in turn on the enemy's communications we see therefore that however passive this defence is in the leading ideas on which it is based still it must comprise many active means and in its organization may be forewarned in many ways against complicated events usually those defences pass for the best which make the most use of active or even offensive means but this depends in great part on the nature of the country the characteristics of the troops and even on the talent of the general partly we are also very prone in general to expect too much from movement and other auxiliary measures of an active nature and to place too little reliance on the local defence of a formidable natural obstacle we think we have thus sufficiently explained what we understand by an extended line of defence and we now turn to the third auxiliary means the placing ourselves in front of the enemy by a rapid march to a flank this means is necessarily one of those provided for that defence of a country which we are now considering in the first place the defender even with the most extended position often cannot guard all the approaches to his country which are menaced next in many cases he must be ready to prepare with the bulk of his forces to any posts upon which the bulk of the enemy's force is about to be thrown as otherwise those posts would be too easily overpowered lastly a general who has an aversion to confining his army to a passive resistance in an extended position must seek to attain his object the protection of his country by rapid well-planned and well-conducted movements the greater the spaces which he leaves exposed the greater the talent required in planning the movements in order to arrive at anywhere at the right moment of time the natural consequence of striving to do this is that in such a case positions which afford sufficient advantages to make an enemy give up all idea of an attack as soon as our army or only a portion of it reaches them are sought for and prepared in all directions as these positions are again and again occupied and all depends on reaching the same in right time they are in a certain measure the vowels of all this method of carrying on war which on that account have been termed a war of posts just as an extended position and the relative resistance in war without great decisions do not present the dangers which are inherent in its original nature so in the same manner the intercepting of the enemy in front by a march to a flank is not so hazardous as it would be in the immediate expectation of a great decision 
to attempt at the last moment in greatest haste open bracket by a lateral movement close bracket to thrust in an army in front of an adversary of determined character who is both able and willing to deal heavy blows and has no scruples about an expenditure of forces would be half way to a most decisive disaster for against an unhesitating blow delivered with the enemy's whole strength such running and stumbling into a position would not do but against an opponent who instead of taking up his work with his whole hand uses only the tips of his fingers who does not know how to make use of a great result or rather of the opening for one who only seeks a trifling advantage but at small expense against such an opponent this kind of resistance certainly may be applied with effect a natural consequence is that this means also in general occurs oftener in the last half of a campaign than at its commencement here also the general staff has an opportunity of displaying its topographical knowledge in framing a system of combined measures connected with the choice and preparation of the positions and the roads leading to them when the whole object of one party is to gain in the end a certain point and the whole object of his adversary on the other hand is to prevent his doing so then both parties are often obliged to make their movements under the eyes of each other for this reason these movements will be made with a degree of precaution and precision not otherwise required formerly before the mass of an army was formed of independent divisions and even on the march was always regarded as an indivisible whole this precaution and precision was attended with much more formality and with the copious use of tactical skill on these occasions certainly single brigades were often obliged to leave the general line of battle to secure peculiar points and act an independent part until the army arrived but these were and continued anomalous proceedings and the aim in the order of march generally was to move the army from one point to another as a whole preserving its normal formation and avoiding such exceptional proceedings as the above as far as possible now that the parts of the main body of an army are subdivided again into independent bodies and these bodies can venture to enter into an engagement with the mass of the enemy's army provided the rest of the force of which it is a member is sufficiently near to carry it on and finish it now such a flank march is attended with less difficulty even under the eye of the enemy what formerly could only be effected through the actual mechanism of the order of march can now be done by starting single divisions at an earlier hour by hastening the march of others and by the greater freedom in the employment of the whole by the means of defence just considered the assailant can be prevented from taking any fortress from occupying any important extent of country or capturing magazines and he will be prevented if in every direction combats are offered to him in which he can see little probability of success or too great danger of a reaction in case of failure or in general an expenditure of force too great for his object in existing relations if now the defender succeeds in this triumph of his art and skill and the assailant wherever he turns his eyes sees prudent preparations through which he is cut off from any prospect of attaining his modest wishes then the offensive principle often seeks to escape from the difficulty in the satisfaction of the mere honour of its arms the gain of some combat of respectable importance gives the arms of the victor a semblance of superiority appeases the vanity of the general of the court of the army and the people and thus satisfies to a certain extent the expectations which are naturally always raised when the offensive is assumed an advantageous combat of some importance merely for the sake of the victory and some trophies becomes therefore the last hope of the assailant no one must suppose that here we involve ourselves in a contradiction for we contend that we still continue within our own supposition that the good measures of the defender have deprived the assailant of all expectation of attaining any one of those other objects by means of a successful combat to warrant that expectation two conditions are required that is a favourable termination to the combat and next that the result shall lead directly to the attainment of one of those objects the first may very well take place without the second and therefore the defender's corps and posts singly are much more frequently in danger of getting involved in disadvantageous combats if the assailant merely aims at the honour of the battlefield then if he connects with that a view to further advantages as well if we place ourselves in down's situation and with his way of thinking then his venturing on the surprise at hochkirk does not appear inconsistent with his character as long as we suppose him aiming at nothing more than the trophies of the day but a victory rich in results which would have compelled the king to abandon dresden and nice appears an entirely different problem one with which he would not have been inclined to meddle let it not be imagined that these are trifling or idle distractions we have on the contrary now before us one of the deep-rooted leading principles of war 
The signification of combat is its very soul in strategy, and we cannot too often repeat that in strategy the leading events always proceed from the ultimate views of the two parties, as it were, from a conclusion of the whole train of ideas. This is why there may be such a difference strategically between one battle and another, that they can hardly be looked upon as the same means. Now, although the fruitless victory of the assailant can hardly be considered any serious injury to the defence, still, as the defender will not willingly concede even this advantage, particularly as we never know what accident may also be connected with it, therefore the defender requires to keep an incessant watch upon the situation of all his corps and posts. No doubt here all greatly depends on the leaders of those corps making suitable dispositions, but any one of them may be led into an unavoidable catastrophe by injudicious orders imposed on him by the general-in-chief, who is not reminded here of Folk's corps at Landshut and of Fink's at Maxon. In both cases, Frederick the Great reckoned too much on customary ideas. It was impossible that he could suppose 10,000 men capable of successfully resisting 30,000 in the position of Lancet, or that Fink could resist a superior force pouring in and overwhelming him on all sides. But he thought the strength of the position of Lancet would be accepted, like a bill of exchange, as heretofore, and that Down would see in the demonstration against his flank sufficient reason to exchange his uncomfortable position in Saxony for the more comfortable one in Bohemia. He misjudged Loudon in one case and Down in the other, and therein lies the error in these measures. But irrespective of such errors, into which even generals may fall who are not so proud, daring, and obstinate, as Frederick the Great in some of his proceedings may certainly be termed, there is always in respect to the subject we are now considering a great difficulty in this way, that the general-in-chief cannot always expect all he desires from the sagacity, goodwill, courage, and firmness of character of his corps commanders. He cannot therefore leave everything to their good judgment, he must prescribe rules on many points by which their course of action being restricted may easily become inconsistent with the circumstances of the moment. This is, however, an unavoidable inconvenience. Without an imperious commanding will, the influence of which penetrates through the whole army, war cannot be well conducted, and whoever would follow the practice of always expecting the best from his subordinates would, from that very reason, be quite unfit for a good commander of an army. Therefore the situation of every corps and post must be for ever clearly in view to prevent any of them being unexpectedly drawn into a catastrophe. The aim of all these efforts is to preserve the status quo. The more fortunate and successful these efforts are, the longer will the war last at the same point, but the longer the war continues at one point, the greater become the cares for subsistence, in place of collections and contributions from the country. A system of subsistence from magazines commences at once, or in a very short time. In place of country wagons being collected upon each occasion, the formation, more or less, of a regular transport takes place, composed either of carriages of the country, or of those belonging to the army. In short, there arises an approach to that regular system of feeding troops from magazines, of which we have already treated in the 14th chapter, open bracket, on subsistence, close bracket. At the same time, it is not this which exercises a great influence on this mode of conducting war. For as this mode by its object and character is in fact already tied down to a limited space, therefore the question of subsistence may very well have a part in determining its action, and will do so in most cases without altering the general character of the war. On the other hand, the actions of the belligerents mutually against the lines of communication gains a much greater importance for two reasons. First, because in such campaigns, there being no measure of a great and comprehensive kind, generals must apply their energies to those of an inferior order, and secondly, because here there is time enough to wait for the effect of this means. The security of his line of communications is therefore specially important to the defender, for although it is true that its interruption cannot be an object of the hostile operations which take place, yet it might compel him to retreat, and thus to leave other objects open to attack. All the measures having for their object the protection of the area of the theatre of war itself must naturally also have the effect of covering the lines of communication. Their security is therefore in part provided for in that way, and we have only to observe that it is a principal condition in fixing upon a position. A special means of security consists in the bodies of troops, both large and small, escorting convoys. First, the most extended positions are not sufficient to secure the lines of communication, and next, such an escort is particularly necessary when the general wishes to avoid a very extended position. Therefore, we find in Tempelhof's History of the Seven Years' War, instances without end in which Frederick the Great caused his bread and flour wagons 
to be escorted by single regiments of infantry or cavalry, sometimes also by whole brigades. On the Austrian side, we nowhere find mention of the same thing, which certainly may be partly accounted for in this way, that they had no such circumstantial historian on their side. But in part, it is also to be ascribed just to this, that they always took up much more extended positions. Having now touched upon the four efforts which form the foundation of a defensive that does not aim at a decision, and which are at the same time altogether free upon the whole from all offensive elements, we must now say something of the offensive means with which they may become more or less mixed up, in a certain measure flavoured. These offensive means are chiefly, one, operating against the enemy's communications, under which we likewise include enterprises against his places of supply, two, diversions and incursions within the enemy's territory, three, attacks on the enemy's corps and posts, and even upon his main body under favourable circumstances, or the threat only of such intention. The first of these means is incessantly in action in all campaigns of this kind, but in a certain measure quite quietly without actually making its appearance. Every suitable position for the defender derives a great part of its efficacy from the disquietude which it causes in the assailant in connection with his communications, and as the question of subsistence in such warfare becomes, as we have already observed, one of vital importance affecting the assailant equally, therefore, through this apprehension of offensive action, possibly resulting from the enemy's position, a great part of the strategic web is determined, as we shall again find in treating of the attack. Not only this general influence proceeding from the choice of positions, which, like pressure in mechanics, produces an effect invisibly, but also an actual offensive movement, with part of the army against the enemy's lines of communication, comes within the compass of such a defensive. But that it may be done with effect, the situation of the lines of communication, the nature of the country, and the peculiar qualities of the troops must be specially propitious to the undertaking. Incursions into the enemy's country, which have as their object reprisals or levying contributions, cannot properly be regarded as defensive means. They are rather true offensive means. But they are usually combined with the object of a real diversion, which may be regarded as a real defensive measure, as it is intended to weaken the enemy's force opposed to us. But as the above means may be used just as well by the assailant, and in itself is a real attack, we therefore think more suitable to leave its further examination for the next book. Accordingly, we shall only count it in here in order to render a full account of the arsenal of small offensive arms belonging to the defender of a theatre of war, and for the present merely add that, in extent and importance, it may attain to such a point as to give the whole war the appearance, and along with that the honour, of the offensive. Of this nature are Frederick the Great's enterprises in Poland, Bohemia and Franconia before the campaign of 1759. His campaign itself is plainly a pure defence, these incursions into the enemy's territory, however, gave it the appearance of an aggression, which perhaps had a special value on account of the moral effect. An attack on one of the enemy's corps, or on his main body, must always be kept in view as a necessary complement of the whole defence whenever the aggressor takes the matter too easily, and on that account shows himself very defenceless at particular points. Under this silent condition the whole action takes place, but here also the defender in the same way as in operating against the communications of the enemy, may go a step further in the province of the offensive, and just as well as his adversary, may make it his business to lie in wait for a favourable stroke. In order to ensure a result in this field, he must either be very decidedly superior in force to his opponent, which certainly is inconsistent with the defensive in general, but still may happen, or he must have a method and the talent of keeping his forces more concentrated, and make up by activity and mobility, for the danger which he incurs in other respects. The first was Down's case in the Seven Years' War, the latter the case of Frederick the Great. Still, we hardly ever see Down's offensive make its appearance except when Frederick the Great invited it by excessive boldness and a display of contempt for him. Open bracket, Hockkirk, Maxon, Lansut. Close bracket. On the other hand, we see Frederick the Great almost constantly on the move in order to beat one or other of Down's corps with his main body. He certainly seldom succeeded, at least the results were never great, because Down, in addition to his great superiority in numbers, had also a rare degree of prudence and caution, but we must not suppose, therefore, that the king's attempts were altogether fruitless. In these attempts lay rather a very effectual resistance, for the care and fatigue which his adversary had to undergo in order to avoid fighting at a disadvantage, neutralised those forces which would otherwise have aided in advancing the offensive action. Let us only call to mind the campaign of 1760 in Silesia, where Down and the Russians 
out of sheer apprehension of being attacked and beaten by the king, first here and then there, could never succeed in making one step in advance. End of chapter 30, part 1. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Book 6, Chapter 30, Part 2 of On War, Volumes 2 and 3 by Karl von Clausewitz. Translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Defence of a Theatre of War Continued. We believe we have now gone through all subjects which form the predominant ideas, the principal aims, and therefore the main stay of the whole action in the defence of a theatre of war when no idea of decision is entertained. Our chief, indeed, sole object in bringing them all close together was to let the organism of the whole strategic action be seen in one view. The particular measures by which those subjects come to life, marches, positions, etc., etc., we have already considered in detail. By now casting a glance once more at the whole of our subject, the idea must strike us forcibly that with such a weak offensive principle, with so little desire for a decision on either side, with so little positive motive, with so many counteracting influences of a subjective nature which stop us and hold us back, the essential difference between attack and defence must always tend more to disappear. At the opening of a campaign certainly one party will enter the other's theatre of war, and in that manner to a certain extent such party puts on the form of offensive, but it may very well take place, and happens frequently, that he must soon enough apply all his powers to defend his own country on the enemy's territory. Then both stand, in reality, opposite one another in a state of mutual observation. Both intent on losing nothing, perhaps both alike intent also on obtaining a positive advantage. Indeed it may happen, as with Frederick the Great, that the real defender aims higher in that way than his adversary. Now, the more the assailant gives up the position of an enemy making progress, the less the defender is menaced by him, and confined to a strictly defensive attitude by the pressing claims of a regard for mere safety. So much the more a similarity in relations of the parties is produced, in which then the activity of both will be directed towards gaining an advantage over his opponent, and protecting himself against any disadvantage, therefore to a true strategic manoeuvring, and indeed this is the character into which all campaigns resolve themselves more or less, where the situation of the combatants or political views do not allow of any great decision. In the following book we have allotted a chapter specially to the subject of strategic manoeuvres, but as this equipoised play of forces has frequently been invested in theory with an importance to which it is not entitled, we find ourselves under the necessity of examining the subject more closely while we are treating of the defence, as it is in that form of warfare more particularly that this false importance is ascribed to strategic manoeuvres. We call it an equipoised play of forces, for when there is no movement of the whole body there is a state of equilibrium. Where no great object impels, there is no movement of the whole. Therefore, in such a case, the two parties, however unequal they may be, are still to be regarded as in a state of equilibrium. From this state of equilibrium of the whole now come forth the particular motives to actions of a minor class and secondary objects. They can here develop themselves, because they are no longer kept down by the pressure of a great decision and a great danger. Therefore what can be lost or won upon the whole is changed into small counters, and the action of the war as a whole is broken up into smaller transactions. With these smaller operations for smaller gains, a contest of skill now takes place between the two generals. But as it is impossible in war to shut out chance, and consequently good luck, therefore this contest will never be otherwise than a game. In the meantime, here arise two other questions. That is, whether in this manoeuvring chance will not have a smaller, and superior intelligence a greater, share in the decision, than where all concentrates itself into a single great act. The last of these questions we must answer in the affirmative. The more complete the organisation of the whole, the oftener time and space come into consideration, the former by single moments, and the latter at particular points. So much the greater plainly will be the field for calculation. Therefore, the greater the sway exercised by superior intelligence. 
what the superior understanding gains is abstracted in part from chance but not necessarily altogether and therefore we are not obliged to answer the first question affirmatively moreover we must not forget that a superior understanding is not the only mental quality of a general courage energy resolution presence of mind etc are qualities which rise again to a higher value when all depends on a single great decision they will therefore have somewhat less weight when there is an equipoised play of forces and the predominating ascendancy of sagacious calculation increases not only at the expense of chance but also at the expense of these qualities on the other hand these brilliant qualities at the moment of a great decision may rob chance of a great part of its power and therefore to a certain extent secure that which calculating intelligence in such cases would be obliged to leave to chance we see by this that here a conflict takes place between several forces and that we cannot positively assert that there is a greater field left open to chance in the case of a great decision than in the total result when that equipoised play of forces takes place if we therefore see more particularly in this play of forces a contest of mutual skill that must only be taken to refer to skill in sagacious calculation and not to the sum total of military genius now it is just from this aspect of strategic manoeuvring that the whole has obtained that false importance of which we have spoken above in the first place in this skilfulness the whole genius of a general has been supposed to consist but this is a great mistake for it is as already said not to be denied that in moments of great decisions other moral qualities of a general may have a power to control the force of events if this power proceeds more from the impulse of noble feelings and those sparks of genius which start up almost unconsciously and therefore does not proceed from long chains of thought still it is not the less a free citizen of the art of war for that art is neither a mere act of understanding nor are the activities of the intellectual faculties its principal ones further it has been supposed that every active campaign without results must be owing to that sort of skill on the part of one or even of both generals while in reality it has always had its general and principal foundation just in the general relations which have turned war into such a game as most wars between civilized states have had for their object rather the observation of the enemy than his destruction therefore it was only natural that the greater number of the campaigns should bear the character of strategic manoeuvring those amongst them which did not bring into notice any renowned generals attracted no attention but where there was a great commander on whom all eyes were fixed or to oppose to each other like turenne and montecuculi there the seal of perfection has been stamped upon this whole art of manoeuvring through the names of these generals a further consequence has been that this game has been looked upon as the summit of the art as the manifestation of its highest perfection and consequently also as the source at which the art of war must chiefly be studied this view prevailed almost universally in the theoretical world before the wars of the french revolution but when these wars at one stroke opened to view a quite different world of phenomena in war at first somewhat rough and wild but which afterwards under bonaparte systematized into a method on a grand scale produced results which created astonishment amongst old and young then people set themselves free from the old models and believed that all the changes they saw resulted from modern discoveries magnificent ideas etc but also at the same time certainly from the changes in the state of society it was now thought that what was old would never more be required and would never even reappear but as in such revolutions in opinions two parties are always formed so it was also in this instance and the old views found their champions who looked upon the new phenomena as rude blows of brute force as a general decadence of the art and held the opinion that in the evenly balanced nuggetary fruitless war game the perfection of the art is realized there lies at the bottom of this last view such a want of logic and philosophy that it can only be termed a hopeless distressing confusion of ideas but at the same time the opposite opinion that nothing like the past will ever reappear is very irrational of the novel appearances manifested in the domain of the art of war very few indeed are to be ascribed to new discoveries or to a change in the direction of ideas they are chiefly attributable to the alterations in the social estate and its relations but as these took place just at the crisis of a state of fermentation they must not be taken as a norm 
and we cannot therefore doubt that a great part of the former manifestations of war will again make their appearance this is not the place to enter further into these matters it is enough for us that by directing attention to the relation which this even balanced play of forces occupies in the whole conduct of a war and to its signification and connection with other objects we have shown that it is always produced by constraint laid on both parties in the contest and by a military element greatly attenuated in this game one general may show himself more skilful than his opponent and therefore if the strength of his army is equal he may also gain many advantages over him or if his force is inferior he may by his superior talent keep the contest evenly balanced but it is completely contradictory to the nature of the thing to look here for the highest honour and glory of a general such a campaign is always rather a certain sign that neither of the generals has any great military talent or that he who has talent is prevented by the force of circumstances from venturing on a great decision but when this is the case there is no scope afforded for the display of the highest military genius we have hitherto been engaged with the general character of strategic manoeuvring we must now proceed to a special influence which it has on the conduct of war namely this that it frequently leads the combatants away from the principal roads and places into unfrequented or at least unimportant localities when trifling interests which exist for a moment and then disappear are paramount the great features of a country have less influence on the conduct of the war we therefore often find that bodies of troops move to points where we should never look for them judging only by the great and simple requirements of the war and that consequently also the changefulness and diversity in the details of the contest as it progresses are much greater here than in wars directed to a great decision let us only look how in the last five campaigns of the seven years war in spite of the relations in general remaining unchanged in themselves each of these campaigns took a different form and closely examined no single measure ever appears twice and yet in these campaigns the offensive principle manifests itself on the side of the allied army much more decidedly than in most other earlier wars in this chapter on the defence of a theatre of war if no great decision is proposed we have only shown the tendencies of the action together with its combination and the relations and character of the same the particular measures of which it is composed have been described in detail in a former part of our work now the question arises whether for these different tendencies of action no thoroughly general comprehensive principles rules or methods can be given to this we reply that as far as history is concerned we have decidedly not been led to any deductions of that kind through constantly recurring forms and at the same time for a subject so diversified and changeful in its general nature we could hardly admit any theoretical rule except one founded on experience a war directed to great decisions is not only much simpler but also much more in accordance with nature is more free from inconsistencies more objective more restricted by a law of inherent necessity hence the mind can prescribe forms and laws for it but a war without a decision for its object this appears to us to be much more difficult even the two fundamental principles of the earliest theories of strategy published in our times the breadth of the base in bulow and the position of interior lines in Germany, if applied to the defence of a theatre of war have in no instance shown themselves absolute and effective but being mere forms this is just where they should show themselves most efficacious because forms are always more efficacious always acquire a preponderance over other factors of the product the more the action extends over time and space notwithstanding this we find that they are nothing more than particular parts of the subject and certainly anything but decisive advantages it is very clear that the peculiar nature of the means and relations must always from the first have a great influence adverse to all general principles what down did by the extent and provident choice of positions the king did by keeping his army always concentrated always hugging the enemy close and by being always ready to act extemporarily with the whole army the method of each general proceeded not only from the nature of the army he commanded but also from the circumstances in which he was placed to extemporize movements is always much easier for a king than for any commander who acts under responsibility we shall here once more point out particularly that the critic has no right to look upon the different manners and methods which may make their appearance as different degrees on the road to perfection 
the one inferior to the other. They are entitled to be treated as on an equality, and it must rest with the judgment to estimate their relative fitness for use in each particular case. To enumerate these different manners which may spring from the particular nature of an army, of a country, or of circumstances, is not our object here. The influence of these things generally we have already noticed. We acknowledge, therefore, that in this chapter we are unable to give any maxims, rules, or methods, because history does not furnish the means, and on the contrary, at almost every moment, we there meet with peculiarities, such as are often quite inexplicable, and often also surprise us by their singularity. But it is not on that account unprofitable to study history in connection with this subject also, where neither system nor any dogmatic apparatus can be found, there may still be truth and this truth will then, in most cases, only be discovered by a practised judgment and the tact of long experience. Therefore, even if history does not here furnish any formula, we may be certain that here as well, as everywhere else, it will give us exercise for the judgment. We shall only set up one comprehensive general principle, or rather we shall reproduce and present to view more vividly, in the form of a separate principle, the natural presupposition of all that has now been said. All the means which have here been set forth have only a relative value. They are all placed under the legal ban of a certain disability on both sides. Above this region a higher law prevails, and there is a totally different world of phenomena. The general must never forget this. He must never move in imaginary security within the narrower sphere, as if he were in an absolute medium. Never look upon the means which he employs here as the necessary or as the only means and still adhere to them, even when he himself already trembles at their insufficiency. From the point of view at which we have placed ourselves, such an error may appear to be almost impossible, but it is not impossible in the real world, because there are things which do not appear in such sharp contrast. We must just again remind our readers that for the sake of giving clearness, distinctness, and force to our ideas, we have always taken as the subject of our consideration only the complete antithesis, that is, the two extremes of the question, but that the concrete case in war generally lies between these two extremes, and is only influenced by either of these extremes according to the degree in which it approaches nearer towards it. Therefore, quite commonly, everything depends on the general making up his own mind before all other things as to whether his adversary has the inclination and the means of outbidding him by the use of greater and more decisive measures. As soon as he has a reason to apprehend this, he must give up small measures intended to ward off small disadvantages, and the course which remains for him then is to put himself in a better situation by a voluntary sacrifice in order to make himself equal to a greater solution. In other words, the first requisite is that the general should take the right scale in laying out his work. In order to give these ideas still more distinctiveness through the help of real experience, we shall briefly notice a string of cases in which, according to our opinion, a false criterion was made use of, that is, in which one of the generals, in the calculation of his operations, very much underestimated the decisive action intended by his adversary. We begin with the opening of the campaign of 1757, in which the Austrians showed by the disposition of their forces that they had not counted upon so thorough an offensive as that adopted by Frederick the Great. Even the delay of Piccolomini's corps on the Silesian frontier, while Duke Charles of Lorraine was in danger of having to surrender with his whole army, is a similar case of complete misconception of the situation. In 1758 the French were in the first place completely taken in as to the effects of the convention of Kloster Seven, open bracket, a fact certainly, with which we have nothing to do here, close bracket and two months afterwards they were completely mistaken in their judgment of what their opponent might undertake, which very shortly after cost them the country between the Weser and the Rhine. That Frederick the Great, in 1759 at Maxen, and in 1760 at Lancet, completely misjudged his enemies, in not supposing them capable of such decisive measures, has been already mentioned. But in all history we can hardly find a greater error in the criterion than that in 1792. It was then imagined possible to turn the tide in a national war by a moderate-sized auxiliary army, which brought down on those who attempted it the enormous weight of the whole French people, at the time completely unhinged by political fanaticism. We only call this error a great one, because it has proved so since, and not because it would have been easy to avoid it. 
as far as regards the conduct of the war itself it cannot be denied that the foundation of all the disastrous years which followed was laid in the campaign of seventeen ninety four on the side of the allies in that campaign even the powerful nature of the enemy's system of attack was quite misunderstood by opposing to it a pitiful system of extended positions and strategic manoeuvres and further in the want of unanimity between prussia and austria politically and the foolish abandonment of belgium and the netherlands we may also see how little presentiment the cabinets of that day had of the force of the torrent which had just broken loose in the year seventeen ninety six the partial acts of resistance offered at montnot lodi etc etc show sufficiently how little the austrians understood the main point when confronted by a bonaparte in the year eighteen hundred it was not by the direct effect of surprise but by the false view which mellus took of the possible consequences of this surprise that his catastrophe was brought about Ulm in the year eighteen o five was the last knot of a loose network of scientific but extremely feeble strategic combinations good enough to stop a down or a lacy but not a bonaparte the revolution's emperor the indecision and embarrassment of the prussians in eighteen o six proceeded from antiquated pitiful impracticable views and measures being mixed up with some lucid ideas and a true feeling of the immense importance of the moment if there had been a distinct consciousness and a complete appreciation of the position of the country how could they have left thirty thousand men in prussia and then entertained the idea of forming a special theatre of war in westphalia and of gaining any results from a trivial offensive such as that for which Ruchel's and the weimar corps were intended and how could they have talked of danger to magazines and loss of this or that strip of territory in the last moments left for deliberation even in eighteen twelve in the grandest of all campaigns there was no want at first of unsound purposes proceeding from the use of an erroneous standard scale in the headquarters at vilna there was a party of men of high mark who insisted on a battle on the frontier in order that no hostile foot should tread on russian ground with impunity that this battle on the frontier might be lost nay that it would be lost these men certainly admitted for although they did not know that there would be three hundred thousand french to meet eighty thousand russians still they knew that their enemy was considerably superior in numbers the chief error was in the value which they ascribed to this battle they thought it would be a lost battle like many other lost battles whereas it may with certainty be asserted that this great battle on the frontier would have produced a succession of events completely different to those which actually took place even the camp at drissa was a measure at the root of which there lay a completely erroneous standard with regard to the enemy if the russian army had been obliged to remain there they would have been completely isolated and cut off from every quarter and then the french army would not have been at a loss for means to compel the russians to lay down their arms the designer of that camp never thought of power and will on such a scale as that but even bonaparte sometimes used a false standard after the armistice of eighteen thirteen he thought to hold in check the subordinate armies of the allies under blucher and the crown prince of sweden by corps which were certainly not able to offer any effectual resistance but which might impose sufficiently on the cautious to prevent them from risking anything as had so often been done in preceding wars he did not reflect sufficiently on the reaction proceeding from the deep-rooted resentment with which both blucher and bulow were animated and from the imminent danger in which they were placed in general he underestimated the enterprising spirit of old blucher at Leipzig, Blücher alone wrested from him the victory. At Leon, Blücher might have entirely ruined him, and if he did not do so, the cause lay in circumstances completely out of the calculation of Bonaparte. Lastly, at Belle Alliance, the penalty of this mistake reached him like a thunderbolt. End of Book Six, Chapter Thirty, Part Two. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Book Seven, Chapters One through Eight of On War, Volumes Two and Three, by Karl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Book Seven, The Attack. Chapter One, The Attack in Relation to the Defence. 
If two ideas form an exact logical antithesis, that is to say, if the one is the complement of the other, then, in fact, each one is implied in the other, and when the limited power of our mind is insufficient to apprehend both at once, and by the mere antithesis to recognise in the one perfect conception the totality of the other also, still, at all events, the one always throws on the other a strong and, in many parts, a sufficient light. Thus we think the first chapter on the defence throws a sufficient light on all the points of the attack which it touches upon, but it is not so thorough in respect of every point. The train of thought could nowhere be carried to a finality. It is therefore natural that where the opposition of ideas does not lie so immediately at the root of the conception, as in the first chapters, all that can be said about the attack does not follow directly from what has been said on the defence. An alteration of our point of view brings us nearer to the subject, and it is natural for us to observe, at this closer point of view, that which escaped observation at our former standpoint. What is thus perceived will, therefore, be the complement of our former train of thought, and it will not unfrequently happen that what is said on the attack will throw a new light on the defence. In treating of the attack, we shall, of course, very frequently have the same subjects before us, with which our attention has been occupied in the defence, but we have no intention, nor would it be consistent with the nature of the thing, to adopt the usual plan of works on engineering, and in treating of the attack, to circumvent or upset all that we have found of positive value in the defence, by showing that against every means of defence there is an infallible method of attack. The defence has its strong points and weak ones. If the first are not insurmountable, still they can be overcome at a disproportionate price, and that must remain true from whatever point of view we look at it, or we get involved in a contradiction. Further, it is not our intention thoroughly to review the reciprocal action of the means. Each means of defence suggests a means of attack, but this is often so evident that there is no occasion to transfer oneself from our standpoint in treating of the defence to a fresh one for the attack in order to perceive it. The one issues from the other of itself. Our object is, in each subject, to set forth the peculiar relations of the attack, so far as they do not directly come out of the defence, and this mode of treatment must necessarily lead us to many chapters to which there are no corresponding ones in the defence. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 Nature of the Strategical Attack We have seen that the defensive in war generally Therefore, also, the strategic defensive is no absolute state of expectancy in warding off, therefore no completely passive state, but that it is a relative state, and consequently impregnated more or less with offensive principles. In the same way, the offensive is no homogeneous whole, but incessantly mixed up with the defensive. But there is this difference between the two, that a defensive without an offensive return blow cannot be conceived that this return blow is a necessary constituent part of the defensive, whilst in the attack at the blow or act is in itself one complete idea. The defence in itself is not necessarily a part of the attack, but time and space to which it is inseparably bound import into it the defensive as a necessary evil. For in the first place, the attack cannot be continued uninterruptedly up to its conclusion. It must have stages of rest, and in these stages, when its action is neutralised, the state of defence steps in of itself. In the second place, the space which a military force, in its advance, leaves behind it, and which is essential to its existence, cannot always be covered by the attack itself, but must be specially protected. The act of attack in war, but particularly in that branch which is called strategy, is therefore a perpetual alternating and combining of attack and defence. But the latter is not to be regarded as an effectual preparation for attack, as a means by which its force is heightened, that is to say, not as an active principle, but purely as a necessary evil, as the retarding weight arising from the specific gravity of the mass. It is its original sin, its seed of mortality. We say a retarding weight, because if the defence does not contribute to strengthen the attack, it must tend to diminish its effect by the very loss of time which it represents. But now may not this defensive element, which is contained in every attack, have over it a positively disadvantageous influence? 
If we suppose the attack is the weaker, the defence the stronger form of war, it seems to follow that the latter cannot act in a positive sense prejudicially on the former. For as long as we have sufficient force for the weaker form, we should have more than enough for the stronger. In general, that is, as regards the chief part, this is true. In its detail we shall analyse it more precisely in the chapter on the culminating point of victory. But we must not forget that the superiority of the strategic defence is partly founded in this, and that the attack itself cannot take place without a mixture of defence and of a defensive of a very weak kind. What the assailant has to carry about with him of this kind are its worst elements. With respect to these, that which holds good of the whole in a general sense cannot be maintained, and therefore it is conceivable that the defensive may act upon the attack positively as a weakening principle. It is just in these moments of weak defensive in the attack that the positive action of the offensive principle in the defensive should be introduced. During the twelve hours' rest which usually succeeds a day's work, what a difference there is between the situations of the defender in his chosen, well-known and prepared position and that of the assailant occupying a bivouac into which, like a blind man, he has groped his way, or during a longer period of rest, required to obtain provisions and to await reinforcements etc when the defender is close to his fortresses and supplies whilst the situation of the assailant on the other hand is like that of a bird on a tree every attack must lead to a defence what is to be the result of that defence depends on circumstances these circumstances may be very favourable if the enemy's forces are destroyed but they may be very unfavourable if such is not the case Although this defensive does not belong to the attack itself, its nature and effects must react on the attack, and must take part in determining its value. The deduction from this view is that in every attack the defensive, which is necessarily an inherent feature in the same, must come into consideration in order to see clearly the disadvantages to which it is subject, and to be prepared for them. On the other hand, in another respect the attack is always in itself one and the same but the defensive has gradations according as the principle of expectancy approaches to an end this begets forms which differ essentially from each other as has been developed in the chapter on the forms of defence as the principle of the attack is strictly active and the defensive which connects itself with it is only a dead weight there is therefore not the same kind of difference in it no doubt in the energy employed in the attack in the rapidity and force of the blow there may be a very great difference, but only a difference in degree, not in form. It is quite possible to conceive even that the assailant may choose a defensive form, the better to attain his object. For instance, that he may choose a strong position, that he may be attacked there. But such instances are so rare that we do not think it necessary to dwell upon them in our grouping of ideas and facts, which are always found on the practical. We may therefore say that there are no such gradations in the attack as those which present themselves in the defence. Lastly, as a rule, the extent of the means of attack consists of the armed force only. Of course, we must add to these the fortresses, for if in the vicinity of the theatre of war, they have a decided influence on the attack. But this influence gradually diminishes as the attack advances, and it is conceivable that, in the attack, its own fortresses never can play such an important part as in the defence, in which they often become objects of primary importance. The assistance of the people may be supposed in cooperation with the attack. In those cases in which the inhabitants of the country are better disposed towards the invader of the country than they are to their own army. Finally, the assailant may also have allies, but then they are only the result of special or accidental relations, not an assistance proceeding from the nature of the aggressive. Although, therefore, in speaking of the defence we have reckoned fortresses popular insurrections and allies as available means of resistance. We cannot do the same in the attack. There they belong to the nature of the thing. Here they only appear rarely, and for the most part, accidentally. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 Of the Objects of Strategical Attack The overthrow of the enemy is the aim in war. Destruction of the hostile military forces the means, both in attack and defence. By the destruction of the enemy's military force, the defensive is led on to the offensive. The offensive is led by it to the conquest of territory. Territory is therefore the object of the attack, 
but that need not be a whole country it may be confined to a part a province a strip of country a fortress all these things have a substantial value for their political importance in treating for peace whether they are retained or exchanged the object of the strategic attack is therefore conceivable in an infinite number of gradations from the conquest of the whole country down to that of some insignificant place as soon as this object is obtained and the attack ceases the defensive commences we may therefore represent to ourselves the strategic attack as a distinctly limited unit but it is not so if we consider the matter practically that is in accordance with actual phenomena practically the movements of the attack that is its views and measures often glide just as imperceptibly into the defence as the plans of the defence into the offensive it is seldom or at all events not always that a general lays down positively for himself what he will conquer he leaves that dependent on the course of events his attack often leads him further than he had intended after rest more or less he often gets renewed strength without our being obliged to make out of this two quite different acts at another time he is brought to a standstill sooner than he expected without however giving up his intentions and changing to a real defensive we see therefore that if the successful defence may change imperceptibly into the offensive so on the other hand an attack may in like manner change into a defence these gradations must be kept in view in order to avoid making a wrong application of what we have to say of the attack in general end of chapter three chapter four decreasing force of the attack this is one of the principal points in strategy on its right valuation in the concrete depends our being able to judge correctly what we are able to do the decrease of absolute power arises one through the object of the attack the occupation of the enemy's country this generally commences first after the first decision but the attack does not cease upon the first decision two through the necessity imposed on the attacking army to guard the country in its rear in order to preserve its line of communication and means of subsistence three through losses in action and through sickness four distance of the various depots of supplies and reinforcements five sieges and blockades of fortresses six relaxation of efforts seven secession of allies but frequently in opposition to these weakening causes there may be many others which contribute to strengthen the attack it is clear at all events that a net result can only be obtained by comparing these different quantities thus for example the weakening of the attack may be partly or completely compensated or even surpassed by the weakening of the defensive this last is a case which rarely happens we cannot always bring into the comparison any more forces than those in the immediate front or at decisive points not the whole of the forces in the field different examples the french in austria and prussia in russia the allies in france the french in spain end of chapter four chapter five culminating point of the attack the success of the attack is the result of a present superiority of force it being understood that the moral as well as physical forces are included in the preceding chapter we have shown that the power of the attack gradually exhausts itself possibly at the same time the superiority may increase but in most cases it diminishes the assailant buys up prospective advantages which are to be turned to account hereafter in negotiations for peace but in the meantime he has to pay down on the spot for them a certain amount of his military force if a preponderance on the side of the attack although thus daily diminishing is still maintained until peace is concluded the object is attained there are strategic attacks which have led to an immediate peace but such instances are rare the majority on the contrary lead only to a point at which the forces remaining are just sufficient to maintain a defensive and to wait for peace beyond that point the scale turns there is a reaction the violence of such a reaction is commonly much greater than the force of the blow this we call the culminating point of the attack as the object of the attack is the possession of the enemy's territory it follows that the advance must continue till the superiority is exhausted this cause therefore impels us towards the ultimate object and may easily lead us beyond it if we reflect upon the number of the elements of which an equation of the forces in action is composed we may conceive how difficult it is in many cases to determine which of two opponents 
has the superiority on his side often all hangs on the silken thread of imagination everything then depends on discovering the culminating point by fine tact of judgment here we come upon a seeming contradiction the defence is stronger than the attack therefore we should think that the latter can never lead us too far for as long as the weaker form remains strong enough for what is required the stronger form ought to be still more so footnote here follows in the manuscript this note development on this subject after book three in the essay on the culminating point of victory under this title in an envelope endorsed various dissertations as materials an essay has been found which appears to be a revision of the chapter here only sketched it will be found at the end of the seventh book editress's note footnote ends end of chapter five chapter six destruction of the enemy's armies the destruction of the enemy's armed forces is the means to the end and what is meant by this the price it costs different points of view which are possible in respect to the subject one only to destroy as many as the object of the attack requires two or as many on the whole as is possible three the sparing of our own forces as the principal point of view for this may again be carried so far that the assailant does nothing towards the destruction of the enemy's force except when a favourable opportunity offers which may also be the case with regard to the object of the attack as already mentioned in the third chapter the only means of destroying the enemy's armed force is by combat but this may be done in two ways one directly two indirectly through a combination of combats if therefore the battle is the chief means still it is not the only means the capture of a fortress or of a portion of territory is in itself really a destruction of the enemy's force and it may also lead to a still greater destruction and therefore also be an indirect means the occupation of an undefended strip of territory therefore in addition to the value which it has as a direct fulfilment of the end may also reckon as a destruction of the enemy's force as well the manoeuvring so as to draw an enemy out of a district of country which is occupied is somewhat similar and must therefore only be looked at from the same point of view and not as a success of arms properly speaking these means are generally estimated at more than they are worth they have seldom the value of a battle besides which it is always to be feared that the disadvantageous position to which they lead will be overlooked they are seductive through the low price which they cost we must always consider means of this description as small investments from which only small profits are to be expected as means suited only to very limited state relations and weak motives then they are certainly better than battles without a purpose than victories the results of which cannot be realized to the full end of chapter six chapter seven the offensive battle what we have said about the defensive battle throws a strong light upon the offensive also we there had in view that class of battle in which the defensive appears most decidedly pronounced in order that we might convey a more vivid impression of its nature but only the fewer number are of that kind most battles are demi recontres in which the defensive character disappears to a great extent it is otherwise with the offensive battle it preserves its character under all circumstances and can keep up that character the more boldly as the defender is out of his proper s for this reason in the battle which is not purely defensive and in the real recontres there always remains also something of the difference of the character of the battle on the one side and on the other the chief distinctive characteristic of the offensive battle is the manoeuvre to turn or surround therefore the initiative as well a combat in lines formed to envelop has evidently in itself great advantages it is however a subject of tactics the attack must not give up these advantages because the defence has a means of countering them for the attack itself cannot make use of that means inasmuch as it is one that is too closely dependent upon other things connected with the defence to be able to turn to operate with success against the flanks of an enemy whose aim is to turn our line it is necessary to have a well-chosen and well-prepared position but what is much more important is that all the advantages which the defensive possesses cannot be made use of most defences are poor makeshifts the greater number of defenders find themselves in a very harassing and critical position in which expecting the worst they meet the attack half-way the consequence of this 
that battles formed with enveloping lines or even with an oblique front which should properly result from an advantageous relation of the lines of communication are commonly the result of a moral and physical preponderance open brackets marengo austerlitz jena close brackets besides in the first battle fought the base of the assailant if not superior to that of the defender is still mostly very wide in extent on account of the proximity of the frontier he can therefore afford to venture a little the flank attack that is the battle with oblique front is moreover generally more efficacious than the enveloping form it is an erroneous idea that an enveloping strategic advance from the very commencement must be connected with it as at prague open bracket, that strategic measure has seldom anything in common with it and is very hazardous of which we shall speak further in the attack of a theatre of war Close bracket. as it is an object with the commander in the defensive battle to delay the decision as long as possible and gain time because a defensive battle undecided at sunset is commonly one gained therefore the commander in the offensive battle requires to hasten the decision but on the other hand there is a great risk in too much haste because it leads to a waste of forces one peculiarity in the offensive battle is the uncertainty in most cases as to the position of the enemy it is a complete grouping about amongst things that are unknown open bracket austerlitz wagram hohenlinden jena katzbach close bracket the more this is the case so much the more concentration of forces becomes paramount and turning a flank to be preferred to surrounding that the principal fruits of victory are first gathered in the pursuit we have already learned in the twelfth chapter of the fourth book according to the nature of the thing the pursuit is more an integral part of the whole action in the offensive than in the defensive battle end of chapter seven chapter eight passage of rivers one a large river which crosses the direction of the attack is always very inconvenient for the assailant for when he has crossed it he is generally limited to one point of passage and therefore unless he remains close to the river he becomes very much hampered in his movements whether he meditates bringing on a decisive battle after crossing or may expect the enemy to attack him he exposes himself to a great danger therefore without a decided superiority both in moral and physical force a general will not place himself in such a position two from this mere disadvantage of placing a river behind an army a river is much oftener capable of defence than it would otherwise be if we suppose that this defence is not considered the only means of safety but is so planned that even if it fails still a stand can be made near the river then the assailant in his calculations must add to the resistance which he may experience in the defence of the river all the advantages mentioned in number one as being on the side of the defender of a river and the effect of the two together is that we usually see generals show great respect to a river before they attack it if it is defended three but in the preceding book we have seen that under certain conditions the real defence of a river promises right good results and if we refer to experience we must allow that such results follow in reality much more frequently than theory promises because in theory we only calculate with real circumstances as we find them take place while in the execution things commonly appear to the assailant much more difficult than they really are and they become therefore a greater clog on his action suppose for instance an attack which is not intended to end in a great solution and which is not conducted with thorough energy we may be sure that in carrying it out a number of little obstacles and accidents which no theory could calculate upon will start up to the disadvantage of the assailant because he is the acting party and must therefore come first into collision with such impediments let us just think for a moment how often some of the insignificant rivers of lombardy have been successfully defended if on the other hand cases may also be found in military history in which the defence of rivers has failed to realise what was expected of them that lies in the extravagant results sometimes looked for from this means results not found in any kind of way on its technical nature but merely on its well-known efficacy to which people have thought there were no bounds for it is only when the defender commits the mistake of placing his entire dependence on the defence of a river so that in case it is forced he becomes involved in great difficulty in a kind of catastrophe it is only then that the defence of a river can be looked upon as a form of defence favourable to the attack for it is certainly easier to force the passage of a river than to gain an ordinary battle five it follows of itself from what has just been said that the defence of a river may become of great value if no great solution is desired 
but where that is to be expected, either from the superior numbers or energy of the enemy, then this means, if wrongly used, may turn to the positive advantage of the assailant. 6. There are very few river lines of defence which cannot be turned, either on the whole length or at some particular point. Therefore the assailant, superior in numbers and bent upon serious blows, has the means of making a demonstration at one point and passing at another, and then, by superior numbers and advancing, regardless of all opposition, he can repair any disadvantageous relations in which he may have been placed by the issue of the first encounters, for his general superiority will enable him to do so. It very rarely happens that the passage of a river is actually tactically forced by overpowering the enemy's principal post by the effect of superior fire and greater valour on the part of the troops and the expression forcing a passage is only to be taken in a strategic sense, in so far that the assailant, by his passage at an undefended or only slightly defended point within the line of defence, braves all the dangers which, in the defender's view, should result to him through the crossing. But the worst which the assailant can do is to attempt a real passage at several points, unless they lie close enough to each other and admit of all the troops joining in the combat for as the defender must necessarily have his forces separated, therefore, if the assailant fractions his in like manner, he throws away his natural advantage. In that way, Bellegarde lost the battle on the Minkio, 1814, where by chance both armies passed at different points at the same time, and the Austrians were more divided than the French. 7. If the defender remains on this side of the river, it necessarily follows that there are two ways to gain a strategic advantage over him either to pass at some point regardless of his position and so to outbid him in the same means or to give battle in the first case the relations of the base and lines of communications should chiefly decide but it often happens that special circumstances exercise more influence than general relations he who can choose the best positions who knows best how to make his depositions who is better obeyed whose army marches fastest etc may contend with advantage against general circumstances. As regard the second means, it presupposes on the part of the assailant the means, suitable relations, and the determination to fight. But when these conditions may be presupposed, the defender will not readily venture upon this mode of defending a river. 8. As a final result, we must therefore give as our opinion that although the passage of a river in itself rarely presents great difficulties, yet in all cases not immediately connected with great decision, so many apprehensions of the consequences and of future complications are bound up with it that at all events the progress of the assailant may easily be so far arrested that he either leaves the defender on this side of the river or he passes and then remains close to the river for it rarely happens that two armies remain at any length of time confronting one another on different sides of a river but also in cases of a great solution a river is an important object it always weakens and deranges the offensive, and the most fortunate thing in this case is that the defender is introduced through that to look upon the river as a tactical barrier, and to make the particular defence of that barrier the principal act of his resistance, so that the assailant at once obtains the advantage of being able to strike a decisive blow in a very easy manner. Certainly in the first instance this blow will never amount to a complete defeat of the enemy but it will consist of several advantageous combats, and these bring about a state of general relations very adverse to the enemy, as happened to the Austrians on the Lower Rhine, 1796. End of chapter 8. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Book 7, chapters 9 through 15 of On War, volumes 2 and 3, by Carl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Chapter 9. Attack of Defensive Positions. In the book on the defence, it has been sufficiently explained how far defensive positions can compel the assailant either to attack them or to give up his advance. Only those which affect this are subservient to our object and suited to wear out or neutralize the forces of the aggressor either wholly or in part and in so far the attack can do nothing against such positions that is to say there are no means at its disposal by which to counterbalance this advantage but defensive positions are not all really of this kind if the assailant sees he can pursue his object without attacking such a position it would be an error to make the attack 
if he cannot follow out his object then it is a question whether he cannot manoeuvre the enemy out of his position by threatening his flank it is only if such means are ineffectual that a commander determines on the attack of a good position and then an attack directed against one side always in general presents the less difficulty but the choice of the side must depend on the position and direction of the mutual lines of retreat consequently on the threatening of the enemy's retreat and covering our own between these two objects a competition may arise in which case the first is entitled to the preference as it is of an offensive nature therefore homogeneous with the attack whilst the other is of a defensive character but it is certain and may be regarded as a truth of the first importance that to attack an enemy thoroughly inured to war in a good position is a critical thing no doubt instances are not wanting of such battles and of successful ones too as at Torgau, wagram we do not say dresden because we cannot call the enemy there quite a word but upon the whole the danger is small and it vanishes altogether opposed to the infinite number of cases in which we have seen the most resolute commanders make their bow before such positions open bracket torres vedras close bracket we must not however confuse the subject now before us with ordinary battles most battles are real rencontres in which one party certainly occupies a position but one which has not been prepared end of chapter nine chapter ten attack of an entrenched camp it was for a time the fashion to speak with contempt of entrenchments and their utility the cordon lines of the french frontier which had often been burst through the entrenched camp at breslau in which the duke of bevern was defeated the battle of torgau and several other cases led to this opinion of their value and the victories of frederick the great gained by the principle of movement and the use of the offensive threw a fresh light on all kind of defensive action or fighting in a fixed position particularly in entrenchments and brought them still more into contempt certainly when a few thousand men are to defend several miles of country and when entrenchments are nothing more than ditches reversed they are worth nothing and they constitute a dangerous snare through the confidence which is placed in them but is it not inconsistent or rather nonsensical to extend this view even to the idea of field fortification in a mere swaggering spirit as templehof does what would be the object of entrenchments generally if not to strengthen the defence no not only reason but experience in hundreds and thousands of instances show that a well traced sufficiently manned and well defended entrenchment is as a rule to be looked upon as an impregnable point and is also so regarded by the attack starting from this point of the efficiency of a single entrenchment we argue that there can be no doubt as to the attack of an entrenched camp being a most difficult undertaking and one in which generally it will be impossible for the assailant to succeed it is consistent with the nature of an entrenched camp that it should be weakly garrisoned but with good natural obstacles of ground and strong field works it is possible to bid defiance to superior numbers frederick the great considered the attack of the camp of piena as impracticable although he had at his command double the force of the garrison and although it has since been asserted here and there that it was quite possible to have taken it the only proof in favour of this assertion is founded on the bad condition of the saxon troops an argument which does not at all detract in any way from the value of entrenchments but it is a question whether those who have since contended not only for the feasibility but also for the facility of the attack would have made up their minds to execute it at that time we therefore think that the attack of an entrenched camp belongs to the category of quite exceptional means on the part of the offensive it is only if the entrenchments have been thrown up in haste are not completed still less strengthened by obstacles to prevent their being approached or when as is often the case taken altogether the whole camp is only an outline of what it was intended to be a half-finished ruin that then an attack on it may be advisable and at the same time become the road to gain an easy conquest over the enemy end of chapter ten chapter eleven attack of a mountain from the fifth and following chapters of the sixth book may be deduced sufficiently the strategic relations of a mountain generally both as regards the defence and the attack we have also there endeavoured to explain the part which a mountain plays as a line of defence properly so called and from that naturally flows how it is to be looked upon in this signification from the side of the assailant there remains therefore little for us to say here on this important subject 
Our chief result was there that the defence must choose as his point of view a secondary combat or the entirely different one of a great general action. That in the first case the attack of a mountain can only be regarded as a necessary evil because all the circumstances are unfavourable to it, but in the second case the advantages are on the side of the attack. An attack, therefore, armed with the means and the resolution for a battle will give the enemy a meeting in the mountains, and certainly find his account in so doing. But we must here once more repeat that it will be difficult to obtain respect for this conclusion because it runs counter to appearances, and is also at first sight contrary to the experience of war. It has been observed in most cases hitherto that an army pressing forward to the attack, open bracket, whether seeking a great general action or not, close bracket, has considered it an unusual piece of good fortune if the enemy has not occupied the intervening mountains, and has itself then hastened to be beforehand in the occupation of them. No one will find this forestalling of the enemy in any way inconsistent with the interests of the assailant. In our view, this is also quite admissible. Only we must point out clearly a fine distinction here between circumstances. An army advancing against the enemy with the design of bringing him to a general action, if he has to pass over an unoccupied range of mountains, has naturally to apprehend that the enemy may at the last moment block up those very passes which it proposes to use on its march. In such a case the assailant will by no means have the same advantages as if the enemy occupied merely an ordinary mountain position. The latter is, for instance, not then in a position extended beyond measure, nor is he in uncertainty as to the road which the assailant will take. The assailant has not been able to choose his road with reference to the enemy's position, and therefore this battle in the mountains is not then unified with all the advantages on his side of which we have spoken in the sixth book. Under such circumstances, the defender might be found in an impregnable position. According to this, the defender might even have the means at his command of making advantageous use of the mountains for a great battle. This is at any rate possible. But if we reflect on the difficulties which the defender would have to encounter in establishing himself in a strong position in the mountains just at the last moment, particularly if he has left it entirely unoccupied before, we may put down this means of defence as one upon which no dependence can be placed and therefore as one the probability of which the assailant has little reason to dread. But even if it is a very improbable case, yet still it is natural to fear it, for in war many a thing is very natural, and yet, in a certain measure, superfluous. But another measure which the assailant has to apprehend here is a preliminary defence of the mountains by an advanced guard or chain of outposts. This means also will seldom accord with the interests of the defender, but the assailant has not the means of discerning how far it may be beneficial to the defender, or otherwise, and therefore has only to provide against the worst. Further, our view by no means excludes the possibility of a position being quite unassailable from the mountainous character of the ground. There are such positions which are not on that account in the mountains. Open bracket, Piena, Schmotzefen, Meissen, Feldkirch. Close bracket. And it is just because they are not in the mountains that they are so well suited for defence. We may also very well conceive that positions may be found in mountains themselves where the defender might avoid the ordinary disadvantages of mountain positions, as, for instance, on lofty plateau. But they are not common, and we can only take, in our view, the generality of cases. It is just in military history that we see how little mountain positions are suited to decisive defensive battles, for great generals have always preferred a position in the plains, when it was their object to fight a battle of the first order, and throughout the whole range of military history there are no examples of decisive battles in the mountains except in the revolutionary wars, and even there it was plainly a false application and analogy which led to the use of mountain positions, where of necessity a decisive battle had to be fought, open brackets 1793 and 1794 in the Vosges, and 1795-1796 and 1797 in Italy, close bracket. Milas has been generally blamed for not having occupied the Alpine passes in 1800, but such criticisms are nothing more than early notions. We might say childlike judgments founded on appearances. Bonaparte, in Miller's place, would just as little have thought of occupying the passes. The dispositions for the attack of mountain positions are mostly of a tactical nature, but we think it necessary to insert here the following remarks as to the general outline, consequently as to those parts which come into immediate contact with and are coincident with strategy. 
as we cannot move wide of the roads in mountains as we can in other districts and form two or three columns out of one when the exigency of the moment requires that the mass of troops should be divided but on the contrary we are generally confined to long defiles the advance in mountains must generally be made on several rows or rather upon a somewhat broader front two against a mountain line of defence of wide extent the attack must naturally be made with concentrated forces to surround the whole cannot be thought of there and if an important result is to be gained from victory it must be obtained rather by bursting through the enemy's line and separating the wings than by surrounding the force and so cutting it off a rapid continuous advance upon the enemy's principal line of retreat is there the natural endeavour of the assailant three but if the enemy to be attacked occupies a position somewhat concentrated turning movements are an essential part of the scheme of attack as the front attacks fall upon the mass of the defender's forces but the turning movements again must be made more with a view to cutting off the enemy's retreat than as a tactical rolling up of the flank or attack on the rear for mountain positions are capable of a prolonged resistance even in rear if forces are not wanting and the quickest result is invariably to be expected only from the enemy's apprehension of losing his line of retreat this sort of uneasiness arises sooner and acts more powerfully in mountains because when it comes to the worst it is not so easy to make room sword in hand a mere demonstration is no sufficient means here it might certainly manoeuvre the enemy out of his position but it would not ensure any special result the aim must therefore be to cut him off in reality from his line of retreat end of chapter eleven chapter twelve attack of cordon lines if the supreme decision should lie in their defence and their attack they place the assailant in an advantageous situation for their wide extent is still more in opposition to all the requirements of a decisive battle than the direct defence of a river or a mountain range eugene's lines of denson seventeen twelve are an illustration to the point here for their loss was quite equal to a complete defeat but villars would hardly have gained such a victory against eugene in a concentrated position if the offensive side does not possess the means required for a decisive battle then even lines are treated with respect that is if they are occupied by the main body of the army for instance those of stolhofen led by lewis of baden in the year seventeen o three were respected even by villars but if they are only held by a secondary force then it is merely a question of the strength of the corps which we can spare for their attack the resistance in such cases is seldom great but at the same time the result of the victory is seldom worth much the circumvallation lines of a besieger have a peculiar character of which we shall speak in the chapter on the attack of a theatre of war all positions of the cordon kind as for instance entrenched lines of outposts etc etc have always this property that they can be easily broken through but when they are not forced with a view of going further and bringing on a decision there is so little to be gained in general by the attack that it hardly repays the trouble expended end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen manoeuvring one we have already touched upon this subject in the thirtieth chapter of the sixth book it is one which concerns the defence and the attack in common nevertheless it has always in it something more of the nature of the offensive than the defensive we shall therefore now examine it more thoroughly two manoeuvring is not only the opposite of executing the offensive by force by means of great battles it stands also opposed to every such execution of the offensive as proceeds directly from offensive means let it be either an operation against the enemy's communications or line of retreat a diversion etc etc three if we adhere to the ordinary use of the word there is in the conception of manoeuvring an effect which is first produced to a certain extent from nothing that is from a state of rest or equilibrium through the mistakes into which the enemy is enticed it is like the first move in a game of chess it is therefore a game of evenly balanced powers to obtain results from favourable opportunity and then to use these as an advantage over the enemy for but those interests which partly as the final object partly as the principal supports open bracket pivot close bracket of action must be considered in this matter are chiefly a the subsistence from which it is our object to cut off the enemy or to impede his obtaining b the junction with other corps c the threatening other communications with the interior of the country or with other armies or corps d threatening the retreat e attack of isolated points with superior forces these five interests may establish themselves in the smallest features of detail belonging to any particular situation 
and any such object then becomes on that account a point round which everything for a time revolves a bridge a road or an entrenchment often thus plays the principal part it is easy to show in each case that it is only the relation which any such object has to one of the above interests which gives it importance f the result of a successful manoeuvre then is for the offensive or rather for the active party which may certainly be just as well the defensive a piece of land a magazine etc g in a strategic manoeuvre two converse propositions appear which look like different manoeuvres and have sometimes served for the derivation of false maxims and rules and have four branches which are however in reality all necessary constituents of the same thing and are to be regarded as such the first antithesis is the surrounding the enemy and the operating on interior lines the second is the concentration of forces and their extension over several posts h as regards the first antithesis we certainly cannot say that one of its members deserves a general preference over the other for partly it is natural that action of one kind calls forth the other as its natural counterpoise its true remedy partly the enveloping form is homogeneous to the attack but the use of interior lines to the defence and therefore in most cases the first is more suitable to the offensive side the latter to the defensive that form will gain the upper hand which is used with greatest skill i the branches of the other antithesis can just as little be classed the one above the other the stronger force has the choice of extending itself over several posts by that means he will obtain for himself a convenient strategic situation and liberty of action in many respects and spare the physical powers of his troops the weaker on the other hand must keep himself more concentrated and seek by rapidity of movement to counteract the disadvantage of his inferior numbers this greater mobility supposes greater readiness in marching the weaker must therefore put a greater strain on his physical and moral forces a final result which we must naturally come upon everywhere if we would always be consistent and which therefore we regard to a certain extent as the logical test of the reasoning the campaigns of frederick the great against dawn in the years seventeen fifty nine and seventeen sixty and against loudon seventeen sixty one and montecuculus against turin in sixteen seventy three sixteen seventy five have always been reckoned the most scientific combinations of this kind and from them we have chiefly derived our view k just as the four parts of the two antitheses above suspended must not be abused by being made the foundation of false maxims and rules so we must also give a caution against attaching to other general relations such as base ground etc an importance and a decisive influence which they do not in reality possess but the smaller the interests at stake so much the more important the details of time and place become so much the more that which is general and great falls into the background having in a certain measure no place in small calculations is there to be found viewed generally a more absurd situation than that of turenne in sixteen seventy five when he stood with his back close to the rhine his army along a line of three miles in extent and with his bridge of retreat at the extremity of his right wing but his measures enter their object and it is not without reason that they are acknowledged to show a high degree of skill and intelligence we can only understand this result and this skill when we look more closely into the details and judge them according to the value which they must have had in this particular case we are convinced that there are no rules of any kind for strategic manoeuvring that no method no general principle can determine the mode of action but that superior energy precision order obedience intrepidity in the most special and trifling circumstances may find means to obtain for themselves signal advantages and that therefore chiefly on those qualities will depend the victory in this sort of contest end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen attack of morasses inundations woods morasses that is impassable swamps which are only traversed by a few embankments present peculiar difficulties to the tactical attack as we have stated in treating of the defence their breadth hardly ever admits of the enemy being driven from that opposite bank by artillery and of the construction of a roadway across the strategic consequence is that endeavours are made to avoid attacking them by passing round them where the state of culture as in many low countries is so great that the means of passing are innumerable the resistance of the defender is still strong enough relatively but but it is proportionably weakened for an absolute decision and therefore wholly unsuitable for it on the other hand if the low land open bracket as in holland close bracket is aided by inundations the resistance may become absolute and defy every attack 
This was shown in Holland in the year 1672, when after the conquest and occupation of all the fortresses outside the margin of the inundation, 50,000 French troops became available, who first under Conde, then under Luxembourg, were unable to force the line of inundation, although it was only defended by about 20,000 men. The campaign of the Prussians in 1787 under the Duke of Brunswick against the Dutch ended, it is true, in quite a contrary way, as these lines were carried by force very little superior to the defenders and with trifling loss. But the reason of that is to be found in the dissensions amongst the defenders from political animosities and a want of unity in the command. And yet nothing is more certain than that the success of the campaign, that is, the advance through the last line of inundation up to the walls of Amsterdam, depended on a point of such extreme nicety that it is impossible to draw any general deduction from this case. The point alluded to was the leaving unguarded the Sea of Harlem. By means of this, the Duke turned the inundation line and got in rear of the post of Amselvoen. If the Dutch had had a couple of armed vessels on this lake, the Duke would never have got to Amsterdam, for he was au bout de son latin. What influence that might have had on the conclusion of peace does not concern us here, but it is certain that any further question of carrying the last line of inundation would have been put to an end completely. The winter is no doubt the natural enemy of this means of defence, as the French have shown in 1794 and 1795, but it must be a severe winter. Woods which are scarcely passable, we have also included amongst the means which afford the defence powerful assistance. If they are of no great depth, then the assailant may force his way through by several roads running near one another, and thus reach better ground, for no one point can have any tactical strength, as we can never suppose a wood as absolutely impassable as a river or a morass. But when, as in Russia and Poland, a very large tract of country is nearly everywhere covered with wood, and the assailant has not the power of getting beyond it, then certainly his situation becomes very embarrassing. We have only to think of the difficulties he must contend with to subsist his army, and how little he can do in the depths of the forest to make his ubiquitous adversary feel his superiority in numbers. Certainly this is one of the worst situations in which the offensive can be placed. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 Attack of a Theatre of War With the View to a Decision Most of the subjects have been already touched upon in the sixth book and by their mere reflection throw sufficient light on the attack. Moreover, the conception of an enclosed theatre of war has a nearer relation to the defence than to the attack. Many of the leading points, the object of the attack, the sphere of action of victory, etc., have been already treated of in that book, and that which is most decisive and essential on the nature of the attack cannot be made to appear until we get to the plan of war. Still, there remains a good deal to say here, and we shall again commence with the campaign, in which a great decision is positively intended. 1. The first aim of the attack is a victory. To all the advantages which the defender finds in the nature of his situation, the assailant can only oppose superior numbers, and perhaps, in addition, the slight advantage which the feeling of being the offensive and advancing side gives an army. The importance of this feeling, however, is generally overrated, for it does not last long and will not hold out against real difficulties. Of course, we assume that the defender is as faultless and judicious in all he does as the aggressor. Our object in this observation is to set aside those vague ideas of sudden attack and surprise, which in the attack are generally assumed to be fertile sources of victory, and which yet, in reality, never occur except under special circumstances. The nature of the real strategic surprise we have already spoken of elsewhere. If, then, the attack is inferior in physical power, it must have the ascendancy in moral power, in order to make up for the disadvantages which are inherent in the offensive form. If the superiority in that way is also wanting, then there are no good grounds for the attack, and it will not succeed. 2. As prudence is the real genius of the defender, so boldness and self-confidence must animate the assailant. We do not mean that the opposite qualities in each case may be altogether wanting, but that these qualities named have the greatest affinity to the attack and defence respectively. These qualities are only in reality necessary because action in war is no mere mathematical calculation. It is activity which is carried on, if not in the dark, at all events in a feeble twilight, in which we must trust ourselves to the leader who is best suited to carry out the aim we have in view. The weaker the defender shows himself morally, the bolder the assailant should become. 
3. For victory, it is necessary that there should be a battle between the enemy's principal force and our own. This is less doubtful as regards the attack than in regard to the defence, for the assailant goes in search of the defender in his position. But we have maintained in treating of the defensive that the offensive should not seek the defender out if he has placed himself in a false position, because he may be sure that the defender will seek him out, and then he will have the advantage of fighting where the defender has not prepared the ground. Here all depends on the road and direction which have the greatest importance. This is a point which is not examined in the defence, being reserved for the present chapter. We shall, therefore, say what is necessary about it here. 4. We have already pointed out those objects to which the attack should be more immediately directed, and which, therefore, are the ends to be obtained by victory. Now, if these are within the theatre of war which is attacked, and within the probable sphere of victory, then the road to them is the natural direction of the blow to be struck. But we must not forget that the object of the attack does not generally obtain its signification until victory has been gained, and therefore the mind must always embrace the idea of victory with it. The principal consideration for the assailant is, therefore, not so much merely to reach the object as to reach it a conqueror. Therefore, the direction of his blow should not be so much on the object itself as on the way which the enemy's army must take to reach it. This way is the immediate object of the attack. To fall in with the enemy before he has reached this object, to cut him off from it, and in that position to beat him, to do this is to gain an intensified victory. If, for example, the enemy's capital is the object of the attack, and the defender has not placed himself between it and the assailant, the latter would be wrong in marching directly upon the capital. He would do much better by taking his direction upon the line connecting the defender's army with the capital, and seeking there the victory which will place the capital in his hands. If there is no great object within the assailant's sphere of victory, then the enemy's line of communication with the nearest great object to him is the point of paramount importance. The question then for every assailant to ask himself is, if I am successful in the battle, what is the first use I shall make of the victory? The object to be gained, as indicated by the answer to this question, shows the natural direction for his blow. If the defender has placed himself in that direction, he has done right, and there is nothing to do but go and look for him there. If his position is too strong, then the assailant must seek to turn it, that is, to make a virtue of necessity. But if the defender has not placed himself on this right spot, then the assailant chooses that direction, and as soon as he comes in line with the defender, if the latter has not in the meantime had a lateral movement and placed himself across his path, he should then turn himself in the direction of the defender's line of communication in order to seek an action there. If the defender remains quite stationary, then the assailant must wheel round towards him and attack him in rear. Of all the roads amongst which the assailant has a choice, the great roads which serve the commerce of the country are always the best and most natural to choose. To avoid any very great bends, more direct roads, even if smaller, must be chosen. For a line of retreat which deviates much from a direct line is always perilous. 5. The assailant, when he sets out with a view to a great decision, has seldom any reason for dividing his forces, and if, notwithstanding this, he does so, he generally proceeds from a want of clear views. He should, therefore, only advance with his columns on such a width of front as will admit of their all coming into action together. If the enemy himself has divided his forces, so much the better for the assailant, and to preserve this further advantage, small demonstrations should be made against the enemy's corps, which have separated from the main body. These are strategic forces attacks. A detachment of forces for this purpose would be justifiable. Such separation into several columns as is indisputably necessary must be made use of for the disposition of the tactical attack in the enveloping form, for that form is natural to the attack and must not be disregarded without good reason, but it must be only of a tactical nature. For a single strategic envelopment, when a great blow takes place, is a complete waste of power. It can only be excused when the assailant is so strong that there can be no doubt at all about the result. 6. But the attack requires also prudence, for the assailant has also a rear, and has communications which must be protected. This service of protection must be performed, as far as possible, by the manner in which the army advances, that is, eo ipso by the army itself. 
if a force must be specially detailed for this duty, and therefore a partition of forces is required, this cannot but naturally weaken the force of the blow itself, as a large army is always in the habit of advancing with the front of a day's march at least in breadth, therefore if the lines of retreat and communication do not deviate much from the perpendicular, the covering of those lines is in most cases attained by the front of the army. Dangers of this description, to which the assailant is exposed, must be measured chiefly by the situation and character of the adversary. When everything lies under the pressure of an imminent great decision, there is little room for the defender to engage in undertakings of this description. The assailant has, therefore, in ordinary circumstances, not much to fear. But if the advance is over, if the assailant himself is gradually passing into the defensive, then the covering of the rear becomes every moment more necessary, becomes more a thing of the first importance, for the rear of the assailant being naturally weaker than that of the defender, therefore the latter, long before he passes over to the real offensive, and even at the same time that he is yielding ground, may have commenced to operate against the communications of the assailant. End of chapter 15 Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia Book 7, chapters 16 through 19 of On War by Karl von Clausewitz. Translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Chapter 16 Attack of a Theatre of War without the View to a Great Decision. 1. Although there is neither the will nor the power sufficient for a great decision, there may still exist a decided view in a strategic attack but it is directed against some secondary object. If the attack succeeds, then, with the attainment of this object, the whole falls again into a state of rest and equilibrium. If difficulties to a certain extent present themselves, the general progress of the attack comes to a standstill before the object is gained. Then, in its place, commences a mere occasional offensive or strategic manoeuvring. This is the character of most campaigns. 2. The objects which may be the aim of an offensive of this description are a. A strip of territory, gain in means of subsistence, perhaps contributions, sparing our own territory, equivalents in negotiations for peace. Such are the advantages to be derived from this procedure. Sometimes an idea of the credit of the army is attached to it, as was perpetually the case in the wars of the French marshals in the time of Louis the Fourteenth. It makes a very important difference whether a portion of territory can be kept or not. In general, the first is the case only when the territory is on the edge of our own theatre of war and forms a natural complement of it. Only such portions come into consideration as an equivalent in negotiating a peace. Others are usually only taken possession of for the duration of a campaign and to be evacuated when the winter begins. B. One of the enemy's principal magazines. If it is not one of considerable importance, it can hardly be looked upon as the object of an offensive determining a whole campaign. It certainly in itself is a loss to the defender and a gain to the assailant. The great advantage, however, from it for the latter is that the loss may compel the defender to retire a little or give up a strip of territory which he would otherwise have kept. The capture of a magazine is therefore in reality more of a means and is only spoken of here as an object because until captured, it becomes, for the time being, the immediate definite aim of the action. C. The capture of a fortress. We have made the siege of fortresses the subject of a separate chapter to which we refer our readers. For the reasons there explained, it is easy to conceive how it is that fortresses always constitute the best and most desirable objects in those offensive wars and campaigns in which views cannot be directed to the complete overthrow of the enemy or the conquest of an important part of his territory. We may also easily understand how it is that in the wars in the low countries, where fortresses are so abundant, everything has always turned on the possession of one or other of these fortresses, so much so that the successive conquests of whole provinces never once appear as leading features, while on the other hand, each of these strong places used to be regarded as a separate thing, which had an intrinsic value in itself, and more attention was paid to the convenience and facility with which it could be attacked than to the value of the place itself. 
At the same time, the attack of a place of some importance is always a great undertaking because it causes a very large expenditure, and in wars in which the whole is not staked at once on the game, this is a matter which ought to be very much considered. Therefore, such a siege takes its place here as one of the most important objects of a strategic attack. The more unimportant a place is, or the less earnestness there is about the siege, the smaller the preparations for it, the more it is done as a thing en passant so much the smaller also will be the strategic object, and the more it will be a service fit for small forces and limited views. And the whole thing then often sinks into a kind of sham fight, in order to close the campaign with honour, because, as assailant, it is incumbent to do something. d. A successful combat in counter or even battle, for the sake of trophies or merely for the honour of the arms, sometimes even for the mere ambition of the commanders. That this does happen no one can doubt, unless he knows nothing at all of military history. In the campaigns of the French during the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, the most of the offensive battles were of this kind. But what is of more importance for us is to observe that these things are not without objective value. They are not the mere pastime of vanity. They have a very distinct influence on peace, and therefore lead, as it were, direct to the object. The military fame, the moral superiority of the army, and of the general, are things the influence of which, although unseen, never ceases to bear upon the whole action in war. The aim of such a combat, of course, presupposes a. that there is an adequate prospect of victory, b. that there is not a very heavy stake dependent on the issue. Such a battle fought in straitened relations, and with a limited object, must naturally not be confounded with a victory which is not turned to profitable account merely from moral weakness. 3. With the exception of the last of these objects, d. They may all be attained without a combat of importance, and generally they are so obtained by the offensive. Now, the means which the assailant has at command, without resorting to a decisive battle, are derived from the interests which the defensive has to protect in his theatre of war. They consist, therefore, in threatening his lines of communications, either through objects connected with subsistence, as magazines, fertile provinces, water communications, etc., or important points, open brackets, bridges, defiles, and such like, close brackets, or also by placing other corps in the occupation of strong positions situated inconveniently near to him, and from which he cannot again drive us out. The seizure of important towns, fertile districts, disturbed parts of the country, which may be excited to rebellion, the threatening of weak allies, etc., etc. Should the attack effectually interrupt the communications, and in such a manner the defender cannot re-establish them, but at a great sacrifice, it compels the defender to take up another position more to the rear or to a flank to cover the objects, at the same time giving up objects of secondary importance. Thus a strip of territory is left open, a magazine or a fortress uncovered, the one exposed to overrun, the other to be invested. Out of this, combats greater or less may arise, but in such case they are not sought for and treated as an object of the war, but as a necessary evil, and can never exceed a certain degree of greatness and importance. For the operation of the defensive on the communications of the offensive is a kind of reaction, which in wars waged for the great solution can only take place when the lines of operation are very long. On the other hand, this kind of reaction lies more in accordance with the nature of things in wars which are not aimed at the great solution. The enemy's lines of communication are seldom very long in such a case, but then neither is it here so much a question of inflicting great losses of this description on the enemy, a mere impeding and cutting short his means of subsistence often produces an effect, and what the lines want in length is made up for, in some degree, by the length of time which can be expended in this kind of contest with the enemy. For this reason, the covering his strategic flanks becomes an important object for the assailant. If, therefore, a contest or rivalry of this description takes place between the assailant and defender, the assailant must seek to compensate by numbers for his natural disadvantages. If he retains sufficient power and resolution still to venture upon a decisive stroke against the enemy's core or against the enemy's main body itself, the danger which he thus holds over the head of his opponent is his best means of covering himself. 5. In conclusion, we must notice another great advantage which the assailant certainly has over the defender in wars of this kind, which is that of being better able to judge of the intentions and force of his adversary than the latter can, in turn, of his. 
it is much more difficult to discover in what degree an assailant is enterprising and bold than when the defender has something of consequence in his mind. Practically viewed, there usually lies already in the choice of the defensive form of war a sort of guarantee that nothing positive is intended. Besides this, the preparations for a great reaction differ much more from the ordinary preparations for defence than the preparations for a great attack differ from those directed against minor objects. Finally, the defender is obliged to take his measures soonest of the two, which gives the assailant the advantage of playing the last hand. End of chapter 16. Chapter 17. Attack of Fortresses. The attack of fortresses cannot, of course, come before us here in its aspect as a branch of the science of fortification or military works. We have only to consider the subject first in its relation to the strategic object with which it is to be connected, secondly, as regards the choice among several fortresses, and thirdly, as regards the manner in which a siege should be covered. That the loss of a fortress weakens the defence, especially in case it forms an essential part of that defence, that many conveniences accrue to the assailant by gaining possession of one, insomuch as he can use it for magazines and depots, and by means of it can cover districts of country cantonments, etc., that if his offensive at last should have to be changed into the defensive, it forms the very best support for that defensive, all these relations which fortresses bear to theatres of war in the course of war make themselves sufficiently evident by what has been said about fortresses in the book on the defence, the reflection from which throws all the light required on these relations with the attack. In relation to the taking of strong places, there is also a great difference between campaigns which tend to a great decision and others. In the first consequence of this description is always to be regarded as an evil which is unavoidable. As long as there is yet a decision to be made, we undertake no sieges, but such as are positively unavoidable. When the decision has been already given, the crisis, the utmost tension of forces, some time passed, and when, therefore, a state of rest has commenced, then the capture of strong places serves as a consolidation of the conquests made, and then they can generally be carried out, if not without effort and expenditure of force, at least without danger. In the crisis itself, the siege of a fortress heightens the intensity of the crisis to the prejudice of the offensive. It is evident that nothing so much weakens the force of the offensive, and therefore there is nothing so certain to rob it of its preponderance for a season. But there are cases in which the capture of this or that fortress is quite unavoidable if the offensive is to be continued, and in such a case a siege is to be considered as an intensified progress of the attack. The crisis will be so much greater the less there has been decided previously. All that remains now for considerations on this subject belongs to the book on the plan of the war. In campaigns with a limited object, a fortress is generally not the means, but the end itself. It is regarded as a small independent conquest, and as such has the following advantages over every other. 1. That a fortress is a small, distinctly defined conquest, which does not require a further expenditure of force, and therefore gives no cause to fear a reaction. 2. That in negotiating for peace, its value as an equivalent may be turned to account. 3. That a siege is a real progress of the attack, or at least seems so, without constantly diminishing the force, like every other advance of the offensive. 4. That the siege is an enterprise without a catastrophe. The result of these things is that the capture of one or more of the enemy's strong places is very frequently the object of those strategic attacks which cannot aim at any higher object. The grounds which decide the choice of the fortress which should be attacked, in case that may be doubtful, generally are a that it is one which can be easily kept, therefore stands high in value as an equivalent in case of negotiations for peace, b. that the means of taking it are at hand. Small means are only sufficient to take small places, but it is better to take a small one than to fall before a large one. c. its strength in engineering respects, which obviously is not always in proportion to its importance in other respects. Nothing is more absurd than to waste forces before a vast, strong place of little importance, if a place of less strength may be made the object of the attack. d. The strength of the armament and of the garrison as well. If a fortress is weakly armed and insufficiently garrisoned, its capture must naturally be easier, but here we observe that the strength of the garrison and armament are to be reckoned amongst those things which make up the total importance of the place, because garrison and armaments are directly parts of the enemy's military strength, which cannot be said in the same measure of works of fortification. 
The conquest of a fortress with a strong garrison can, therefore, much more readily repay the sacrifice it costs than one with very strong works. E. The facility of moving the siege train. Most sieges fail for want of means, and the means are generally wanting from the difficulty attending their transport. Eugene's siege of Landrechy, 1712, and Frederick the Great's siege of Olmutz, 1758, are very remarkable instances in point. If, lastly, there remains the facility of covering the siege as a point now to be considered. There are two essentially different ways by which a siege may be covered, by entrenching the besieging force, that is, by a line of circumvallation, and by what is called lines of observation. The first of these methods has quite gone out of fashion, although evidently one important point speaks in its favour, namely that by this method the force of the assailant does not suffer by division, exactly that weakening which is so generally found a great disadvantage at sieges. But we grant there is still a weakening in another way, to a very considerable degree, because, one, the position round the fortress, as a rule, is of too great extent for the strength of the army, two, the garrison, the strength of which, added to that of the relieving army, would only make up the force originally opposed to us, under these circumstances is to be looked upon as an enemy's corps in the middle of our camp, which, protected by walls, is invulnerable, or at least not to be overpowered, by which its power is immensely increased. 3. The defence of a line of circumvallation admits of nothing but the most absolute defensive, because the circular order facing outwards is the weakest and most disadvantageous of all possible orders of battle, and is particularly unfavourable to any advantageous counter-attacks. There is no alternative, in fact, but to defend ourselves to the last extremity within the entrenchments. That these circumstances may cause a greater diminution of the army than one-third, which perhaps would be occasioned by forming an army of observation is easy to conceive. If added to that, we now think of the general preference which has existed since the time of Frederick the Great for the offensive, as it is called, but which in reality is not always so, for movements and manoeuvres, and the aversion to entrenchments, we shall not wonder at lines of circumvallation having gone quite out of fashion. But this weakening of the tactical resistance is by no means its only disadvantage, and we have only reckoned up the prejudices which force themselves into the judgment on the lines of circumvallation, next in order after that disadvantage, because they are nearly akin to each other. A line of circumvallation only in reality covers that portion of the theatre of war which it actually encloses, all the rest is more or less given up to the enemy, if special detachments are not made use of to cover it in which way the very partition of the force which it was intended to obviate takes place. Thus the besieging army will always be in anxiety and embarrassment on account of the convoys which it requires, and the covering of the same by lines of circumvallation is not to be thought of if the army and the siege supplies required are considerable, and the enemy is in the field in strong force, unless under such conditions as are found in the Netherlands, where there is a whole system of fortresses lying close to each other and immediate lines connecting them, which cover the rest of the theatre of war, and considerably shorten the lines by which transport can be effected. In the time of Louis the Fourteenth, the conception of a theatre of war had not yet bound itself up with the position of an army. In the Thirty Years' War particularly, the armies moved here and there sporadically before this or that fortress, in the neighbourhood of which there was no enemy's corps at all, and besieged it as long as the siege equipment they had brought with them lasted, and until the enemy's army approached to relieve the place. Then lines of circumvallation had their foundation in the nature of circumstances. In future, it is not likely they will be often used again, unless where the enemy in the field is very weak, or the conception of the theatre of war vanishes before that of the siege. Then it will be natural to keep all the forces united in the siege, as a siege by that means unquestionably gains in energy in a high degree. The lines of circumvallation in the reign of Louis the Fourteenth at Cambrai and Valences were of little use, as the former were stormed by Turenne, opposed to Conde, the latter by Conde, opposed to Turenne. But we must not overlook the endless number of other cases in which they were respected, even when there existed in the place the most urgent need for relief, and when the commander on the defensive side was a man of great enterprise, as in 1708, when Villars did not venture to attack the Allies in their lines at Lyle. Frederick the Great at Ulmutz, 1758, and at Dresden, 1760, although he had no regular lines of circumvallation, had a system which in all essentials was identical. He used the same army to carry on the siege, and also as a covering army. The distance of the Austrian army induced him to adopt this plan at Ulmutz, but the loss of his convoy at Domstadtel made him repent it, 
at Dresden in 1760, the motives which led him to this mode of proceeding were his contempt for the German state's imperial army and his desire to take Dresden as soon as possible. Lastly, it is a disadvantage in lines of circumvallation that, in case of a reverse, it is more difficult to save the siege train. If a defeat is sustained at a distance of one or more days' march from the place besieged, the siege must be raised before the enemy can arrive, and the heavy trains may, in the meantime, gain also a day's march. In taking up a position for an army of observation, an important question to be considered is the distance at which it should be placed from the besieged place. This question will in most cases be decided by the nature of the country or by the position of other armies or corps with which the besiegers have to remain in communication. In other respects, it is easy to see that, with a great distance, the siege is better covered, but that by a smaller distance, not exceeding a few miles, the two armies are better able to afford each other mutual support. End of chapter 17. Chapter 18. Attack of Convoys. The attack and defence of a convoy form a subject of tactics. We should therefore have nothing to say upon the subject here if it was not necessary first to demonstrate generally to a certain extent the possibility of the thing, which can only be done from strategic motives and relations. We should have had to speak of it in this respect before, when treating of the defence, had it not been the little which can be said about it, it can easily be framed to suit both the attack and defence, while at the same time the first plays the higher part in connection with it. A moderate convoy of three or four hundred wagons, let the load be what it may, takes up half a mile. A large convoy is several miles in length. Now, how is it possible to expect that the few troops usually allotted to a convoy will suffice for its defence? If to this difficulty we add the unwieldy nature of the mass, which can only advance at the slowest pace, and which, besides, is always liable to be thrown into disorder, and lastly, that every part of a convoy must be equally protected, because the moment that one part is attacked by the enemy, the whole is brought to a stop and thrown into a state of confusion, we may well ask, how can the covering and defence of such a train be possible at all? Or, in other words, why are not all convoys taken when they are attacked? And why are not all attacked which require an escort, or which is the same thing, all that come within the reach of the enemy? It is plain that all tactical expedients, such as Tempelhof's most impracticable scheme of constantly halting and assembling the convoy at short distances, and then moving off afresh, and the much better plan of Scharnost, of breaking up the convoy into several columns, are only slight correctives of a radical evil. The explanation consists in this, that by far the greater number of convoys derive more security from the strategic situation in general than any other parts exposed to the attacks of the enemy which bestows on their limited means of defence very much increased efficiency convoys generally move more or less in rear of their own army or at least at a great distance from that of the enemy the consequence is that only weak detachments can be sent to attack them and these are obliged to cover themselves by strong reserves added to this the unwieldiness itself of the carriages used makes it very difficult to carry them off the assailant must therefore in general content himself with cutting the traces taking away horses and blowing up powder wagons by which the whole is certainly detained and thrown into disorder but not completely lost by all this we may perceive that the security of such trains lies more in these general relations than in the defensive power of its escort if now to all of this we add the defence of the escort which although it cannot by marching resolutely against the enemy directly cover the convoy is still able to derange the plan of the enemy's attack then at last the attack of a convoy instead of appearing easy and sure of success will appear rather difficult and very uncertain in its result but there remains still a chief point which is the danger of the enemy's army or one of its corps retaliating on the assailants of its convoy and punishing it ultimately for the undertaking by defeating it the apprehension of this puts a stop to many undertakings without the real cause ever appearing so that the safety of the convoy is attributed to the escort and people wonder how a miserable arrangement such as an escort should meet with such respect in order to feel the truth of this observation we have only to think of the famous retreat which frederick the great made through bohemia after the siege of ulmutz seventeen fifty eight when the half of his army was broken into a column of companies to cover the convoy of four thousand carriages what prevented Dawn from falling on this monstrosity? The fear that Frederick would throw himself upon him with the other half of his army and entangle him in a battle which Dawn did not desire. 
what prevented lorden who was constantly at the side of that convoy from falling upon it at zikbowitz sooner and more boldly than he did the fear that he would get a rap over the knuckles ten miles from his main army and completely separated from it by the prussian army he thought himself in danger of a serious defeat if the king who had no reason at that time to be concerned about dawn should fall upon him with the bulk of his forces it is only if the strategic situation of an army involves it in the unnatural necessity of connecting itself with its convoys by the flank or by its front that then these convoys are really in great danger and become an advantageous object of attack for the enemy if his position allows him to detach troops for that purpose the same campaign of seventeen fifty eight affords an instance of the most complete success of an undertaking of this description in the capture of the convoy at domstadtel the road to nice lay on the left flank of the prussian position and the king's forces were so neutralized by the siege and by the corps watching dawn that the partisans had no reason to be uneasy about themselves and were able to make their attack completely at their ease when eugene besieged landrecky in seventeen twelve he drew his supplies for the siege from bouchan by denain therefore in reality from the front of the strategic position it is well known what means he was obliged to use to overcome the difficulty of protecting his convoys on that occasion and in what embarrassments he involves himself ending in a complete change of circumstances the conclusion we draw therefore is that however easy an attack on a convoy may appear in its tactical aspect still it has not much in its favour on strategic grounds and only promises important results in the exceptional instances of lines of communication very much exposed End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen attack on the enemy's army in its cantonments we have not treated of this subject in the defence because a line of cantonments is not to be regarded as a defensive means but as a mere existence of the army in a state which implies little readiness for battle in respect to this readiness for battle we therefore did not go beyond what we required to say in connection with this condition of an army in the thirteenth chapter of the fifth book but here in considering the attack we have to think of an enemy's army in cantonments in all respects as a special object for in the first place such an attack is of a very peculiar kind in itself and in the next place it may be considered as a strategic means of particular efficacy here we have before us therefore not the question of an onslaught on a single cantonment or a small corps dispersed amongst a few villages as the arrangements for that are entirely of a tactical nature but of the attack of a large army distributed in cantonments more or less extensive an attack in which the object is not the mere surprise of a single cantonment but to prevent the assembly of the army the attack of the enemy's army in cantonments is therefore the surprise of an army not assembled if this surprise succeeds fully then the enemy's army is prevented from reaching its appointed place of assembly and therefore compelled to choose another more to the rear as this change of the point of assembly to the rear in a state of such emergency can seldom be effected in less than a day's march but generally will require several days the loss of ground which this occasions is by no means an insignificant loss and this is the first advantage to be gained by the assailant but now this surprise which is in connection with the general relations may certainly at the same time in its commencement be an onslaught on some of the enemy's single cantonments not certainly upon all or upon a great many because that would suppose a scattering of the attacking army to an extent which could never be advisable therefore only the most advanced quarters only those which lie in the direction of the attacking columns can be surprised and even this will seldom happen to many of them as large forces cannot easily approach unobserved however this element of the attack is by no means to be disregarded and we reckon the advantages which may thus be obtained as the second advantage of the surprise a third advantage consists in the minor combats forced upon the enemy in which his losses will be considerable a great body of troops does not assemble itself at once by single battalions at the spot appointed for the general concentration of the army but usually forms itself by brigades divisions or corps in the first place and these masses cannot then hasten at full speed to the rendezvous in case of meeting with an enemy's column in their course they are obliged to engage in a combat now they may certainly come off victorious in the same particularly if the enemy's attacking column is not of sufficient strength but in conquering they lose time and in most cases as may be easily conceived a corps under such circumstances and in the general tendency to gain a point which lies to the rear will not make any beneficial use of its victory on the other hand they may be beaten 
and that is the most probable issue in itself, because they have not had time to organise a good resistance. We may therefore very well suppose that in an attack well planned and executed, the assailant, through these partial combats, will gain up a considerable number of trophies, which become a principal point in the general result. Lastly, the fourth advantage, and the keystone to the whole, is a certain momentary disorganisation and discouragement on the side of the enemy, which, when the force is at last assembled, seldom allows for it being immediately brought into action, and generally obliges the party attacked to abandon still more ground to his assailant, and to make a change generally in his plan of operations. Such are the proper results of a successful surprise of the enemy in cantonments, that is, of one in which the enemy is prevented from assembling his army without loss at the point fixed in his plan. But by the nature of the case, success has many degrees, and therefore the results may be very great in one case, and hardly worth mentioning in another. But even when, through the complete success of the enterprise, these results are considerable, they will seldom bear comparison with the gain of a great battle, partly because in the first place the trophies are seldom as great, and in the next the moral impression never strikes so deep. The general result must always be kept in view, that we may not promise ourselves more from an enterprise of this kind than it can give. Many hold it to be the non plura ultra of offensive activity, but it is not so by any means, as we may see from this analysis, as well as from military history. One of the most brilliant surprises in history is that made by the Duke of Lorraine in 1643 on the cantonments of the French under General Ranzen at Dutlingen. The corps was 16,000 men, and they lost the general commanding and 7,000 men. It was a complete defeat. The want of outposts was the cause of the disaster. The surprise of Turenne at Mergentheim, Mariendal, as the French call it, in 1644, is in like manner to be regarded as equal to a defeat in its effects, for he lost 3,000 men out of 8,000, which was principally owing to his having been led into making an untimely stand after he got his men assembled. Such results we cannot therefore often reckon upon. It was rather the result of an ill-judged action than of the surprise, properly speaking, for Turin might easily have avoided the action, and have rallied his troops upon those in more distant quarters. A third noted surprise is that which Turin made on the Allies under the great elector, the imperial general Bournonville and the Duke of Lorraine, in Alsace in the year 1674. The trophies were very small, the loss of the Allies did not exceed two or three thousand men, which could not decide the fate of a force of 50,000, but the Allies considered that they could not venture to make any further resistance in Alsace, and retired across the Rhine again. This strategic result was all that Turenne wanted, but we must not look for the causes of it entirely in the surprise. Turenne surprised the plans of his opponents more than the troops themselves. The want of unanimity amongst the Allied generals and the proximity of the Rhine did the rest. This event altogether deserves a closer examination, as it is generally viewed in a wrong light. In 1741, Nieperg surprised Frederick the Great in his quarters. The whole of the result was that the king was obliged to fight the Battle of Molwitz before he had collected all his forces, and with a change of front. In 1745, Frederick the Great surprised the Duke of Lorraine in his cantonments in Lusatia. The chief success was through the real surprise of one of the most important quarters, that of Hennersdorf, by which the Austrians suffered the loss of 2,000 men. The general result was that the Duke of Lorraine retreated to Bohemia by Upper Lusatia, but that did not at all prevent his returning into Saxony by the left bank of the Elbe, so that without the Battle of Kesseldorf there would have been no important result. 1758. The Duke Ferdinand surprised the French quarters. The immediate result was that the French lost some thousands of men and were obliged to take up a position behind the Aller. The moral effect may have been of more importance and may have had some influence on the subsequent evacuation of Westphalia. If from these different examples we seek for a conclusion as to the efficacy of this kind of attack, then only the two first can be put in comparison with the battle gained. But the cause were only small, and the want of outposts in the system of war in those days was a circumstance greatly in favour of these enterprises. Although the four other cases must be reckoned completely successful enterprises, it is plain that not one of them is to be compared with a battle gained as respects its result. The general result could not have taken place in any of them, except with an adversary weak in will and character, and therefore it did not take place at all in the case of 1741. In 1806, the Prussian army contemplated surprising the French in this manner in Franconia. 
the case promised well for a satisfactory result. Bonaparte was not present. The French corps were in widely extended cantonments. Under these circumstances, the Prussian army, acting with great resolution and activity, might well reckon on driving the French back across the Rhine with more or less loss. But this was also all. If they reckoned upon more, for instance, on following up their advantages beyond the Rhine, or on gaining such a moral ascendancy that the French would not again venture to appear on the right bank of the river in the same campaign, such an expectation had no sufficient grounds whatever. In the beginning of August 1812, the Russians from Smolensk mediated falling upon the cantonments of the French where Napoleon halted his army in the neighbourhood of Witebsk. But they wanted courage to carry out the enterprise, and it was fortunate for them they did for as the French commander with his centre was not only more than twice the strength of their centre, but also in himself the most resolute commander that ever lived, as further the loss of a few miles of ground would have decided nothing, and there was no natural obstacle in any feature of the country near enough up to which they might pursue their success, and by that means in some measure make it certain, and lastly, as the war of the year 1812 was not in any way a campaign of that kind, which draws itself in a languid way to a conclusion, but the serious plan of an assailant who had made up his mind to conquer his opponent completely, therefore the trifling results to be expected from a surprise of the enemy in his quarters appear nothing else than utterly disproportionate to the solution of the problem. They could not justify a hope of making good by their means the great inequality of forces and other relations. But this scheme shows to serve how a confused idea of the effect of this means may lead to an entirely false application of the same. What has been hitherto said places the subject in the light of a strategic means, but it lies in its nature that its execution also is not purely tactical, but in part belongs again to strategy so far particularly that such an attack is generally made on a front of considerable width, and the army which carries it out can and generally will come to blows before it is concentrated, so that the whole is an agglomeration of partial combats. We must now add a few words on the most natural organisation of such an attack. The first condition is, one, to attack the front of the enemy's quarters in a certain width of front, for that is the only means by which we can really surprise several cantonments, cut off others, and create generally that disorganisation in the enemy's army which is intended. The number of, and the intervals between, the columns must depend on circumstances. Two, the direction of the different columns must converge upon a point where it is intended they should unite for the enemy ends more or less with the concentration of his force, and therefore we must do the same. This point of concentration should, if possible, be the enemy's point of assembly, or lie on his line of retreat. It will naturally be best where the line crosses an important obstacle in the country. The separate columns, when they come in contact with the enemy's forces, must attack them with great determination, with dash and boldness, as they have general relations in their favour, and daring is always there in its right place. From this it follows that the commanders of the separate columns must be allowed freedom of action and full power in this respect. For the tactical plan of attack against those of the enemy's corps that are the first to place themselves in position must always be directed to turn a flank, for the greatest result is always to be expected by separating the corps and cutting them off. Five, each of the columns must be composed of portions of the three arms and must not be stinted in cavalry. It may even sometimes be well to divide amongst them the whole of the reserve cavalry, for it would be a great mistake to suppose that this body of cavalry could play any great part in a mass in an enterprise of this sort. The first village, the smallest bridge, the most insignificant thicket, would bring it to a halt. 6. Although it lies in the nature of a surprise that the assailant should not send his advance guard very far in front, that principle only applies to the first approach to the enemy's quarters. When the fight has commenced in the enemy's quarters, and therefore all that was to be expected from actual surprise has been gained, then the columns of the advanced guard of all arms should push on as far as possible, for they may greatly increase the confusion on the side of the enemy by more rapid movements. It is only by this means that it becomes possible to carry off, here and there, the mass of baggage, artillery, non-effectives and camp followers, which have to be dragged after a cantonment suddenly broken up, and these advanced guards must also be the chief instruments in turning and cutting off the enemy. 7. Finally, the retreat in case of ill success must be thought of, and a rallying point fixed upon beforehand. End of chapter 19. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia.
Book seven, chapters twenty and twenty one of On War, volumes two and three by Carl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Chapter twenty Diversion. According to the ordinary use of language, under the term diversion is understood such an incursion into the enemy's country as draws off a portion of his force from the principal point. It is only when this is the chief end in view, and not the gain of the object which is selected as the point of attack, that it is an enterprise of a special character, otherwise it is only an ordinary attack. Naturally, the diversion must at the same time always have an object of attack, for it is only the value of this object that will induce the enemy to send troops for its protection. Besides, in case the undertaking does not succeed as a diversion, this object is a compensation for the forces expended in the attempt. These objects of attack may be fortresses or important magazines or rich and large towns, especially capital cities, contributions of all kinds. Lastly, assistance may be afforded in this way to discontented subjects of the enemy. It is easy to conceive that diversions may be useful, but they certainly are not so always. On the contrary, they are just as often injurious. The chief condition is that they should withdraw from the principal theatre of war more of the enemy's troops than we employ, on the diversion, for if they only succeed in drawing off just the same number, then their efficacy as diversions, properly called, ceases, and the undertaking becomes a mere subordinate attack. Even where, on account of circumstances, we have in view to attain a very great end with a very small force, as for instance to make an easy capture of an important fortress, and another attack is made adjoining to the principal attack to assist the latter, that is no longer a diversion. When two states are at war, and a third falls upon one of them, such an event is very commonly called a diversion, but such an attack differs in nothing from an ordinary attack except in its direction. There is therefore no occasion to give it a particular name, for in theory it should be a rule only to denote by particular names such things as are in their nature distinct. But if small forces are to attract large ones, there must obviously be some special cause, and therefore... For the object of a diversion, it is not sufficient merely to detach some troops at a point not hitherto occupied. If the assailant, with a small corps of a thousand men, overruns one of his enemy's provinces, not belonging to the theatre of war, and levies contribution, etc., it is easy to see beforehand that the enemy cannot put a stop to this by detaching a thousand men, but that if he means to protect the province from invaders, he must at all events send a considerably larger force. But it may be asked, cannot a defender, instead of protecting his own province, restore the balance by sending a similar detachment to plunder a province in our country? Therefore, if an advantage is to be obtained by an aggressor in this way, it must first be ascertained that there is more to be got, or to be threatened, in the defender's provinces than in his own. If this is the case, then no doubt a weak diversion will occupy a force on the enemy's side greater than that composing the enterprise. On the other hand, this advantage naturally diminishes as the masses increase. For 50,000 men can defend a province of moderate extent not only against equal, but even against somewhat superior numbers. The advantage of large diversions is therefore very doubtful, and the greater they become, the more decisive must be the other circumstances which favour a diversion, if any good is to come out of such an enterprise upon the whole. Now, these favourable circumstances may be a. Forces which the assailant holds available for a diversion without weakening the great mass of his force. b. Points belonging to the defender which are of vital importance to him and can be threatened by a diversion. c. Discontented subjects of the same. d. A rich province which can supply a considerable quantity of munitions of war. If only these diversions are undertaken which, when tested by these different considerations, promise results, it will be found that an opportunity of making a diversion does not occur frequently. But now comes another important point. Every diversion brings war into a district into which the war would not otherwise have penetrated. For that reason, it will always be the means, more or less, of calling forth military forces which would otherwise have continued in abeyance. This will be done in a way which will be very sensibly felt if the enemy has any organised militia and means of arming the nation at large. It is quite the natural order of things, and amply shown by experience, that if a district is suddenly threatened by an enemy's force, and nothing has been prepared beforehand for its defence, 
all the most efficient official functionaries immediately lay hold of and set in motion every extraordinary means that can be imagined in order to ward off the impending danger thus new powers of resistance spring up such as are next to a people's war and may easily excite one this is a point which should be kept well in view in every diversion in order that we may not dig our own graves the expeditions to north holland in seventeen ninety nine and Walcheren in 1809, regarded as diversions, are only to be justified in so far that there was no other way of employing the English troops. But there is no doubt that the sum total of the means of resistance of the French was thereby increased, and every landing in France would have just the same effect. To threaten the French coast certainly offers great advantages, because by that means an important body of troops becomes neutralised in watching the coast, but a landing with a large force can never be justifiable unless we count on the assistance of a province in opposition to the government. The less a great decision is looked forward to in war, the more will diversions be allowable, but so much the smaller will also certainly be the gain to be derived from them. They are only a means of bringing the stagnant masses into motion. Reader's note, heading, execution. 1. A diversion may include in itself a real attack then the execution has no special character in itself except boldness and expedition two it may also have as an object to appear more than it really is being in fact a demonstration as well the special means to be employed in such a case could only suggest themselves to a subtle mind well versed in men and in the existing state of circumstances it follows from the nature of the thing that there must be a great fractioning of forces on such occasions three if the forces employed are not quite inconsiderable and the retreat is restricted to certain points then a reserve on which the whole may rally is an essential condition End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one invasion almost all that we have to say on this subject consists in an explanation of the term we find the expression very frequently used by modern authors and also that they pretend to denote by it something particular Gour de invasion occurs perpetually in french authors they use it as a term for every attack which enters deep into the enemy's country and perhaps sometimes mean to apply it as the antithesis to methodical attack that is one which only nibbles at the frontier but this is a very unphilosophical confusion of language whether an attack is to be confined to the frontier or to be carried into the heart of the country whether it shall make the seizure of the enemy's strong places the chief object or seek out the core of the enemy's power and pursue it unremittingly is the result of circumstances and not dependent on a system in some cases to push forward may be more methodical and at the same time more prudent than to tarry on the frontier but in most cases it is nothing else than just the fortunate result of a vigorous attack and consequently does not differ from it in any respect readers note the follows a heading on the culminating point of victory which is marked with an asterisk the asterisk links to a footnote which says see chapters four and five readers note ends the conqueror in a war is not always in a condition to subdue his adversary completely often in fact almost universally there is a culminating point of victory experience shows this sufficiently but as the subject is one especially important to the theory of war and the pivot of almost all plans of campaigns while at the same time on its surface some apparent contradictions glitter as in ever-changing colours we therefore wish to examine it more closely and look for its essential causes victory as a rule springs from a preponderance of the sum of all physical and moral powers combined undoubtedly it increases this preponderance or it would not be sought for and purchased at a great sacrifice victory itself does this unquestionably also its consequences have the same effect but not to the utmost point generally only up to a certain point this point may be very near at hand and is sometimes so near that the whole of the results of a victorious battle are confined to an increase of the moral superiority how this comes about we have now to examine in the progress of the action in war the combatant force is incessantly meeting with elements which strengthen it and others which weaken it hence it is a question of superiority on one side or the other as every diminution of power on one side is to be regarded as an increase on the opposite it follows of course that this double current this ebb and flow takes place whenever troops are advancing or retiring it is therefore necessary to find out the principal cause of this alteration in the one case to determine the other along with it 
in advancing the most important causes of the increase of strength which the assailant gains are one the loss which the enemy's army suffers because it is usually greater than that of the assailant two the loss which the enemy suffers in inert military means such as magazines depots bridges etc and which the assailant does not share with him three that from the moment the assailant enters the enemy's territory there is a loss of provinces to the defence consequently of sources of new military forces for that the advancing army guards a portion of those resources in other words gains the advantage of living at the expense of the enemy five the loss of internal organization and of the regular action of everything on the side of the enemy six that the allies of the enemy secede from him and others join the conqueror seven lastly the discouragement of the enemy who lets the arms in some measure drop out of his hands the causes of the decrease of strength in an army advancing are one that it is compelled to lay siege to the enemy's fortresses to blockade them or observe them or that the enemy who did the same before the victory in his retreat draws in these corps on his main body two that from the moment the assailant enters the enemy's territory the nature of the theatre of war is changed it becomes hostile we must occupy it for we cannot call any portion our own beyond what is in actual occupation and yet it everywhere presents difficulties to the whole machine which must necessarily tend to weaken its effects three that we are removing further away from our own resources whilst the enemy is drawing nearer to his this causes a delay in the replacement of expended power four that the danger which threatens the state rouses other powers to its protection five lastly the greater efforts of the adversary in consequence of the increased danger on the other hand a relaxation of effort on the side of the victorious state all these advantages and disadvantages can exist together meet each other in a certain measure and pursue their way in opposite directions except that the last meet as real opposites cannot pass therefore mutually exclude each other this alone shows how infinitely different may be the effect of a victory according as it stuns the vanquished or stimulates him to greater exertions we shall now try to characterize in a few words each of these points singly one the loss of the enemy when defeated may be at the greatest in the first moment of defeat and then daily diminish in amount until it arrives at a point where the balance is restored as regards our force but it may go on increasing every day in an ascending ratio the difference of situation and relations determines this we can only say that in general with a good army the first will be the case with an indifferent army the second next to the spirit of the army the spirit of the government is here the most important thing it is of great consequence in war to distinguish between the two cases in practice in order not to stop just at the point where we ought to begin in good earnest and vice versa two the loss which the enemy sustains in that part of the apparatus of war which is inert may ebb and flow just in the same manner and this will depend on the accidental position and nature of the depots from which supplies are drawn this subject however in the present day cannot be compared with the others in point of importance three the third advantage must necessarily increase as the army advances indeed it may be said that it does not come into consideration until an army has penetrated far into the enemy's country that is to say until a third or a fourth of the country have been left in rear in addition the intrinsic value which a province has in connection with the war comes also into consideration in the same way the fourth advantage should increase with the advance but with respect to these two last it is also to be observed that their influence on the combatant powers actually engaged in the struggle is seldom felt so immediately and they only work slowly and by circuitous course therefore we should not bend the bow too much on their account that is to say not place ourselves in any dangerous position the fifth advantage again only comes into consideration if we have made a considerable advance and if by the form of the enemy's country some provinces can be detached from the principal mass as these like limbs compressed by ligatures usually soon die off as to six and seven it is at least probable that they increase with advance furthermore we shall return to them hereafter let us now pass on to the causes of weakness one the besieging blockade and investment of fortresses generally increase as the army advances this weakening influence alone acts so powerfully on the condition of the combatant force that it may soon outweigh all the advantages gained no doubt in modern times a system has been introduced to blockading places with a small number of troops or watching them with a still smaller number and also the enemy must keep garrisons in them nevertheless they remain a great element of security the garrisons consist very often in half of people who have taken no part in the war previously 
before those places which are situated near the line of communication it is necessary for the assailant to leave a force at least double the strength of the garrison and if it is desirable to lay formal siege or to starve out one single considerable place a small army is required for the purpose two the second cause the taking up of a theatre of war in the enemy's country increases necessarily with the advance and if it does not further weaken the condition of the combatant force at the moment it does so at all events in the long run we can only regard as our theatre of war so much of the enemy's country as we actually possess that is to say where we either have small corps in the field or where we have left here and there strong garrisons in large towns or stations along the roads etc now however small the garrisons may be which are detached still they weaken the combatant force considerably but this is the smallest evil every army has strategic flanks that is the country which borders both sides of its lines of communications the weakness of these parts is not sensibly felt as long as the enemy is similarly situated with respect to this but that can only be the case as long as we are in our own country as soon as we get into the enemy's country the weakness of these parts is very much felt because the smallest enterprise promises some result when directed against a long line only feebly or not at all covered and these attacks may be made from any quarter in the enemy's country the further we advance the longer these flanks become and the danger arising from them is enhanced in an increased ratio for not only are they difficult to cover but the spirit of enterprise is also first roused in the enemy chiefly by long insecure lines of communication and the consequences which their loss may entail in case of a retreat are matter of grave consideration all this contributes to place a fresh load on an advancing army at every step of its progress so that if it is not commenced with a more than ordinary superiority it will feel itself always more and more cramped in its plans gradually weakened in its impulsive force and at last in a state of uncertainty and anxiety as to its situation three the third cause the distance from the sources from which the incessantly diminishing combatant force is to be just as incessantly filled up increases with the advance a conquering army is like the light of a lamp in this respect the more the oil which feeds it sinks into the reservoir and recedes from the focus of light the smaller the light becomes until at length it is quite extinguished the richness of the conquered provinces may certainly diminish this evil very much but can never entirely remove it because there are always a number of things which can only be supplied to the army from its own country men in particular because the subsidies furnished by the enemy's country are in most cases neither so promptly nor so surely forthcoming as in our own country because the means of meeting any unexpected requirement cannot be so quickly procured because misunderstandings and mistakes of all kinds cannot so soon be discovered and remedied if a prince does not lead his army in person as became the custom in the last wars if he is not anywhere near it then another and very great inconvenience arises in the loss of time occasioned by communications backwards and forwards for the fullest powers conferred on a sufficient commander of an army are never sufficient to meet every case in the wide expanse of his activity four the change in political alliances if these changes produced a victory should be such as they are disadvantageous to the conqueror they will probably be so in a direct relation to his progress just as in this case if they are of an advantageous nature this all depends on the existing political alliances interests customs and tendencies on princes ministers etc in general we can only say that when a great state which has smaller allies is conquered these usually secede very soon from their alliance so that the victor in this respect with every blow becomes stronger but if the conquered state is small protectors much sooner present themselves when his very existence is threatened and others who have helped to place him in his present embarrassment will turn round to prevent his complete downfall five the increased resistance on the part of the enemy which is called forth sometimes the enemy drops his weapon out of his hands from terror and stupefaction sometimes an enthusiastic paroxysm seizes him every one runs to arms and the resistance is much stronger after the first defeat than it was before the character of the people and of the government the nature of the country and its political alliances are here the data from which the probable effect must be conjectured what countless differences these two last points also make in the plans which may or should be made in war in one case and another whilst one through an excess of caution and what is called methodical proceedings fritters away his good fortune another from want of a rational reflection tumbles into destruction in addition we must here call to mind the supineness 
which not unfrequently comes over the victorious side when danger is removed whilst on the contrary renewed efforts are then required in order to follow up the success if we cast a general glance over these different and antagonistic principles the deduction doubtless is that the profitable use of the onward march in a war of aggression in the generality of cases diminishes the preponderance with which the assailants set out or which has to be gained by victory here the question must naturally strike us if this be so what is it which impels the conqueror to follow up the career of victory to continue the offensive and can this really be called making further use of the victory would it not be better to stop where as yet there is hardly any diminution of the preponderance gained to this we must naturally answer the preponderance of combat forces is only the means not the end the end or object is to subdue the enemy or at least to take from him part of his territory in order thus to put ourselves in a condition to realize the value of the advantages we have gained when we conclude a peace even if our aim is to conquer the enemy completely we must be content that perhaps every step we advance reduces our preponderance but it does not necessarily follow from this that there will be nil before the fall of the enemy the fall of the enemy may take place before that and if it is to be obtained by the last minimum of preponderance it would be an error not to expend it for that purpose the preponderance which we have to acquire in war is therefore the means not the end and it must be staked to gain the latter but it is necessary to know how far it will reach in order not to go beyond that point and instead of fresh advantages reap disaster it is not necessary to introduce special examples from experience in order to prove that this is the way in which the strategic preponderance exhausts itself in the strategic attack it is rather the multitude of instances which has forced us to investigate the causes of it it is only since the appearance of bonaparte that we have known campaigns between civilized nations in which the preponderance has led without interruption to the fall of the enemy before his time every campaign ended with the victorious army seeking to win a point where it could simply maintain itself in a state of equilibrium at this point the movement of victory stopped even if the retreat did not become necessary now this culminating point of victory will also appear in the future in all wars in which the overthrow of the enemy is not the military object of the war and the generality of wars will still be of this kind the natural aim of all single plans of campaigns is the point at which the offensive changes into the defensive but now to overstep this point it is more than simply a useless expenditure of power yielding no further result it is a destructive step which causes reaction and this reaction is according to all general experience productive of most disproportionate effects the last fact is so common and appears so natural and easy to understand that we need not enter circumstantially into the causes want of organization in the conquered land and the very opposite effect which a serious loss instead of the looked-for fresh victory makes on the feelings are the chief causes in every cause the moral forces courage on the one side rising often to audacity and extreme depression on the other now begin generally their active play the losses on the retreat are increased thereby and the hitherto successful party now generally thanks providence if he can escape with only the surrender of all his gains without losing some of his own territory we must now clear up an apparent contradiction it may be generally supposed that as long as progress in the attack continues there must still be a preponderance and that as the defensive which will commence at the end of the victorious career is a stronger form of war than the offensive therefore there is so much the less danger of becoming unexpectedly the weaker party but yet there is and keeping history in view we must admit that the greatest danger of a reverse is often just at the moment when the offensive ceases and passes into the defensive we shall try and find the cause of this the superiority which we have attributed to the defensive form of war consists one in the use of ground two in the possession of a prepared theatre of war three in the support of the people four in the advantage of the state of expectancy it must be evident that these principles cannot always be forthcoming and active in a like degree that is consequently one defence is not always like another and therefore also that the defence will not always have this same superiority over the offensive this must be particularly the case in a defensive which commences after the exhaustion of an offensive and has its theatre of war naturally situated at the apex of an offensive triangle thrust far forward into the country of the four principles above named this defensive only enjoys the first the use of the ground undiminished the second generally vanishes altogether and the third becomes negative and the fourth is very much reduced a few more words only by way of explanation respecting the last 
if the imagined equilibrium under the influence of which whole campaigns have often passed without any results because the side which should assume the initiative is wanting in the necessary resolution and just therein lies as we conceive the advantage of the state of expectancy if this equilibrium is disturbed by any offensive act the enemy's interests damaged and his will stirred up to action then the probability of his remaining in a state of indolent irresolution is much diminished a defence which is organised on conquered territory has a much more irritating character than one upon our own soil the offensive principle is engrafted on it in a certain measure and its nature is thereby weakened the quiet which dawn allowed frederick the second in silesia and saxony he would never have granted him in bohemia thus it is clear that the defensive which is interwoven or mixed up with an offensive undertaking is weakened in all its chief principles and therefore will no longer have the preponderance which belongs to it originally as no defensive campaign is composed of purely defensive elements so likewise no offensive campaign is made up entirely of offensive elements because besides the short intervals in every campaign in which both armies are on the defensive every attack which does not lead to a peace must necessarily end in a defensive in this manner it is the defensive itself which contributes to the weakening of the offensive this is so far from being an idle subtlety that on the contrary we consider it a chief disadvantage of the attack that we are afterwards reduced through it to a very disadvantageous defensive and this explains how the difference which originally exists between the strength of the offensive and defensive forms in war is gradually reduced we shall now show how it may completely disappear and the advantage for a short time may change into the reverse if we may be allowed to make use of an idea from nature we shall be able sooner to explain ourselves it is the time which every force in the material world requires to show its effect a power which if applied slowly by degrees would be sufficient to check a body in motion will be overcome by it if time fails this law of the material world is a striking illustration of many of the phenomena in our inner life if we are once roused to a certain train of thought it is not every motive sufficient in itself which can change or stop that current of thought time tranquillity and durable impressions on our senses are acquired so it is also in war when once the mind has taken a decided direction towards an object or turned back towards a harbour of refuge it may easily happen that the motives which in the one case naturally serve to restrain and those which in the other as naturally excite to enterprise are not felt at once in their full force and as the progress of action in the meantime continues one is carried along by the stream of movement beyond the line of equilibrium beyond the culminating point without being aware of it indeed it may never happen that in spite of the exhaustion of force the assailant supported by the moral forces which specially lie in the offensive like a horse drawing a load up hill finds it less difficult to advance than to stop by this we believe we have now shown without contradiction in itself how the assailant may pass that point where if he had stopped at the right moment he might still through the defensive have had a result that is equilibrium rightly to determine this point is therefore important in framing a plan of a campaign as well as for the offensive that he may not undertake what is beyond his powers open bracket to a certain extent contract debts close bracket as for the defensive that he may perceive and profit by this error if committed by the assailant if now we look back at all the points which the commander should bear in mind in making his determination and remember that he can only estimate the tendency and value of the most important of them through the consideration of many other near and distant relations that he must to a certain extent guess at them guess whether the enemy's army after the first blow will show a stronger core and increasing solidity or like a bologna vial will turn into dust as soon as the surface is injured guess the extent of weakness and prostration which the drying up of certain sources the interpretation of certain communications will produce on the military state of the enemy guess whether the enemy from the burning pain of the blow which has been dealt him will collapse powerless or whether like a wounded bull he will rise to a state of fury lastly guess whether other powers will be dismayed or roused what political alliances are likely to be dissolved and what are likely to be formed when we say that he must hit all this and much more with the tact of his judgment as the rifleman hits a mark it must be admitted that such an act of the human mind is no trifle a thousand wrong roads running here and there present themselves to the judgment and whatever the number the confusion and complexity of objects leaves undone is completed by the sense of danger and responsibility thus it happens that the majority of generals prefer to fall short of the mark 
rather than to approach too close and thus it happens that a fine courage and great spirit of enterprise often go beyond the point and therefore also fail to hit the mark only he that does great things with small means has made a successful hit end of chapter twenty one recording by timothy ferguson gold coast australia Book Eight, Chapters One and Two of On War, Volumes Two and Three, by Carl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Chapter One, Introduction. In the chapter on the essence and object of war, we sketched, in a certain measure, its general conception and pointed out its relations to surrounding circumstances in order to commence with a sound fundamental idea. We there cast a glance at the manifold difficulties which the mind encounters in the consideration of this subject. Whilst we postponed the closer examination of them and stopped at the conclusion that the overthrow of the enemy, consequently the destruction of his combatant force, is the chief object of the whole of the action of war, this put us in a position to show in the following chapter that the means at which the act of war employs is the combat alone in this manner we think we have obtained at the outset a correct point of view having gone through singly all the principal relations and forms which appear in military action but are extraneous to or outside of the combat in order that we might fix more distinctly their value partly through the nature of the thing, partly from the lessons of experience which military history affords, purify them from and root out those vague, ambiguous ideas which are generally mixed up with them, and also to put prominently forward the real object of the act of war, the destruction of the enemy's combatant force, as the primary object universally belonging to it, we now return to war as a whole, as we propose to speak of the plan of war and of campaigns and that obliges us to revert to the ideas in our first book. In these chapters, which are to deal with the whole question, is contained strategy, properly speaking, in its most comprehensive and important features. We enter this innermost part of its domain where all other threads meet, not without a degree of diffidence which, indeed, is amply justified. If, on the one hand, we see how extremely simple the operations of war appear, if we hear and read how the greatest generals speak of it, just in the plainest and briefest manner, how the government and management of this ponderous machine with its hundred thousand limbs is made no more of in their lips than if they were only speaking of their own persons, so that the whole tremendous act of war is individualised into a kind of duel, if we find the motives also of their action brought into connection sometimes with a few simple ideas, sometimes with some excitement of feeling, if we see the easy, sure, we might almost say light manner in which they treat the subject, and now see, on the other hand, the immense number of circumstances which present themselves for the consideration of the mind, the long, often indefinite distances to which the threads of the subject run out, and the number of combinations which lie before us, if we reflect that it is the duty of theory to embrace all of this systematically, that is, with clearness and fullness, and always to refer the action to the necessity of a sufficient cause, then comes upon us an overpowering dread of being dragged down to a pedantic dogmatism, to crawl about in the lower regions of heavy, obtruse conceptions, where we shall never meet any great captain with his natural coup de oil. If the result of an attempt at theory is to be of this kind, it would have been as well, or rather it would have been better, not to have made the attempt. It could only bring down on theory the contempt of genius and the attempt itself would soon be forgotten. And on the other hand, this facile coup de oil of the general, this simple art of forming notions, this personification of the whole action of war is so entirely and completely the soul of the right method of conducting war that in no other but this broad way is it possible to conceive that freedom of the mind which is indispensable if it is to dominate events, not to be overpowered by them. With some fear we proceed again. 
we can only do so by pursuing the way which we have prescribed for ourselves from the first theory ought to throw a clear light on the mass of objects that the mind may the easier find its bearings theory ought to pull up the weeds which error has sown broadcast it should show the relations of things to each other separate the important from the trifling where ideas resolve themselves spontaneously into such a core of truth as is called principle when they of themselves keep such a line as forms a rule theory should indicate the same whatever the mind sees as the rays of light which are awakened in it by this exploration amongst the fundamental notions of things that is the assistance which theory affords the mind theory can give no formulas with which to solve problems it cannot confine the mind's course to the narrow lines of necessity by principles set up on both sides it lets the mind take a look at the mass of objects and their relations and then allows it to go free to the higher regions of action there to act according to the measure of its natural forces with the energy of the whole of those forces combined and to grasp the true and the right as one single clear idea which shooting forth from under the united pressure of all these forces would seem to be rather a product of feeling than of reflection end of chapter one chapter two absolute and real war the plan of war comprehends the whole military act through it that act becomes a whole which must have one final determinate object in which all particular objects must become absorbed no war is commenced or at least no war should be commenced if people acted wisely without saying to themselves what is to be obtained by and in the same the first is the final object the other is the intermediate aim by this chief consideration the whole course of the war is prescribed the extent of the means and the measure of energy are determined its influence manifests itself down to the smallest organ of action we said in the first chapter that the overthrow of the enemy is the natural end of the act of war and that if we would keep within the strictly philosophical limits of the idea there can be no other in reality as this idea must apply to both the belligerent parties it must follow that there can be no suspension in the military act and peace cannot take place until one or other of the parties concerned is overthrown in the chapter on the suppression of the belligerent act we have shown how the simple principle of hostility applied to its embodiment man and all circumstances out of which it makes a war is subject to checks and modifications from causes which are inherent in the apparatus of war but this modification is not nearly sufficient to carry us from the original conception of war to the concrete form in which it almost everywhere appears most wars appear only as an angry feeling on both sides under the influence of which each side takes up arms to protect himself and put his adversary in fear and when the opportunity offers to strike a blow they are therefore not like mutually destructive elements brought into collision but like tensions of two elements still apart which discharge themselves in small partial shocks but what is now the non-conducting medium which hinders the complete discharge why is the philosophical conception not satisfied that medium consists in the number of interests forces and circumstances of various kinds in the existence of the state which are affected by the war and through the infinite ramifications of which the logical consequence cannot be carried out as it would be on the simple threads of a few conclusions in this labyrinth it sticks fast and man who in great things as well as in small usually acts more on the impulse of ideas and feelings than according to strictly logical conclusions is hardly conscious of his own confusion unsteadiness of purpose and inconsistency but if the intelligence by which the war is decreed could even go over all these things relating to the war without for a moment losing sight of its aim still all the other intelligences in the state which are concerned may not be able to do the same thus an opposition arises and with that comes the necessity for a force capable of overcoming the inertia of the whole mass a force which is seldom forthcoming to the full this inconsistency takes place on one or other of the two sides or it may be on both sides and becomes the cause of the war being something quite different to what it should be according to the conception of it 
a half and half production a thing without a perfect inner cohesion this is how we find it almost everywhere and we might doubt whether our notion of its absolute character or nature was founded in reality if we had not seen real warfare make its appearance in this absolute completeness just in our own times after a short introduction performed by the french revolution the impetuous bonaparte quickly brought it up to this point under him it was carried on without slackening for a moment until the enemy was prostrated and the counterstroke followed almost with as little remission is it not natural and necessary that this phenomenon should lead us back to the original conception of war with all its rigorous deductions shall we now rest satisfied with this idea and judge of all wars according to it however much they may differ from it deduce from it all the requirements of theory we must decide upon this point for we can say nothing trustworthy on the plan of war until we have made up our minds whether war should only be of this kind or whether it may be of another kind if we give an affirmative to the first then our theory will be in all respects nearer to the necessary it will be a clearer and more settled thing but what should we say then of all the wars since those of alexander up to the time of bonaparte if we accept some campaigns of the romans we should have to reject them in a lump and yet we cannot perhaps do so without being ashamed of our presumption but an additional evil is that we must say to ourselves that in the next ten years there may perhaps be a war of the same kind again in spite of our theory and that this theory with a rigorous logic is still quite powerless against the force of circumstances we must therefore decide to construe war as it is to be and not from pure conception but by allowing room for everything of a foreign nature which mixes itself up with it and fastens itself upon it all the natural inertia and friction of its parts the whole of the inconsistency the vagueness and hesitation or timidity of the human mind we shall have to grasp the idea that war and the form which we give it proceeds from ideas feelings and circumstances which dominate for the moment indeed if we would be perfectly candid we must admit that this has even been the case when it has taken its absolute character that is under bonaparte if we must do so if we must grant that war originates and takes its form not from a final adjustment of the innumerable relations with which it is connected but from some amongst them which happen to predominate then it follows as a matter of course that it rests upon a play of possibilities probabilities good fortune and bad in which rigorous logical deduction often gets lost and in which it is in a general a useless inconvenient instrument for the head then it also follows that war may be a thing which is sometimes war in a greater sometimes in a lesser degree all this theory must admit but it is its duty to give the foremost place to the absolute form of war and use that form as a general point of direction that whoever wishes to learn something from theory may accustom himself never to lose sight of it to regard it as the natural measure of all his hopes and fears in order to approach it where he can or where he must that a leading idea which lies at the root of our thoughts and actions gives them a certain tone and character even when the immediately determining grounds come from totally different regions is just as certain as that the painter can give this or that tone to his picture by the colours which he lays on his ground theory is indebted to the last wars for being able to do this effectually now without these warning examples of the destructive force of the elements set free she might have talked herself hoarse to no purpose no one would have believed possible what all have now lived to see realised would prussia have ventured to penetrate into france in the year seventeen ninety eight with seventy thousand men if she had foreseen that the reaction in case of failure would be so strong as to overthrow the old balance of power in europe would prussia in eighteen o six have made war with a hundred thousand against france if she had supposed that the first pistol shot would be a spark in the heart of the mine which would blow it into the air End of chapter two recording by timothy ferguson gold coast australia Book Eight, Chapter Three of On War, Volumes Two and Three by Carl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. 
Chapter three A Interdependence of the Parts in War According as we have in view the absolute form of war, or one of the real forms deviating more or less from it, so likewise different notions of its result will arise. In the absolute form, where everything is the effect of its natural and necessary cause, one thing follows another in rapid succession. There is, if we may use the expression, no neutral space. There is, on account of the manifold reactionary effects which the war contains in itself, on account of the connection in which, strictly speaking, the whole series of combats follow one after another, on account of the culminating point which every victory has, beyond which losses and defeats commence, on account of all these natural relations of war, there is, I say, only one result, to wit, the final result. Until it takes place, nothing is decided, nothing won, nothing lost. Here we may say, indeed, the end crowns the work. In this view, therefore, war is an indivisible whole, the parts of which, the subordinate results, have no value except in their relation to the whole. The conquest of Moscow and half of Russia in 1812 was of no value to Bonaparte unless it obtained for him the peace which he desired, but it was only a part of his plan of campaign. To complete that plan, one part was still wanted, the destruction of the Russian army. If we suppose this added to the other successes, then the peace was as certain as it is possible for things of this kind to be. The second part, Bonaparte missed at the right time, and he could never afterwards attain it, and so the whole of the first part was not only useless, but fatal to him. To this view of the relative connection of results in war, which may be regarded as extreme, stands opposed another extreme, according to which war is composed of single individual results in which, as in any number of games played, the proceeding has no influence on the next following, Everything here, therefore, depends only on the sum total of the results, and we can lay up each single one like a counter in play. Just as the first kind of view derives its truth from the nature of things, so we find that of the second in history. There are cases without number, in which a small, moderate advantage might have been gained without any very onerous condition being attached to it. The more the element of war is modified, the more common these cases become. But as little as the first of the views now imagined was ever completely realised in any war, just as little is there any war in which the last suits in all respects, and the first can be dispensed with. If we keep to the first of these supposed views, we must perceive the necessity of every war being looked upon as a whole from the very commencement, and that at the very first step forwards the commander should have his eye in the object to which every line must converge. If we admit the second view then subordinate advantages may be pursued on their own account, and the rest left to subsequent events. As neither of these forms of conception is entirely without result, therefore theory cannot dispense with either, but it makes this difference in the use of them, that it requires the first to be laid as a fundamental idea at the root of everything, and that the latter shall only be used as a modification which is justified by circumstances. If Frederick the Great, in the years 1742, 1744, 1757, and 1758, thrust out from Silesia and Saxony a fresh offensive point into the Austrian Empire, which he knew very well could not lead to a new and durable conquest, like that of Silesia and Saxony, it was done not with a view to overthrow the Austrian Empire, but from a motive, namely, to gain time and strength, and it was optional with him to pursue that subordinate object without being afraid that he should thereby risk his whole existence. Reader's note, there is a footnote at this point which reads, Had Frederick the Great gained the Battle of Colm, and taken prisoner the chief Austrian army, with their two field marshals in Prague, it would have been such a tremendous blow that he might then have entertained the idea of marching to Vienna to make the Austrian court tremble and gain a peace directly. This, in these times unparalleled result, which would have been quite like what we have seen in our day, only still more wonderful and brilliant from the contest, being between a little David and a great Goliath, might very probably have taken place after the gain of this one battle. But that does not contradict the assertion above maintained, for it only refers to what the king originally looked forward to from his offensive. The surrounding and taking prisoners the enemy's army was an event which was beyond all calculation, and which the king never thought of, at least not until the Austrians laid themselves open to it, 
by the unskilful position in which they placed themselves at Prague. Readers note the footnote ends. But if Prussia in 1806 and Austria in 1805-1809 proposed to themselves a still more moderate object, that of driving the French over the Rhine, they would have not acted in a reasonable manner if they had not first scanned in their minds the whole series of events which either, in the case of success or of the reverse, would probably follow the first step and lead up to peace. This was quite indispensable as well to enable them to determine with themselves how far victory might be followed up without danger, and how and where they would be in a condition to arrest the course of victory on the enemy's side. An attentive consideration of history shows wherein the difference of the two cases consists. At the time of the Silesian War, in the 18th century, war was still a mere cabinet affair in which the people only took part as a blind instrument. At the beginning of the 19th century, the people on each side weighed in the scale, the commanders opposed to Frederick the Great were men who acted on commission, and just on that account, men in whom caution was a predominant characteristic. The opponent of the Austrians and Prussians may be described in a few words as the very god of war himself. Must these different circumstances give rise to quite different considerations? Should they not, in the year 1805, 1806, and 1809, have pointed to the extremity of disaster as a very close possibility, nay, even a very great probability, and should they not at the same time have led to widely different plans and measures from any merely aimed at the conquest of a couple of fortresses or a paltry province. They did not do so in a degree commensurate with their importance, although both Austria and Prussia, judging by their armaments, felt that storms were brewing in the political atmosphere. They could not do so, because those relations at that time were not yet so plainly developed as they have been since from history. It is just those very campaigns of 1805, 1806, 1809, and following ones, which have made it easier for us to form a conception of modern absolute war in its destroying energy. Theory demands, therefore, that at the commencement of every war, its character and main outline shall be defined according to what the political conditions and relations lead us to anticipate as probable. The more that, according to this probability, its character approaches the form of absolute war, the more its outline embraces the mass of the belligerent states and draws them into the vortex, so much more complete will be the relation of events to one another in the whole, but so much the more necessary it will also be not to take the first step without thinking what may be the last. B of the magnitude of the object of the war and the efforts to be made the compulsion which we must use towards our enemy will be regulated by the proportions of our own and his political demands in so far as these are mutually known they will give the measure of the mutual efforts but they are not always quite so evident and this may be a first ground of a difference in the means adopted by each the situation and relations of the states are not like each other this may become a second cause. The strength of will, the character and capabilities of the governments are as little like. This is a third cause. These three elements cause an uncertainty in the calculation of the amount of resistance to be expected, consequently an uncertainty as to the amount of means to be applied and the object to be chosen. As in war, the want of sufficient exertion may result not only in failure but in positive harm, Therefore, the two sides respectively seek to outstrip each other, which produces a reciprocal action. This might lead to the utmost extremity of exertion if it was possible to define such a point. But then regard for the amount of the political demands would be lost. The means would lose all relation to the end, and in most cases this aim at an extreme effort would be wrecked by the opposing weight of forces within itself. In this manner, he who undertakes war is brought back again, into a middle course, in which he acts, to a certain extent, upon the principle of only applying so much force, and aiming at such an object in war, as are sufficient for the attainment of its political object. To make this principle practicable, he must renounce every absolute necessity of a result, and throw out of the calculation remote contingencies. Here, therefore, the action of the mind leaves the province of science, strictly speaking, of logic and mathematics, and becomes, in the widest sense of the term, an art, that is, skill in discriminating by the tact of judgment, 
among an infinite multitude of objects and relations that which is the most important and decisive this tact of judgment consists unquestionably more or less in some intuitive comparison of things and relations by which the remote and unimportant are more quickly set aside and the more immediate and important are sooner discovered than they could be by strictly logical deduction in order to ascertain the real scale of the means which we must put forth for war we must think over the political object both on our own side and on the enemy's side we must consider the power and position of the enemy's state as well as our own the character of his government and of his people and the capacities of both and all that again on our own side and the political connections of other states and the effect the war will produce on those states that the determination of these diverse circumstances and their diverse connections with each other is an immense problem that it is the true flash of genius which discovers here in a moment what is right and that it would be quite out of the question to become a master of the complexity merely by a methodical study this is easy to conceive in this sense bonaparte was quite right when he said that it would be a problem in algebra before which a newton might stand aghast if the diversity and magnitude of the circumstances and the uncertainty as to the right measure augment in a high degree the difficulty of obtaining a right result we must not overlook the fact that although the incomparable importance of the matter does not increase the complexity and difficulty of the problem still it very much increases the merit of its solution in men of an ordinary stamp freedom and activity of mind are depressed not increased by the sense of danger and responsibility but where these things give wings to strengthen the judgment there undoubtedly must be unusual greatness of soul first of all therefore we must admit that the judgment on an approaching war on the end of which it should be directed and on the means which are required can only be formed after a full consideration of the whole of the circumstances in connection with it with which therefore must also be combined the most individual traits of the moment next that this decision like all in military life cannot be purely objective but must be determined by the mental and moral qualities of princes statesmen and generals whether they are united in the person of one man or not the subject becomes general and more fit to be treated in the abstract if we look at the general relations in which states have been placed by circumstances at different times we must allow ourselves here a passing glance at history half civilized tartars the republics of ancient times the feudal lords and commercial cities of the middle ages kings of the eighteenth century and lastly princes and people of the nineteenth century all carry on war in their own way carry it on differently with different means and for a different object the tartars seek new abodes they march out as a nation with their wives and children they are therefore greater than any other army in point of numbers and their object is to make the enemy submit or expel him altogether by these means they would soon overthrow everything before them if a high degree of civilization could be made compatible with such a condition the old republics with the exception of rome were of small extent still smaller their armies for they excluded the great mass of the populace they were too numerous and lay too close together not to find it an obstacle to great enterprises in the natural equilibrium in which small separate parts always place themselves according to the general law of nature therefore their wars were confined to devastating the open country and taking some towns in order to ensure to themselves in these a certain degree of influence for the future rome alone forms an exception but not until the later period of its history for a long time by means of small bands it carried on the usual warfare with its neighbours for booty and alliances it became great more through the alliances which it formed and through which neighbouring peoples by degrees became amalgamated with it into one whole than through actual conquests it was only after having spread itself in this manner all over southern italy that it began to advance as a really conquering power carthage fell spain and gaul were conquered greece subdued and its dominion extended to egypt and asia at this period its military power was immense without its efforts being in the same proportion these forces were kept up by its riches it no longer resembled the ancient republics nor itself as it had been it stands alone just as peculiar in their way are the wars of alexander with a small army but distinguished for its intrinsic perfection he overthrew the decayed fabric of the asiatic states 
without rest and regardless of risks he traverses the breadth of asia and penetrates into india no republics could do this only a king in a certain measure his own condottieri could get through so much so quickly the great and small monarchies of the middle ages carried on their wars with feudal armies everything was then restricted to a short period of time whatever could not be done in that time was held to be impracticable the feudal force itself was raised through an organization of vassaldom the bond which held it together was partly legal obligation partly voluntary contract the whole formed a real confederation the armament and tactics were based on the right of might on single combat and therefore little suited to large bodies in fact at no period has the union of states been so weak and the individual citizen so independent all this influenced the character of the wars at that period in the most distinct manner they were comparatively rapidly carried out there was little time spent idly in camps but the object was generally only punishing not subduing the enemy they carried off his cattle burnt his towns and then returned home again the great commercial towns and small republics brought forward the condottieri that was an expensive and therefore as far as visible strength a very limited military force as for its intensive strength it was of still less value in that respect so far from their showing anything like extreme energy or impetuosity in the field their combats were generally only sham fights in a word hatred and enmity no longer roused a state to personal activity but had become articles of trade war lost great part of its danger altered completely its nature and nothing we can say of the character it then assumed would be applicable to it in its reality the feudal system condensed itself by degrees into a decided territorial supremacy the ties binding the state together became closer obligations which concerned the person were made subject of composition by degrees gold became the substitute in most cases and the feudal armies were turned into mercenaries the condottieri formed the connecting link in the change and were therefore for a time the instrument of the more powerful states but this had not lasted long when the soldier hired for a limited term was turned into a standing mercenary and the military force of states now became an army having its base in the public treasury it is only natural that the slow advance to this stage caused a diversified interweaving of all three kinds of military force under henry the fourth we find the feudal contingents condottieri and standing army all employed together the condottieri carried their existence up to the period of the thirty years war indeed there are slight traces of them even in the eighteenth century the other relations of the states of europe at these different periods were quite as peculiar as their military forces upon the whole this part of the world had split up into a mass of petty states partly republics in a state of internal dissension partly small monarchies in which the power of the government was very limited and insecure a state in either of these cases could not be considered as a real unity it was rather an agglomeration of loosely connected forces neither therefore could such a state be considered an intelligent being acting in accordance with simple logical rules it is from this point of view we must look at the foreign politics and wars of the middle ages let us only think of the continual expeditions of the emperors of germany into italy for five centuries without any substantial conquest of that country resulting from them or even having been so much as in view it is easy to look upon this as a fault repeated over and over again as a false view which had its root in the nature of the times but it is more in accordance with reason to regard it as the consequence of a hundred important causes which we can partly realize in idea but the vital energy of which it is impossible for us to understand so vividly as those who were brought into actual conflict with them as long as the great states which have risen out of this chaos required time to consolidate and organize themselves their whole power and energy is chiefly directed to that point their foreign wars are few and those that took place bear the stamp of a state unity not yet well cemented the wars between france and england are the first that appear and yet at that time france is not to be considered as really a monarchy but as an agglomeration of dukedoms and countships england although bearing more the semblance of a unity still fought with the feudal organization and was hampered by serious domestic troubles under louis the eleventh france made its greatest step towards internal unity under charles the eighth it appears in italy as a power bent on conquest 
and under louis the fourteenth it had brought its political state and its standing army to the highest perfection spain attains unity under ferdinand the catholic through accidental marriage connections under charles v suddenly arose the great spanish monarchy composed of spain burgundy germany and italy united what this colossus wanted in unity and internal political cohesion it made up for by gold and its standing army came for the first time into collision with the standing army of france after charles's abdication the great spanish colossus split in two parts spain and austria the latter strengthened by the acquisition of bohemia and hungary now appears on the scene as a great power towing the german confederation like a small vessel behind her the end of the seventeenth century the time of louis the fourteenth is to be regarded as the point in history at which the standing military power such as it existed in the eighteenth century reached its zenith the military force was based on enlistment and money states had organized themselves into complete unities and the governments by commuting the personal obligations of their subjects into a money payment had concentrated their whole power in their treasuries through the rapid strides in social improvements and a more enlightened system of government this power had become very great in comparison to what it had been france appeared in the field with a standing army of a couple of hundred thousand men and the other powers in proportion the other relations of states had likewise altered europe was divided into a dozen kingdoms and two republics it was now conceivable that two of these powers might fight with each other without ten times as many others being mixed up in the quarrel as would certainly have been the case formerly the possible combinations in political relations were still manifold but they could be discerned and determined from time to time according to probability internal relations had almost everywhere settled down into a pure monarchical form the rights and influence of privileged bodies or estates had gradually died away and the cabinet had become a complete unity acting for the state in all its external relations the time had therefore come that a suitable instrument and a despotic will could give war a form in accordance with the theoretical conception and at this epoch appeared three new alexanders gustavus adolphus charles the twelfth and frederick the great whose aim was by small but highly disciplined armies to raise little states to the rank of great monarchies and throw down everything that opposed them if they had only to deal with asiatic states they would have more closely resembled alexander in the parts they acted in any case we may look upon them as the precursors of bonaparte as respects that which may be risked in war but what war gained on the one side in force and consistency was lost again on the other side armies were supported out of the treasury which the sovereign regarded partly as his private purse or at least as a resource belonging to the government and not to the people relations with other states except with respect to a few commercial subjects mostly concerned only the interests of the treasury or of the government not those of the people at least ideas tended everywhere in that way the cabinets therefore looked upon themselves as the owners and administrators of large estates which they were continually seeking to increase without the tenants on these estates being particularly interested in this improvement the people therefore who in the tartar invasions were everything in war who in the old republics and in the middle ages open bracket if we restrict the idea to those possessing the rights of citizens close bracket were of great consequence were in the eighteenth century absolutely nothing directly having only still an indirect influence on the war through their virtues and faults in this manner in proportion as the government separated itself from the people and regarded itself as the state war became more exclusively a business of the government which it carried on by means of the money in its coffers and the idle vagabonds it could pick up in its own and neighbouring countries the consequence of this was that the means which the government could command had tolerably well defined its limits which could be mutually estimated both as to their extent and duration this robbed war of its most dangerous feature namely the effort towards the extreme and the hidden series of possibilities connected therewith the financial means the contents of the treasury the state of the credit of the enemy were approximately known as well as the size of his army any large increase of these at the outbreak of a war was impossible insomuch as the limits of the enemy's power could thus be judged of 
a state felt tolerably secure from complete subjugation and as the state was conscious at the same time of the limits of its own means it saw itself restricted to a moderate aim protected from an extreme there was no necessity to venture on an extreme necessity no longer giving an impulse in that direction that impulse could only now be given by courage and ambition but these found a powerful counterpoise in the political relations even kings in command were obliged to use the instrument of war with caution if the army was dispersed no new one could be got and except the army there was nothing this imposed as a necessity great prudence in all undertakings it was only when a decided advantage seemed to present itself that they made use of the costly instrument to bring about such an opportunity was a general's art but until it was brought about they floated to a certain degree in absolute vacuum there was no ground of action and all forces that is all designs seemed to rest the original motive of the aggressor faded away in prudence and circumspection thus war in reality became a regular game in which time and chance shuffled the cards but its signification was only diplomacy somewhat intensified a more vigorous way of negotiating in which battles and sieges were substituted for diplomatic notes to obtain some moderate advantage in order to make use of it in negotiations for peace was the aim of even the most ambitious this restricted shrivelled up form of war proceeded as we have said from the narrow basis on which it was supported but that excellent generals and kings like gustavus adolphus charles the twelfth and frederick the great at the head of armies just as excellent could not gain more prominence in the general mass of phenomena that even these men were obliged to be contented to remain at the ordinary level of moderate results is to be attributed to the balance of power in europe now that the states had become greater and their centres further apart from each other what had formerly been done through direct perfectly natural interests proximity contact family connections personal friendships to prevent any one single state among the number from becoming suddenly great was effected by a higher cultivation of the art of diplomacy political interests attractions and repulsions developed into a very refined system so that a cannon shot could not be fired in europe without all cabinets having some interest in the occurrence a new alexander must therefore try the use of a good pen as well as his good sword and yet he never went very far with his conquests but although louis the fourteenth had in view to overthrow the balance of power in europe and at the end of the seventeenth century had already got to such a point as to trouble himself little about the general feeling of animosity he carried on war just as it had heretofore been conducted for while his army was certainly that of the greatest and richest monarch in europe in its nature it was just like the others plundering and devastating the enemy's country which play such an important part with the tartars with ancient nations and even in the middle ages were no longer in accordance with the spirit of the age they were justly looked upon as unnecessary barbarity which might easily be retaliated and which did more injury to the enemy's subjects than the enemy's government therefore produced no effect beyond throwing the nation back many stages in all that relates to peaceful arts and civilization war therefore confined itself more and more both regards means and end to the army itself the army with its fortresses and some prepared positions constituted a state in a state within which the element of war slowly consumed itself all europe rejoiced at its taking this direction and held it to be the necessary consequence of the spirit of progress although there lay in this an error insomuch as the progress of the human mind can never lead to what is absurd can never make five out of twice two as we have already said and must again repeat still upon the whole this change had a beneficial effect for the people only it is not to be denied that it had a tendency to make war still more an affair of the state and to separate it still more from the interests of the people the plan of a war on the part of the state assuming the offensive in those times consisted generally in the conquest of one or other of the enemy's provinces the plan of the defender was to prevent this the particular plan of campaign was to take one or other of the enemy's fortresses or to prevent one of our own from being taken it was only when a battle became unavoidable for this purpose that it was sought for and fought whoever fought a battle without this unavoidable necessity from merely innate desire of gaining a victory was reckoned a general with too much daring generally the campaign passed over with one siege or if it was to be a very active one with two sieges and winter quarters which were regarded as a necessity and during which the faulty arrangements of the one could never be taken advantage of by the other 
and in which the mutual relations of the two parties almost entirely ceased, formed a distinct limit to the activity which was considered to belong to one campaign. If the forces opposed were too much of an equality, or if the aggressor was decidedly the weaker of the two, then neither battle nor siege took place, and the whole of the operation of the campaign pivoted on the maintenance of certain positions and magazines, and the regular exhaustion of particular districts of country. As long as war was universally conducted in this manner, and the natural limits of its force were so close and obvious, so far from anything absurd being perceived in it always considered to be in the most regular order and criticism which in the eighteenth century began to turn its attention to the field of art in war addressed itself to details without troubling itself much about the beginning and the end thus there was eminence and perfection of every kind and even field marshal dawn to whom it was chiefly owing that frederick the great completely attained his object and that maria theresa completely failed in hers notwithstanding that could still pass for a great general only now and again a more penetrating judgment made its appearance that is sound common sense acknowledged that with superior numbers something positive should be obtained or war is badly conducted whatever art may be displayed thus matters stood when the french revolution broke out austria and prussia tried their diplomatic art of war this very soon proved insufficient whilst according to the usual way of seeing things all hopes were placed on a very limited military force in seventeen ninety three such a force as no one had any conception of made its appearance war had suddenly become again an affair of the people and that of a people numbering thirty millions every one of whom regarded himself as a citizen of the state without entering here into the details the circumstances with which this great phenomenon was attended we shall confine ourselves to the results which interest us at present by this participation of the people in the war instead of a cabinet and an army a whole nation with its natural weight came into the scale henceforward the means available the efforts which might be called forth had no longer any definite limits the energy with which the war itself might be conducted had no longer any counterpoise and consequently the danger for the adversary had risen to the extreme if the whole war of the revolution passed over without all this making itself felt in its full force and becoming quite evident if the generals of the revolution did not persistently press on to the final extreme and did not overthrow the monarchies of europe if the german armies now and again had the opportunity of resisting with success and checking for a time the torrent of victory the cause lay in reality in that technical incompleteness with which the french had to contend which showed itself first among the common soldiers then in the generals lastly at the time of the directory in the government itself after all this was perfected by the hand of bonaparte this military power based on the strength of the whole nation marched over europe smashing everything in pieces so surely and certainly that where it only encountered the old-fashioned armies the result was not doubtful for a moment a reaction however awoke in due time in spain the war became of itself an affair of the people in austria in the year eighteen o nine the government commenced extraordinary efforts by means of reserves and landwehr which were nearer to the true object and far surpassed in degree what this state had hitherto conceived possible in russia in eighteen twelve the example of spain and austria was taken as a pattern the enormous dimensions of that empire on the one hand allowed the preparations although too long deferred still to produce effect and on the other hand intensified the effect produced the result was brilliant in germany prussia rose up first made the war a national cause and without either money or credit and with a population reduced one half took the field with an army twice as strong as that of eighteen o six the rest of germany followed the example of prussia sooner or later and austria although less energetic than in eighteen o nine still also came forward with more than its usual strength thus it was that germany and russia in the years eighteen thirteen and eighteen fourteen including all those that took an active part in or were absorbed into these two campaigns appeared against france with about a million of men under these circumstances the energy thrown into the conduct of the war was quite different and although not quite on a level with that of the french although at some points timidity was still to be observed the course of the campaigns on the whole may be said to have been in the new not in the old style 
In eight months the theatre of war was removed from the Oda to the Seine. Proud Paris had to bow its head for the first time, and the redoubtable Bonaparte lay fettered on the ground. Therefore, since the time of Bonaparte, war, though being first on one side, then again on the other, an affair of the whole nation, has assumed quite a new nature, or rather it has been approached much nearer to its real nature, to its absolute perfection. The means then called forth had no visible limit, the limit losing itself in the energy and enthusiasm of the government and its subjects. By the extent of the means, and the wide field of possible results, as well as by the powerful excitement of feeling which prevailed, energy in the conduct of war was immensely increased. The object of its action was the downfall of the foe, and not until the enemy lay powerless on the ground was it supposed to be possible to stop, or to come to any understanding with respect to the mutual objects of the contest. Thus, therefore, the element of war, freed from all conventional restrictions, broke loose with all its natural force. The cause was the participation of the people in this great affair of state, and this participation arose partly from the effects of the French Revolution on the internal affairs of countries, partly from the threatening attitude of the French towards all nations. Now, whether this will be the case always in future, whether all wars hereafter in Europe will be carried on with the whole power of the states, and consequently will only take place on account of great interests closely affecting the people, or whether a separation of the interests of the government from those of the people will gradually again arise, would be a difficult point to settle. And least of all, shall we take upon us to settle it? But every one will agree with us that bounds, which to a certain extent existed only in an unconsciousness of what is possible, when once thrown down, are not easily built up again, and that at least, whenever great interests are in dispute, mutual hostility will discharge itself in the same manner as it has done in our times. We here bring our historical survey to a close, for it was not our design to give at a gallop some of the principles on which war has been carried out in each age, but only to show how each period has its own peculiar forms of war, its own restrictive conditions, and its own prejudices. Each period would, therefore, also keep its own theory of war, even if everywhere, in early times, as well as in latter, the task had been undertaken of working out a theory of philosophical principles. The events in each age must, therefore, be judged of in connection with the peculiarities of the time, and only he who, less through an anxious study of minute details than through an accurate glance at the whole, can transfer himself into each particular age, is fit to understand and appreciate its generals. But this conduct of war, conditioned by the peculiar relations of states and of the military forces employed, must still always contain in itself something more general, or rather, something quite general, with which, above everything, theory is concerned. The latest period of past time, in which war reached its absolute strength, contains most of what is of general application and necessary, but it is just as improbable that wars henceforth will all have this grand character as that the wide barriers which have been opened to them will ever be completely closed again. Therefore, by a theory which only dwells upon this absolute war, all cases in which external influences alter the nature of war would be excluded or condemned as false. This cannot be the objective theory, which ought to be the science of war, not under ideal but under real circumstances. Theory, therefore, whilst casting a searching, discriminating and classifying glance at objects, should always have in view the manifold diversity of causes from which war may proceed, and should, therefore, so trace out its great features as to leave room for what is required by the exigencies of time and the moment. Accordingly, we must add that the object which every one who undertakes war proposes to himself, and the means which he calls forth, are determined entirely according to the particular details of his position, and on that very account they will also bear in themselves the character of the time and of the general relations. Lastly, that they are always subject to the general conclusions to be deduced from the nature of war. End of chapter 3. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Book 8, Chapters 4 and 5 of On War. 
volumes two and three by Carl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Chapter four ends in war more precisely defined. Overthrow of the enemy. The aim of war in conception must always be the overthrow of the enemy. This is the fundamental idea from which we set out. Now, what is this overthrow? It does not always imply as necessary the complete conquest of the enemy's country. If the Germans had reached Paris in 1792, there, in all human probability, the war with the revolutionary party would have been brought to an end at once for a season. It was not at all necessary at that time to beat their armies beforehand, for those armies were not yet to be looked upon as potent powers in themselves singly. On the other hand, in 1814, the Allies would not have gained everything by taking Paris, if Bonaparte had still remained at the head of a considerable army. But as his army had nearly melted away, therefore also in the year 1814 and 1815, the taking of Paris decided all. If Bonaparte, in the year 1812, either before or after taking Moscow, had been able to give the Russian army of 120,000 on the Kaluga road a complete defeat, such as he gave the Austrians in 1805 and the Prussian army 1806, then the possession of that capital would have, most probably, have brought about a peace, although an enormous tract of country still remained to be conquered. In the year 1805, it was the Battle of Austerlitz that was decisive, and therefore the previous possession of Vienna and two-thirds of the Austrian states was not sufficient weight to gain for Bonaparte a peace. But, on the other hand also, after that battle of Austerlitz, the integrity of Hungary, still intact, was not of sufficient weight to prevent the conclusion of peace. In the Russian campaign, the complete defeat of the Russian army was the last blow required. The Emperor Alexander had no other army at hand, and therefore peace was the certain consequence of victory. If the Russian army had been on the Danube, along with the Austrian, and had shared in its defeat, then, probably, the conquest of Vienna would not have been necessary, and peace would have been concluded in Linz. In other cases, the complete conquest of a country has not been sufficient, as in the year 1807 in Prussia, when the blow levelled against the Russian auxiliary army, in the doubtful battle of Eylau, was not decisive enough, and the undoubted victory of Friedland was required as a finishing blow, like the victory of Austerlitz in the previous year. We see that here also the result cannot be determined from general grounds, the individual causes which no one knows who is not on the spot, and many of a moral nature which are never heard of, even the smallest traits and accidents which only appear in history as anecdotes, are often decisive. All that theory can say here is as follows, that the great point is to keep the overruling relations of both parties in view. Out of them a certain centre of gravity, a centre of power and movement, will form itself on which everything depends and against the centre of gravity of the enemy, the concentrated blow of all the forces must be directed. The little always depends on the great, the unimportant on the important, and the accidental on the essential. This must guide our view. Alexander had his centre of gravity in his army. So had Gustavus Adolphus, Charles the Twelfth, and Frederick the Great, and the career of any one of them would soon have been brought to a close by the destruction of his army, in states torn by internal dissensions, this centre generally lies in the capital. In small states, dependent on greater ones, it lies generally in the army of these allies. In a confederacy, it lies in the unity of interests, in a national insurrection, in the person of the chief leader, and in public opinion. Against these points, the blow must be directed. If the enemy by this loses his balance, no time must be allowed for him to recover it. The blow must be persistently repeated in the same direction, or, in other words, the conqueror must always direct his blows upon the mass, but not against a fraction of the enemy. It is not by conquering one of the enemy's provinces, with little trouble and superior numbers, and preferring the more secure possession of this unimportant conquest to great results, but by seeking out constantly the heart of the hostile power and staking everything in order to gain all, that we can effectually strike the enemy to the ground. But whatever may be the central point of the enemy's power against which we are to direct our operations, 
still the conquest and destruction of his army is the surest commencement and in all cases the most essential hence we think that according to the majority of ascertained facts the following circumstances chiefly bring about the overthrow of the enemy one dispersion of his army if it forms in some degree a potential force two capture of the enemy's capital city if it is both the centre of the power of the state and the seat of political assemblies and actions three an effectual blow against the principal ally if he is more powerful than the enemy himself we have always hitherto supposed the enemy in war as a unity which is allowable for considerations of a very general nature but having said that the subjugation of the enemy lies in the overcoming of his resistance concentrated in the centre of gravity we must lay aside this supposition and introduce the cases in which we have to deal with more than one opponent if two or more states combine against a third that combination constitutes in a political aspect only one war at the same time this political union has also its degrees the question is whether each state in the coalition possesses an independent interest in and an independent force with which to prosecute the war or whether there is one amongst them on whose interests and forces those of the others lean for support the more that the last is the case the easier it is to look upon the different enemies as one alone and the more readily we can simplify our principal enterprise to one great blow and as long as this is in any way possible it is the most thorough and complete means of success we may therefore establish it as our principle that if we can conquer all our enemies by conquering one of them the defeat of that one must be the aim of the war because in that one we hit the common centre of gravity of the whole war there are very few cases in which this kind of conception is not admissible and where this reduction of several centres of gravity to one cannot be made but if this cannot be done then indeed there is no alternative but to look upon the war as two or more separate wars each of which has its own aim as this case supposes the substantive independence of several enemies consequently a great superiority of the whole therefore in this case the overthrow of the enemy cannot in general come into question we now turn more particularly to the question when is such an object possible and advisable in the first place our forces must be sufficient one to gain a decisive victory over those of the enemy two to make the expenditure of force which may be necessary to follow up the victory to a point at which it will no longer be possible for the enemy to regain his balance next we must feel sure that in our political situation such a result will not excite against us new enemies who may compel us on the spot to set free our first enemy france in the year eighteen o six was able to completely conquer prussia although in doing so it brought down upon itself the whole military power of russia because it was in a condition to cope with the russians in prussia france might have done the same in spain in eighteen o eight as far as regards england but not as regards austria it was compelled to weaken itself materially in spain in eighteen o nine and must have quite given up the contest in that country if it had not otherwise great superiority both physically and morally over austria these three cases should therefore be carefully studied that we may not lose in the last the cause which we have gained in the former ones and be condemned in costs in estimating the strength of forces and that which may be affected by them the idea very often suggests itself to look upon time by a dynamic analogy as a factor of forces and to assume accordingly that half efforts or half the number of forces would accomplish in two years what could only be effected in one year by the whole force united this view which lies at the bottom of military schemes sometimes clearly sometimes less plainly is completely wrong an operation in war like everything else upon earth requires its time as a matter of course we cannot walk from vilna to moscow in eight days but there is no trace to be found in war of any reciprocal action between time and force such as takes place in dynamics time is necessary to both belligerents and the only question is which of the two judging by his position has most reason to expect special advantages from time now exclusive of peculiarities in the situation on one side or the other the vanquished has plainly the most reason at the same time certainly not by dynamic but by psychological laws envy jealousy anxiety for self as well as now and again magnanimity 
are the natural intercessors for the unfortunate they raise up for him on one hand friends and on the other hand weaken and dissolve the coalition amongst his enemies therefore by delay something advantageous is more likely to happen for the conquered than for the conqueror further we must recollect that to make right use of a first victory as we have already shown a great expenditure of force is necessary this is not a mere outlay once for all but has to be kept up like housekeeping on a great scale the forces which have been sufficient to give us possession of a province are not always sufficient to meet this additional outlay by degrees the strain upon our resources becomes greater until at last it becomes insupportable time therefore of itself may bring about a change could the contributions which bonaparte levied from the russians and poles in money and in other ways in eighteen twelve have procured the hundreds of thousands of men that he must have sent to moscow in order to retain his position there but if the conquered provinces are sufficiently important if there are in them points which are essential to the well-being of those parts which are not conquered so that the evil like a cancer is perpetually of itself gnawing further into the system then it is possible that the conqueror although nothing further is done may gain more than he loses now in this state of circumstances if no help comes from without then time may complete the work thus commenced what still remains unconquered will perhaps fall of itself therefore thus time may become a factor of his forces but this can only take place if a return blow from the conquered is no longer possible a change of fortune in his favour no longer conceivable when therefore this factor of his forces is no longer of any value to the conqueror for he has accomplished the chief object the danger of the culminating point is past in short the enemy is already subdued our object in the above reasoning has been to show clearly that no conquest can be finished too soon that spreading it over a greater space of time than is absolutely necessary for its completion instead of facilitating it makes it more difficult if this assertion is true it is further true also that if we are strong enough to effect a certain conquest we must also be strong enough to do it in one march without intermediate stations of course we do not mean by this without short halts in order to concentrate the forces and make other indispensable arrangements by this view which makes the character of a speedy and persistent effort towards a decision essential to offensive war we think we have completely set aside all grounds for that theory which in place of the irresistible continued following up of victory would substitute a slow methodical system as being more sure and prudent but even for those who have readily followed us so far our assertion has perhaps after all so much the appearance of a paradox is at first sight so much opposed and offensive to an opinion which like an old prejudice has taken deep root and has been repeated a thousand times in books that we considered it advisable to examine more closely the foundations of those plausible arguments which may be advanced it is certainly easier to reach an object near us than one at a distance but when the nearest one does not suit our purpose it does not follow that dividing the work that a resting point will enable us to get over the second half of the road easier a small jump is easier than a large one but no one on that account wishing to cross a wide ditch would jump half of it first if we look closely into the foundation of the conception of the so-called methodical offensive war we shall find it generally consists of the following things one conquest of those fortresses belonging to the enemy which we meet with two laying in necessary supplies three fortifying important points as magazines bridges positions etc four resting the troops in quarters during winter or when they require to be recruited in health and refreshed five waiting for the reinforcements of the ensuing year if for the attainment of all these objects we make a formal division in the course of the offensive action a resting point in the movement it is supposed that we gain a new base and renewed force as if our own state was following up in the rear of the army and that the latter laid in renewed vigour for every fresh campaign all these praiseworthy motives may make the offensive war more convenient but they do not make its results surer and are generally only make-believes to cover certain counteracting forces such as the feelings of the commander or irresolution of the cabinet 
we shall try to roll them up from the left flank one the waiting for reinforcements suits the enemy just as well and is we may say more to his advantage besides it lies in the nature of the thing that a state can place in line nearly as many combatant forces in one year as in two for all the actual increase in combatant force in the second year is but trifling in relation to the whole two the enemy rests himself at the same time we do three the fortification of towns and positions is not the work of the army and therefore no ground for delay for according to the present system of subsisting armies magazines are more necessary when the army is in cantonments than when it is advancing as long as we advance with success we continually fall into possession of some of the enemy's provision depots which assist us when the country itself is poor five the taking of the enemy's fortresses cannot be regarded as a suspension of the attack it is an intensified progress and therefore the seeming suspension which is caused thereby is not properly a case such as we allude to it is neither a suspension nor a modifying of the use of force but whether a regular siege a blockade or a mere observation of one or other is most to the purpose is a question which can only be decided according to particular circumstances we can only say this in general that in answering this question another must be clearly decided which is whether the risk will not be too great if while only blockading we at the same time make a further advance where this is not the case and when there is ample room to extend our forces it is better to postpone the formal siege until the termination of the whole offensive movement we must therefore take care not to be led into an error of neglecting the essential through the idea of immediately making secure that which is conquered no doubt it seems as if by thus advancing we at once hazard the loss of what has been already gained our opinion however is that no division of action no resting point no intermediate stations are in accordance with the nature of offensive war and that when the same are unavoidable they are to be regarded as an evil which makes the result not more certain but on the contrary more uncertain and further that strictly speaking if from weakness or any cause we have been obliged to stop a second spring at the object we have in view is as a rule impossible but if such a second spring is possible then the stoppage at the intermediate station was unnecessary and that when an object at the very commencement is beyond our strength it will always remain so we say this appears to be the general truth by which we wish only to set aside the idea that time of itself can do something for the advantage of the assailant but as the political relations may change from year to year therefore on that account alone many cases may happen which are exceptions to this general rule it may appear perhaps as if we had left our general point of view and had nothing in our eye except offensive war but it is not so by any means certainly he who can set before himself the complete overthrow of the enemy as his object will not easily be reduced to take refuge in the defensive the immediate object of which is only to keep possession but as we stand by the declaration throughout that a defensive without any positive principle is a contradiction in strategy as well as in tactics and therefore always come back to the fact that every defensive according to its strength will change to the attack as soon as it has exhausted the advantages of the defensive so therefore however great or small the defence may be we still also include in its contingency the overthrow of the enemy as an object which this attack may have and which is to be considered as the proper object of the defensive and we say that there may be cases in which the assailant notwithstanding he has in view such a great object may prefer at first to make use of the defensive form that this idea is founded in reality is easily shown by the campaign of eighteen twelve the emperor alexander in engaging in the war did not perhaps think of ruining his enemy completely as was done in the sequel but is there anything which makes such an idea impossible and yet if so would it not still remain very natural that the russians began the war on the defensive end of chapter four chapter five ends in war more precisely defined continued limited object in the preceding chapter we have said that under the expression overthrow of the enemy we understand the real absolute aim of the act of war now we shall see what remains to be done when the conditions under which this object might be attained do not exist these conditions presuppose a great physical or moral superiority or a great spirit of enterprise an innate propensity to extreme hazards now 
where all this is not forthcoming the aim in the act of war could only be of two kinds either the conquest of some small or moderate portion of the enemy's territory or the defence of our own until better times this last is the usual case in defensive war whether the one or the other of these aims is of the right kind can always be settled by calling to mind the expression used in reference to the last the waiting till more favourable times implies that we have reason to expect such times hereafter and this waiting for that is defensive war is always based on this prospect on the other hand offensive war that is the taking advantage of the present moment is always commanded when the future holds out a better prospect not to ourselves but to our adversary the third case which is probably the most common is when neither party has anything definite to look for from the future when therefore it furnishes no motive for decision in this case the offensive war is plainly imperative upon him who is politically the aggressor that is who has the positive motive for he has taken up arms with that object and every moment of time which is lost without any good reason is so much lost time for him we have here decided for offensive or defensive war on grounds which have nothing to do with the relative forces of the combatants respectively and yet it may appear that it would be nearer right to make the choice of the offensive or defensive chiefly dependent on the mutual relations of the combatants in point of military strength our opinion is that in doing so we should just leave the right road the logical correctness of our simple argument no one will dispute we shall now see whether in the concrete case it leads to the contrary let us suppose a small state which is involved in a contest with a very superior power and foresees that with each year its position will become worse should it not if war is inevitable make use of the time when its situation is furthest from the worst then it must attack not because the attack in itself ensures any advantages it will rather increase the disparity of forces but because this state is under the necessity of either bringing the matter completely to an issue before the worst time arrives or of gaining at least in the meantime some advantages which it may hereafter turn to account this theory cannot appear absurd but if this small state is quite certain that the enemy will advance against it then certainly it can and may make use of the defensive against its enemy to procure a first advantage there is then at any rate no danger of losing time if again we suppose a small state engaged in a war with a greater and that the future has no influence on their decision still if the small state is politically the assailant we demand of it also that it should go forward to its object if it has had the audacity to propose to itself a positive end in the face of superior numbers that it must also act that is attack the foe if the latter does not save it the trouble waiting would be an absurdity unless at the moment of execution it has altered its political resolution a case which very frequently occurs and contributes in no small degree to give wars an indefinite character these considerations on the limited object apply to its connection both with offensive war and defensive war we shall consider both in separate chapters but we shall first turn our attention to another phase hitherto we have deduced the modifications in the object of war solely from intrinsic reasons the nature of the political view or design we have only taken into consideration in so far as it is or is not directed at something positive everything else in the political design is in reality something extraneous to war but in the second chapter of this book ends and means in war we have already admitted that the nature of the political object the extent of our own or the enemy's demand and our whole political relation practically have a most decisive influence on the conduct of the war and we shall therefore devote the following chapter to that subject specially end of chapter five recording by timothy ferguson gold coast australia book eight chapters six to eight of on war volumes two and three by Karl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Chapter 6. A. Influence of the political object on the military object. We never find that a state joining in the cause of another state takes it up with the same earnestness 
as its own an auxiliary army of moderate strength is sent if it is not successful then the ally looks upon the affair as in a manner ended and tries to get out of it on the cheapest terms possible in european politics it has been usual for states to pledge themselves to mutual assistance by an alliance offensive and defensive not so far that the one takes part in the interests and quarrels of the other but only so far as to promise one another beforehand the assistance of a fixed generally very moderate contingent of troops without regard to the object of the war or the scale on which it is about to be carried on by the principles in a treaty of alliance of this kind the ally does not look upon himself as engaged with the enemy in a war properly speaking which should necessarily begin with a declaration of war and end with a treaty of peace still this idea is nowhere fixed with any distinctness and usage varies one way and another the thing would have a kind of consistency and it would be less embarrassing to the theory of war if this promised contingent of ten twenty or thirty thousand men was handed over entirely to the state engaged in war so that it could be used as required it might then be regarded as a subsidized force but the usual practice is widely different generally the auxiliary force has its own commander who depends only on his own government and to whom they prescribe an object such as best suits the shilly-shally measures they have in view but even if two states go to war with a third they do not always both look in like measure upon this common enemy as one that they must destroy or be destroyed by themselves the business is often settled like a commercial transaction each according to the amount of the risk he incurs or the advantage to be expected takes shares in the concern to the extent of thirty thousand or forty thousand men and acts as if he could not lose more than the amount of his investment not only is this point of view taken when a state comes to the assistance of another in a cause in which it has in a manner little concern but even when both allies have a common and very considerable interest at stake nothing can be done except under diplomatic reservation and the contracting parties usually only agree to furnish a small stipulated contingent in order to employ the rest of the forces according to the special ends to which policy may happen to lead them this way of regarding wars entered into by reason of alliances was quite general and was only obliged to give place to the natural way in quite modern times when the extremity of danger drove men's minds in the natural direction as in the wars against bonaparte and when the most boundless power compelled them to it as under bonaparte it was an abnormal thing an anomaly for war and peace are ideas in which their foundations can have no gradations nevertheless it was no mere diplomatic offspring which the reason could look down upon but deeply rooted in the natural limitedness and weakness of human nature lastly even in wars carried out without allies the political cause of a war has a great influence on the method in which it is conducted if we only require from the enemy a small sacrifice then we content ourselves with aiming at a small equivalent by the war and we expect to attain that by moderate efforts the enemy reasons in very much the same way now if one or the other finds that he has erred in his reckoning that in place of being slightly superior to the enemy as he supposed he is if anything rather weaker still at that moment money and all other means as well as sufficient moral impulse for greater exertions are very often deficient in such a case he just does what is called the best he can hopes better things in the future although he has not the slightest foundation for such hope and the war in the meantime drags itself feebly along like a body worn out with sickness thus it comes to pass that the reciprocal action the rivalry the violence and impetuosity of war lose themselves in the stagnation of weak motives and that both parties move with a certain kind of security in very circumscribed spheres if this influence of the political object is once permitted as it then must be there is no longer any limit and we must be pleased to come down to such warfare as consists in a mere threatening of the enemy and in negotiating that the theory of war if it is to be and to continue a philosophical study finds itself here in a difficulty is clear all that is essentially inherent in the conception of war seems to fly from it and it is in danger of being left without any point of support but the natural outlet soon shows itself 
according as a modifying principle gains influence over the act of war or rather the weaker the motives to action become the more the action will glide into a passive resistance the less eventful it will become and the less it will require guiding principles all military art then changes itself into mere prudence the principal object of which will be to prevent the trembling balance from suddenly turning to our disadvantage and the half war from changing into a complete one b war is an instrument of policy having made the requisite examination on both sides of that state of antagonism in which the nature of war stands with relation to other interests of men individually and of the bond of society in order not to neglect any of the opposing elements an antagonism which is founded in our own nature and which therefore no philosophy can unravel we shall now look for that unity into which in practical life these antagonistic elements combine themselves by partly neutralizing each other we should have brought forward this unity at the very commencement if it had not been necessary to bring out this contradiction very plainly and also to look at the different elements separately now this unity is the conception that war is only a part of political intercourse therefore by no means an independent thing in itself we know certainly that war is only called forth through the political intercourse of governments and nations but in general it is supposed that such intercourse is broken off by war and that a totally different state of things ensues subject to no laws but its own we maintain on the contrary that war is nothing but a continuation of political intercourse with a mixture of other means we say mixed with other means in order thereby to maintain at the same time that this political intercourse does not cease by the war itself is not changed into something quite different but that in essence it continues to exist whatever may be the form of the means which it uses and that the chief lines on which the events of the war progress and to which they are attached are only the general features of policy which run all through the war until peace takes place and how can we conceive it to be otherwise does the cessation of diplomatic notes stop the political relations between nations and governments is not war merely another kind of writing and language for political thought it has certainly a grammar of its own but its logic is not peculiar to itself accordingly war can never be separated from political intercourse and if in the consideration of the matter this is done in any way all the threads of the different relations are to a certain extent broken and we have before us a senseless thing without an object this kind of idea would be indispensable even if war was perfect war the perfectly unbridled element of hostility for all the circumstances on which it rests and which determine its leading features viz our own power the enemy's power allies on both sides the characteristics of the people and their governments respectively etc as enumerated in the first chapter of the book are they not of a political nature and are they not so intimately connected with the whole political intercourse that it is impossible to separate them but this view is doubly indispensable if we reflect that a real war is no such consistent effort tending to an extreme as it should be according to the abstract idea but a half and half thing a contradiction in itself that as such it cannot follow its own laws but must be looked upon as a part of another whole and this whole is policy policy in making use of war avoids all those rigorous conclusions which proceed from its nature it troubles itself little about final possibilities confining its attention to immediate probabilities if much uncertainty in the whole action ensues therefrom if it thereby becomes a sort of game the policy of each cabinet places its confidence in the belief that in this game it will surpass its neighbour in skill and sharp-sightedness thus policy makes out of the all-powering element of war a mere instrument changes the tremendous battle sword which should be lifted with both hands and the whole power of the body to strike once and for all into a light handy weapon which is even sometimes nothing more than a rapier to exchange thrusts and feints and parries thus the contradictions in which man naturally timid becomes involved by war may be solved if we choose to accept this as a solution if war belongs to policy it will naturally take its character from thence if policy is grand and powerful so also will be the war and this may be carried to the point at which the war attains its absolute form in this way of viewing the subject therefore we need not shut out of sight the absolute form of war we rather keep it continually in view 
in the background only through this kind of view war recovers unity only by it can we see all wars as things of one kind and it is only through it that the judgment can obtain the true and perfect basis and point of view from which great plans may be traced out and determined upon it is true that the political element does not sink deep into the details of war vedettes are not planted patrols do not make their rounds from political considerations but small as is its influence in this respect it is great in the formation of a plan for a whole war or a campaign and often even for a battle for this reason we were in no hurry to establish this view at the commencement while engaged with particulars it would have given us little help and on the other hand would have distracted our attention to a certain extent in the plan of a war or campaign it is indispensable there is upon the whole nothing more important in life than to find out the right point of view from which things should be looked at and judged of and then to keep to that point for we can only apprehend the mass of events in their unity from one standpoint and it is only the keeping to one point of view that guards us from inconsistency if therefore in drawing up a plan of a war it is not allowable to have a twofold or threefold point of view from which things may be looked at now with the eye of a soldier then with that of an administrator and then again with that of a politician etc then the next question is whether policy is necessarily paramount and everything else subordinate to it that policy unites in itself and reconciles all the interests of internal administrations even those of humanity and whatever else are rational subjects of consideration is presupposed for it is nothing in itself except a mere representative and exponent of all these interests towards other states that policy may take a false direction and may promote unfairly the ambitious ends the private interests the vanity of rulers does not concern us here for under no circumstances can the art of war be regarded as its preceptor and we can only look at policy here as the representative of the interests generally of the whole community the only question therefore is whether in framing plans for a war the political point of view should give way to the purely military if such a point is conceivable that is to say should disappear altogether or subordinate itself to it or whether the political is to remain the ruling point of view and the military to be considered subordinate to it that the political point of view should end completely when war begins is only conceivable in contests which are wars of life and death from pure hatred as wars are in reality they are as we before said only the expressions or manifestations of policy itself the subordination of the political point of view to the military would be contrary to common sense for policy has declared the war it is the intelligent faculty war only the instrument and not the reverse the subordination of the military point of view to the political is therefore the only thing which is possible if we reflect on the nature of real war and call to mind what has been said in the third chapter of this book that every war should be viewed above all things according to the probability of its character and its leading features as they are to be deduced from the political forces and proportions and that often indeed we may safely affirm in our days almost always war is to be regarded as an organic whole from which the single branches are not to be separated in which therefore every individual activity flows into the whole and also has its origin in the idea of this whole then it becomes certain and palpable to us that the superior standpoint for the conduct of the war from which its leading lines must proceed can be no other than that of policy from this point of view the plans come as it were out of caste the apprehension of them and the judgment upon them becomes easier and more natural our convictions respecting them gain in force motives are more satisfying and history more intelligible at all events from this point of view there is no longer in the nature of things a necessary conflict between the political and military interests and where it appears it is therefore to be regarded as imperfect knowledge only that policy makes demands on the war which it cannot respond to would be contrary to the supposition that it knows the instrument which it is going to use therefore contrary to a natural and indispensable supposition but if it judges correctly of the march of military events it is entirely its affair and can be its only to determine what are the events and what the direction of events most favourable to the ultimate and great end of the war in one word the art of war in its highest point of view is policy 
but no doubt a policy which fights battles instead of writing notes according to this view to leave a great military enterprise or the plan for one to a purely military judgment and decision is a distinction which cannot be allowed and is even prejudicial indeed it is an irrational proceeding to consult professional soldiers on the plan of a war that they may give a purely military opinion upon what the cabinet should do but still more absurd is the demand of theorists that a statement of the available means of war should be laid before the general that he may draw out a purely military plan for the war or from a campaign in accordance with these means experience in general also teaches us that notwithstanding the multifarious branches and scientific character of the military art in the present day still the leading outlines of a war are always determined by the cabinet that is if we would use technical language by a political not a military functionary this is perfectly natural none of the principal plans which are required for a war can be made without an insight into the political relations and in reality when people speak as they often do of the prejudicial influence on policy of the conduct of a war they say in reality something very different to what they intend it is not this influence but the policy itself which should be found fault with if policy is right that is if it succeeds in hitting the object then it can only act on the war in its sense with advantage also but if this influence of policy causes a divergence from the object the cause is only to be looked for in a mistaken policy it is only when policy promises itself a wrong effect from certain military means and measures an effect opposed to their nature that it can exercise a prejudicial effect on war by the course it prescribes just as a person in a language with which he is not conversant sometimes says what he does not intend so policy when intending right may often order things which do not tally with its own views this has happened times without end and it shows that a certain knowledge of the nature of war is essential to the management of political commerce but before going further we must guard ourselves against a false interpretation of which this is very susceptible we are far from holding the opinion that a war minister smothered in official papers a scientific engineer or even a soldier who has been well tried in the field would any of them necessarily make the best minister of state where the sovereign does not want to act for himself or in other words we do not mean to say that this acquaintance with the nature of war is the principal qualification for a war minister elevation superiority of mind strength of character these are the principal qualifications which he must possess a knowledge of war may be supplied in one way or the other france was never worse advised in its military and political affairs than by the two brothers belle isle and the duke of choiseul although all three were good soldiers if war is to harmonize entirely with the political views and policy to accommodate itself to the means available for war there is only one alternative to be recommended when the statesman and soldier are not combined in one person which is to make the chief commander a member of the cabinet that he may take part in its councils and decisions on important occasions but then again this is only possible when the cabinet that is the government itself is near the theatre of war so that these things can be settled without a serious waste of time this is what the emperor of austria did in eighteen o nine and the allied sovereigns in eighteen thirteen eighteen fourteen eighteen fifteen and the arrangement proved completely satisfactory the influence of any military man except the general-in-chief in the cabinet is extremely dangerous it very seldom leads to able vigorous action the example of france in seventeen ninety three seventeen ninety four seventeen ninety five when carnot while residing in paris managed the conduct of the war is to be avoided as a system of terror is not at the command of any but a revolutionary government we shall now conclude with some reflections derived from history in the last decennary of the past century when that remarkable change in the art of war in europe took place by which the best armies found that a part of their method of war had become utterly unserviceable and events were brought about of a magnitude far beyond what any one had previous conception of it certainly appeared that a false calculation of everything was to be laid to the charge of the art of war it was plain that while confined by habit within a narrow circle of conceptions she had been surprised by the force of a new state of relations lying no doubt outside that circle but still not outside the nature of things those observers who took the most comprehensive view ascribed the circumstance to the general influence which policy had exercised for centuries on the art of war and undoubtedly to its very great disadvantage and by which it had sunk into a half measure often into mere sham fighting 
they were right as to fact but they were wrong in attributing it to something accidental or which might have been avoided others thought that everything was to be explained by the momentary influence of the particular policy of austria prussia england etc with regard to their own interests respectively but is it true that the real surprise by which men's minds were seized was confined to the conduct of war and did not rather relate to policy itself that is as we should say did the ill success proceed from the influence of policy on the war or from a wrong policy itself the prodigious effects of the french revolution abroad were evidently brought about much less through new methods and views introduced by the french in the conduct of war than through the changes which it wrought in statecraft and civil administration in the character of governments in the condition of the people etc that other governments took a mistaken view of all these things that they endeavoured with their ordinary means to hold their own against forces of a novel kind and overwhelming in strength all that was a blunder in policy would it have been possible to perceive and mend this error by a scheme for the war from a purely military point of view impossible for if there had been even in reality a philosophical strategist who merely from the nature of the hostile elements had foreseen all the consequences and prophesied remote possibilities still it would have been purely impossible to have turned such wisdom to account if policy had risen to a just appreciation of the forces which had sprung up in france and of the new relations in the political state of europe it might have foreseen the consequences which must follow in respect to the great features of war and it was only in this way that it could arrive at a correct view of the extent of the means required as well as of the best use to make of those means we may therefore say that the twenty years victories of the revolution are chiefly to be ascribed to the erroneous policy of the governments by which it was opposed it is true these errors first displayed themselves in the war and the events of the war completely disappointed the expectations which policy entertained but this did not take place because policy neglected to consult its military advisers the art of war in which the politicians of the day could believe namely that derived from the reality of war at that time that which belonged to the policy of the day that familiar instrument which policy had hitherto used that art of war i say was naturally involved in the error of policy and therefore could not teach it anything better it is true that war itself underwent important alterations both in its nature and forms which brought it nearer to its absolute form but these changes were not brought about because the french government had to a certain extent delivered itself from the leading strings of policy they arose from an altered policy produced by the french revolution not only in france but over the rest of europe as well this policy had called forth other means and other powers by which it became possible to conduct war with a degree of energy which could not have been thought of otherwise therefore the actual changes in the art of war are a consequence of alterations in policy and so far from being an argument for the possible separation of the two they are on the contrary very strong evidence of the intimacy of their connection therefore once more war is an instrument of policy it must necessarily bear its character it must measure with its scale the conduct of war in its great features is therefore policy itself which takes up the sword in place of the pen but which does not on that account cease to think according to its own laws End of chapter six chapter seven limited object offensive war even if the complete overthrow of the enemy cannot be the object there may still be one which is directly positive and this positive object can be nothing else than the conquest of a part of the enemy's country the use of such a conquest is this that we weaken the enemy's resources generally therefore of course his military power while we increase our own that we therefore carry on the war to a certain extent at his expense further in this way that negotiations for peace the possession of the enemy's province may be regarded as a net gain because we can either keep them or exchange them for other advantages this view of a conquest of the enemy's provinces is very natural and would be open to no objection if it were not that the defensive attitude which must succeed the offensive may often cause uneasiness in the chapter on the culminating point of victory we have sufficiently explained the manner in which such an offensive weakens the combatant force and that it may be succeeded by a situation causing anxiety as to the future 
the weakening of our combatant force by this conquest of part of the enemy's territory has its degrees and these depend chiefly on the geographical position of this portion of territory the more it is an annex of our own country being contiguous to or embraced by it the more it is in the direction of our own principal forces by so much the less will it weaken our combatant force in the seven years war saxony was a natural complement of the prussian theatre of war and frederick the great's army instead of being weakened was strengthened by the possession of that province because it lies nearer to silesia than to the mark and at the same time covers the latter even in seventeen forty and seventeen forty one after frederick the great had once conquered silesia it did not weaken his army in the field because owing to its form and situation as well as the contour of its frontier line it only presented a narrow point to the austrians as long as they were not masters of saxony and besides that this small point of contact also lay in the direction of the chief operations of the contending forces if on the other hand the conquered territory is a strip running between two hostile provinces has an eccentric position and unfavourable configuration of ground then the weakening increases so visibly that a victorious battle becomes not only so much easier for the enemy but it may even become unnecessary as well the austrians have always been obliged to evacuate provence without a battle when they have made attempts on it from italy in the year seventeen forty four the french were well pleased even to get out of bohemia without having lost a battle in seventeen fifty eight frederick the great could not hold his position in bohemia and moravia with the same force with which he had obtained such brilliant successes in silesia and saxony in seventeen fifty seven examples of armies not being able to keep possession of conquered territory solely because their combatant force was so much weakened thereby are so common it does not appear necessary to quote any more of them therefore the question whether we should aim at such an object depends on whether we can expect to hold possession of the conquest or whether a temporary occupation invasion diversion would repay the expenditure of force required especially whether we have not to apprehend such a vigorous counterstroke as will completely destroy the balance of forces in the chapter on the culmination point we have treated of the consideration due to this question in each particular case there is just one point which we have still to add an offensive of this kind will not always compensate us for what we lose upon other points whilst we are engaged in making a partial conquest the enemy may be doing the same at other points and if our enterprise does not greatly preponderate in importance then it will not compel the enemy to give up his it is therefore a question for serious consideration whether we may not lose more than we gain in a case of this description even if we suppose two provinces one on each side to be of equal value we shall always lose more by the one which the enemy takes from us than we gain by the one we take because a number of our forces become to a certain extent like faux fray non-effective but as the same takes place on the enemy's side also one would suppose that in reality there is no ground to attach more importance to the maintenance of what is our own than to the conquest but yet there is the maintenance of our own territory is always a matter which more deeply concerns us and the suffering inflicted on our own state cannot be outweighed nor to a certain extent neutralized by what we gain in return unless the latter promises a high percentage that is is much greater the consequence of all this is that a strategic attack directed against only a moderate object involves a greater necessity for steps to defend other points which it does not directly cover than one which is directed against the centre of the enemy's force consequently in such an attack the concentration of forces in time and space cannot be carried out to the same extent in order that it may take place at least as regards time it becomes necessary for the advance to be made offensively from every point possible and at the same moment exactly and therefore this attack loses another advantage of being able to make shift with a much smaller force by acting on the defensive at particular points in this way the effect of aiming at a minor object is to bring all things more to a level the whole act of war cannot now be concentrated into one principal affair which can be governed according to leading points of view it is more dispersed the friction becomes greater everywhere and there is everywhere more room for chance this is the natural tendency of the thing the commander is weighed down by it finds himself more and more neutralized the more he is conscious of his own powers the greater his resource subjectively and his power objectively so much the more he will seek to liberate himself from this tendency in order to give some one point a preponderating importance even if that should only be possible by running greater risks 
End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Limited Object Defence The ultimate aim of defensive war can never be an absolute negation, as we have before observed. Even for the weakest, there must be some point in which the enemy may be made to feel and which may be threatened. Certainly, we may say that this object is the exhaustion of the adversary, for as he has a positive object, every one of his blows which fails, if it has no other result than the loss of the force applied, still may be considered a retrograde step in reality, whilst the loss which the defence suffers is not in vain because his object was keeping possession and that he has effected. This would be tantamount to saying that the defensive has his positive object in merely keeping possession. Such reasoning might be good if it was certain that the assailant, after a certain number of fruitless attempts, must be worn out and desist from further efforts. But just this necessary consequence is wanting. If we look at the exhaustion of forces, the defender is under a disadvantage. The assailant becomes weaker, but only in the sense that it may reach a turning point. If we set aside that supposition, the weakening goes on certainly more rapidly on the defensive side than on that of the assailant, for in the first place he is the weaker, and therefore, if the losses on both sides are equal, he loses more actually than the other. In the next place he is deprived generally of a portion of territory and of his resources. We have therefore here no ground on which to build the expectation that the offensive will cease and nothing remains but the idea that if the assailant repeats his blows, while the defensive does nothing but wait to ward them off, then the defender has no counterpoise as a set-off to the risk he runs of one of these attacks succeeding sooner or later. Although in reality the exhaustion, or rather the weakening of the stronger, has brought about a peace in many instances, this is to be attributed to the indecision which is so general in war, but cannot be imagined philosophically as the general and ultimate object of any defensive war whatever. There is therefore no alternative but that the defence should find its object in the idea of the waiting for, which is, besides, its real character. This idea in itself includes that of an alteration of circumstances, of an improvement of the situation, which therefore, when it cannot be brought about by internal means, that is, by defence pure in itself, can only be expected through assistance coming from without. Now this improvement from without can proceed from nothing else than a change in political relations, either new alliances springing up in favour of the defender, or old ones directed against him fall to pieces. Here then is the object for the defender, in case his weakness does not permit him to think of any important counterstroke. But this is not the nature of every defensive war, according to the conception which we have given of its form. According to that conception, it is the stronger form of war, and on account of that strength it can also be applied when a counterstroke more or less important is designed. These two cases must be kept distinct from the very first, as they have influence on the defence. In the first case, the defender's object is to keep possession of his own country intact as long as possible, because in that way he gains most time, and gaining time is the only way to attain his object. The positive object which he can in most cases attain, and which will give him an opportunity of carrying out his object in the negotiations for peace, he cannot yet include in his plan for the war. In this state of strategic passiveness, the advantages which the defender can gain at certain points consist merely in repelling partial attacks. The preponderance gained at those points he tries to make of service to him at others, for he is generally hard-pressed at all points. If he has not the opportunity of doing this, then there often only accrues to him the small advantage that the enemy will leave him at rest for a time. If the defender is not altogether too weak, small offensive operations directed less towards permanent possession than a temporary advantage to cover losses, which may be sustained afterwards, invasions, diversions, or enterprises against a single fortress, may have a place in this defensive system without altering its object or essence. But in the second case, in which a positive object is already grafted upon the defensive, the greater the counterstroke, that is warranted by circumstances, the more the defensive imports into itself of a positive character. In other words, the more the defence has been adopted voluntarily in order to make the first blow surer, the bolder may be the snares which the defender lays for his opponent. The boldest, and if it succeeds, the most effectual is the retreat into the interior of the country, and this means is then at the same time that which differs most widely 
from the other systems. Let us only think of the difference between the position in which Frederick the Great was placed in the Seven Years' War and that of Russia in 1812. When the war began, Frederick, through his advanced state of preparation for war, had a kind of superiority. This gave him the advantage of being able to make himself master of Saxony, which, besides such a natural complement of his theatre of war, the possession of it did not diminish but increased his combatant force. At the opening of the campaign in 1757, the king endeavoured to proceed with his strategic attack, which seemed not impossible as long as the Russians and French had not reached the theatre of war in Silesia, the Mark and Saxony. But the attack miscarried, and Frederick was thrown back on the defensive for the rest of the campaign, was obliged to evacuate Bohemia and to rescue his own theatre from the enemy, in which he only succeeded by turning himself with one and the same army first upon the French, then upon the Austrians. This advantage he owed entirely to the defensive. In the year 1758, when his enemies had drawn round him in a closer circle, and his forces were dwindling down to a very disproportionate relation, he determined on an offensive on a small scale in Moravia. His plan was to take Ulmutz before his enemies were prepared, not in the expectation of keeping possession of, or of making it a base for further advance, but to use it as a sort of advanced work, a counter-approach against the Austrians, who would be obliged to devote the rest of the present campaign, and perhaps even a second, to recover possession of it. This attack also miscarried. Frederick then gave up on the idea of a real offensive, as he saw that it only increased the disproportion of his army. A compact position in the heart of his own country in Saxony and Silesia, the use of short lines, that he might be able to rapidly increase his forces at any point which might be menaced, a battle when unavoidable, small incursions when opportunity offered, and along with this a patient state of waiting for, expectation, a saving of his means for better times became now his general plan. By degrees the execution of it became more and more passive. As he saw that even a victory cost him too much, therefore he tried to manage at still less expense. Everything depended on gaining time and on keeping what he had got. He therefore became more tenacious of yielding any ground and did not hesitate to adopt a perfect cordon system. The positions of Prince Henry in Saxony, as well as those of the king in the Silesian mountains, may be so termed. In his letters to the Marquis de Argen, he manifests the impatience with which he looks forward to winter quarters, and the satisfaction he felt at being able to take them up again without having suffered any serious loss. Whoever blames Frederick for this, and looks upon it as a sign that his spirit had sunk, would, we think, pass judgment without much reflection. If the entrenched camp at Bunzelwitz, the positions taken up by Prince Henry in Saxony, and by the king in the Silesian mountains, do not appear to us now as measures on which a general should place his dependence in a last extremity, because a Bonaparte would soon have thrust his sword through such tactical cobwebs, we must not forget that times have changed, that war has become a totally different thing, is quickened with new energies, and that therefore positions might have been excellent at that time, although they are not so now and that, in addition to all, the character of the enemy deserves attention against the army of the German states, against Daun and Bertolin. It might have been the height of wisdom to employ the means which Frederick would have despised if used against himself. The result justified this view. In the state of patient expectation, Frederick attained his object and got round difficulties in a collision with which his foes would have been dashed to pieces. The relation in point of numbers between the Russian and French armies opposed to each other at the opening of the campaign of 1812 was still more unfavourable to the former than between Frederick and his enemies in the Seven Years' War. But the Russians looked forward to being joined by large reinforcements in the course of the campaign. All Europe was in secret hostility to Bonaparte, his power had been screwed up to the highest point, a devouring war occupied him in Spain, and the vast extent of Russia allowed of pushing the exhaustion of the enemy's military means to the utmost extremity by a retreat over a hundred miles of country. Under circumstances on this grand scale, a tremendous counterstroke was not only to be expected if the French enterprise failed, and how could it succeed if the Russian emperor would not make peace, or his subjects did not rise in insurrection? But this counterstroke might also end in the complete destruction of the enemy. The most profound sagacity could, therefore, not have devised a better plan of campaign than that which the Russians followed on the spur of the moment. That this was not the opinion at the time, and that such a view would then have been looked upon as preposterous, is no reason for our now denying it to be the right one. 
if we are to learn from history we must look upon things which have actually happened as also possible in the future and that the series of great events which succeeded the march upon moscow is not a succession of mere accidents every one will grant who can claim to give an opinion on such subjects if it had been possible for the russians with great efforts to defend their frontier it is certainly probable that in such case the french power would have sunk and they would have at last suffered a reverse of fortune but the reaction would certainly not have been so violent and decisive by sufferings and sacrifices which certainly in any other country would have been greater and in most would have been impossible russia purchased this enormous success thus a great positive success can never be obtained except through positive measures planned not with a view to a mere state of waiting for but with a view to a decision in short even on the defensive there is no great gain to be won except by a great stake End of chapters 6 to 8, recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Book 8, Chapter 9 of On War, Volumes 2 and 3, by Carl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson Plan of war when the destruction of the enemy is the object Having characterized in detail the different aims to which war may be directed We shall go through the organization of war as a whole for each of the three separate gradations corresponding to these aims In conformity with all that has been said on the subject up to the present two fundamental principles reign throughout the whole plan of the war and serve as a guide for everything else the first is to reduce the weight of the enemy's power into as few centres of gravity as possible into one if it can be done again to confine the attack against these centres of force to as few principal undertakings as possible to one if possible lastly to keep all secondary undertakings as subordinate as possible in a word the first principle is to act concentrated as much as possible the second principle runs thus to act as swiftly as possible therefore to allow of no delay or detour without sufficient reason the reducing of the enemy's power to one central point depends one on the nature of its political connection if it consists of armies of one power there is generally no difficulty if of allied armies of which one is acting simply as an ally without any interest of its own then the difficulty is not much greater if of a coalition for a common object then it depends on the cordiality of the alliance we have already treated of this subject two on the situation of the theatre of war upon which the different hostile armies make their appearance if the enemy's forces are collected in one army upon one theatre of war they constitute in reality a unity and we need not inquire further if they are upon one theatre of war but in separate armies which belong to different powers there is no longer absolute unity there is however a sufficient interdependence of the parts for a decisive blow upon one part to throw down the other in concussion if the armies are posted in theatres of war adjoining each other and not separated by any great natural obstacles then there is in such a case also a decided influence of the one upon the other but if the theatres of war are wide apart if there is neutral territory great mounts etc intervening between them then the influence is very doubtful and improbable as well if they are on quite opposite sides of the state against which the war is made so that operations directed against them must diverge on eccentric lines then almost every trace of connection is at an end if prussia was attacked by france and russia at the same time it would be as respects the conduct of the war much the same as if there were two separate wars at the same time the unity would appear in the negotiations saxony and austria on the contrary as military powers in the seven years war were to be regarded as one what they suffered the other felt also partly because the theatres of war lay in the same direction for frederick the great partly because saxony had no political independence numerous as were the enemies of bonaparte in germany in eighteen thirteen still they all stood very much in one direction in respect to him and the theatres of war for their armies were in close connection and reciprocally influenced each other very powerfully if a concentration of all his forces had been able to overpower the main army such a defeat would have had a decisive effect on all the parts if he had beaten the bohemian grand army and marched upon vienna by prague 
Blücher, however willing, could not have remained in Saxony, because he would have been called upon to cooperate in Bohemia, and the Crown Prince of Sweden, as well, would have been unwilling to remain in the mark. On the other hand, Austria, if carrying on a war against the French on the Rhine and Italy at the same time, will always find it difficult to give a decision upon one of those theatres by means of a successful stroke on the other, partly because Switzerland with its mountains forms too strong a barrier between the two theatres, and partly because the direction of the roads on each side is divergent. France, again, can much sooner decide in the one by a successful result in the other, because the direction of its forces in both converges upon Vienna, the centre of power of the whole Austrian Empire. We may add further that a decisive blow in Italy will have more effect on the Rhine theatre than a success on the Rhine would have in Italy, because the blow from Italy strikes nearer to the centre, and that from the Rhine more upon the flank of the Austrian dominions. It proceeds from what we have said that the conception of separated or connected hostile power extends through all degrees of relationship, and that therefore in each case the first thing is to discover the influence which events in one theatre may have upon the other, according to which we may then afterwards settle how far the different forces of the enemy may be reduced into one centre of force. There is only one exception to the principle of directing all our strength against the centre of gravity of the enemy's power, that is, if ancillary expeditions promise extraordinary advantages, and still in this case it is a condition assumed that we have such a decisive superiority as enables us to undertake such enterprises without incurring too great a risk at the point which forms our great object. When General Bulow marched into Holland in 1814, it was to be foreseen that the 30,000 men comprising his corps would not only neutralise the same number of Frenchmen, but would besides give the English and Dutch an opportunity of entering the field with forces which otherwise would never have been brought into activity. Thus, therefore, the first consideration in the combination of a plan of war is to determine the centres of gravity of the enemy's power, and if possible, to reduce them to one. The second is to unite the forces which are to be employed against the centre of force into one great action. Here, now, the following grounds for dividing our forces may present themselves. 1. The original position of the military forces, therefore also the situation of the states engaged in the offensive. If the concentration of the forces would occasion detours and loss of time, and the danger of advancing by separate lines is not too great, then the same may be justifiable on those grounds to effect an unnecessary concentration of forces with great loss of time by which the freshness and rapidity of the first blow is diminished would be contrary to the second leading principle we have laid down in all cases in which there is hope of surprising the enemy in some measure this deserves particular attention but the case becomes still more important if the attack is undertaken by allied states which are not situated on a line directed towards the state attacked not one behind the other, but situated side by side. If Prussia and Austria undertook a war against France, it would be a very erroneous measure, a squandering of time and force, if the armies of the two powers were obliged to set out from the same point, as the natural line for an army operating from Prussia against the heart of France is from the lower Rhine, and that of the Austrians is from the upper Rhine. Concentration, therefore, in this case could only be effected by a sacrifice. Consequently, in any particular instance, the question to be decided would be, is the necessity for concentration so great that this sacrifice must be made? 2. The attack by separate lines may offer greater results. As we are now speaking of advancing by separate lines against one centre of force, we are therefore supposing an advance by converging lines. A separate advance on parallel or eccentric lines belongs to the rubric of accessory undertakings of which we have already spoken. Now, every convergent attack in strategy as well as in tactics holds out the prospect of great results, for if it succeeds, the consequence is not simply a defeat, but more or less the cutting off of the enemy. The concentric attack is therefore always that which may lead to the greatest results, but on account of the separation of the parts of the force and the enlargement of the theatre of war, it also involves the most risk. It is the same here as with the attack and defence. The weaker form holds out the greater results in prospect. The question, therefore, is whether the assailant feels strong enough to try for this great result. 
when frederick the great advanced upon bohemia in the year seventeen fifty seven he set out from saxony and silesia with his forces divided the two principal reasons for his doing so were first that his forces were so cantoned in the winter that a concentration of them at one point would have divested the attack of all the advantages of surprise and next that by this concentric advance each of the two austrian theatres of war was threatened in the flanks and the rear the danger to which frederick the great exposed himself on that occasion was that one of his two armies might have been completely defeated by superior forces should the austrians not see this then they would have to give battle with their centre only or run the risk of being thrown off their line of communication either on one side or the other and meeting with a catastrophe this was the great result which the king hoped for by this advance the austrians preferred the battle in the centre but prague where they took up their position was in a situation too much under the influence of the convergent attack which as they remained perfectly passive in their position had time to develop its efficacy to the most the consequence of this was that when they lost the battle it was a complete catastrophe as is manifest from the fact that two-thirds of the army with the commander-in-chief were obliged to shut themselves up in prague this brilliant success at the opening of the campaign was attained by the bold stroke with a concentric attack if frederick considered the precision of his own movements the energy of his generals the moral superiority of his troops on one side and the sluggishness of the austrians on the other as sufficient to ensure the success of his plan who can blame him but as we cannot leave these moral advantages out of consideration neither can we ascribe the success solely to the mere geometrical form of the attack let us only think of that not less brilliant campaign of bonaparte's in the year seventeen ninety six when the austrians were so severely punished for their concentric march into italy the means which the french general had at command on that occasion the austrian general also had at his disposal in seventeen fifty seven with the exception of the moral indeed he had rather more for he was not like bonaparte weaker than his adversary therefore when it is to be apprehended that the advance on separate converging lines may afford the enemy the means of counteracting the inequality of numerical forces by using interior lines such a form of attack is not advisable and if on account of the situation of the belligerents it must be resorted to it can only be regarded as a necessary evil if from this point of view we cast our eyes on the plan which was adopted for the invasion of france in eighteen fourteen it is impossible to give it approval the russian austrian and prussian armies were concentrated at a point near frankfurt on the main on the most natural and most direct line to the centre of the force of the french monarchy these armies were then separated that one might penetrate into france from mayence the other from switzerland as the enemy's force was so reduced that a defence of the frontier was out of the question the whole advantage to be expected from this concentric advance if it succeeded was that while lorraine and alsace were conquered by one army fresh comte would be taken by the other was this trifling advantage worth the trouble of marching into switzerland we know very well that there were other but just as insufficient grounds which caused this march but we confine ourselves here to the point which we are considering on the other side bonaparte was a man who thoroughly understood the defensive to oppose to a concentric attack as he had already shown in his masterly campaign of seventeen ninety six and although the allies were very considerably superior in numbers yet the preponderance due to his superiority as a general was on all occasions acknowledged he joined his army too late near chalons and looked down rather too much generally on his opponents still he was very near hitting the two armies separately and what was the state he found them in at brienne blucher had only twenty seven thousand of his sixty five thousand men with him and the great army out of two hundred thousand had only one hundred thousand present it was impossible to make a better game for the adversary and from the moment that active work began no greater want was felt than that of reunion after all these reflections we think that although the concentric attack is in itself a means of obtaining greater results still it should generally only proceed from a previous separation of the parts comprising the whole force and that there are few cases in which we should do right in giving up the shortest and most direct line of operation for the sake of adopting that form three the breadth of a theatre of war can be a motive for attacking on separate lines if an army on the offensive in its advances from any point penetrates with some success to some distance into the interior of the enemy's country then certainly the space which it commands is not restricted exactly to the line of road by which it marches it will command a margin on each side still that will depend very much if we may use the figure on the solidity and cohesion of the opposing state 
if the state only hangs loosely together if the people are an effeminate race unaccustomed to war then without our taking much trouble a considerable extent of country will open behind our victorious army but if we have to deal with a brave and loyal population the space behind our army will form a triangle more or less acute in order to obviate this evil the attacking force requires to regulate its advance on a certain width of front if the enemy's force is concentrated at a particular point of this breadth of front can only be preserved as long as we are not in contact with the enemy and must be contracted as we approach his position that is easy to understand but if the enemy himself has taken up a position with a certain extent of front then there is nothing absurd in a corresponding extension on our part we speak here of one theatre of war or of several if they are quite close to each other obviously this is therefore the case when according to our view the chief operation is at the same time to be decisive on subordinate points but now can we always run the chance of this and may we expose ourselves to the danger which must arise if the influence of the chief operation is not sufficient to decide at the minor points does not the want of a certain breadth for a theatre of war deserve special consideration here as well as everywhere else it is impossible to exhaust the number of combinations which may take place but we maintain that with few exceptions the decision on the capital point will carry with it the decision on all minor points therefore the action should be regulated in conformity with this principle in all cases in which the contrary is not evident when bonaparte invaded russia he had good reason to believe that by conquering the main body of the russian army he would compel their forces on the upper duina to succumb he left at first only the corps of Wiednot to oppose them, but Wittgenstein assumed the offensive, and Bonaparte was then obliged to send also the sixth corps to that quarter. On the other hand, at the beginning of the campaign, he directed part of his forces against Bagration, but that general was carried along by the influence of the backward movement in the centre, and Bonaparte was enabled then to recall that part of his force. If Wittgenstein had not had to cover the second capital, he would also have followed the retreat of the great army under Barclay in the years eighteen o five and eighteen o nine bonaparte's victories at ulm and ratisbon decided matters in italy and also in the tyrol although the first was rather a distant theatre and an independent one in itself in the year eighteen o six his victories at jena and Auerstadt were decisive in respect to everything that might have been attempted against him in westphalia and hesse or on the frankfurt road amongst the number of circumstances which may have an influence on the resistance at secondary points there are two which are the most prominent the first is that in a country of vast extent and also relatively of great power like russia we can put off the decisive blow at the chief point for some time and are not obliged to do all in a hurry the second is when a minor point like silesia in the year eighteen o six through a great number of fortresses possesses an extraordinary degree of independent strength and yet bonaparte treated that point with great contempt inasmuch as when he had to leave such a point completely in his rear on the march to warsaw he only detached twenty thousand men under his brother jerome to that quarter if it happens that the blow at the capital point in all probability will not shake such a secondary point or has not done so and if the enemy has still forces at that point then to these as a necessary evil an adequate force must be opposed because no one can absolutely lay open his line of communication from the very commencement but prudence may go a step further it may require that the advance upon the chief point shall keep pace with that on the secondary points and consequently the principal undertaking must be delayed whenever the secondary points will not succumb this principle does not directly contradict ours as uniting all action as far as possible in one great undertaking but the spirit from which it springs is diametrically opposed to the spirit in which ours is conceived by following such a principle there would be such a measured pace in the movement such a paralysation of the impulsive force such room for the freak of chance and such a loss of time as would be practically perfectly inconsistent with an offensive directed to the complete overthrow of the enemy the difficulty becomes greater still if the forces stationed at these minor points can retire on divergent lines what would then become of the unity of our attack we must therefore declare ourselves completely opposed in principle to the dependence of the chief attack on minor attacks and we maintain that an attack directed to the destruction of the enemy which has not the boldness to shoot like the point of an arrow direct at the heart of the enemy's power can never hit the mark for lastly there is a fourth ground for a separate advance in the facility which it may afford for subsistence it is certainly much pleasanter to march with a small army through an opulent country than a large army through a poor one 
but by suitable measures and with an army accustomed to privations the latter is not impossible and therefore the first should never have such an influence on our plans as to lead us into a great danger we have now done justice to the grounds for a separation of forces which divides the chief operation into several and if the separation takes place on any of these grounds with a distinct conception of the object and after due consideration of the advantages and disadvantages we shall not venture to find fault but if as usually happens a plan is drawn out by a learned general staff merely according to routine if different theatres of war like the squares of a chessboard must each have its piece first placed on it before the moves begin if these moves approach the aim in complicated lines and relations by dint of an imaginary profundity in the art of combination if the armies are to separate to-day in order to apply all their skill in reuniting at the greatest risk in fourteen days then we have a perfect horror of this abandonment of the simple common-sense road to rush intentionally into absolute confusion this folly happens more easily the less the general-in-chief directs the war and conducts it in the sense which we have pointed out in the first chapter as an act of his individuality invested with extraordinary powers the more therefore the whole plan is manufactured by an inexperienced staff and from the ideas of a dozen smatterers we have still now to consider the third part of our first principle that is to keep the subordinate parts as much as possible in subordination whilst we endeavour to refer the whole of the operations of a war to one single aim and to try and attain this as far as possible by one great effort we deprive the other points of contact of the states at war with each other of a part of their independence they become subordinate actions if we could concentrate everything absolutely into one action then those points of contact would be completely neutralized but this is seldom possible and therefore what we have to do is keep them so far within bounds that they shall not cause the abstraction of too many forces from the main action next we maintain that the plan of the war itself should have this tendency even if it is not possible to reduce the whole of the enemy's resistance to one point consequently in case we are placed in the position already mentioned of carrying on two almost quite separate wars at the same time the one must always be looked upon as the principal affair to which our forces and activity are to be chiefly devoted in this view it is advisable only to proceed offensively against that one principal point and to preserve the defence upon all others the attack there being only justifiable when invited by very exceptional circumstances further we are to carry on this defensive which takes place at minor points with as few troops as possible and to seek to avail ourselves of every advantage which the defensive form can give this view applies with still more force to all theatres of war on which armies come forward belonging to different powers really but still such as will be struck when the general centre of force is struck but against the enemy at whom the great blow is aimed there must be according to this no defensive on minor theatres of war the chief attack itself and the secondary attacks which for other reasons are combined with it make up this blow and make every defensive on points not directly covered by it superfluous all depends on this principal attack by it every loss will be compensated if the forces are sufficient to make it reasonable to seek for that great decision then the possibility of failure can be no ground for guarding oneself against injury at other points in any event for just by such a course this failure will become more probable and it therefore constitutes here a contradiction in our action this same predominance of the principal action over the minor must be the principle observed in each of the separate branches of the attack but as there are generally ulterior motives which determine what forces shall advance from one theatre of war and what from another against the common centre of the enemy's power we only mean here that there must be an effort to make the chief action overruling for everything will become simpler and less subject to the influence of chance events the nearer this state of preponderance can be attained the second principle concerns the rapid use of forces every unnecessary expenditure of time every unnecessary detour is a waste of power and therefore contrary to the principles of strategy it is most important to bear always in mind that almost the only advantage which the offensive possesses is the effect of surprise at the opening of the scene suddenness and irresistible impetuosity are its strongest pinions and when the object is the complete overthrow of the enemy it can rarely dispense with them by this therefore theory demands the shortest way to the object and completely excludes from consideration endless discussions about right and left here and there 
If we call to mind what was said in the chapter on the subject of the strategic attack respecting the pit of the stomach in a state, and further what appears in the fourth chapter of this book on the influence of time, we believe no further argument is required to prove that the influence which we claim for the principle really belongs to it. Bonaparte never acted otherwise. The shortest high road from army to army, from one capital to another, was always the way he loved best, and in what will now consist the principal action to which we have referred everything, and for which we have demanded a swift and straightforward execution? In the fourth chapter we have explained, as far as it is possible, in a general way, what the total overthrow of the enemy means, and it is unnecessary to repeat it. Whatever that may depend on at last in particular cases, still the first step is always the same in all cases, namely, the destruction of the enemy's combatant force, that is, a great victory over the same, and its dispersion. The sooner, which means the nearer our own frontiers, this victory is sought for, the easier it is. The latter, that is, the further into the heart of the enemy's country it is gained, the more decisive it is. Here, as well as everywhere, the facility of success and its magnitude balance each other. If we are not so superior to the enemy that the victory is beyond doubt, then we should, when possible, seek him out, that is, his principal force. We say when possible, for if this endeavour to find him led to great detours, false directions, and a loss of time, it might very likely turn out a mistake. If the enemy's principal force is not on our own road, and our interests otherwise prevent our going in quest of him, we may be sure we shall meet him hereafter, for he will not fail to place himself in our way. We shall then, as we have just said, fight under less advantageous circumstances, an evil to which we must submit. However, if we gain the battle, it will be so much the more decisive. From this it follows that, in the case now assumed, it would be an error to pass by the enemy's principal force designedly, if it places itself in our way, at least if we expect thereby to facilitate a victory. On the other hand, it follows from what proceeds that if we have a decided superiority over the enemy's principal force, we may designedly pass it by in order, at future time, to deliver a more decisive battle. We have been speaking of a complete victory, therefore a thorough defeat of the enemy, and not of a mere battle gained. But such a victory requires an enveloping attack, or a battle with an oblique front, for these two forms always give the result a decisive character. It is therefore an essential part of a plan of a war to make arrangements for this movement, both as regards the mass of forces required and the direction to be given them, of which more will be said in the chapter on the plan of campaign. It is certainly not impossible that even battles fought with parallel fronts may lead to complete defeats, and cases in point are not wanting in military history, but such an event is uncommon and will be still more so the more armies become on par as regards discipline and handiness in the field. We no longer take 21 battalions in a village, as they did in Blenheim. Once the great victory is gained, the next question is not about rest, not about taking breath, not about considering, not about reorganising, etc., etc., but only of pursuit of fresh blows wherever necessary of the capture of the enemy's capital, of the attack of the armies of his allies, or whatever else appears to be a rallying point for the enemy. If the tide of victory carries us near the enemy's fortresses, the laying siege to them or not will depend on our means. If we have a great superiority of forces, it would be a loss of time not to take them as soon as possible. But if we are not certain of further events before us, we must keep the fortresses in check with as few troops as possible, which precludes any regular formal sieges. The moment that the siege of a fortress compels us to suspend our strategic advance, that advance as a rule has reached its culminating point. We demand, therefore, that the main body should press forward rapidly in pursuit without any rest. We have already condemned the idea of allowing the advance towards the principal point being made dependent on successes at secondary points. The consequence of this is that in all ordinary cases our chief army only keeps behind it a narrow strip of territory which it can call its own, and which therefore constitutes its theatre of war. How this weakens the momentum at the head, and the dangers for the offensive arising therefrom, we have shown already. Will not this difficulty, will not this intrinsic counterpoise, come to a point which impedes further advance? Certainly that may occur. But just as we have already insisted that it would be a mistake to try and avoid this contracted theatre of war at the commencement, 
and for the sake of that object to rob the advance of its elasticity so we now maintain that as long as the commander has not yet overthrown his opponent as long as he considers himself strong enough to effect that object so long must he also pursue it he does so perhaps at an increased risk but also with the prospect of a greater success if he reaches a point which he cannot venture to go beyond where in order to protect his rear he must extend himself left and right well then this is most probably the culminating point the power of flight is spent and if the enemy is not subdued most probably he will not be now all that the assailant now does to intensify his attack by conquest of fortresses defiles provinces is no doubt still a slow advance but it is only of a relative kind it is no longer absolute the enemy is no longer in flight he is perhaps preparing a renewed resistance and it is therefore already possible that although the assailant still advances intensively the position of the defence is every day improving in short we come back to this that as a rule there is no second spring after a halt has once been necessary theory therefore only requires that as long as there is an intention of destroying the enemy there must be no cessation in the advance of the attack if the commander gives up this object because it is attended with too great a risk he does right to stop and extend his force theory only objects to this when he does it with a view to more readily defeating the enemy we are not so foolish as to maintain that no instance can be found of states having been gradually reduced to utmost extremity in the first place the principle we now maintain is no absolute truth to which an exception is impossible but one founded only on the ordinary and probable result next we must make a distinction between cases in which the downfall of a state has been effected by a slow gradual process and those in which the event was the result of a first campaign we are here only treating of the latter case for it is only in such that there is the tension of forces which either overcomes the centre of gravity of the weight or is in danger of being overcome by it if in the first year we gain a moderate advantage to which in the following we add another and thus gradually advance towards our object there is nowhere very imminent danger but it is distributed over many points each pause between one result and another gives the enemy fresh chances the effects of the first results have very little influence on those which follow often none often a negative only because the enemy recovers himself or is perhaps excited to increase resistance or obtains foreign aid whereas when all is done in one march the success of yesterday brings on with itself that of today one brand lights itself from another if there are cases in which states have been overcome by successive blows in which consequently time generally the patron of the defensive has proved adverse how infinitely more numerous are the instances in which the designs of the aggressor have by that means utterly failed let us only think of the result of the seven years war in which the austrians sought to attain their objects so comfortably cautiously and prudently that they completely missed it in this view therefore we cannot at all join in the opinion that the care which belongs to the preparation of a theatre of war and the impulse which urges us onwards are on a level in importance and that the former must to a certain extent be a counterpoise to the latter but we look upon any evil which springs out of the forward movement as an unavoidable evil which only deserves attention when there is no longer hope for us ahead by the forward movement bonaparte's case in eighteen twelve very far from shaking our opinion has rather confirmed us in it his campaign did not miscarry because he advanced too swiftly or too far as is commonly believed but because the only means of success failed the russian empire is no country which can be regularly conquered that is to say which can be held in possession at least not by the forces of the present states of europe nor by the five hundred thousand men with which bonaparte invaded the country such a country can only be subdued by its own weakness and by the effect of internal dissension in order to strike these vulnerable points in its political existence the country must be agitated to its very centre it was only by reaching moscow with the force of his blow that bonaparte could hope to shake the courage of the government the loyalty and steadfastness of the people in moscow he expected to find peace and this was the only rational object which he could set before himself in undertaking such a war 
he therefore led his main body against that of the Russians, which fell back before him, trudged past the camp at Drissa, and did not stop until it reached Smolensk. He carried back Russian along in his movement, beat the principal Russian army, and took Moscow. He acted on this occasion as he had always done. It was only in that way that he made himself the arbiter of Europe, and only in that way was it possible for him to do so. He therefore, who admires Bonaparte in all his earlier campaigns as the greatest of generals, ought not to censure him in this instance. It is quite allowable to judge an event according to the result, as that is the best criticism upon it. Open bracket, see fifth chapter, second book, close bracket. But this judgment derived merely from the result must not then be passed off as evidence of superior understanding. To seek out the causes of the failure of a campaign is not going the length of making a criticism upon it. It is only if we show that these causes should neither have been overlooked nor disregarded that we make a criticism and place ourselves above the general. Now, we maintain that any one who pronounces the campaign of 1812 an absurdity merely on account of the tremendous reaction in it, and who, if it had been successful, would look upon it as a most splendid combination, shows an utter incapacity of judgment. If Bonaparte had remained in Lithuania as most of his critics think he should, in order first to get possession of the fortresses, of which, moreover, except Riga, situated quite at one side, there is hardly one, because Bobruisk is a small, insignificant place of arms, he would have involved himself for the winter in a miserable defensive system. Then the same people would have been the first to exclaim, This is not the old Bonaparte. How is it? He has not got even as far as a first great battle. He who used to put the final seal to his conquests on the last ramparts of the enemy's states by victories such as Austerlitz and Friedland, has his heart failed him, that he has not taken the enemy's capital, the defenceless Moscow, ready to open its gates, and thus left a nucleus round which new elements of resistance may gather themselves. He had the singular luck to take this far off and enormous colossus by surprise, as easily as one would surprise a neighbouring town, or as Frederick the Great entered the little state of Silesia, lying at his door, and he makes no good use of his fortune, halts in the middle of his victorious career, as if some evil spirit laid at his heels. This is the way which he would have been judged of after the result, for this is the fashion of critics' judgments in general. In opposition to this, we say the campaign of 1812 did not succeed because the government remained firm, the people loyal and steadfast, because it therefore could not succeed. Bonaparte may have made a mistake in undertaking such an expedition. At all events, the result has shown that he deceived himself in his calculations. But we maintain that, supposing it necessary to seek the attainment of this object, it could not have been done in any other way upon the whole. Instead of burthening himself with an interminable, costly defensive war in the east, such as he had on his hands in the west, Bonaparte attempted the only means to gain his object by one bold stroke to extort a peace from his astonished adversary. The destruction of his army was the danger to which he exposed himself in the venture. It was the stake in the game, the price of great expectations. If this destruction of his army was more complete than it need have been, through his own fault, this fault was not in his having penetrated too far into the heart of the country, for that was his object, and unavoidable. But in the late period at which the campaign opened, the sacrifice of life occasioned by his tactics, the want of due care for the supply of his army, and for his line of retreat, and lastly, in his having too long delayed his march from Moscow that the Russians were able to reach the Beresina before him, intending regularly to cut off his retreat, is no strong argument against us. For in the first place, the failure of that attempt just shows how difficult it is really to cut off an army, as the army which was intercepted in this case under the most unfavourable circumstances that can be conceived, still managed, at last, to cut its way through. And although this act upon the whole contributed certainly to increase its catastrophe, still it was not essentially the cause of it. Secondly, it was only the very peculiar nature of the country which afforded the means to carry things as far as the Russians did, for if it had not been for the marshes of the Beresina, with its wooded impassable borders lying across the great road, the cutting off would have been still less possible. Thirdly, there is generally no means of guarding against such an eventuality except by making the forward movement with the front of the army of such a width as we have already disproved. 
for if we proceed on the plan of pushing on in advance with the centre and covering the wings by armies detached right and left then if either of these detached armies meets with a check we must fall back with the centre and then very little can be gained by the attack moreover it cannot be said that bonaparte neglected his wings a superior force remained fronting wittgenstein a proportionate siege corps stood before riga which at the same time was not needed there and in the south Schwarzburg had fifty thousand men with which he was superior to tormasov and almost equal to shishigau in addition there were thirty thousand men under victor covering the rear of the centre even in the month of november therefore at the decisive moment when the russian armies had been reinforced and the french were very much reduced the superiority of the russians in rear of the moscow army was not so very extraordinary wittgenstein shishigau and sacken made up together a force of one hundred thousand schwarzenberg regmer victor widenot and sincere had still eighty thousand effectives the most cautious general in advancing would scarcely devote a greater portion of his force to the protection of his flanks if out of the six hundred thousand men who crossed the Niemen in eighteen twelve bonaparte had brought back two hundred and fifty thousand instead of the fifty thousand who repassed it under schwarzenberg Rima, and macdonald which was possible by avoiding the mistakes with which he has been reproached the campaign would still have been an unfortunate one but theory would have had nothing to object to it for the loss of half an army in such a case is not at all unusual and only appears so to us in this instance on account of the enormous scale of the whole enterprise so much for the principal operation its necessary tendency and the unavoidable risks as regard the subordinate operations there must be above all things a common aim for all but this aim must be so situated as to not paralyze the action of any of the individual parts if we invade france from the upper and middle rhine and holland with the intention of uniting in paris neither of the armies employed to risk anything on the advance but to keep itself intact until the concentration is effected that is what we call a ruinous plan there must be necessarily a constant comparison of the state of this threefold movement causing delay indecision and timidity in the forward movement of each of the armies it is better to assign to each part its mission and only to place the point of unison wherever these several activities become unity of themselves therefore when a military force advances to the attack on separate theatres of war to each army should be assigned an object against which the force of its shock is to be directed here the point is that these shocks should be given from all sides simultaneously but not that proportional advantages should result from all of them if the task assigned to one army is found too difficult because the enemy has made a disposition of his force different to that which was expected if it sustains a defeat this neither should nor must have any influence on the action of the others or we should turn the probability of the general success against ourselves at the very outset it is only the unsuccessful issue of the majority of enterprises or of the principal one which can and must have an influence upon the others for then it comes under the head of a plan which has miscarried this same rule applies to those armies and portions of them which have originally acted on the defensive and owing to the successes gained have assumed the offensive unless we prefer to attach such spare forces to the principal offensive a point which will chiefly depend on the geographical situation of the theatre of war but under these circumstances what becomes of the geometrical form and unity of the whole attack what of the flanks and rear of corps when those corps next to them are beaten that is precisely what we wish chiefly to combat this gluing down of a great offensive plan of attack on a geometrical square is losing one's way in the regions of fallacy in the fifteenth chapter of the third book we have shown that the geometrical element has less influence in strategy than in tactics and we shall only here repeat the deduction there obtained that in the attack especially the actual results at the various points throughout deserve more attention than the geometrical figure which may gradually be formed through the diversity of results but in any case it is quite certain that looking to the vast spaces with which strategy has to deal the views and resolutions which the geometrical situation of the parts may create should be left to the general-in-chief that therefore no subordinate general has a right to ask what his neighbour is doing or leaving undone but each is to be directed peremptorily to follow out his object 
if any serious incongruity really arises from this a remedy can always be applied in time by the supreme authority thus then may be obviated the chief evil of this separate mode of action which is that in the place of realities a cloud of apprehensions and suppositions mix themselves up in the progress of an operation that every accident affects not only the part it comes immediately in contact with but also the whole by the communication of impressions and that a wide field of action is open for the personal failings and personal animosities of subordinate commanders we think that these views will only appear paradoxical to those who have not studied military history long enough or with sufficient attention who do not distinguish the important from the unimportant nor make proper allowance for the influence of human weaknesses in general if even in tactics there is a difficulty which all experienced soldiers admit their ears in succeeding in an attack in separate columns when it depends on the perfect connection of the several columns how much more difficult or rather how impossible must this be in strategy where the separation is so much wider therefore if a constant connection of all parts was a necessary condition of success a strategic plan of attack of that nature must be at once given up but on the one hand it is not left to our option to discard it completely because circumstances which we cannot control may determine in favour of it on the other hand even in tactics this constant close conjunction of all parts at every moment of the execution is not at all necessary and it is still less so in strategy therefore in strategy we should pay the less attention to this point and insist the more upon a distinct piece of work being assigned to each part we have still to add one important observation it relates to the proper allotment of parts in the year seventeen ninety three and seventeen ninety four the principal austrian army was in the netherlands that of the prussians on the upper rhine the austrians marched from vienna to cond and valenciennes crossing the line of march of the prussians from berlin to landau the austrians had certainly to defend their belgian provinces in that quarter and any conquests made in french flanders would have been acquisitions conveniently situated for them but that interest was not strong enough after the death of prince kaunitz the minister thugut carried a measure for giving up the netherlands entirely for the better concentration of the austrian forces in fact austria is about twice as far from flanders as from alsace and at a time when military resources were very limited and everything had to be paid for in ready money that was no trifling consideration still the minister thugut had plainly something else in view his object was through the urgency of the danger to compel holland england and prussia the powers interested in the defence of the netherlands and lower rhine to make greater efforts he certainly deceived himself in his calculations because nothing could be done with the prussian cabinet at the time but this occurrence always shows the influence of political interests on the course of a war prussia had neither anything to conquer nor to defend in alsace in the year seventeen ninety two it had undertaken the march through lorraine into champagne in a sort of chivalrous spirit but as that enterprise ended in nothing through the unfavourable course of circumstances it continued the war with a feeling of very little interest if the prussian troops had been in the netherlands they would have been in direct communication with holland which they might look upon almost as their own country having conquered it in the year seventeen eighty seven they would have covered the lower rhine and consequently that part of the prussian monarchy which lay next to the theatre of war prussia on account of subsidies would also have had a closer alliance with england which under these circumstances would not so easily have degenerated into the crooked policy of which the prussian cabinet was guilty at that time a much better result therefore might have been expected if the austrians had appeared with their principal force on the upper rhine the prussians with their whole force in the netherlands and the austrians had left there only a corps of proportionate strength if instead of the enterprising blucher general barclay had been placed at the head of the silesian army in eighteen fourteen and blucher and schwarzenberg had been kept with the great army the campaign would perhaps have turned out a complete failure if the enterprising loudon instead of having his theatre of war at the strongest point of the prussian dominions namely in silesia had been in the position of the german states army perhaps the whole seven years war would have had quite a different turn in order to look at this subject more narrowly we must look at the cases according to their chief distinctions the first is if we carry on war in conjunction with other powers who not only take part as our allies but also have an independent interest as well the second is if the army of the ally has come to our assistance the third is when it is only a question with regard to the personal characteristics of the general 
In the first two cases, the point may be raised whether it is better to mix up the troops of the different powers completely, so that each separate army is composed of corps of different powers, as was done in the wars of 1813 and 1814, or to keep them separate as much as possible, so that the army of each power may continue distinct and act independently. Plainly, the first is the most salutary plan, but it supposes a degree of friendly feeling and community of interests which is seldom found. When there is this close good fellowship between the troops, it is much more difficult for the cabinets to separate their interests, and as regards the prejudicial influence of the egotistical views of commanders, it can only show itself under these circumstances amongst the subordinate generals, therefore only in the province of tactics, and even there not so freely or with such impunity as when there is a complete separation. In the latter case, it affects the strategy and therefore makes decided marks. But as already observed, for the first case, there must be a rare spirit of conciliation on the part of the government. In the year 1813, the exigencies of the time impelled all governments in that direction, and yet we cannot sufficiently praise this in the Emperor of Russia, that although he entered the field with the strongest army, and the change of fortune was chiefly brought about by him, yet he set aside all pride about appearing at the head of a separate and independent Russian army, and placed his troops under the Prussian and Austrian commanders. If such a fusion of armies cannot be effected, a complete separation of them is certainly better than a half-and-half half state of things. The worst of all is when two independent commanders of armies of different powers find themselves on the same theatre of war, as frequently happened in the Seven Years' War with the armies of Russia, Austria, and the German states. When there is a complete separation of forces, the burdens which must be borne are also better divided, and each suffers only from what is his own consequently is more impelled to activity by the force of circumstances. But if they find themselves in close connection, or quite on the same theatre of war, this is not the case. And besides that, the ill-will of one paralyses also the powers of the other as well. In the first of the three supposed cases, there will be no difficulty in the complete separation, as the natural interest of each state generally indicates to it a separate mode of employing its force. This may not be so in the second case, and then, as a rule, there is nothing to be done but to place oneself completely under the auxiliary army, if its strength is in any way proportionate to that measure, as the Austrians did in the later part of the campaign of 1815, and the Prussians in the campaign of 1807. With regard to the personal qualifications of the general, everything in this passes into what is particular and individual, but we must not omit to make one general remark, which is that we should not, as is generally done, place at the head of subordinate armies the most prudent and cautious commanders, but the most enterprising. For we repeat that in strategic operations conducted separately, there is nothing more important than that every part should develop its powers to the full. In that way, faults committed at one part may be compensated for by successes at others. This complete activity at all points, however, is only to be expected when the commanders are spirited, enterprising men who are urged forwards by natural impulsiveness, by their own hearts, because a mere objective, coolly reasoned out, conviction of the necessity of action, seldom suffices. Lastly, we have to remark that if circumstances in other respects permit, the troops and their commanders as regards their destination should be employed in accordance with their qualities and the nature of the country, that is, regular armies, ground troops, numerous cavalry, old, prudent, intelligent generals in an open country, militia, national levies, young, enterprising commanders in wooded country, mountains and defiles, auxiliary armies in rich provinces where they can make themselves comfortable. What we have now said upon a plan of a war in general, and in this chapter upon those in particular which are directed to the destruction of the enemy, is intended to give special prominence to the object of the same, and next to indicate principles which may serve as guides in the preparation of ways and means. Our desire has been in this way to give a clear perception of what is to be and should be done in such a war. We have tried to emphasise the necessary in general and leave a margin for the play of the particular and accidental, but to include all that is arbitrary, unfounded, trifling, fantastical or sophistical. If we have succeeded in this object, we look upon our problem as solved. Now, if any one wonders at finding nothing here about turning rivers, about commanding mountains from their highest points, about avoiding strong positions and finding the keys of a country, he has not understood us. Neither does he, as yet, understand war in its general relations, according to our views. In preceding books we have characterised these subjects in general, and we have arrived at the conclusion they are much more insignificant in their nature 
than we should think from their high repute therefore so much the less can or ought they play a great part that is so far as to influence the whole plan of a war when it is a war which has for its object the destruction of the enemy at the end of the book we shall devote a chapter specially to the consideration of the chief command the present chapter we shall close with an example if austria prussia the german confederation the netherlands and england determine on a war with france but russia remains neutral a case which has frequently happened during the last one hundred and fifty years they are able to carry on an offensive war having for its object the overthrow of the enemy for powerful and great as france is it is still possible for it to see more than half its territory overrun by the enemy its capital occupied and itself reduced in its means to a state of complete inefficiency without there being any power except russia which can give it effectual support spain is too distant and too disadvantageously situated the italian states are at present too brittle and powerless the countries we have named have exclusive of their possessions out of europe above seventy five million inhabitants readers note there is an asterisk here the footnote reads this chapter was probably written in eighteen twenty eight since which time the numerical relations have considerably changed a d h readers note ends whilst france has only thirty million and the army which they could call out for a war against france really meant in earnest would be as follows without exaggeration austria two hundred and fifty thousand prussia two hundred thousand the rest of germany a hundred and fifty thousand netherlands seventy five thousand england fifty thousand total seven hundred and twenty five thousand should this force be placed on a war footing it would in all probability very much exceed that which france could oppose for under bonaparte the country never had an army of the like strength now if we take into account the deductions required as garrisons for fortresses and depots to watch the coasts etc there can be no doubt the allies would have a great superiority in the principal theatre of war and upon that the object or plan of overthrowing the enemy is chiefly founded the centre of gravity of the french power lies in its military force and in paris to defeat the former in one or more battles to take paris and drive the wreck of the french across the loire must be the object of the allies the pit of the stomach of the french monarchy is between paris and brussels on that side the frontier is only thirty miles from the capital part of the allies the english netherlanders prussian and north german states have their natural point of assembly in that direction as these states lie partly in the immediate vicinity partly in a direct line behind it austria and south germany can only carry on their war conveniently from the upper rhine their natural direction is upon troyes and paris or it may be orleans both shocks therefore that from the netherlands and the other from the upper rhine are quite direct and natural short and powerful and both fall upon the centre of gravity of the enemy's power between these two points therefore the whole invading army should be divided but there are two considerations which interfere with the simplicity of this plan the austrians would not lay bare their italian dominions they would wish to retain the mastery over events there in any case and therefore would not incur the risk of making an attack on the heart of france by which they would leave italy only indirectly covered looking to the political state of the country this collateral consideration is not to be treated with contempt but it would be a decided mistake if the old and oft-tried plan of attack from italy directed against the south of france was bound up with it and if on that account the force in italy was increased to a size not required for mere security against contingencies in the first campaign only the number needed for that security should remain in italy only that number should be withdrawn from the great undertaking if we would not be unfaithful to that first maxim unity of plan concentration of force to think of conquering france by the rhone would be like trying to lift a musket by the point of its bayonet but also as an auxiliary enterprise an attack on the south of france is to be condemned for it only raises new forces against us whenever an attack is made on distant provinces interests and activities are roused which would otherwise have lain dormant it would only be in case that the forces left for the security of italy were in excess of the number required and therefore to avoid leaving them unemployed that there would be any justification for an attack on the south of france from that quarter we therefore repeat that the force left in italy must be kept down as low as circumstances will permit 
and it will be quite large enough if it will suffice to prevent the austrians from losing the whole country in one campaign let us suppose that number to be fifty thousand men for the purpose of our illustration another consideration deserving attention is the relation of france in respect to its sea coast as england has the upper hand at sea it follows that france must on that account be very susceptible with regard to the whole of her atlantic coast and consequently must protect it with garrisons of greater or less strength now however weak this coast defence may be still the french frontiers are tripled by it and large drafts on that account cannot fail to be withdrawn from the french army on the theatre of war twenty or thirty thousand troops disposable to effect a landing with which the english threaten france would probably absorb twice or three times the number of french troops and further we must think not only of troops but also of money artillery etc etc required for ships and coast batteries let us suppose that the english devote twenty five thousand to this object our plan of war would then consist simply in this one that in the netherlands two hundred thousand prussians seventy five thousand netherlanders twenty five thousand english fifty thousand north german confederation total three hundred and fifty thousand be assembled of whom about fifty thousand should be set aside to garrison frontier fortresses and the remaining three hundred thousand should advance against paris and engage the french army in a decisive battle that two hundred thousand austrians and one hundred thousand south german troops should assemble on the upper rhine to advance at the same time as the army of the netherlands the direction being towards the upper seine and from thence towards the loire with a view likewise to a great battle these two attacks would perhaps unite in one on the loire by this the chief point is determined what we have to add is chiefly intended to root out false conceptions and is as follows one to seek for the great battle as prescribed and deliver it with such a relation in point of numerical strength and under such circumstances as promise a decisive victory is the course for the chief commanders to follow to this object everything must be sacrificed and as few men as possible should be employed in sieges blockades garrisons etc if like schwarzenberg in eighteen fourteen as soon as they enter the enemy's provinces they spread out in eccentric rays all is lost that this did not take place in eighteen fourteen the allies may thank the powerless state of france alone the attack should be like a wedge well driven home not like a soap bubble which distends itself until it bursts two switzerland must be left to its own forces if it remains neutral and forms a good point appui on the upper rhine if it is attacked by france let her stand up for herself which in more than one respect she is very well able to do nothing is more absurd than to attribute to switzerland a predominant geographical influence upon events in war because it is the highest land in europe such an influence only exists under certain very restricted conditions which are not to be found here when the french are attacked in the heart of their country they can undertake no offensive from switzerland either against italy or swabia and least of all can the elevated situation of the country come into consideration as a decisive circumstance the advantage of a country which is dominating in a strategic sense is in the first place chiefly important in the defensive and any importance which it has in the offensive may manifest itself in a single encounter whoever does not know this has not thought over the thing and arrived at a clear perception of it and in case that at any future council of potentates and generals some learned officer of the general staff should be found who with an anxious brow displays such wisdom we now declare it beforehand to be mere folly and wish that in the same council some true blade some child of sound common sense may be present who will stop his mouth three the space between two attacks we think of very little consequence when six hundred thousand assemble thirty or forty miles from paris to march against the heart of france would any one think of covering the middle rhine as well as berlin dresden vienna and munich there would be no sense in such a thing are we to cover the communications that would not be unimportant but then we might soon be led into giving this covering the importance of an attack and then instead of advancing on two lines as the situation of the states positively requires we should be led to advance upon three which is not required these three would then perhaps become five or perhaps seven and in that way the old rigmarole would once more become the order of the day our two attacks have each their object the forces employed on them are probably very superior to the enemy in numbers 
if each pursues his march with vigour they cannot fail to react advantageously upon each other if one of the two attacks is unfortunate because the enemy has not divided his forces equally we may fairly expect that the result of the other will of itself repair this disaster and this is the true interdependence between the two an interdependence extending to open bracket so as to be affected by close bracket the events of each day is impossible on account of the distance neither is it necessary and therefore the immediate or rather the direct connection is of no such great value besides the enemy attacked in the very centre of his dominions will have no forces worth speaking of to employ in interrupting this connection all that is to be apprehended is that this interruption may be attempted by a cooperation of the inhabitants with the partisans so that this object does not actually cost the enemy any troops to prevent that it is sufficient to send a corps of ten or fifteen thousand men particularly strong in cavalry in the direction from treves to reims it will be able to drive every partisan before it and keep in line with the grand army this corps should neither invest nor watch fortresses but march between them depend on no fixed basis but give way before superior forces in any direction no great misfortune could happen to it and if such did happen it would again be no serious misfortune for the whole under these circumstances such a corps might probably serve as an intermediate link between the two attacks for the two subordinate undertakings that is the austrian army in italy and the english army for landing on the coast might follow their object as appeared best if they do not remain idle their mission is fulfilled as regards the chief point and on no account should either of the two great attacks be made dependent in any way on these minor ones we are quite convinced that in this way france may be overthrown and chastised whenever it thinks fit to put on that insolent air with which it has oppressed europe for a hundred and fifty years it is only on the other side of paris on the loire that those conditions can be obtained from it which are necessary for the peace of europe in this way alone the natural relation between thirty millions of men and seventy-five millions will quickly make itself known but not if the country from dunkirk to genoa is to be surrounded in the way it has been for a hundred and fifty years by a girdle of armies whilst fifty different small objects are aimed at not one of which is powerful enough to overcome the inertia friction and extraneous influences which spring up and reproduce themselves everywhere but more especially in allied armies how little the provisional organization of the german federal armies is adapted to such a disposition will strike the reader by that organization the federative part of germany forms the nucleus of the german power and prussia and austria thus weakened lose their natural influence but a federative state is a very brittle nucleus in war there is in it no unity no energy no rational choice of a commander no authority no responsibility austria and prussia are the two natural centres of force of the german empire they form the pivot or fulcrum the forte of the sword they are monarchical states used to war they have well-defined interests independence of power they are predominant over the others the organization should follow these natural lineaments and not a false notion about unity which is an impossibility in such a case and he who neglects the possible in quest for the impossible is a fool end of chapter nine and end of book eight recording by timothy ferguson gold coast australia Appendix 1, Part 1 of On War, Volumes 2 and 3 by Karl von Clausewitz. Translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Appendix 1, Summary of the Instruction given by the Author to His Royal Highness the Crown Prince in the years 1810, 1811, and 1812. Part 1 scheme which was laid before general von gordy presuming that it is only a preliminary knowledge of the art of war which his royal highness the crown prince is to receive from me with a view to his royal highness being enabled to understand modern military history it is of the first importance that i should give the prince a clear idea of war and that i should do so in such a manner as to avoid diffuseness or taxing the prince's faculties too much in order to acquire a thorough knowledge of a science it is necessary to apply one's mind chiefly to the study of it for some time and it appears to be too soon for the prince to do this 
For these reasons I have adopted the following course, which appears to me most in accordance with the natural direction of the ideas of a young man. In carrying it out, my chief endeavour will be, in the first place, to make myself always intelligible to the prince, as otherwise the most attentive pupil must soon become wearied, confused, and disgusted. Secondly, in every case to avoid giving any erroneous ideas, through which his further instruction or progress of his own studies might be impeded or interfered with. For the sake of the first of these objects, I shall endeavour to keep the subject always in correspondence with the natural understanding as much as possible, and in this effort shall often deviate from the scientific spirit and scholastic forms. I now submit to Your Excellency the plan I have sketched hastily, and beg you will do me the favour to correct my view in any points in which it may not be in accordance with your own. Next to a preparatory knowledge of weapons and the different kinds of troops, some conception of applied or higher tactics, as they are called, and strategy, is principally necessary in order to comprehend military history. Tactics, or the theory of fighting, is in reality the principal thing, partly because battles are decisive, partly because it comprises the most of what can be taught. Strategy, or the theory of combination of separate battles towards the object of the campaign, is a subject more of natural and matured power of judgment. Still, we must at least point out clearly the subjects which are therein to be found, and show their mutual connection and relation to the whole. Field fortification in such a synoptical course will be most suitably placed with the theory of the defensive in tactics, permanent fortification in or after strategy. Tactics itself comprises two different classes of subjects. One class may be understood without having any acquaintance with the strategic relations of the whole. To this belong the formation for tactical purposes and the mode of fighting of all the smaller parts, from the company or squadron up to the brigade of all arms and in all kinds of country. Those of the other class are in intimate connection with strategic conceptions. To this class belong the usual action of whole corps and armies in battle, outpost services, and the minor operations of war, etc., etc., because in such there are introduced conceptions of position, battle, march, etc., which cannot be understood without previous conceptions of the combination of the whole campaign. I shall therefore separate the two classes of subjects, begin with a concise and very general description of war, pass on to tactics, or the action of the smaller divisions in battle, and then stop short when I reach the position, order of battle, of the whole corps or armies, in order to return to the general view of the campaign and to explain more in detail the connection of things. Then the remaining chapters on tactics will follow. Lastly, I shall begin strategy again with the idea of the course of a campaign in order to consider the subject from this new point of view. From this now follows the arrangement as under. Arms, powder, small arms, rifles, cannon, and all appertaining thereto. Artillery, theory of charges for horizontal and vertical firing, service of cannon of all kinds, organisation of a battery, expense of guns and ammunition, etc., effect of artillery, ranges, probability of hitting, other kinds of troops, cavalry, light, heavy, infantry, ditto, formation, destination, character. Applied or higher tactics, a general conception of war, battles, position of smaller divisions and their mode of fighting, a company of infantry with or without artillery on all kinds of ground, a squadron of cavalry the same, the two together, ditto in different kinds of ground, order of battle for a corps of several brigades, ditto of an army of several corps, the two last sections without relation to ground because otherwise the idea of position would be introduced, more detailed explanation of the campaign, organisation of army at the commencement of a campaign, Whilst it marches and takes up positions, it requires measures of security, outposts, patrols, reconnaissances, detachments, minor warfare. When an army chooses a position, such arrangements must be made that the army can defend itself in the same tactical defensive field fortification, attacks of the army in such positions, conduct to be observed in the combat itself, battle, retreat, pursuit, marches, defence of rivers, passage of rivers, lines of posts, Cantonments, strategy, view of a campaign and of a whole war in strategic respects, 
what determines the result in war, plan of operations, plan of operations, arrangements for subsistence, offensive war, defensive war, positions, lines of posts, battles, marches, defence and passage of rivers, cantonments, winter quarters, mountain warfare, system of war, etc., etc., permanent fortifications and siege warfare, either proceed strategy or form a conclusion to the whole. The most important principles of the art of war to complete my course of instruction of His Royal Highness the Crown Prince. Although these principles are the result of much reflection and an assiduous study of military history, they have only been drawn up hastily on the present occasion, and the form in which they appear will not bear any stringent criticism. Besides from the multiplicity of subjects, only the most important have been selected, a certain conciseness being essentially necessary. These principles, therefore, do not constitute a complete course of instruction for your Royal Highness. They are only intended as a foundation for reflection on your own part, and to serve as a guide in these reflections. 1. General Principles to be Observed in War 1. The great object of the theory of war is to guide us to the way of obtaining a preponderance of physical force and advantages at the decisive points. But if this is not possible, theory teaches also how to speculate upon the moral powers, upon the probable errors of the enemy, upon the impression made by a bold spirit of enterprise, etc., etc., even upon our own desperation. All this is by no means beyond the province of the art of war and its theory, for that theory is nothing but rational reflection upon all situations in which we can be placed in war. The most dangerous positions in which we can be placed are just those which we should look upon as most likely to occur, and those about which we should most distinctly make up our minds. That leads to heroic resolves founded on reason. Whoever represents the affair to your Royal Highness in any other manner is a pedant who can only do harm by the views he advances. In the critical moments of life, in the tumult of battle, you will one day feel clearly that no other view can give any help when help is most necessary, and when a dry pedantry of figures leaves us to our fate. Two, naturally in war, we always seek to have the probability of success on our side, whether it be that we count upon a physical or moral superiority. But this is not always possible. We must often undertake things when the probability of our succeeding is against us, if, for instance, we can do nothing better. If in such a case we despair, then our rational reflection and judgment leave us just when most wanted, when everything seems to conspire against us. Therefore, even when the probability of success is against us, we must not, on that account, consider our undertaking as impossible or unreasonable. Reasonable it will always be if we can do nothing better, and if we employ the few means we have to the best advantage. In order that in such cases we may never lose equanimity and firmness, two qualities which in war are always the first to be in peril, which in such a situation are difficult to maintain, but without which, with the most brilliant qualities of mind, we can effect nothing, we must familiarise ourselves with the idea of falling with honour. Cherish that idea constantly and completely accustom ourselves to it. Be convinced, most noble prince, that without this firm determination nothing great can be effected in the most fortunate war, to say nothing of an unfortunate one. We may be certain that this idea often occupied the mind of Frederick the Second during his first Silesian campaign, and because he was accustomed to it, he made the attack at Luthen on that memorable 5th of December, and not because he had made a calculation that with the oblique order of battle he would in all probability beat the Austrians. 3. Amongst all the operations left to your choice in any given case, Amongst all the manoeuvres which are open to adoption, there will always be a choice between the bold and the prudent. Some people think that theory is always on the side of the prudent. That is false. If theory could give advice in the matter, it would counsel the most decisive, consequently the boldest, as that is the most consistent with the nature of war. But it leaves to the general to choose, according to the measure of his own courage, of his spirit of enterprise and confidence in himself. Choose, then, according to the measure of these inner powers, always remembering that there was never a great general who was wanting in boldness. 2. Tactics or the theory of combat. War consists of a combination of many distinct battles. Now, although this combination may be either skilful or the reverse, and the result, in a great measure, depends upon that point, 
still the battle itself stands before it in a point of importance for nothing but a combination of successful battles gives a good result therefore the thing of the highest importance in war will always be the art of conquering the enemy in battle on this your royal highness cannot bestow too much attention and thought the following principles i hold to be the most important one general principles a for the defence one to keep troops on the defensive under cover from fire as long as possible as we may be attacked consequently may have to defend ourselves at any moment except when we are ourselves acting on the offensive we must therefore always take up a position as much under cover as possible two not to bring the whole force into action at once if this fault is committed all rational guidance of the combat is at an end it is only with disposable troops that we can turn the course of a battle three to trouble ourselves little about the width of our front as it is a matter of little consequence in itself and the depth of the position that is the number of troops placed one behind the other is diminished by an extension of the front troops which are in rear of the front line are disposable they can either be used to restore the combat at that point or brought forward at other adjacent points this principle follows from the preceding for as the enemy whilst he attacks some part of the front often seeks to outflank and envelop at the same time therefore the troops placed at the rear are available to repel such attempts and accordingly supply the want of local obstacles on which to rest the flanks they are better placed for that purpose than if they stood in line and extended the width of the front for in such case they themselves would be easily turned by the enemy this point also further establishes the second five if there are many troops to be posted in the rear only a part should be placed directly behind the front the rest are placed in an oblique direction in echelon to the rear beyond either flank from this last position the enemy's columns approaching to turn our flank can in turn be taken in flank it is a first maxim never to remain perfectly passive but to fall upon the enemy in front and flank even when he is in the act of making an attack upon us we adopt the defensive therefore on a certain line only to compel the enemy to develop his forces for the attack of that line and we then pass over to the offensive with troops which have been kept in reserve as your royal highness once justly remarked the art of field fortification is not to serve the defender like a wall behind which he can stand in greater security but to aid him in attacking the enemy with more success the same applies to every passive defence it is always only the means of attacking the enemy with advantage on ground that we have looked out and prepared for ourselves and where we have drawn up our troops this attack belonging to the defensive may be made either at the moment the enemy opens his attack on us or whilst he is on the march to do so it may also be arranged that when the enemy commences his attack we draw back and thus lure him on to ground of which he is ignorant in order to fall upon him on all sides for all dispositions of this kind the deep formation of an army that is an order in which only two-thirds or the half or even less are in front and the rest posted directly and obliquely in rear under cover if possible is very well suited and therefore this order of battle is a point of infinite importance eight therefore if we have two divisions it is better to place one behind the other than to place them in line with three divisions one at least should be placed in rear with four probably two with five at least two in many cases three etc etc nine at the points where we remain passive we should make use of field fortification but only in separate enclosed works of bold profile ten in forming a plan of battle we should have a great object in view as for example the attack of a strong column of the enemy and a complete victory over it if we only choose a small object whilst the enemy pursues a great one we shall evidently be the losers we play with thalers against phoenix eleven if our plan of defence is aimed at some great object open bracket, the destruction of a column of the enemy etc close bracket, we must follow it up with the utmost energy expend upon it all our forces in most cases the efforts of the assailant will be in some other direction whilst we fall upon his right wing he will be seeking to gain an advantage with his left if we slacken our efforts sooner than the enemy if we follow up our object with less energy than he does he will attain his object he will gain his advantage completely whilst we shall only half reach ours thus the enemy obtains the preponderance thus the victory becomes his and we must give up even our half advantage gained if your royal highness reads attentively the account of the battles of ratisbon and wagram you will see the truth and importance of this 
in both these battles the emperor napoleon attacked with his right wing standing on the defensive with the left the archduke charles did the same but the one did it with full resolution and energy the other was undecided and stopped always halfway the successes gained by that portion of the archduke's army which was victorious were unimportant those which the emperor napoleon gained in the same time at the opposite point were decisive twelve if i may be allowed to bring forward once more the two last principles the combination of them yields a maxim which in the modern art of war may be regarded as the first among all causes of victory that is to follow up a great and decisive object with energy and perseverance thirteen danger in case of failure is increased thereby it is true but prudence increased at the cost of victory is no art it is a false prudence which as already said is opposed to the very nature of war for great ends we must venture much true prudence is if we risk anything in war to select and apply carefully the means to our end and to neglect nothing through indolence or want of consideration of this kind was the prudence of the emperor napoleon who never followed great objects timidly and with half measures through over prudence among the few victorious defensive battles that are noted in history you will find noble sir that the greatest were fought in the spirit of these principles for they are principles derived from the study of history at minden the duke ferdinand suddenly appeared on a field of battle on which the enemy did not expect him and proceeded to the attack whilst at tannhausen he defended himself passively behind entrenchments at rossbach frederick the second threw himself on the enemy at a point and at a time where his attack was not expected at lignitz the austrians found the king in the night in quite a different position from that in which they had seen him the day before he fell upon a column of the enemy with the whole weight of his army and defeated it before the others could take part in the engagement at hohenlinden moreau had five divisions in his front and four behind him either directly or obliquely to the rear he turned the enemy and fell upon the right flank column before it could carry out its intended attack at ratisbon marshal davis defended himself passively while napoleon with the right wing attacked the fifth and sixth corps d'armee and completely defeated them at wagram the austrians were in reality on the defensive still as they attacked the emperor on the second day with the greater part of their force we may look upon the latter as acting on the defensive with his right wing he attacked the austrian left turned and beat it not troubling himself meanwhile about his weak left wing consisting of a single division resting on the danube but by means of his strong reserves deep position he prevented the victory of the austrian right wing from having any influence on the victory which he had gained on the rusbach with these reserves he retook adekla all the foregoing principles are not plainly exemplified in each of the battles enumerated but all are examples of an active defensive the mobility of the prussian army under frederick the second was a means to victory for him upon which we can no longer build as other armies are capable of moving as ours now on the other hand at that time the turning a flank was less generally in vogue and therefore the deep order of battle was less imperative b for the attack one we try to fall upon a point in the enemy's position that is a part of his army a division a corps with a great preponderance of force whilst we keep the other parts in uncertainty that is to say occupy them it is only in this way that when our forces are equal or inferior we can fight with the superiority on our side that is with the probability of success if we are very weak then we can only spare very few troops to occupy the enemy at other points that we may be as strong as possible at the decisive point unquestionably frederick the second only gained the battle of luthen because he had his small army on one spot and well concentrated as compared with the enemy two the principal blow is directed against a wing of the enemy's force by an attack in front and flank or by completely going round it and attacking it in rear it is only if we push the enemy off his line of retreat by victory that we gain a great success three even when in strong force we often choose only one point for the great shock and give the blow against that point the greater strength for to surround an army completely is seldom possible or supposes an immense preponderance both physically and morally but the enemy may also be cut off from his line of retreat by an attack directed against a point in one of his flanks and that is generally sufficient to ensure great results generally the certainty high probability of the victory 
that is the certainty of being able to drive the enemy from the field of battle is the principal point upon this as an object or end the plan of battle must be formed for a victory once gained even if it is not decisive is easily made so by energy in pursuit five we endeavour to make our attack concentrically on that wing of the enemy which is to receive the shock of our main body that is in such a form that his troops find themselves engaged on all sides at once allowing the enemy has troops enough to show a front in all directions still the troops under such circumstances become more easily discouraged they suffer more are sooner thrown into disorder etc in short we may expect to make them give way sooner six this turning of the enemy compels the assailant to develop a greater force in front than the defender readers note there follows a diagram in the diagram there are three white rectangles and one black rectangle the white rectangles are labelled a b and c the black rectangle is labelled e the white rectangles form a loose horseshoe around the black rectangle readers note ends if the corps a b c are to fall concentrically or by converging lines on the part e of the enemy's army they must naturally stand on lines contiguous to each other but this development of our force in front must never be carried so far that we do not retain strong reserves that would be the greatest error possible and would lead to defeat if the enemy is in only some measure prepared against being outflanked readers know to the follows a diagram which is an elaboration of the previous diagram a b and c form a loose horseshoe about the thin edge of the black rectangle e assuming e's point of view behind rectangle a there are now two further white rectangles g and f readers note ends if a b c are corps intended to attack e as part of the enemy's army then the corps f g must be kept in reserve with this deep formation we can incessantly renew our attacks upon the same point and if our troops are repulsed at the opposite extremity of the enemy's position we are not obliged to give up the day at this because we have to set off any success the enemy may have gained it was thus with the french at wagram the left wing which was opposed to the austrian right resting on the danube was extremely weak and was totally defeated even their centre at adakla was not very strong and was obliged to give way to the austrians on the first day but that did not signify because the emperor's right with which he attacked the austrian left in front and flank had such a depth that he brought a heavy column of cavalry and horse artillery to bear upon the austrians in adakla and if he did not beat them was able at all events to stop their progress seven as in the defensive so in the offensive that part of the enemy's army which in its destruction will yield decisive advantages should be the object of attack eight as in the defensive so here we must not relax our efforts till we have attained our object or that our means are entirely exhausted if the defender is also active if he attacks us at other points we have no chance of the victory except by surpassing him in energy and boldness if he remains passive then in that case we run no great danger nine long continuous lines of troops are to be particularly avoided they only lead to parallel attacks which are now no longer to the purpose each division makes its own attack although in conformity with the plans of higher authority and consequently so that they accord with each other but one division eight thousand to ten thousand men is never now formed in one line always in three or four from this it follows that no long continuous lines can be used any more ten the attacks or divisions of army corps in concert must not be combined with the intention of their being under one guidance so that although at distance from each other and perhaps even separated by the enemy they still remain in communication even alighting themselves on each other etc this is an erroneous bad method of carrying out a cooperation which is liable to a thousand accidents through which nothing great can ever be effected and by which one is almost certain to be well beaten if we have to deal with an active vigorous enemy the true way is to give each corps or division commander the general control of his march to give him the enemy as the point on which his march is to be directed and the victory over the enemy as the object of his march each commander of a column has therefore the order to attack the enemy where he finds him and to do so with all his strength he must not be made answerable for the result for that leads to indecision he must be responsible for nothing more 
than that his corps joins in the fight with all its energies and makes any sacrifice that may be necessary eleven a well-organized independent corps can resist the attacks of a vastly superior force for a certain length of time some hours and is therefore not to be destroyed in a moment therefore if it has even been engaged with the enemy too soon and is beaten still its action is not lost on the whole the enemy must have deployed his forces and expended a certain portion of them on this corps and thus given our other corps a favourable opportunity for attack of the organisation of a corps for this purpose we shall speak hereafter we ensure the harmonious action of the whole in concert when each corps has in this manner a certain independence and seeks out the enemy and attacks him at any cost twelve one of the most important principles for offensive war is the surprise of the enemy the more the attack partakes of the nature of a surprise the more successful we may expect it to be the surprise which the defender effects by the concealment of his dispositions by the covered position in which he places his troops the offensive can only effect by the unexpected march to the attack this is an occurrence which rarely happens in modern warfare this is partly owing to better measures for the security of an army partly owing to wars being now prosecuted with more vigour so that there are not now those long pauses in the operations which lulled the one party to sleep and gave the other a favourable opportunity to make a sudden attack under these circumstances except by a regular night surprise such as at hochkirch which is always possible the only way now to surprise an enemy is to make a march to the flank or the rear and then suddenly return upon him or if we are at a distance then by forced marches and by great efforts to reach the enemy's position sooner than he expects thirteen the regular surprise by night as at hochkirk affords the best chance of doing something when our army is small but it is attended with more risks for the assailant if the defender knows the country better than he does the less we know of the country and of the enemy's arrangements the greater these risks are therefore such attacks in many instances can only be regarded as desperate means fourteen in such attacks all the arrangements must be more simple and we must keep still more concentrated than by day two principles for the use of troops one if we cannot dispense with the use of firearms and if we could why should we carry them at all we must open the combat with them and the cavalry should not be employed until the enemy has suffered considerably by the action of infantry and artillery from this follows a that the cavalry should be posted behind the infantry b that we must not be induced to bring the cavalry into action too soon the cavalry should not be launched boldly to the attack until such disorder prevails in the enemy's ranks that we may hope for success by his hasty retreat two the fire of artillery produces greater effect than that of infantry a battery of eight six-pounders does not occupy a third part of the front of a battalion of infantry is worked by an eighth of the number of men composing a battalion and does certainly twice if not three times as much execution with its fire on the other hand artillery has the disadvantage of not being so easily moved as infantry this applies in general even to the lightest description of horse artillery for it cannot be used like infantry upon any ground from the commencement therefore the artillery must be kept united at the most important points because it cannot like the infantry concentrate itself at those points during the progress of the battle a great battery of twenty or thirty guns is in most cases decisive at the point where it is placed three from the particulars just specified and others which are evident the following rules present themselves for the use of the different arms of the service respectively a the battle is commenced by artillery the greater proportion of that arm being brought into use from the very first it is only with large masses of troops that both horse and foot artillery are kept in reserve artillery is used in large masses brought together at single points twenty or thirty guns defend the principal point in one great battery or batter the point in the enemy's line which it is intended to attack b we use light infantry either marksmen riflemen or fusiliers principally in order not to bring too many troops into action at once we try first to feel what there is in our front for that can seldom be properly examined we want to see which direction the fight is likely to take if we can maintain an equal fight with the enemy with this line of skirmishers and that there is no reason for hastening the affair 
we should do wrong to hurry forward other forces we should weary out the enemy with this kind of fight as much as possible c if the enemy brings so many troops into the combat as to overpower our line of skirmishers or we cannot delay any longer we bring forward a full line of infantry which deploys itself at a hundred or two hundred paces from the enemy and either opens fire or advances to the charge according to circumstances d this is the chief purpose for which the infantry is destined if we are drawn up in such deep formation that we have still a line of infantry in column in reserve we are tolerably well master of the combat at this point this second line of infantry should if possible be used only in columns to decide the day e the cavalry during this time keeps in rear of the troops engaged in action as near as it can without suffering much loss that is beyond the reach of grape and musketry it must however be at hand that we may be able to profit by any success which takes place in the course of the combat for in following these rules more or less strictly we must keep in view the following principle on which i cannot insist too strongly viz not to make a venture with all our forces at once because we thus throw away all means of directing them to weary our adversary with as few troops as possible and keep in hand a considerable mass for the last decisive moment once this last reserve is staked it must be led with the utmost boldness five an order of battle that is a method of drawing up the troops before and during the battle must be established for the whole campaign or the whole war this order of battle is to be observed in all cases where there is not time to make special dispositions it must therefore be based chiefly with a view to the defensive this order of battle will reduce the form or manner in which the army fights to a kind of method which is very necessary as well as salutary because a great number of the generals of second order and other officers at the head of smaller divisions have little knowledge of tactics and no special aptitude at all for war by this a certain methodicism is instituted which takes the place of art where the latter is wanting my persuasion is that this exists to the greatest degree in the french army six according to what has been said respecting the use of the different arms of the service this order of battle for a brigade would look something like the following readers note that follows a diagram the caption of the diagram is as follows a b is a line of light infantry which opens the battle and in a broken uneven country serves in some measure as an advanced guard then comes the artillery c d intended to be placed in battery at advantageous points until put in position it remains behind the first line of infantry e f is the first line of infantry intended to deploy and open fire in this case it is formed of four battalions g h two regiments of cavalry i k the second line of infantry which constitutes the reserve intended to decide the result of the battle l m its cavalry caption ends the diagram also shows an extra line marked horse artillery behind the lines mentioned in the caption readers note ends according to the same principles a similar disposition may be established for a corps of larger proportions at the same time it is not essential that the order adopted should be precisely that now laid down it may differ in some respects so that it is in conformity with the foregoing principles thus for instance the usual position of the cavalry g h may be in the line l m and then it is only brought forward when it is found to be too far in rear at l m seven the army consists of several such independent corps which have their generals and staff they are drawn up in line or one behind another according as that may be prescribed by the general principles for the combat one thing we have still to add which is that if we are not too weak in cavalry we should form a special reserve of that arm which naturally will be placed quite in rear and is for the following purposes a to press upon the enemy if he retreats from the field and to attack the cavalry which he employs in covering his retreat if the enemy's cavalry is beaten at that moment great results must follow unless the enemy's infantry performs prodigies of valour small bodies of cavalry will not answer the purpose on such an occasion b to hasten the pursuit of the enemy if without being beaten he makes a retreat or if after a lost battle he continues to retire on the following day cavalry marches quicker than infantry and is more dreaded by troops that are retreating and next to beating the enemy the pursuit is the most important thing in war c if our object is to make a great turning movement to turn the enemy strategically and on account of the detour we must employ an arm which marches quicker then we may take this reserve cavalry for that purpose 
in order to make this corps more independent horse artillery should be attached to it for there is a greater strength in a combination of several arms eight the order of battle for the troops has relation to the battle it is their disposition for that end the order of march is in its essentials as follows a each complete corps whether brigade or division has its own advance and rear guard and forms a column of itself that does not however prevent several such corps from marching on the same road one after another and thus to a certain extent forming as a whole one great column b the corps march according to their position in the general order of battle that is to say according to their appointed place in that order may happen to be in line with or in rear of each other so they march c in the corps themselves the following order is invariably observed the light infantry form the advanced and rear guards accompanied by a proportion of cavalry then follow the infantry then the artillery last of all the rest of the cavalry this order is kept whether we move against the enemy in which case it is the natural order or parallel with the enemy in which case properly those who in the order of battle are to stand behind one another should march side by side if we have to form a line of battle there can never be want of time to such a degree that we cannot withdraw the cavalry and the second line by one flank or the other three principles for the use of ground one the terrain the ground or country gives two advantages in war the first is that obstacles to approach are thus presented which either render it impossible for an enemy to reach certain points or compel him to march slowly to keep in column etc the second is that obstacles of ground enable us to conceal the position of our troops both advantages are very important but the second appears to me the greatest at all events it is certainly the one which we can most frequently make use of because even the most level country in most cases still allows of drawing up of troops more or less under cover formerly the first of these advantages was almost the only one known and very little use was made of the second now the mobility of all armies is such that the first is of less service and just on that account we must make use the more frequently of the second the first of these two advantages is only serviceable in the defensive and the second in both attack and defence two the ground considered as an obstacle to approach is of use chiefly in the following points a as a support for the flanks b as a means of strengthening the front three as a fit support for a flank an obstacle should be quite impassable such as a large river a lake an impassable swamp these are all impediments which are rarely met with and therefore perfect supports for the flanks are seldom to be found and the want of them is felt now more frequently than formerly because armies move more do not remain so long in one position consequently require a greater number of positions in the theatre of war if the obstacle to approach is not an impassable barrier then it is properly speaking no point d'appui for a flank it is only a point which strengthens the position troops must then be placed behind it and then again it becomes in relation to these an obstacle to approach it is certainly always of advantage to strengthen the flanks in this manner as fewer troops are then required at these points but we must take precautions against two things the first is placing too much reliance on such supports for the flank and thus neglecting to have strong reserves behind them the second is covering both wings with obstacles of this description for as they do not completely secure either they do not prevent the possibility of a combat on both flanks this may easily become a most disadvantageous defensive for the obstacles will not allow us easily to sally forth with an active defence on one wing and thus we may be reduced to defend ourselves in the most unfavourable of all forms with both flanks thrown back readers note there is a diagram at this point which shows a semicircle enveloping a rectangular shape the points of the rectangle being the position of the two flanks before and after they are thrown back readers note ends for these considerations lead again to the deep order of battle the less we are able to find secure support for the wings the more cause we must have in rear with which we may in turn outflank any portion of the enemy's army which shall seek to act against our flank five all kinds of ground which cannot be passed by troops marching in line all villages all enclosures of parcels of ground by hedges and ditches marshy meadows lastly all hills which can only be mounted with some difficulty come under the head of terrain hindrances of this kind that is of obstacles that cannot be passed except with difficulty and slowly and which therefore add greatly to the strength of the troops posted behind them in the combat woods can only be included in this category when the underwood is very thick and the ground marshy a common wood of high trees is as easy to pass as a plain there is one point however in respect to a wood which must not be overlooked that is that it may serve to conceal the enemy 
if we place ourselves inside it then there is the same disadvantage for both sides but it is very dangerous and at the same time a great mistake to have woods in front or on the flank such a thing can never be allowable unless there are very few roads by which they can be traversed abatis intended to bar the passages are so easily removed that they are not of much use six from all this follows that we should endeavour to make use of such obstacles upon one flank in order to offer there a relatively strong resistance with few troops whilst we carry out our intended offensive on the other flank with these obstacles the use of entrenchments may be combined with great advantage because then if the enemy passes the obstacle the fire from the entrenchments may secure our weak force from being overwhelmed by superior numbers and thrown back too suddenly seven when we are on the defensive every obstacle covering our front is of great value all hills on which positions are taken up are only occupied on this account for an elevated position has seldom any important influence often none at all on the effect of arms in use if we stand above the enemy as he approaches he must ascend with difficulty therefore he advances only slowly his ranks get into disorder and he reaches us with his physical powers exhausted advantages for us which with equal bravery and numbers on each side ought to be decisive the great effect morally of a rapid charge at full speed is a point which must not on any account be overlooked the soldier who is advancing becomes insensible even to danger the one who is standing still loses his presence of mind it is therefore always advantageous to place the first lines of infantry and artillery on high ground if the slope of the hill is so steep its declivity so broken and uneven that we cannot sweep it well with our fire which is often the case then instead of placing our front line on the summit ridge that part should at most only be occupied by skirmishers and the full line should be so placed on the reverse slope that at the moment when the enemy reaches the summit ridge and begins to rally his ranks he is exposed to the greatest fire all other local features which form obstacles to approach such as small rivers streams hollow ways etc serve to make breaks in the enemy's front he must after passing them halt to reform and that delays him therefore he should then be brought within range of our most effectual fire the most effectual fire is grape four hundred to six hundred yards if there is plenty of artillery available the fire of musketry a hundred and fifty to two hundred yards if there is little artillery at hand eight through this it becomes a rule to include within the zone of our most effective fire every obstacle to approach with which we wish to strengthen our front but at the same time it is important to observe that our whole defence should never depend entirely on our fire but a considerable portion of our troops one third to one half should always be kept ready to attack with the bayonet therefore if we are very weak we must merely place the line of fire riflemen and artillery near enough to cover the obstacle with their fire and place the rest of the troops in columns six hundred or eight hundred yards further back and if possible under cover nine another way of making use of obstacles to approach in front is to let them be a little further in front of our line so that they shall be within the effective range of cannon shot one thousand to two thousand yards and if the enemy's columns pass them to attack him from all sides at minden the duke ferdinand did something like this in this manner an obstacle of ground is favourable to the plan of actively defending ourselves and this active defence of which we have already spoken elsewhere then takes place on our front ten in the preceding observations obstacles of ground and country have been considered chiefly as connected lines in relation to extensive positions but it is necessary to say something about single points isolated points in general can only be defended either by entrenchments or by a strong natural obstacle of ground of the first we do not speak at present obstacles of ground which standing isolated may have to be defended can only be a isolated steep heights in this case entrenchments are indispensable because the enemy can always advance against the defender with a front more or less extended and the defender must then at last be taken in rear because he will rarely be strong enough to show a front on all sides b defiles under this term we include every narrow way forming the only approach by which the enemy can reach a particular point bridges embankments rocky gullies with precipitous sides belong to this class in respect to all these cases it is to be observed that either it is impossible for the assailant to turn the obstacle as for instance a bridge over a great river in which case the defender may boldly use all his force in order to bring as much fire as possible to bear on the point of passage or we are not secure against the obstacle being turned as in the case of bridges over small streams and the greater number of mountain defiles then it is necessary to reserve a considerable part of the force one third to one half for an attack in close order c 
buildings and enclosures villages small towns etc if troops are brave and carry on a war with enthusiasm there is no place or condition of things in which a few can so well resist many as in the defence of houses but if we are not quite certain of the men individually it is better only to occupy the houses gardens etc with riflemen and to plant cannon at the approaches and to draw up the greater part of the troops one third to one half in close column in the place itself or behind it under cover in order to rush upon the enemy with this reserve when he attempts to enter eleven these isolated posts serve the great operations partly as outposts not intended to offer an absolute defence but mostly only to detain the enemy partly at points which are of importance in the combinations planned for the whole army it is also often necessary to hold a distant point in order to gain time for the development of active defensive measures which we have in view if the point is remote it is naturally on that account isolated twelve it is only now necessary to add two remarks concerning isolated points the first is that we must hold troops in readiness behind these points for the detachments to rally upon in case of being driven out the second is that whoever includes such a defence in the series of his combinations should never reckon too much upon it let the strength of the natural obstacles of ground be ever so great that on the other hand whoever is entrusted with the defence must determine to carry out the object let circumstances be ever so adverse to him for this a spirit of resolution and self-devotion is required which can only spring from a thirst for glory and from enthusiasm for this reason people must be chosen for such duties who are not deficient in these noble qualities of the soul thirteen all that concerns the use of the ground as a means of covering our position and our march up to occupy it requires no elaborate exposition we do not now place ourselves on a hill we wish to defend open bracket, as was often done formerly close bracket, but behind it we do not place ourselves before a wood but in it or behind it the latter only when we can overlook the wood or thicket we keep our troops in columns that they may be more easily concealed we take advantage of villages plantations all undulations of the ground in order to conceal our troops behind them in advancing we choose the most broken intersected country etc in cultivated countries there are hardly any localities so much overlooked that it is not possible by a skilful use of such obstacles and features as the ground presents to keep a great part of the troops on the defensive from being seen for the assailant there is more difficulty in keeping a march secret because he must follow the high road of course when the ground is made use of for purposes of concealment of troops this must be done with a due regard to the end and the combinations which have been decided upon therefore in this we must take care above all things that we do not pull to pieces the order of battle although some small deviations may be allowable fourteen if we sum up what has now been said on ground we deduce from it as respects the defensive that is the choice of positions that the following points are those of most importance a support one or both flanks b open view before front and flanks c obstacles to the approach in front d masked positions for troops to this may be added e a broken country in rear because that makes pursuit difficult in case of disaster but no defiles too near as at friedland for that causes delay and confusion fifteen it would be pedantic to suppose that all these advantages are to be obtained at every position which it is necessary to take up in war all positions are not of equal importance their importance increases in proportion to the probability of our being attacked in them it is only in the most important that we try to combine if possible all these advantages in others we try to do so more or less sixteen the considerations which the assailant has to study in respect to ground are principally embraced in two leading points not to choose an over difficult country for the point of attack and next on all those occasions to advance through the country so that the enemy could see as little as possible of our movements seventeen i close these observations on the use of ground with a maxim of the highest importance for the defence and which is to be regarded as the keystone of the whole theory of defence which is not to expect everything from the strength of the ground consequently never to be enticed into a passive defence by a strong country for if the country is in reality so strong that it is impossible for the assailant to drive us out of our position he will turn it which is always possible and then the strongest country is useless 
we are then compelled to fight under quite different circumstances in quite a different country and we might as well not have included the other locality in our combinations but if the ground is not of such strength if it is possible to attack it still the advantages of such a position will never outweigh the disadvantages of a passive defence all obstacles of ground must therefore only be taken advantage of for a partial defensive in order to offer a relatively great resistance with few troops and to gain time for the offensive by which the real victory is to be gained at other points end of appendix one part one recording by timothy ferguson gold coast australia Appendix 1, Part 2 of On War, Volumes 2 and 3 by Carl von Clausewitz. Translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Appendix 1, Summary of the Instruction given by the Author to His Royal Highness the Crown Prince in the years 1810, 1811, and 1812. Part 2. 3. Strategy. This is the combination of the single battles of a war in order to attain the object of the campaign or war. If we know how to fight, if we know how to conquer, there is not much more wanted. To combine successful results is easy, because it is merely an affair of a well-practised judgment and does not depend, like the direction of a battle, on special knowledge. All that is essential in the few principles which there are, and which depend chiefly on the constitution of states and armies, may, therefore, be brought within a small compass. 1 general principles one there are three principal objects in carrying on war a to conquer and destroy the enemy's armed force b to get possession of the material elements of aggression and of the other sources of existence of the hostile army c to gain public opinion two to attain the first of these objects the chief operation must be directed against the enemy's principal army or at least against a very important portion of the hostile force for it must be beaten before we can follow up the other two objects with success three in order to seize the material forces operations are directed against those points at which these resources are chiefly concentrated principal towns magazines great fortresses on the road to these the enemy's principal force or a considerable part of his army will be encountered for public opinion is ultimately gained by great victories and by the possession of the enemy's capital five the first and most important maxim which we can set before us for the attainment of these objects is to employ all the forces which we can make available with the utmost energy in every modification which manifests itself in these respects there is a shortcoming as respects the object even if the result is tolerably certain in itself it is extremely unwise not to use the utmost efforts to make it perfectly certain for these efforts can never produce injurious effects let the country suffer ever so much by it no disadvantage can arise from that because the pressure of the war is the sooner removed the moral impression produced by vigorous preparations is of infinite value every one feels certain of success this is the best means of raising the spirits of the nation. 8. The second principle is to concentrate our force as much as is possible at the point where the decisive blows are to be struck, to run the risk even of being at a disadvantage at other points, in order to make sure of the result at the decisive point. The success at that point will compensate for all defeats at secondary points. 7. The third principle is not to lose time. If no special and considerable advantage will arise by delay, it is important to commence work as quickly as possible. By rapidity, many measures of the enemy are nipped in the bud, and public opinion is gained in our favour. Surprise plays a much greater part in strategy than in tactics. It is the most powerful element of victory. Alexander, Hannibal, Caesar, Gustavus Adolphus, Frederick the Second, Napoleon, owe the brightest rays of their fame to their promptitude. 8. Lastly, the fourth principle is to follow up the success we gain with the utmost energy. The pursuit of the enemy when defeated is the only means of gathering up the fruits of victory. 9. The first of these principles is the foundation of the three others. If we have followed the first principle, we can venture any length with respect to the others without risking our all. 
it gives the means of continually creating new forces behind us and with fresh forces every disaster may be repaired in this and not in going forward with timid steps lies that prudence which may be called wise ten small states in the present day cannot make any wars of conquest but at the same time for a defensive war even their means are very great therefore i am perfectly convinced that whoever calls forth all his powers in order to appear incessantly with new masses whoever adopts every imaginable means of preparation whoever concentrates his force at the decisive point whoever thus armed pursues a great object with resolution and energy has done all that can be done in a general way for the strategical conduct of the war and that unless he is altogether unfortunate in battle he will undoubtedly be victorious in the same measure as his adversary has fallen short of this exertion and energy eleven due attention being paid to these principles the form in which the operations are carried on is in the end of little consequence i shall however try to explain in a few words what is most important in tactics we always seek to get round the enemy that is to say that portion of his force against which our principal attack is directed partly because the convergent action of the combatant force is more advantageous than the parallel partly because it is the only method of cutting the enemy off from his line of retreat if this which relates to the enemy in his position tactically is used strategically and applied to the enemy's theatre of war open bracket, therefore also his subsistence lines close bracket, then the separate columns or armies which should envelop the enemy will be in most cases so far apart from each other that they cannot take part in one and the same battle the enemy will be in the middle and may be able to turn with the mass of his forces against these corps singly and beat them in detail frederick the second's campaigns furnish examples of this more especially those of seventeen fifty seven and seventeen fifty eight now as the battle is the principal affair the decisive one the party acting on converging lines unless he has a most decisive superiority in numbers will lose by battles all the advantages which the enveloping movement would have gained him for an operation against the lines of communication only takes effect very slowly but victory in battle very quickly therefore in strategy he who finds himself in the midst of his enemies is better off than his opponent who tries to envelop him particularly if the forces on each side are equal and of course still more so if there is an inferiority on the enveloping side a strategic enveloping or turning movement is no doubt a very effective means of cutting the enemy off from his line of retreat but as this object may also just as well be attained by a tactical turning movement the strategic enveloping movement is therefore never advisable unless we are physically and morally so superior that we shall be strong enough at the decisive point and yet can at the same time dispatch with the detached corps napoleon never engaged in attempts to turn his enemy strategically although he was so often indeed almost always both physically and morally superior frederick the second only did it once in the attack on bohemia seventeen fifty seven certainly by that means the austrians were prevented from bringing on a battle until they got to prague but what was the benefit to him of the conquest of bohemia as far as prague without a decisive battle the battle of kolden forced him to give it up again a proof that battles decide all at prague he was obviously in danger of being attacked by the whole of the austrian forces before the arrival of schwerin he would not have exposed himself to this danger if he had marched through saxony with all his forces united the first battle would in that case probably have been fought at buden on the egger and that would have been as decisive as the battle of prague this concentric march into bohemia was unquestionably a consequence of the prussian army having been broken up during the winter in cantonments in silesia and saxony and it is of importance to observe that reasons of this kind in most cases are more influential than the advantages in the form of the disposition itself for the facility of operations is favourable to their rapid execution and the friction inherent in the immense machinery of a great armed force is in any case so great that we should never add to it except from necessity twelve besides this the principle just stated of concentrating as much as possible at the decisive point is opposed to the idea of enveloping strategically and the order of battle for our troops naturally springs from that principle of itself 
on that account i said with reason that the form of battle is of little consequence there is however one case in which the operating strategically against the enemy's flanks leads to greater results similar to those of a battle that is when in poor or impoverished country the enemy by great exertions has formed large magazines on the preservation of which his operations entirely depend in such a case it may perhaps be advisable not to march with the mass of our forces against the enemy's principal force but to push forward against his base for this there are however two conditions requisite a that the enemy is so far from his base that he will be forced by this means to make a long retreat and that with a few troops and the help of natural and artificial obstacles we shall be able to harass him in such a manner on the road which his principal force must take that no conquests he can make in that direction will compensate for the loss of his base thirteen the subsistence of troops being a condition which is indispensable in the conduct of war it has a great influence on the operations of the war particularly in this way that it will only allow the concentration of troops to a certain degree and as it must be considered in the choice of the line of operations therefore it has an influence in determining the theatre of war fourteen the subsistence of troops is provided whenever the state of a country allows of it at the cost of the country by requisitions according to the present mode of making war armies take up considerably more space than formerly the formation of separate independent corps has made this possible without our being placed at a disadvantage if opposed by an enemy who is concentrated in the old manner open bracket with seventy to a hundred thousand men close bracket at one spot for one of these corps so organized as they now are can sustain itself for some time against an enemy twice or three times superior in numbers during this time other corps arrive and therefore even if this corps is actually beaten it will not have fought in vain as we have already observed elsewhere accordingly now single divisions or corps take the field marching separately either in line with each other or in succession one after another and only so far in connection that if they belong to the same army they can take part in any battle which may occur this makes it practicable to subsist an army for some time without magazines it is facilitated by the organization of the corps itself by its staff and its commissariat department fifteen when important reasons as for instance the position of the enemy's principal army do not decide otherwise one should choose the richest and most productive provinces to operate in for facility of subsistence promotes rapidity of movement there is nothing which in importance surpasses the subsistence except the position of the enemy's principal army which we are seeking the situation of the capital city or strong place which we wish to take all other considerations for instance the advantageous form of drawing up the armed force order of battle of which we have already spoken are as a rule much less important sixteen in spite of this new method of subsisting we are very far from being able to dispense with all magazines and a wise commander even if the resources of the province are quite sufficient will not neglect to form magazines behind him as a provision against unforeseen events and so as to be able the more readily to concentrate his strength at certain points this is one of those measures of precaution which are no detriment to the main object two defensive in political language a defensive war is one which a state carries on to maintain its independence in strategy a defensive war is a campaign in which we limit ourselves to contending with the enemy in a theatre of war which has been prepared by us for the purpose whether the battles we fight in this theatre of war are offensive or defensive makes no difference in this respect we choose the strategic defensive chiefly when the enemy is superior in force naturally fortresses and entrenched camps which are to be regarded as the chief preparations of a theatre of war afford great advantages to which may be added knowledge of the country and the possession of good maps and surveys with these advantages a small army or an army which is based on a small state and limited resources will be more in a condition to oppose the enemy than without the aid of such assistance there are besides the two following grounds upon which we may choose the defensive form of war by preference first if the poverty of the provinces surrounding our theatre of war makes the operations of war extremely difficult on account of the question of subsistence in that case we escape the disadvantage and the enemy must submit to it this is for instance at this moment eighteen twelve the case of the russian army secondly if the army has greater advantages for carrying on the war in a theatre of war prepared which we know where all the surrounding circumstances are in our favour war is more easily conducted 
there will not be so many faults committed in this case that is when the little dependence to be placed on our troops and generals compels us to resort to the defensive we gladly combine the tactical defensive with the strategic that is we give battle in positions prepared beforehand we do so further because there is less risk of our committing faults three in defensive war just as much as in the offensive a great object should be pursued this can be nothing else than to annihilate the enemy's army either in a battle or by making his subsistence so difficult as to produce disorganization and compel him to retreat by which he must necessarily suffer considerable losses wellington's campaigns in the years eighteen ten and eighteen eleven is an instance of this the defensive war therefore does not consist in an indolent waiting for events we must only pursue the waiting for system when there is a palpable and decisive utility in that mode of procedure that sort of calm before a storm whilst the offensive is gathering up new force for great blows is extremely dangerous for the defender if the austrians after the battle of aspen had reinforced themselves to three times the strength of the french emperor which they certainly might have done then the time of rest which took place before the battle of wagram might have been advantageous to them but only on that condition as they did not do so that was only so much lost time for them and it would have been wiser if they had taken advantage of napoleon's critical position to reap the fruits of their success at aspen for fortresses are intended to occupy an important part of the enemy's army in besieging them this period must therefore be taken advantage of to beat the rest of the army our battles should be fought behind our fortresses not in front of them at the same time however we must not quietly look on at their being captured as benningsen did during the siege of danzig five a great river that is as such as we cannot build a bridge across without considerable difficulty rivers like the danube below vienna and the lower rhine afford a natural line of defence not by distributing our forces equally along its banks and seeking to hinder the passage absolutely which is a dangerous measure but by watching it and when the enemy passes then falling upon him from all sides just at the moment when he has not yet got all his forces under command and is still hemmed in within a narrow space close to the river the battle of aspen is an instance at the battle of wagram the austrians without any necessity allowed the french to get possession of far too much space by which means they did away with the disadvantages peculiarly inherent to the passage of a river six mountains are the second natural obstacles of ground which afford a good line of defence as we can either have them in front and only occupy them with a few light troops treat them to a certain extent as a river which the enemy must cross and as soon as he debouches with single columns fall upon one of them with our whole weight or we may ourselves take position in the mountains in the last case we must only defend the single passes with small corps and a considerable part of the army a third or a half must remain in reserve in order to fall in superior numbers on any column which forces its way through this great reserve must however not be split up with a view to absolutely preventing all the columns from passing but we must from the first resolve to make use of it to attack that column which we suppose to be the strongest if in this way we rout a considerable part of the enemy's force the other columns which have forced their way through will of themselves retire again the formation of mountain ranges in general is such that about the centre of the masses there are plateaus or plains at a greater or less elevation and the sides next to the level country are intersected by deep valleys forming the entrances or avenues the defender therefore has in the mountains a district in which he can make rapid movements right or left whilst the attacking columns are separated from each other by steep inaccessible ridges it is only a mountain mass of this kind that is well adapted for a good defence if it is rugged and impassable generally throughout so that the corps on the defensive must be scattered and disconnected then to undertake the defence with the principal army is a dangerous measure for under such circumstances all the advantages are on the side of the assailant who can fall upon any of the isolated posts with far superior numbers as no pass no single post is so strong that it cannot soon be taken by superior numbers seven with regard to mountain warfare it is specially to be observed that in it a great deal depends on the aptitude of subordinate officers but still more on the high spirit which animates the ranks great skill in manoeuvring is not here requisite but a military spirit and a heart in the cause for every one is more or less left to act independently this is why national levies find their account in mountain warfare 
for while they are deficient in the first quality they possess the other in the highest degree eight lastly in respect to the strategic defensive it is to be observed that while it is in itself stronger than the offensive it should only be used to gain the first great result and that if this object is attained and peace does not immediately follow upon that greater results can only be obtained by the offensive for whoever remains always on the defensive exposes himself to the disadvantage of always carrying on the war at his own expense no state can endure that for more than a certain time and therefore if it exposes itself to the blows of its adversary without ever striking in return it is almost sure in the end to become exhausted and be obliged to submit we should therefore begin with the defensive that we may with more certainty end with the offensive three attack one the strategic attack pursues the aim of the war directly for it is aimed directly at the destruction of the enemy's armed force whilst the strategic defence seeks to obtain this object partly only indirectly from this it comes that the principles of the attack are already contained in the general principles of strategy only two subjects require special mention two the first is the keeping of the army constantly complete in men and arms to the defender this is relatively easier from the proximity of his resources the assailant although in most cases possessed of the resources of a powerful state must bring his means more or less from a distance and therefore of course with greater difficulty that he may not run short in means he must make such arrangements that the levy of recruits and transport of arms anticipate his wants in these respects the roads of his line of operations must be incessantly covered with reinforcements and trains of supplies moving to the front on these roads military stations must be formed to expedite the transport three even in the most prosperous circumstances and with the greatest moral and physical superiority the assailant must keep in view the possibility of a great change of fortune for this reason he must provide points on the line of operations suitable for refuge in the event of his army being beaten such are fortresses with entrenched camps or simply entrenched camps large rivers afford the best means of checking the pursuit of an enemy for a time we should therefore secure the passages across them with bridgeheads surrounded with a girdle of strong redoubts for the defence of these points and as garrisons for important towns and fortresses troops in greater or less number must be left behind according as we have to apprehend attacks from the enemy or the hostility of the inhabitants of the country these with the reinforcements coming up form new corps which in case of success follow the army but in case of disaster are stationed at the points which have been fortified to secure the retreat napoleon always showed great foresight in the provision he made in this manner in the rear of his army and in that way even in his boldest operations he incurred less risks than might be imagined at first sight four on the practice in war of the principles now laid down one the principles of the art of war are in themselves very simple and are quite within the compass of sound common sense and although in tactics they rest rather more than in strategy upon special knowledge still even this knowledge is so limited that it can hardly be compared with any other science either in diversity or extent learning and profound science are therefore not at all requisite nor are even great powers of understanding if any special faculty of understanding besides a practice judgment is required it is clear from all that proceeds that it is a talent for artifice or stratagem the exact contrary has been long maintained but merely from a misplaced feeling of awe regarding the subject and the vanity of authors who have written on the subject an impartial consideration must convince us of this but experience tends to impress upon us this conviction still more forcibly in the late revolutionary war many men have made themselves conspicuous as skilful generals often as generals of the first order without having had the benefit of any military education as regards cond wallenstein suwarrow and many others it is at least a very doubtful point that the conduct itself of war is very difficult is a matter of no doubt but the difficulty is not that special learning or great genius is required to comprehend the true principles of conducting war that can be done by any well-organised head with a mind free from prejudice and not altogether ignorant of the subject even the application of these principles on a map and on paper presents no difficulty and even a good plan of operations is still no great masterpiece the great difficulty is to adhere steadfastly in execution to the principles which we have adopted the object of this concluding observation is to fix attention on this difficulty to give your royal highness a lucid and distinct idea of it for i look upon that as being the most important point 
which i can attain by this paper the whole conduct of war is like the action of a complicated machine with an immense amount of friction so that combinations which are easily made on paper can only be carried into execution by very great exertion therefore the free will the mind of the general finds itself impeded in its action at every instant and requires a peculiar strength of mind and understanding to overcome this resistance by this friction many a good idea is lost and we are obliged to lay down a plain simple scheme when by a somewhat more complicated one greater results might be attained to enumerate the causes of this friction in full is perhaps not possible but the following are the greatest one we always know much less of the actual condition and of the designs of the enemy than we assume on supposition in forming our plans innumerable doubts rise up at the moment of the execution of a resolution doubts caused by the dangers to which we see we are exposed if it should prove that we have been much deceived in the conjectures we have formed that feeling of anxiety which so easily seizes men in general in the execution of great designs then overpowers us and from this state of anxiety to a state of irresolution from that to half measures is a short step not perceptible two not only are we uncertain as to the strength of the enemy but rumour open bracket all intelligence which we receive through outposts spies or by accident close bracket increases his numbers the great masses of the people are timid by nature and thereby danger is invariably exaggerated all the influences brought to bear on the general therefore tend to give him a false impression of the strength of the enemy before him and herein lies a new source of irresolution we cannot imagine the full extent of this uncertainty and it is therefore important to prepare for it beforehand if we have quietly reflected on everything beforehand if we have impartially considered if we have sought for and if we have made up our minds on the probabilities of the case we should not be ready to give up at once the first opinion but carefully criticise reports as they come in compare several with each other send out for further information etc very often by this means false intelligence is detected on the spot often the first information is confirmed in both cases therefore we attain to certainty and can form a resolution accordingly if we cannot obtain this certainty then we must say to ourselves that in war nothing can be carried out without a risk that the nature of war never allows us thoroughly to see at all times which way we are going that the probable will still always remain the probable even if it does not strike upon our senses at once and that if we have made judicious arrangements generally we shall not be completely ruined at once even if there is one error three the uncertainty as to the existing state of things at any given moment applies to our own army as well as the enemy's our own army can seldom be kept so concentrated that we can at any moment clearly command a view of all parts now if we are disposed to be anxious then new doubts will thus arise we shall wish to wait and see and a delay in the action of the whole is the inevitable consequence we must therefore feel so much confidence in the arrangements we have made as to believe that we will meet our expectations to this belongs in a special manner a reliance on the subordinate generals we must therefore make it a rule to select officers upon whom we can rely making every other consideration give way to that if we have made the dispositions which are suitable if we have provided for contingent mishaps and so arranged that in case such should occur during the execution of our measures we shall not be completely ruined then we must step boldly forward through the night of uncertainty for when we want to carry on a war which causes a great strain upon our powers then subordinate generals and even the troops if they are not used to war will often find obstacles which they represent as insuperable they will find the march too long the fatigue too great the subsistence impracticable if we should listen to all these difficulties as frederick the second called them we should soon have to succumb to them and remain powerless and inactive instead of acting with force and energy to withstand all this a degree of confidence in our own sagacity and convictions is requisite which commonly looks like obstinacy at the moment but which is that power of understanding and character which we call firmness five none of the effects upon which we calculate in war come to pass so exactly as any one would imagine who has not watched war attentively and been accustomed to it in reality we often make a mistake of several hours as to the march of a column and yet we are unable to tell where to fix the cause of the delay obstacles often present themselves which could not be calculated upon beforehand 
often we expect to arrive at a certain point with an army and find ourselves obliged to halt some miles short of it often a post which we have established renders much less service than we expected one of the enemies on the contrary much more often the resources of a province do not amount to as much as we anticipated etc any such obstruction can only be got over by great efforts which the general can only succeed in getting by strictness bordering on severity only by such means only when he is certain that the utmost possible will be done can he feel secure that these little impediments will not exercise a great influence on his operations that he will not fall short of the object which he has proposed to attain six we may feel certain that an army is never in the condition in which a person following its operations in a room supposes it to be if he is in favour of the army he will figure it to himself as being from a third to a half stronger and better than it really is it is natural enough that the commander should find himself in the same case in relation to the first plan of his operations that he should afterwards see his army melt away in a manner he never anticipated his artillery and cavalry become unserviceable etc thus what appeared to the observer and the general as possible and easy at the opening of the campaign will often prove difficult or impossible in the execution now if the commander is a man who impelled by a lofty ambition still follows his object with boldness and energetic will then he will attain it whilst an ordinary man will think himself fully justified in abandoning it owing to the condition of his army messina showed in genoa and portugal the power which a general has over his troops through the strength of his will in one case by the force we might say the severity of his character he drove the men to extraordinary exertions which were crowned with success in the other in portugal he held out at least much longer than any one else would have done in most cases the enemy's army finds itself in a similar condition think of wallenstein and gustavus adolphus at nuremberg of napoleon and berenson after the battle of elau the state of the enemy we do not see our own is before our eyes therefore the latter makes a much greater impression than the former because in ordinary mortals sensuous impressions are more powerful than the language of the understanding seven the subsistence of the troops in whatever way it may be managed open bracket, whether by magazines or requisitions close bracket, presents such difficulties that it must always have a very decisive voice in the choice of measures it is often opposed to the most effectual combination and an army is compelled sometimes to go in quest of its subsistence when it might be on the way to victory to brilliant successes through this chiefly the whole machine acquires the unwieldiness by which the effects realized fall far short of the flight of great plans a general who with a tyrannical power demands from his troops the utmost efforts the most extreme hardships an army accustomed to these sacrifices through wars of long duration what advantages will they not have over their opponents how much more rapidly will they pursue their object in spite of all obstacles with equally good plans how different will be the result eight generally and in all the foregoing cases we cannot keep our eyes too intently fixed on the following truth the sensuous impressions which come before us in the course of execution are more vivid than those obtained previously through mature reflection they are however only first appearances of things and that as we know seldom corresponds exactly with reality we are therefore in danger of sacrificing our mature reflection to first appearance that this first appearance as a rule produces fear and over-caution is owing to the natural timidity of man who takes only a partial view of everything against this we must therefore arm ourselves and place a firm reliance on the results of our own past mature reflections in order to fortify ourselves by that means against the weakening impressions of the moment in this difficulty of execution a great deal depends on the certainty and firmness of our own convictions on that account the study of military history is therefore important because by it we learn the thing itself we see the development of events themselves the principles which we have learnt by theoretical instruction are only suited to facilitate the study of and direct our attention to the points of greatest importance in military history your highness must therefore make yourself acquainted with these principles with a view to proving them by the study of military history and seeing where they coincide with the course of actual events and where they are modified or overthrown by the same but besides this the study of military history is the only means of supplying the place of actual experience by giving a clear idea of which we have termed the friction of the whole machine 
to this end we must not confine ourselves to the leading events much less keep to the reasoning of historians but study details as much as possible for historians rarely make perfect fidelity of representation their object in general they desire to embellish the deeds of their army or to prove a consonance between actual events and some imaginary rules they invent history instead of writing it much reading of history is not required for the above object the knowledge of a few separate battles in their details is more useful than a general knowledge of several campaigns on this account it is more advantageous to read particular narratives and journals than regular works of history the account of the defence of menin in the year seventeen ninety four in the memoirs of general charnost is a pattern of this kind of narration which cannot be surpassed this narrative especially the account of the sortie and the mode in which the garrison cut their way through the enemy will serve your majesty as a criterion for the style in which military history should be written no battle in the world has more thoroughly convinced me that in war we should not despair of success up to the last moment and that the effects of good principles which can never manifest themselves in such a regular manner as we suppose will unexpectedly make their appearance even in the most desperate cases when we believe any such influences are completely lost some great sentiment must stimulate great abilities in the general either ambition as in caesar hatred of the enemy as in hannibal the pride of falling gloriously as in frederick the great open your heart to a feeling of this kind be bold and astute in your designs firm and persevering in executing them determined to find a glorious end and destiny will press on your youthful brow a radiant crown fit emblem of a prince the rays of which will carry your image into the bosom of your latest descendants end of appendix one part two Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Appendices 2 and 3 of On War, Volumes 2 and 3 by Carl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by timothy ferguson appendices two and three on the organic division of armed forces and sketch of a plan for tactics readers note the heading is followed by an asterisk which marks a footnote which reads to serve as an elucidation of chapter five of book five readers note ends that the grounds which determine the division and strength of the different parts of the army and which have their root in elementary tactics are not very distinct and allow of much that is arbitrary we must suppose if we look upon the various modes of formation which actually exist but no great reflection is required to convince us that these grounds cannot determine the matter more exactly what is usually adduced in relation to the subject as for instance if a cavalry officer tries to prove that a cavalry regiment can never be too strong because otherwise it is not in a condition to do anything deserves no serious notice this is the state of things as regards the small divisions with which elementary tactics is concerned that is companies squadrons battalions and regiments but it is much worse with still larger divisions which are beyond elementary tactics and where the question depends on higher tactics or the theory of dispositions for a battle in conjunction with strategy we shall now take up the subject of these greater divisions brigades divisions corps and armies let us first consider for a moment the reasonable grounds the philosophy of the thing why are the masses as a universal rule divided into parts plainly because one person can only exercise direct command over a limited number the general cannot take fifty thousand soldiers and place each man upon a particular spot and keep him there and order him to do this and not to do that which if such a thing was conceivable would plainly be the best thing that could be done for none of the countless subordinate commanders ever intensifies at least it would be an anomaly if he did but each more or less diminishes the force of the original order and takes from the first idea something of its original precision besides this if there are a number of subordinate divisions the order takes considerably more time to reach its destination from this it follows that the divisions and subdivisions by reason of which orders must pass through many hands in succession constitute 
a necessary evil here ends our philosophy and we enter upon tactics and strategy a mass entirely isolated which is opposed to the enemy as an independent whole whether great or small has three parts which are essential and without which such a body can hardly be imagined that is to say one part which it throws out in advance one which in case of unforeseen events it places in the rear and the main body between these two parts readers note there follows a diagram which is simply the letters a b and c in a vertical column a at the top, B in the middle, C at the bottom. Reader's note ends. Therefore, if the division of the greater whole is made with a view to independence, it must never have less than three parts, if the permanent division is to be in accordance with that constant requirement of independence, which must naturally be an object. But it is easy to observe that even these three parts do not constitute quite a natural arrangement, for no one would willingly make his advanced and rear guards each of the same strength with the centre or main body. Therefore, it would be more natural to conceive the centre as consisting of at least two parts, consequently to make a division of the whole into four parts in this order. Readers note the follows a diagram in which four points are highlighted with letters. The four points form a diamond. The diamond's broader axis runs across the page, its narrower axis up the page. The points labelled clockwise are A, C, D and B. Reader's note ends. But even here it is plain we have not yet got to the most natural point, for notwithstanding the depth which it is usual now to give an order of battle, all distributions of forces, either tactical or strategic, invariably assume the linear form consequently there arises of itself the want of a right wing of a left wing and of a centre and five may therefore now be looked upon as the natural number of divisions in this form readers note there follows a diagram in which five points are highlighted the five points form a diamond and again the longer axis of the diamond is across the page the narrower axis up the page the points of the diamond are labelled clockwise A, D, E and B. A point at the centre of the diamond, where the two axes cross, is labelled C. Reader's note ends. This formation now allows of one, or in the case of urgent necessity, of two parts of the principal mass being detached right or left. Whoever, like myself, is a friend of strong reserves, will perhaps find the part in rear, reserve, too weak in relation to the whole, and therefore will add, on that account, another part, in order to have one-third in reserve. Then the whole order will be organised as under. Readers note, the follows a diagram in which six points are delineated. The six points are in three rows across the page. The topmost row contains only the letter A. The second row contains the letters B, C and D and in the second row the letter c is directly underneath the a in the previous row the third row contains the letters e and f e and f are placed so that each is placed halfway between two of the letters in the previous row e between b and c and f between c and d readers note ends if the force we have to organise is very large, a considerable army, then strategy has to remark that such an army almost always finds it necessary to detach parts to the right and left, that therefore on this account, with such a force, two more parts must generally be added. We then get the following strategic figure. Readers note the fullest diagram in which eight points are highlighted with letters. The points are divided into three rows. The topmost row contains only the letter A. The second row contains the letters B, C, D, E and F. B and F, at the extreme right and extreme left edge, are at some distance from C, D and E, which form a tighter group in the centre of the row, with D directly beneath A in the row before it. The third row contains the letters G and H. G and H are placed so that they are halfway between two of the letters on the previous row. G is between C and D. H is between D and E. 
the diagram appears therefore to be a pentagon with the points a e h g and c forming the points of the pentagon with d at the pentagon's central point to the right and left of the pentagon in the central row and at some distance are b on the pentagon's left and f on the pentagon's right readers note ends from this we deduce as a result that a whole mass of troops should never be divided into less than three or more than eight parts but still in this there appears very little that is definite for what a number of different combinations may be made if we reflect that we might divide an army into three times three times three if we should base corps divisions and brigades upon that number which would give twenty seven brigades or in any other possible product of the given factors but there are still some important points remaining for consideration we have not yet entered upon the strength of battalions and regiments leaving that for elementary tactics from what has just been said it only follows that we should make the brigades consist of not less than three battalions upon this we certainly insist and shall probably not encounter any opposition but it is more difficult to limit the greatest strength which the brigade should have as a rule a brigade is considered to be such a body as can and must be guided by one man directly that is to say through the instrumentality of his voice if we adhere to that then it should not exceed a strength of four or five thousand men and consequently will consist of six or eight battalions according to the strength of the battalion but here we must bring in another subject which forms a new element in the inquiry this element is the combination of the different arms that this combination should begin in a body of troops lower down the steps than a whole army is a point on which there is but one opinion throughout europe but some would only commence with it in corps that is in masses of twenty to thirty thousand men others would have it in divisions that is masses from eight thousand to twelve thousand men we shall not enter into this controversy at present but confine ourselves to this which will hardly be disputed that the independence of any body of troops is chiefly constituted by the combination of all three arms and that therefore in all events for divisions which are destined to find themselves frequently isolated in war this combination is very desirable further we have not only to take into consideration the combination of all three arms but also that of two of them namely artillery and infantry this combination according to the generally prevailing custom takes place very much sooner although artillerymen excited by the example of cavalrymen show no slight inclination to form again a little army of their own they have however as yet obliged to content themselves to be divided amongst the brigades through this combination therefore of artillery with infantry the idea of a brigade takes a somewhat different form and the only question to be considered is what should be the minimum size of a body of infantry to which as a rule a portion of artillery must always be attached in a permanent manner this question is more readily answered than one would at first sight suppose for the number of guns which for every thousand men we can take into the field seldom depends on our will it is settled by a variety of other partly very remote causes then again the number of guns which are united in a battery rests upon much more substantial tactical grounds than any similar organization thus it is that we do not ask how many guns shall this mass of infantry for instance a brigade have but what mass of infantry is to be joined by a battery of artillery if we have for example three guns per thousand men with the army and then deduct one for the reserve there remains two to distribute amongst the rest of the troops which allows a mass of four thousand infantry for a battery of eight guns as this is the ordinary proportion it is evident that with our calculation we come nearly to what has been found to answer best in practice after this we shall add no more in regard to the size of a brigade than that it should consist accordingly of from three to five thousand men although the field of division is limited on one side in this way and on the other it was already limited by the strength of the army as a given quantity a great number of combinations still always remain possible and we cannot let them be disposed of at once by a rigorous application of the principle of the least possible number of parts 
we have still to take into consideration some points of a general nature and we must also allow special considerations in particular cases to have their rights first we must observe that great bodies must be split into more parts than smaller ones in order to be made sufficiently handy as already noticed and that small bodies with too many subdivisions or branches are not easy to handle if an army is formed into two principal corps each of which has its own special commander readers note there is an asterisk here which refers to a footnote the footnote reads the commander is the true base of division if a field marshal commands a hundred thousand men of which fifty thousand are under the orders of a general specifically designated whilst the field marshal in person conducts the other fifty thousand formed in five divisions a case which often happens the whole is not in reality divided into parts but into six only that one of them is five times as large as the others footnote ends readers note ends that is as much as to neutralize the commander-in-chief every one who has military experience will understand this without any further elucidation it is not much better if the army is divided into three parts for in such a case there can be no expeditious movements no suitable dispositions for battle without an incessant breaking up of these three principal corps by which their commanders are very soon put out of temper the greater the number of parts the greater becomes the power of the commander-in-chief and the mobility of the whole mass there is therefore a reason for going as far as possible in this direction as there are more means of putting orders in a train of execution at a headquarters like that of commander of an army than with the limited staff of a corps or division therefore on general grounds it is best to divide an army into not less than eight parts if other circumstances require it this number of parts may be increased to nine or ten if there are more than ten parts a difficulty arises in transmitting orders with the necessary rapidity and exactitude for we must not forget that it is not the mere question of the order else an army might have as many divisions as there are heads in a company but that with orders many directions and inquiries are connected which it is easier to arrange for six or eight divisions than for twelve or fifteen again a division if it is small as regards absolute strength in numbers one which therefore may be supposed to form part of a corps can always make shift with fewer parts than we have given as the normal number quite easily with four in case of urgency with three six and eight would be inconvenient because its means are not sufficient to transmit orders rapidly enough to so many parts this revision of our proper normal number gives as a result that an army should have at least five parts and not more than ten that the division should not have above five and may be reduced to four between the two now lies the core and both the question of its strength and the general question whether it should exist at all depend on the adjustment of the two other combinations two hundred thousand men in ten divisions and the division split into five brigades gives the brigade a strength of four thousand men in such a force we could therefore do very well with divisions only we could certainly divide this force into five corps and the corps into four divisions and the division into four brigades then each brigade would be two thousand five hundred men strong to me the first arrangement appears the best for in the first place it has one less step in the gradation of ranks therefore orders are transmitted quicker etc secondly five branches are too few for an army it is not sufficiently pliable with that number the same applies to a corps divided into four divisions and two thousand five hundred men form a weak brigade of which there are in this scheme eighty instead of which the other organization makes only fifty and is therefore simpler these advantages are sacrificed for the sake of only having to give orders direct to five generals instead of ten so far general considerations extend but the points which require to be determined in particular cases are of infinite importance ten divisions may be easily commanded in a level country in widely extended mountain positions the thing may be perfectly impossible a great river which divides an army creates a necessity for the appointment of a separate commander on one side general rules are powerless against the force of circumstances in all such particular cases however it is to be remarked that when such special circumstances make their appearance those disadvantages which a multiplicity of divisions otherwise produces generally disappear at the same time certainly even here abuses may arise as for instance if a bad organization is made to gratify the unseasonable ambition of individuals or out of want of firmness to resist personal considerations 
but however far the requirements of particular cases may extend still experience teaches us that the system of divisioning as a rule is dependent on general principles end of on the organic division of armed forces sketch of a plan for tactics or the theory of combat open bracket nota bene according to this distribution this first part is to be revised and completed close bracket readers note the following section is a table of headings in this reading a pause will indicate the presence of an m dash readers note ends roman numeral one introduction definition of the distinction between the concepts of strategy and tactics roman numeral two general theory of the combat open bracket combat cantonments camps marches close bracket one nature of the combat active elements in the same hatred and hostility modification other moral forces judgment and talent two more precise definition of a combat independent combat partial combat how the latter arise three object of the combat victory degree splendor and weight of victory four causes of victory that is of the enemy leaving the field five kinds of combat according to arms close combat fire combat six different acts of the combat destructive act decisive act seven kinds of combat according as its motive is positive or negative attack and defense eight plan of the combat strategic object of the combat its aims means determination of the kind of combat time space reciprocal action conduct roman numeral three combats definite subdivisions in the abstract open bracket formation order of battle elementary tactics close bracket a the different arms one infantry two artillery three cavalry readers note the headings infantry artillery and cavalry are all pointed out with a bracer and the bracer has the following words written to its right effects produced in action of each arm the formation and elementary tactics of each in attack and defense based on those effects readers note ends b the different arms combined in attack and defense one theory of the combination of arms a infantry and artillery b infantry and cavalry c cavalry and artillery d all three united two fixed divisions which are formed out of them a brigades b divisions c corps d armies readers note these four headings brigades divisions corps and armies are highlighted with a right brace and to the right of the brace of the following words their order of battle position movement combat readers note ends roman numeral four battles in connection with country and ground a on the influence of ground on the combat in general one on the defensive two on the attack note to bene our reflections here must leave the proper logical chain on account of practical considerations the ground must be taken into view as soon as possible and this cannot be done without our at once imagining to ourselves the combat is taking place under one of the two forms attack or defence this is why the two subjects merge into one b general theory of the defence c ditto ditto attack d defensive combats of definite bodies one of a small number of troops two of a brigade three of a division four of a corps five of an army e offensive combats of definite bodies 
one of a small number of troops two of a brigade three of a division four of a corps five of an army roman numeral five combats with definite objects a defence one measures of security a guards b patrols c supports d small posts e chains of advanced posts f intermediate posts g advanced guards h rear guards i advanced corps k covering the flanks on the march l detachments to procure intelligence m detachments of observation n reconnaissances readers note in the original text there is no item j in the list readers note ends two covering a of single posts b of convoys c of foraging parties three lines of posts diversity of objects a in mountains b along rivers c near morasses d in woods four battles diversity of objects destruction of the enemy's armed force possession of country mere moral ascendancy credit of arms a defensive battle without preparations b in a prepared position c in an entrenched position five retreats a the simple retreat the retiring in presence of the enemy a a before a battle a b in the course of the same a c after a battle b strategic retreat that is several consecutive simple retreats in their tactical dispositions b the attack one divided and treated according to the objects of the defence two according to the particular objects of the attack a surprise b cutting through the enemy roman numeral six of camps and cantonments roman numeral seven of marches end of sketch of a plan for tactics or the theory of the combat recording by timothy ferguson gold coast australia volume three appendix four part one of on war volumes two and three by karl von clausewitz translated by j j graham this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Timothy Ferguson Guide to Tactics or the Theory of Combat Part 1 Roman numeral 1 General Theory of the Combat Object of the Combat 1. What is the object of the combat? A. Destruction of the enemy's armed forces B. To gain possession of some object C. Merely victory for the credit of our arms D. Two of these objects or all three taken together Theory of Victory 2 any of these four objects can only be obtained by a victory three victory is the retirement of the enemy from the field of battle four the enemy is moved to this a if his loss is excessive a a and he therefore fears he will be overpowered a b or finds that the object will cost him too much b if the formation of his army consequently the efficiency of the whole is too much shaken c if he begins to get on disadvantageous ground and therefore has to fear excessive loss if he continues the combat in this is therefore included the loss of the position d if the form of the order of battle is attended with too great disadvantages e if he is taken by surprise in any way or suddenly attacked and therefore has not the time to make suitable dispositions to give his measures their proper development f if he perceives that his opponent is too superior to him in numbers g if he perceives that his opponent has too great a superiority in moral forces five in all these cases a commander may give up the combat because he has no hope of matters taking a favourable turn and has to apprehend that his situation will become still worse than it is at present six except upon one of these grounds a retreat is not justifiable and therefore cannot be the decision of the general or commander seven but a retreat can be made in point of fact without his will a if the troops from want of courage or of good will give way b if a panic drives them off eight under these circumstances the victory may be conceded to the enemy against the will of the commander and even when the results springing from the other relations enumerated from a to f incline in our favour nine 
this case can and must often happen with small bodies of troops the short duration of the whole act often hardly leaves the commander time to form a resolution ten a but with large masses such a case can only occur with parts of the force not easily with the whole should however several parts yield the victory thus easily to the enemy a disadvantageous result for the whole may ensue in those respects noted from a to e and thus the commander may be compelled to resolve upon withdrawing from the field ten b when a large mass the disadvantageous relations specified under a b c and d do not exhibit themselves to the commander in the arithmetical sum of all partial disadvantages which have taken place for the general view is never so complete but they show themselves where being compressed into a narrow compass they form an imposing whole this may be the case either with the principal body or an important part of that body the resolution then is decided by this predominant feature of the whole act eleven lastly the commander may be prompted to give up the combat and therefore to retreat for reasons which do not lie in the combat but which may be regarded as foreign to it such as intelligence which does away with the object or materially alters the strategic relations this would be a breaking off of the combat and does not belong to this place because it is a strategic not a tactical act twelve the giving up of the combat is therefore an acknowledgment of the temporary superiority of our opponent let it be either physically or morally and a yielding to his will in that consists the first moral force of victory thirteen as we can only give up the combat by leaving the field of battle therefore the retirement from the field is the sign of this acknowledgment the lowering of our flag as it were fourteen but the sign of victory still decides nothing as to its greatness importance or splendour these three things often coincide but are by no means identical fifteen the greatness of a victory depends on the greatness of the masses over which it has been gained as well as on the greatness of the trophies captured guns prisoners baggage taken killed wounded belong to this therefore over a small body of troops no great victory can be gained sixteen the importance of the victory depends on the importance of the object which it secures to us the conquest of an important position may make an insignificant victory very important seventeen the splendour of a victory depends on the proportion which the number of trophies bears to the strength of the victorious army eighteen there are therefore victories of different kinds and of many different degrees strictly speaking there can be no combat without a decision consequently without a victory but the ordinary use of language and the nature of the thing require that we should only consider those results of combats as victories which have been preceded by very considerable efforts if the enemy contents himself with doing just sufficient to ascertain our designs and as soon as he has found them out gives way we cannot call that a victory if he does more than that it can only be done with a view to becoming conqueror in reality and therefore in that case if he gives up the combat he is to be considered as conquered twenty as the combat can only cease by one or other or both of the parties who have been in contact retiring partially therefore it can never be said properly speaking that both parties have kept the field in so far however as the nature of the thing and the ordinary use of language require us to understand by the term battlefield the position of the principal masses of the contending armies and because the first consequences of victory only commence with the retreat of the principal masses therefore there may be battles which remain quite indecisive the combat is the means of gaining a victory twenty one the means to obtain victory is the combat as the points specified in number four from a to g establish the victory therefore also the combat is directed on those points as its immediate objects twenty two we must now make ourselves acquainted with the combat in its various phases what is an independent combat twenty three in reality every combat may be separated into as many single combats as there are combatants but the individual only appears as a separate item when he fights singly that is independently twenty four from single combats the units sent fresh units coordinately with the ascending scale of subdivisions of command twenty five these units are bound together through the object and plan still not as closely that the members do not retain a certain degree of independence this becomes always greater the higher the rank of the units how this gain of independence on the part of the members takes place we shall show afterwards number ninety seven etc twenty six thus every total combat consists of a great number of separate combats in descending order of members down to the lowest member acting independently 
27, but a total combat consists also of separate combats following one another in succession. 28. All separate combats we call partial combats, and the whole of them a total combat. But we connect the conception of a whole combat with the supposed condition of a personal combat, and therefore only that belongs to one combat which is directed by one will. Open bracket in cordon positions, the limits between the two can never be defined. Close bracket. 29. What has been said here on the theory of combat relates to the total combat as well as to the partial combat. Principles of combat. 30. Every fight is an expression of hostility which passes into combat instinctively. 31. This instinct to attack and destroy the enemy is the real element of war. 32. Even amongst the most savage tribes, this impulse to hostility is not pure instinct alone. The reflecting intelligence supervenes, aimless instinct becomes an act with a purpose. 33. In this manner, the feelings are made submissive to the understanding. 34. But we can never consider them as completely eliminated, and the pure object of reason substituted in their place, for if they were swallowed up in the object of reason, they would come to life again spontaneously in the heat of the combat. 35. As our wars are not utterances of the hostility of individuals opposed to individuals, so the combat seems to be divested of all real hostility, and therefore to be a purely reasonable action. 36. But it is not so by any means. Partly, there is never wanting a collective hatred between the parties, which then manifests itself more or less effectively in the individual, so that from hating and warring against a party, he hates and wars against the individual man as well. Partly, in the course of a combat itself, a real feeling of hostility is kindled more or less in the individuals engaged. 37. Desire of fame, ambition, self-interest, and esprit de corps, along with other feelings, take the place of hostility when that does not exist. 38. Therefore, the mere will of the commander, the mere prescribed object, is seldom or never the sole motive of action in the combatants. Instead of that, a very notable portion of the emotional forces will always be in activity. 39. This activity is increased by the circumstances of the combat moving in the region of danger, in which all emotional forces have greater weight. 40. But even the intelligence which guides the combat can never be a power purely of the understanding, and therefore the combat can never be a subject of pure calculation, a. Because it is the collision of living physical and moral forces, which can only be estimated generally but never subjected to any regular calculation, b. Because the emotions which come into play make the combat a subject of enthusiasm, and through that a subject for higher judgment. 41. The combat may therefore be an act of talent and genius in opposition to calculating reason. 42. Now the feelings and genius which manifest themselves in the combat must be regarded as separate moral agents which, owing to their great diversity and elasticity, incessantly break out beyond the limits of calculating reason. 43. It is the duty of the art of war to take account of these forces in theory and in practice. 44. The more they are used to the utmost, the more vigorous and fruitful of results will be the combat. 45. All inventions of art, such as arms, organisation, exercising tactics, the principles of the use of the different arms in the combat, are restrictions on the natural instinct, which has to be led by indirect means to a more efficient use of its powers. But the emotional forces will not submit to be thus clipped, and if we go too far in trying to make instruments of them, we rob them of their impulse and force. There must therefore always be given them a certain room to play between the rules of theory and its practical execution. This entails the necessity of a higher point of view, of great wisdom as respects theory, and great tact of judgment as respects practice. Two modes of fighting, close combat and fire combat. 46. Of all weapons which have yet been invented by human ingenuity, those which bring the combatants into closest contact, those which are nearest to the pugilistic encounter, are the most natural and correspond most with instinct. The dagger and the battle-axe are more so than the lance, the javelin, or the sling. 47. Weapons with which the enemy can be attacked while he is at a distance are more instruments for the understanding. They allow the feelings, the instinct for fighting properly called, to remain almost at rest, and this so much the more according as the range of their effects is greater. With a sling we can imagine to ourselves a certain degree of anger accompanying the throw, there is less of this feeling in discharging a musket, and still less in firing a cannon-shot. 48. 
although there are shades of difference still all modern weapons may be placed under one or other of two great classes that is the cut and thrust weapons and firearms the former for close combat the latter for fighting at a distance forty nine therefore it follows that there are two modes of fighting the close combat hand to hand and the combat with firearms fifty both have for their object the destruction of the enemy fifty one in close combat this effect is quite certain in the combat with firearms it is only more or less probable from this difference follows a very different signification in the two modes of fighting fifty two as the destruction in hand-to-hand -hand fighting is inevitable the smallest superiority either through advantages or in courage is decisive and the party at a disadvantage or inferior in courage tries to escape the danger by flight fifty three this occurs so regularly so commonly and so soon in all hand-to-hand -hand fights in which several are engaged that the destructive effects properly belonging to this kind of fight are very much diminished thereby and its principal effects consists rather in driving the enemy off the field than in destroying him fifty four if therefore we look for the practical effect of close combat we must place our object not in the destruction of the enemy but in his expulsion from the field the destruction becomes the means fifty five in the hand-to-hand -hand fight originally the destruction of the enemy was the object so in the combat with firearms the primary object is to put the enemy to flight and the destruction is only the means we fire upon the enemy to drive him away and to spare ourselves the close combat for which we are not prepared fifty six but the danger caused by the combat with firearms is not quite inevitable it is only more or less probable its effect therefore is not so great on the senses of individuals and only becomes great through continuance and through its whole sum which as it does not affect the senses so much is not such a direct impression it is therefore not essentially necessary that one of the two sides should withdraw from under it from this it follows that one party is not put to flight at once and in many cases may not be at all fifty seven if this is the case then as a rule at the conclusion of combat with firearms the close combat must be resorted to in order to put the enemy to flight fifty eight on the other hand the destructive effect gains in intensity by continuance of the fire combat just as much as it loses in the close combat by the quick decision fifty nine from this it follows that instead of putting the enemy to flight being the general object of the fire combat that object is to be looked for in the direct effect of the applied means that is the destruction and weakening of the enemy's forces sixty if the object of the close combat is to drive the enemy from the field that of the combat with firearms is to destroy his armed force then the former is the real instrument for the decisive stroke the latter is to be regarded as the preparation sixty one in each however there is a certain amount of the effect pertaining to both principles the close combat is not devoid of destructive effects neither is the combat with firearms ineffectual to drive the enemy from the field sixty two the destructive effect of the close combat is in most cases extremely insignificant very often it amounts to nil it would therefore hardly be taken account of if it did not sometimes become of considerable importance by increasing the number of prisoners sixty three but it is well to observe that these cases generally occur after the fire has produced considerable effect sixty four close combat in the existing relation of arms would therefore have but an insignificant destructive effect without the assistance of fire sixty five the destructive force of firearms in combat may by continuance be intensified to the utmost extremity that is to the shaking and extinction of courage sixty six the consequence of that is that by far the greatest share in the destruction of the enemy's combatant powers is due to the effect of firearms sixty seven the weakening of the enemy through the fire combat either a causes his retreat or b serves as a preparation for the hand-to-hand -hand encounter sixty eight by putting the enemy to flight which is the object of the hand-to-hand -hand combat the real victory may be attained because driving the enemy from the field constitutes a victory if the whole mass engaged is small then such a victory may embrace the whole and be a decisive result sixty nine but when the close combat has only taken place between portions of the whole mass of forces or when several close combats in succession make up the whole combat then the results in one single one can only be considered as a victory in a partial combat seventy if the conquered division is a considerable part of the whole then in its defeat it may carry the whole along with it and thus from the victory over a part a victory over the whole army may immediately follow seventy one 
even if a success in close combat does not amount to a victory over the mass of the enemy's forces still it always ensures the following advantages a gain of ground b shaking of moral force c disorder in the enemy's ranks d destruction of physical force seventy two in a partial combat the fire combat is therefore to be regarded as a destroying act the close combat as a decisive act how these points are to be viewed in relation to the total combat we shall consider at a future time relation of the two forms of combat in regard to attack and defence seventy three the combat consists further of attack and defence seventy four the attack is the positive intention the defence the negative the first aims at putting the enemy to flight the latter merely at keeping possession seventy five but this keeping possession is no mere holding out not passive endurance its success depends on a vigorous reaction this reaction is the destruction of the attacking forces therefore it is only the object not the means which is to be regarded as negative seventy six but it follows of itself that if the defender maintains his position the adversary must give way therefore although the defender has the negative object the retreat that is the giving way of the enemy is the sign of victory also for the defender seventy seven naturally on account of a like object the close combat is the element of attack seventy eight but as close combat contains in itself so little of the destructive principle the assailant who confines himself to use of it alone would hardly be considered as a combatant in most cases and in any case would play a very unequal game seventy nine except when small bodies only are engaged or bodies consisting entirely of cavalry the close combat can never constitute the whole attack the larger the masses engaged the more artillery and infantry come into play the less will it suffice for the end eighty the attack must therefore also include in itself as much of the fire combat as is necessary eighty one in this that is in the fire combat both sides are to be regarded as upon an equality so far as respects the mode of fighting therefore the greater the proportion of fighting with firearms as compared with close combat the more the original inequality between attack and defence is diminished as regards the remaining disadvantages of the close combat to which the assailant must ultimately have recourse they must be compensated for by such advantages as are inherent in that form and by superiority of numbers eighty two the fire combat is the natural element of the defensive eighty three when a successful result the retreat of the assailant is obtained by that form of combat there is no necessity to have recourse to close combat eighty four when that result is not obtained and the assailant resorts to close combat the defender must do the same eighty five generally the defence does not by any means exclude the close combat if the advantages to be expected from it appear greater than those of the combat with firearms advantageous conditions in both forms of combat eighty six we must now examine more closely the nature in general of both combats in order to ascertain the points which give the preponderance in the same eighty seven the fire combat a superiority in the use of the arms open bracket this depends on the organization and the quality of the troops close bracket b superiority in the formation tactical organization and the elementary tactics as established dispositions see methodicism page sixty three volume one in a question of the employment of regularly disciplined troops in the combat these things do not come into consideration because they are supposed to belong to the idea of troops but as a subject of the theory of the combat in its widest sense they may and should be considered c the number d the form of the line of battle so far as it is not already contained in b e the ground eighty eight as we are only now treating of the employment of disciplined troops we have nothing to do with a and b they are only given to be taken into consideration as given quantities eighty nine a superiority of numbers if two unequal bodies of infantry or artillery are drawn up opposite to each other on parallel lines of the same extent then if every shot fired is directed like a target shoot against a separate individual the number of hits will be in proportion to the number of men firing the proportion of hits would bear just the same relation if the shots were directed against a full target therefore if the mark were no longer a single man but a battalion a line etc this is indeed also the way in which the shots fired by skirmishers in war may for the most part be estimated but here the target is not full instead of that it is a line of men with intervals between them the intervals decrease as the number of men increases in a given space consequently the effect of a fire combat between bodies of troops of unequal number 
will be a sum made out of the number of those firing and the number of the enemy's troops they are firing against that is in other words the superiority in number in fire combat produces no preponderating effect because that which is gained through the number of shots is lost again through a greater number of the enemies taking effect suppose that fifty men place themselves upon the same extent of ground as five hundred opposite them let thirty shots out of fifty be supposed to strike the target that is the quadrilateral occupied by the enemy's battalion then out of the enemy's five hundred shots three hundred will strike the quadrilateral occupied by our fifty men but the five hundred men stand ten times as close as the fifty therefore our balls will hit ten times as many as the enemy's and thus by our fifty shots exactly as many of the enemy are hit as are hit on our side by his five hundred readers note there is an asterisk here the asterisk leads to a footnote that says see chapter twelve book three translator readers note ends although this result does not exactly correspond with the reality and there is a small advantage in general on the side of the superior numbers still there is no doubt that it is essentially correct and that the efficacy on either side that is the result in a combat with firearms far from keeping exact pace with the superiority in numbers is scarcely increased at all by that superiority the result is of the utmost importance for it constitutes the basis of that economy of forces in the preparatory destructive act which may be regarded as one of the surest means of victory eighty nine b let it not be thought that this result may lead to an absurdity and that for example two men the smallest number who can take up the line of our supposed target must do just as much execution as two thousand provided the two men are placed at a distance apart equal to the front of the two thousand if the two thousand always fired directly to their front that might be the case but if the number of the weaker side is so small that the stronger directs its concentrated fire upon individuals then naturally there must follow a great difference in the effect for in such a case our supposition of simple target firing is set aside likewise a very weak line of fire would never oblige the enemy to engage in a fire combat instead of that such a line would be driven from the field by him at once we see therefore that the foregoing result is not to be carried to an extreme in application but yet is of great importance for the reasons given hundreds of times a line of fire has maintained its own against one of twice its strength and it is easy to see what consequence may result from that in the economy of force eighty nine c we may therefore say that either of the opposing sides has it in his power to increase or reduce the mutual that is the total effect of the fire according as he brings or does not bring more combatants into the line which is firing ninety the form of the line of battle may be a with parallel fronts of equal length then it is the same for both sides b with parallel front but outflanking the enemy then it is advantageous but we may easily conceive the advantage is small on account of the limited range of firearms c enveloping this is advantageous on account of the double effect of the shots and because the greater extent of front follows of itself from that form forms the reverse of b and c are obviously disadvantageous ninety one ground is advantageous in combat with firearms a by affording cover like a breastwork b by intercepting the view of the enemy thus forming an obstacle to his taking aim c as an obstacle to approach by which the enemy is kept long under our fire and impeded in the delivery of his own fire ninety two in close combat the advantages afforded by ground are the same as in fire combat ninety three the two first subjects a and b number eighty seven do not come into consideration here but we must observe that superiority in the use of weapons does not make as great a difference in close combat as in the fire combat and on the other hand courage plays a most decisive part the subjects touched upon under b number eighty seven are especially important for cavalry the arm by which most close combats are fought ninety four in close combat number is much more decisive than in combat with firearms it is almost the chief thing ninety five the form of the order of battle is also much more decisive than in the combat with firearms and when the front is parallel a small instead of a great extent of front is the most advantageous ninety six the ground a as obstacle to approach in this consists by far its greatest efficacy in close combat b as a means of concealment this favours a surprise which is especially important in close combat analysis of the combat ninety seven in number twenty three we have seen that every combat is a whole composed of many members or parts in which the independence of the parts is very unequal inasmuch as it diminishes by a descending scale 
we shall now examine this point more closely ninety eight we can easily imagine as a single member such a number as can be led into the fight by the word of command for instance a battalion a battery or a regiment of cavalry if these masses are really in close order ninety nine when the word of command no longer suffices a written or verbal order commences one hundred the word of command admits of no gradations in point of fact it is a part of the execution but the order has degrees from the utmost distinctness approaching to the word of command down to the utmost generality it is not the execution itself but only a commission to execute one o one no one subject to the word of command has any will of his own but whenever instead of that word an order is given a certain independence of members begins because the order is of a general nature and the will of the leader must supply any insufficiency in its terms one o two if a combat admitted of being perfectly prearranged and foreseen in all its coincident and successive parts and events if that is to say its plan could descend into the minutest details as in the construction of a piece of inanimate machinery then the order would have none of this indefiniteness one o three but belligerents do not cease to be men and individuals can never be converted into machines having no will of their own and the ground on which they fight will seldom or never be a complete and bare level which can exercise no influence on the combat it is therefore quite impossible to calculate beforehand all that is to take place 104. This insufficiency of plan increases with the duration of the combat, and with the number of the combatants. The close combat of a small troop is almost completely contained in its plan, but the plan for a combat with firearms of even very small bodies can never be thoroughly complete to the same degree on account of its duration and the incidents which spring up. Then again, the close combat of large masses, as, for instance, of a cavalry division of 2,000 or 3,000 horse, cannot be carried out so completely in conformity with the original plan that the will of its single leaders is not frequently obliged to supply something as for the plan of a great battle except as regards the preliminary part it can only be a very general outline one o five as this insufficiency of plan disposition increases with the time and space which the combat takes so therefore as a rule a greater margin for contingencies must be allowed to large than to smaller bodies of troops and the order will increase in its precision as it descends the scale down to those parts which are governed by word of command one o six further the independence of the parts will also differ according to the circumstances in which they are placed space time the character of the ground and country and the nature of the duty will diminish or increase this independence as respects one and the same subdivision one o seven besides this systematic division of the entire combat into separate parts according to a plan a casual division may also take place thus a by our own views expanding beyond the limits of the original plan b by an unforeseen separation of parts which we intended to have kept under word of command one o eight this fresh division depends on circumstances which cannot be foreseen 109 the consequence is unequal results in parts which should have been all united as one whole because in point of fact they become placed in different relations 110 thus arises at certain points the necessity for a change not contemplated in the general plan a that these parts may avoid disadvantages of ground or of numbers or of position b that advantages gained in all these different respects may be turned to account 111 the consequence of this is that involuntarily often more or less designedly a fire combat passes into close combat or the other way the latter into the former one hundred and twelve the problem then is to make these changes fit into the general plan so that a if they lead to a disadvantage it may be remedied in one way or another b if they lead to a success it may be used as far as possible short of exposing us to the risk of a reverse one hundred and thirteen it is therefore the intentional or unintentional division of the total combat into a greater or less number of minor independent combats which causes the form of combat to change from close combat to fire combat as well as from attack to defence during the total combat now the whole remains to be considered in this relation end of appendix four part one recording by timothy ferguson gold coast australia
Appendix four, part two of On War, volumes two and three by Carl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Guide to Tactics, part two. The combat consists of two acts, the destructive and the decisive act. 114. From the fire combat with its destructive principle, and from the close combat with its principle of putting to flight, according to number 72, proceed two different acts in the partial combat, the destructive and the decisive act. 115. The smaller the masses are, the more these two acts will resolve themselves into one simple fire combat or one close combat. 116. The greater the masses, the more must these two acts be taken in a collective sense, in such manner that the destructive act is made up of a number of simultaneous and successive fire combats, and the decisive act in the same manner of several close combats. 117. In this manner the division of the combat not only continues, but also extends itself more and more, the greater the masses brought into conflict whilst the destructive act and the decisive act are further and further separated from each other in time. The Destructive Act 118. The greater the mass of troops, the more important becomes the physical destruction, for a. The influence of the commander is so much the less, his influence is greater in close combat than in fire combat, b. The moral inequality is so much less. With large masses, whole armies for instance, there is nothing but the difference of nationality, whilst in smaller bodies there is to be added that of the corps and of individuals, and lastly of special accidental circumstances which in large bodies balance each other. See, the order of battle is so much the deeper, that is, there are so many more reserves to renew the combat, as we shall see in the sequel. The number of partial combats therefore increases, and consequently the duration of the total combat, and by that means the influence of the first moment, which is so very decisive in putting the enemy to flight, is lessened. 119. From the preceding number it follows that the greater the mass of the army, the greater must be the physical destruction as a preparation for the decision. 120. This preparation consists in this that the number of combatants diminishes on both sides, but the relation alters in our favour. 121. The first of these is sufficient if we are already morally and physically superior. The second is requisite if such is not the case. 122. The destruction of the enemy's combatant force is made up, A, of all that are put physically hors de combat, killed, wounded, and prisoners, B. Of whatever part is spent physically and morally. 123. After a fire combat of several hours' duration in which a body of troops has suffered severe loss, for instance a quarter or one-third of its numbers, the debris may for the time be looked upon as a heap of cinders for A. The men are physically exhausted. B. They have spent their ammunition. C. Their arms want cleaning. D. Many have left the field with the wounded, although not themselves wounded. E. The rest think they have done their part for the day, and, if once they get beyond the sphere of danger, do not willingly return to it. F. The feeling of courage with which they started has had the edge taken off, the longing for the fight is satisfied. G. The original organisation and formation are partly destroyed or thrown into disorder. 124. The consequences E and F make their appearance more or less according as the combat has been successful or the reverse. A body of troops which has gained ground or successfully maintained the original position assigned to it can be made further use of more easily than one that has been repulsed. 125a. There are two deductions from number 123, which we must bring under notice. The first is the economy of force, which is made by the use of a smaller number of men in the combat with firearms than the enemy employs. For, if the dilapidation of forces in the fire combat consists not only in the loss of those placed hors de combat, but further in this that all who have fought are lowered in their powers, then naturally this lowering of powers will be less on the side which brings the fewest troops into action. If 500 men have been able to maintain their ground against a 1,000, if the losses are equal on each side, say 200 men, then on the one side 
there will remain three hundred men who are fatigued while the other side will have eight hundred of whom three hundred are fatigued but five hundred are fresh readers note in the preceding sentence there are two marks leading to footnotes the footnotes read according to chapter twelve page one hundred and nine volume one it seems that this passage should read thus if out of a body of a thousand men five hundred have been placed in reserve and the remaining five hundred men etc the second footnote marks the first occurrence of the number three hundred with a dagger and reads eight hundred see chapter twelve page one hundred and nine volume one i will reread the sentence with the substitution suggested in the footnotes if out of a body of a thousand men five hundred have been placed in reserve and the remaining five hundred men have been able to maintain their ground against a thousand if the losses are equal on each side say two hundred men then on the one side there will remain eight hundred men who are fatigued while the other side will have eight hundred of whom three hundred are fatigued but five hundred are fresh one hundred and twenty five b the second deduction is that the weakening of the enemy consequently the dilapidation of the enemy's combative power is of much greater extent than the mere number of killed wounded and prisoners would seem to represent this number amounts to perhaps only one-sixth of the whole there should therefore remain five-sixths but out of that five-sixths in all probability only the untouched reserve and some troops which although they have been in action have suffered very little are in reality to be regarded as serviceable and the remainder perhaps four-sixths may be looked upon for the present as a caput mortem one hundred and twenty six this diminution of the efficient mass is the first aim of the destructive act the real decision can only be accomplished by smaller masses of troops one hundred and twenty seven but although the absolute size of the masses is not an unimportant matter as fifty men opposed to fifty can proceed to a decision on the spot while fifty thousand opposed to fifty thousand cannot do so still it is the relative not the absolute size of the masses which is an obstacle to the decision thus if five-sixths of the whole have measured their powers in the destructive act then both generals even if they have continued on an equality will be much nearer to the final resolution which they have to make and it is only a relatively small impulse which is required to bring on the decisive act it is all the same whether the sixth part remaining is a sixth of an army of thirty thousand therefore five thousand men or one sixth of an army of a hundred and fifty thousand men that is twenty five thousand men one hundred and twenty eight the principal object of each side in the destructive act is to work out for itself a preponderance for the decisive act one hundred and twenty nine this superiority can be obtained by the destruction of the enemy's physical force but it may also be obtained by the other causes enumerated under number four one hundred and thirty there is therefore in the destructive act a natural endeavour to profit by all the advantages which offer as far as circumstances will admit one hundred and thirty one now the combat of large masses is always split into several partial combats number twenty three which are more or less independent and therefore must frequently contain in themselves both a destructive and a decisive act if the advantages obtained from the first of these acts are to be turned into account one hundred and thirty two through the skilful and successful mixture of the close combat we chiefly obtain the advantages which are to be derived from shaking the enemy's courage creating disorder in his ranks and gaining ground one hundred and thirty three even the physical destruction of the enemy's forces is much increased by that means for prisoners can only be made in close combat thus we conceive that if an enemy's battalion is shaken by our fire if our bayonet attack drives it out of an advantageous position and we follow him in his flight with a couple of squadrons this partial success may place important advantages of all kinds in the scale of the general result but then it is a condition that it be done without involving this victorious troop in difficulty for if our battalion and our squadron through this means should fall into the hands of superior forces of the enemy then this partial decision has been ill-timed one hundred thirty four the utilising of these partial successes is in the hands of the subordinate commanders and gives a great advantage to an army which has experienced officers at the head of its divisions brigades regiments battalions batteries etc one hundred and thirty five thus each of the two commanders seeks to obtain for himself in the course of the destructive act those advantages which bring about the decision and at all events pave the way for it one hundred and thirty six the most important of these objects are always captured guns and ground gained 
137. The importance of the latter is increased if the enemy has made it an object to defend a strong position. 138. Thus, the destructive act on both sides, but especially on that of the assailant, is a cautious advance towards the object. 139. As numbers are so little decisive in the fire combat, number 53, therefore the endeavour naturally follows to keep up the combat with as few troops as possible. 140. As the fire combat predominates in the destructive act, therefore the greatest economy of force must be the prevailing principle in the same. 141. As numerical force is so essential in close combat, therefore for the decision of partial combats in the destructive act, superior numbers must frequently be employed. 142. But upon the whole, the character of thrift must rule here also, and, in general, only those decisions are to the purpose which realise themselves of themselves, as it were, without any great preponderance of numbers. 143. An inopportune endeavour to gain the decision leads to the following consequences. A. If it is undertaken with economy of our forces, we get involved with superior forces. B. If the requisite force is used, we get exhausted before the right time. 144. The question whether it is opportune to try for a decision recurs very frequently during the destructive act. Nevertheless, as respects the great ultimate decision, it presents itself at the end of the destructive act. 145. The destructive act on this account naturally strives at certain points to pass into the decisive act, because no advantage developed in the course of that act will attain completeness except through the decisive act, which is its necessary complement. 146. The more fruitful in results the means applied in the destructive act are, or the greater the physical and moral superiority, the stronger will be this tendency of the whole. 147. But when the results are small or negative, or when the enemy has superiority, this tendency likewise may be so rare and so feeble at isolated points that as respects the whole, it is much the same as if it did not exist at all. 148. This natural tendency may lead to ill-timed decisions in partial combats, as well as in the total combat, but it is very far from being an evil on that account, it is rather a necessary property of the destructive act, because without it much would be neglected. 149. The judgment of the leader at each point, and of the commander-in-chief in the total combat, must determine whether an opportunity which presents itself is advantageous for a decisive blow or not that is, whether it may not lead to a counter-blow, and thus to a negative result. 150. The conduct of a combat in relation to the preparation preceding the decisive stroke, or rather, the preparation expressly for that stroke, consists therefore in organising a fire combat, and in a wider sense a destructive act, and giving to it a proportionate duration, that is, in only proceeding to the decisive stroke when it appears that the destructive act has produced sufficient effect. 151. The judgment on this point must be guided less by the clock, that is, less by the mere relations of time, than by the events which have taken place, by the evident signs of a superiority having been obtained. 152. Now, as the destructive act, if attended with good results, strives of itself already towards the decisive act, therefore, the duty of the chief consists principally in determining when and where the moment arrives to give reins to this tendency. 153. If the tendency towards the decisive act is very weak during the destructive act, that is a tolerably sure sign that victory cannot be calculated on. 154. In such a case, therefore, the chief and his generals will usually not give, but receive the decisive shock. 155. If still it must be given, then it takes place by an express order, which must be accompanied by the use of all the personal means of inspiring the men, all the stimulating influence, which the general has at his command. The Decisive Act 156. The decision is that event which produces in one of the generals a resolution to quit the field. 157. The grounds for quitting the field we have given in number 4. These grounds may come forth gradually by one small disaster after another, being heaped up in the course of the destructive act, and the resolution may therefore be taken without a really decisive event. In such a case, no decisive act in particular takes place. 158. But the resolution may also be produced by one single very disastrous event. 
therefore suddenly when up to that moment everything has been evenly balanced one hundred and fifty nine then that act of the enemy which has called forth this resolution is to be regarded as the decisive act one hundred and sixty the most common case is that the decision ripens gradually in the course of the destructive act but the resolution of the vanquished gets its final impulse from some particular event therefore in this case also the decisive act is to be considered as having been given one hundred and sixty one if a decisive act is given then it must be a positive action a it may be an attack b or it may be only the advance of reserves hitherto held under cover one hundred and sixty two with small bodies close combat by a single charge is often decisive one hundred and sixty three when larger masses are engaged the attack by means of close combat may also suffice but a single charge will then hardly be sufficient one hundred and sixty four if the masses are still larger there is then a mixture of the fire combat as in the case of horse artillery supporting the charge of heavy masses of cavalry one hundred and sixty five with great bodies composed of all arms a decision can never result from close combat alone a renewed fire combat is necessary one hundred and sixty six but this renewed fire combat will be of the nature of an attack itself it will be carried out in close masses therefore with an action concentrated in time and space as a short preparation for the real attack one hundred and sixty seven when the decision is not the result of a particular close combat but of a number of simultaneous and consecutive combats of both kinds it then becomes a distinct act belonging to the entire combat as has already been said in a general way number one hundred and fifteen one hundred and sixty eight in this act the close combat predominates one hundred and sixty nine in the same measure as the close combat predominates so will also the offensive although at certain points the defensive may be preserved one hundred and seventy towards the close of a battle the line of retreat is always regarded with increased jealousy therefore a threat against that line is always then a potent means of bringing on the decision one hundred and seventy one on that account when circumstances permit the plan of battle will be aimed at that point from the very first one hundred and seventy two the more the battle or combat develops itself in the sense of a plan of this kind so much the more seriously the enemy's line of retreat will be menaced one hundred and seventy three another great step towards victory is breaking the order of formation the regular formation in which the troops commence the action suffers considerably in the long destructive combats in which they themselves wring out their strength if this wear and tear and exhaustion has reached a certain point then a rapid advance in concentrated masses on one side against the line of battle of the other may produce a degree of disorder which forbids the latter any longer to think of victory and calls in requisition all his powers to place the separate parts of his line in safety and to restore the connection of the whole in the best way he can for the moment one hundred and seventy four from what proceeds it is evident that as in the preparatory acts the utmost economy of force must predominate so in the decisive act to win the mastery through numbers must be the ruling idea one hundred and seventy five just as in the preparatory acts endurance firmness and coolness are the first qualities so in the decisive act boldness and fiery spirit must predominate one hundred and seventy six usually only one of the opposing commanders delivers the deciding stroke the other receives it one hundred and seventy seven as long as all continues in equilibrium he who gives the decisive blow may be a the assailant b or the defender one hundred and seventy eight as the assailant has the positive object it is most natural that he should deliver it and therefore this is what occurs most frequently one hundred and seventy nine but if the equilibrium is much disturbed then the decision may be given a by the commander who has the advantage b by the one who is under the disadvantage 180 the first is plainly more natural and if this commander is also the assailant it is still more natural therefore there are few cases in which the decision does not emanate from this commander 
181. But if the defender is the party who has the advantage, then it is also natural that he should give the decision, so that the relative situation which is produced by degrees has more influence than the original intention of offensive and defensive. 182. When the decision is given by the assailant, although he has palpably the disadvantage, it looks like a last attempt to gain his original object. If the defender, who has gained advantages, gives him time to do so, it is certainly consistent with the nature of the positive intention of the assailant to make such a last attempt. 183a. A defender who, although decidedly at a disadvantage, still proceeds to give the decision, does that which is contrary to the nature of things, and which may be regarded as an act of desperation. The result in the decisive stage is confirmable to the relations just developed, so that, as a rule, it will only be favourable to the side which gives the decision if he is naturally led to do so by the relations in which he stands. 184. When all is still in a state of equilibrium, the result is generally favourable to the side which gives the decision, for at the moment when a battle is ripe for decision, when the forces have worn themselves out on each other, the positive principle is of much greater weight than at the commencement. 185. The general who receives the decision must either determine on an immediate retreat in consequence and decline all further combat, or he may continue the combat. 186. If he continues the engagement, he can only do so as a. A commencement of his retreat, because he wants time to make the requisite arrangements, or b. A virtual struggle, through which he still hopes for victory. 187. If the general who accepts the decision stands in very favourable relations, he may, in so doing, also adhere to the defensive. 188a. But if the decision proceeds naturally from the advantageous situation of the side giving it, then the general who accepts it must also pass over to a more or less active defence, that is, he must oppose attack by attack, partly because the natural advantages of the defence, position, order, surprise, wear themselves out by degrees in the course of the combat, and at last there is not enough of them left, partly because, as we have said in number 184, the positive principle acquires incessantly more and more weight. Their separation as regards time. 188b. The view here propounded that every combat is composed of two separate acts will meet with strong opposition at first sight. 189. This opposition will proceed partly from a false view of the combat, which has become habitual, partly from an over-pedantic importance being ascribed to the idea of such a division. 190. We imagine to ourselves the opposition between attack and defence as two decided. The two activities as two completely antithetical, or rather... We assume the antithesis to be where it is not to be found in practice. 191. From this it results that we imagine the assailant, from the first moment to the last, as steadily and unremittingly striving to advance, and every modification in that advance as an entirely involuntary and compulsory one which proceeds directly from the resistance encountered. 192. According to this idea, nothing would be more natural than that every attack should begin with the furious energy of an assault. 193. Still, even those who adhere to this kind of idea have become accustomed to a preparatory act on the part of the artillery, because it was too plain that without it an assault would generally be useless. 194. But otherwise that absolute tendency to advance to the attack has been considered so natural that an attack without a shot being fired is looked upon as the ideal of perfection. Even Frederick the Great, up to the time of the Battle of Zorndorf, looked upon fire in the attack as something exceptionable. 195. Although there has since been a disposition to modify that notion, still there are numbers at the present time who think that the assailant cannot make himself master of the important points in a position too soon. 196. Those who make the greatest concessions to fire at the same time advocate an immediate advance to the attack, the delivery of a few volleys by battalion close to the enemy's position, and then an onset with the bayonet. 197. But military history and a glance at the nature of our arms show that absolutely to despise the use of fire in the attack is an absurdity. 198. A little acquaintance with the nature of the combat, and above all actual experience, teach us also that a body of troops which has been engaged under fire is seldom fit for a vigorous assault, therefore... The concession mentioned in number 196 is worth noting. 
199. Lastly, military history gives instances without number in which, owing to a premature advance, advantages previously gained have had to be abandoned with serious loss. Therefore, the principle mentioned in number 195 is also not admissible. 200. We maintain accordingly that the idea now alluded to of an unmixed kind of attack, if we may use that expression, is entirely false, because it only answers to a very few extremely exceptional cases. 201. But if a commencement with close combat, and a decision without preparation in a great battle, are not consistent with the nature of things, then of itself there arises a distinction between the preparation by fire for the decision, and the decision itself therefore between the two acts which we have been discussing 202 we have granted that this distinction may fall to the ground in affairs which are quite of a minor nature open bracket as for instance between small bodies of cavalry close bracket the question now is whether it does not also come to an end if the masses attain to certain proportions not as to whether the employment of fire might cease for that would be a contradiction in itself but whether the sharp distinction between the two activities ceases so that they can no longer be considered as two separate acts. 203. It may perhaps be maintained that a battalion should fire before it charges with the bayonet. The one must precede the other, and thus two different acts take place, but only as regards the battalion, not as respects the greater subdivision of the brigade, etc. These have no fire period and decision period. They seek to come in contact with the object pointed out to them as speedily as possible, and must leave the way in which it is done to the battalions. 204. Do we not perceive that in this way all unity would be lost? As one battalion fights quite close to another, the successes and reverses of one must have a necessary influence on others, and as the effect of our musketry fire is so small that it requires considerable duration to make it efficacious, the influence just noticed must be greater and more decisive through that duration even on this ground alone there must be for the brigade as well as for the battalion a certain general division of time as respects the destructive and the decisive combats two hundred and five but another more substantial reason is that for the decision we are glad to use fresh troops at least troops that have not been engaged in the destructive act but these must be taken from the reserve and the reserve by their nature are common property and on that account cannot be divided beforehand amongst the battalions 206 now as the necessity of a division in the combat passes on from the battalion to the brigade therefore from that it passes on to the division and from the division to still larger bodies 207 but as the parts of a whole divisions of the first order always become more independent the larger the whole is therefore it is true the unity of the whole will also press less stringently on them and thus it happens that in the course of a partial combat more decisive acts may and will always take place according as the whole is greater two hundred and eight the decisions when corps are large will therefore not unite themselves into a whole to the same degree as in the case of corps of smaller size but will distribute themselves more as regards time and space still between the beginning and the end a notable distinction between the two different acts is always observable 209. Now the parts, cause, may be so large, and their separation from each other so wide, that although their action in the combat is certainly still directed by the will of one general, a necessary condition to constitute an independent combat, yet this direction limits itself to instructions at the commencement, or at most to a few orders in the course of the combat. In this case, such a part, corps, has in itself almost complete power to organise its whole combat. 210. The more important the decisions which rest with a core by its situation, so much the more they will influence the decision of the whole. Indeed, we may even suppose the relation of some parts to be such, that in their decisions that of the whole is at once contained, and therefore a separate decisive act for the whole is no longer required. 211. Example. In a great battle, in which the parts of the army of the first rank are corps, a brigade may receive the order at the commencement to take a village. For this purpose, it will make use for itself of its destructive act and its decisive act. Now, the taking of this village may have more or less an influence on the ultimate decision of the whole, but it is not in the nature of things that it should greatly influence, and much less that it should affect the decision of itself, because a brigade is too small a body 
to give a decision at the commencement of a battle but we may very well conceive that the effectual taking of this village forms nevertheless part of the destructive measure by which the enemy's force is to be shattered and reduced on the other hand if we suppose an order given to a considerable corps perhaps a third or half of the whole force to take a certain important part of the enemy's position then the result expected through this corps may easily be so important as to be decisive for the whole and if this corps attains its object no further decisive act may then be necessary now it is easy to conceive further that owing to distance and the nature of the country very few orders can be transmitted to this corps in the course of the battle consequently that both preparatory and decisive measures must be left to its decision in this manner one common decisive act falls to the ground altogether and it is divided into separate decisive acts of some of the great parts two hundred and twelve this indeed frequently takes place in great battles and a pedantic notion of the severance of the two acts of which we conceive the battle to consist would therefore be in contradiction with the course of such a battle two hundred and thirteen although we set up this distinction in the working of a battle as a point of great importance it is far from our intention to place importance on the regular severance and division of these two activities and to assist upon that as a practical principle we only wish to separate in idea two things which are essentially different and to show how this inherent difference governs of itself the form of the combat two hundred and fourteen the difference in the form shows itself most plainly in small combats where the simple fire and close combat form a complete contrast to each other the contrast is less decided when the parts are longer because then in the two acts the two forms of combat from which they proceed unite themselves again but the acts themselves are greater take more time and consequently are further separated from each other in time two hundred and fifteen there may be no separation also as regards the whole in so far that the decision has already been handed over to separate corps of the first order but still even then a trace of it will be found in the whole as it must be our endeavour to bring the decisions of these different corps into concert in relation to time whether it be that we consider it necessary that the decision should take place simultaneously or that the decision should take place in a certain order of succession two hundred and sixteen the difference between these two acts will therefore never be completely lost as respects the whole and that which is lost for the whole will reappear in the elements of the first order two hundred and seventeen this is the way in which our view is to be understood and if thus understood then on the one hand it will not come short of the reality and on the other it will direct the attention of the leader of a combat let it be great or small partial or general to giving each of the two acts of activity its due share that there may be neither precipitation nor negligence two hundred and eighteen precipitation there will be if space and time sufficient are not allowed to the destructive act if things are broken across the knee an unfortunate issue of the decision results which either cannot be repaired at all or at all events remains a substantial disadvantage readers note in the previous sentence there is an asterisk marking a footnote the footnote says done hand over head and it is placed after the phrase if things are broken across the knee readers note ends two hundred and nineteen negligence in general there will be if a complete decision does not take place either from want of courage or from a wrong view of the situation the result of this is always waste of force but it may further be a positive disadvantage because the maturity of the decision does not quite depend upon the duration of the destructive act but on other circumstances as well that is to say on a favourable opportunity end of appendix four part two Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Appendix 4, Section 3 of On War, Volumes 2 and 3 by Karl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson Guide to Tactics, Part 3 Plan of Battle, Definition 220a. The plan of the battle makes its unity possible. Every action in common requires such unity. This unity is nothing else but the object of the combat. From it proceed the directions which require to be given to all the different parts in order to attain the object in the best way. The appointment of the object and the arrangements consequent upon it form, therefore, the plan. 
220 b we mean here by plan everything which is prescribed respecting the battle whether beforehand at the commencement or in the course of the engagement consequently the whole operation of the intelligence on matter 220 c but there is plainly an essential difference between such directions on the one hand as must be and can be given previously and those on the other hand which the exigencies of the moment require 220 d the first constitutes the plan in the proper sense the latter we may call the conduct of the battle 221 as these determinations which the moment calls forth are chiefly derived from the reciprocal action of the opposing parties we shall leave the discussion and analysis of this difference until we come to the subject of the reciprocal action 222 a part of the plan lies ready-made in the formation tactical organization of the combatant forces by which the great number of parts is reduced to a few 223 in a partial combat this formation is a thing of more consequence than in the total combat in the former it often constitutes the whole plan and the smaller the body the more this will be the case a battalion in a great battle does not use many other dispositions than those prescribed by the regulations and on the drill ground but that is not sufficient for a division their particular directions become more necessary 224 but in the total combat the formation is seldom the whole plan even for the smallest body the plan often modifies the formation to afford scope for special dispositions a squadron undertaking the surprise of one of the enemy's small posts divides itself into several separate parts just as well as the largest army aim of the plan 225 the object of the combat makes the unity of the plan we may regard it as its aim that is the direction to which all activity should converge 226 the object of a combat is victory in other words everything which is a condition of victory and which is included in number four 227 none of the objects enumerated in number four can be attained in battle except by the destruction of the enemy's force which therefore appears to be the means for all 228 it is itself in most cases the principal object as well 229 if that is the case the plan is aimed at the greatest possible destruction of the enemy's forces 230 when some of the things named in number one are of greater importance than the destruction of the enemy's force it takes a subordinate place as a means then the greatest possible is no longer demanded but only a sufficient destruction and we may then take the nearest way to the aim 231a there are cases in which the points named in number four c d e f g which lead to the retreat of the enemy may be attained without any destruction of the enemy's armed forces then the enemy is conquered by a manoeuvre not by a combat but this is no victory therefore only for use when we have something else than a victory for an object 231b in such cases the employment of military force will still always imply the idea certainly of a combat therefore of a destruction of the enemy's force but only as possible not as probable for inasmuch as our views are aimed at something else than the destruction of the enemy's forces we presuppose these other things to be effectual and that they will prevent any serious opposition from taking place if we cannot make such a presupposition then we ought not to choose these other things for our end and if we err in the presupposition the plan will miss its aim 232 from the preceding number it follows that whenever a considerable destruction of the enemy's forces is the condition of victory it must also be the chief object of the plan now as a maneuver is not in itself a combat but a combat takes place if a maneuver does not succeed therefore neither can the rules which apply to total combat suit the case of a maneuver and the particular things which are efficacious in a manoeuvre can contribute nothing to the theory of the combat 234 many mixed relations certainly arise in practice but there is no reason against separating things in theory which in themselves are essentially different if we know the nature of each part then the combination of them may easily be made 235 the destruction of the enemy's armed force is therefore in all cases the aim and the things named in number four b c d e f are first called forth by it but then certainly enter into reciprocal action with it as powers in themselves 236 such of these things as perpetually recur 
that is to say, are not the consequence of special relations, ought also properly to be regarded as effects of the destruction of the enemy's forces. 237. So far, therefore, as it is possible to establish anything quite general as to the plan of a battle, it can only relate to the most effectual application of our own forces to the destruction of the enemy's. Relation between the magnitude and certainty of the result. 238. In war, and therefore, of course, in combat, we have to deal with moral forces and effects which cannot be nicely calculated. There must, consequently, always remain a great uncertainty as to the result of the means applied. 239. This is still further increased by the number of contingencies with which operations in war are brought into contact. 240. Wherever there is uncertainty, risk becomes an essential element. 241. To risk in the ordinary acceptation, means to build upon things which are more improbable than probable. To risk in the widest sense is to suppose things which are not certain. We shall take it here in the latter sense. 242. Now, if there was in all cases a clearly defined line between probability and improbability, the idea might occur to us to make it the boundary line of risk, and hold the passing of that line as inadmissible that is, as risk in the restricted sense of the word. 243. But in the first place such a line is a chimera, and in the next the combat is not an act of reflection only, but of passion and courage as well. These things cannot be shut out. If we should try to confine them too closely, we should divest our own powers of the most powerful springs of action in war, and involve ourselves in constant disadvantage, for in most cases the falling short of the true line which is so unavoidable and frequent, is only compensated by our sometimes overstepping it. 244. The more favourable our presuppositions, that is to say, the greater the risk we run, so much the greater are the results which we expect by these same means, and therefore the objects which we have in view. 245. The more we risk, the less the probability, and consequently the certainty, of the result. 246. The greatness of the result and the certainty of it stand therefore in opposition to each other when the means given are the same. 247. The first question now is how much value we should put upon one or other of these two opposite principles. 248. Upon this nothing general can be laid down. On the contrary of all questions in war, it is the one most dependent on the particular circumstances in each case. In the first place, it is determined by relations which, in many cases, oblige us to run the greatest risks. Secondly, the spirit of enterprise and courage are things purely subjective, which cannot be prescribed. We can require of a commander that he should judge of his means and relations with professional knowledge, and not overestimate their effects. If he does this, then we must trust to him to turn his means to the best advantage with the aid of his courage. Relation between the magnitude of the result and the price. 249. The second question in relation to the destruction of the enemy's forces concerns the price to be paid for it. 250. With the intention of destroying the enemy's forces, is certainly in general included the idea of destroying more than we shall in turn sacrifice on our own part. But this is by no means a necessary condition, for there may be cases, for instance, when we have a great superiority in numbers, when the mere diminution of the enemy's forces is an advantage, even if we pay for it, by the greater loss on our own side. 251. But even if we aim decidedly at destroying more of the enemy's force than we sacrifice on our own side, still there always remains the question of how great is the sacrifice to be, for according to it the chance of the result naturally rises and falls. 252. We readily perceive that the answer to this question depends on the value which we place on our forces, therefore on individual interests. To these interests the decision must be left, and we can neither say that it is a rule to spare our own troops as much as possible, or to make a lavish use of them. Determination of the nature of combat for the separate parts, cause, etc. 253. The plan of the battle fixes for each single division where, when, and how it is to fight, that is, it fixes time, place, and form of the combat. 254. Here as well as everywhere the general relations, that is, those proceeding from the abstract idea, are to be distinguished from those which the particular case brings with it. 
255, the manifold diversity in plans of battles must naturally proceed from the special relations in each case, because when the special advantages and disadvantages are sought for and discovered, the former are brought into use and the latter are neutralised. 256. But the general relations also give certain results, and although few in number and simple in form, still they are very important, because they belong to the very essence of the thing, and constitute the basis in all other decisions. Attack and Defence 257. In regard to the nature of the combat, there are only two distinctions which always appear and are therefore general. The first arises from the positive or negative intention, and is the distinction between the attack or defence. The other arises from the nature of arms, and is the distinction between the fire combat and close combat. 258. In the strictest sense, defence should only be the warding off of a blow, and should therefore require no other weapon than a shield. 259. But that would be a pure negation, a state absolutely passive, and making war is anything but patient endurance. The idea of thorough passivity can therefore never be laid at the root of defence. 260. Strictly considered firearms, the most passive of weapons, have still something positive and active in their nature. Now, the defence makes use in general of the same weapons and also of the same forms of combat as the attack, both in fire and close combat. 261. The defence is, therefore, to be considered a contest, just as much as the attack. 262. The object of this contest can be nothing but victory, which is, therefore, just as much an object for the defence as for the attack. 263. There is nothing to justify the conception of the defender's victory being something negative, if somewhat like it in certain cases, that lies in particular conditions. In the conception of the defence, that notion must not enter, otherwise it reacts logically on the whole idea of combat, and introduces into it contradictions, or leads back again by strict deduction to that absurdity, a state of absolute endurance and sufferance. 264. And yet there is a difference between attack and defence, which, while it is one only in principle, is also a very essential one. It is that the assailant wills the action, the combat, and calls it into life, whilst the defender waits for it. 265. This principle runs through all war, therefore through the whole province of combat, and in it all differences between attack and defence have their origin. 266. But whoever wills an action must aim at something thereby, and this object must be something positive, because the intention that nothing should be done could call forth no action. The offensive must, therefore, have a positive object. 267. Victory cannot be this object, for it is only a means. Even in a case where victory is sought entirely on account of itself, on account of the mere honour of arms, or to influence the political negotiations by its moral weight, still, that effect, and not the victory itself, is always the object. 268. The defender, just as well as the aggressor, must have victory in view, but in each the desire springs from a different source. In the offensive, from the object which the victory is to serve, in the defender, from the mere fact of the combat. The one looks down upon it, as it were, from a higher standpoint, the other looks up to it from a lower position. Whoever fights can only fight for the victory. 269. Now, why does the defender fight, that is, why does he accept the combat? because he will not concede the positive object of the offensive, or, in other words, because he wants to maintain the status quo. This is the primary and necessary object of the defender. Whatever further may attach itself to this is not necessary. 270. The necessary intention of the defender, or rather the necessary part of the defender's intention, is therefore negative. 271a. Wherever there is this negativity on the part of the defender, that is, wherever and whenever it is in his interest that nothing should be done, but that things should remain as they are, he is thereby enjoined not to act, but to wait until his opponent acts. But the moment that the latter acts, the defender can no longer attain his object by waiting and not acting. He therefore now acts just as well as his opponent, and the difference ceases. 271b. If we apply this in the first place to the whole combat only, then all difference between attack and defence will consist in this, that the one waits for the other, but the force of the actual combat will not be further influenced by it. 272. 
but this principle of the defence may also be applied to partial combats it may be for the interest of corps or parts of an army that no change should take place and in that way they may also be led to adopt the expectative 273 this is not only possible as regards branches and corps on the side of the defender but also as respects those on the side of the assailant it takes place in reality on both sides 274 it is natural however that it should occur more frequently in the case of the defender than in that of the assailant but this can only be shown when the particular circumstances in connection with the defensive principle come under consideration 275 the more we imagine the defensive principle descending to the smallest branches in a total combat and the more generally it is diffused through all the branches so much the more passive becomes the whole resistance so much the more the defence approaches to that point of absolute endurance which we look upon as an absurdity 276 the point in this direction at which the advantage to the defender of waiting ceases that is the point where its efficacy is exhausted where to a certain extent it is satiated we shall only be able to examine closely hereafter 277 for the present all that we deduce from what has been said is that the offensive or defensive intention not only determines something as to the commencement of the combat but may also pervade its whole course that by that means there are therefore in reality two different kinds of combats two hundred and seventy eight the plan of the combat must therefore determine in every case whether as a whole it is to be an offensive or defensive combat two hundred and seventy nine it must also determine this point for those corps which have been assigned to them a mission different from that of the general body two hundred and eighty if we now leave out of consideration for the present every particular circumstance which might decide the choice of attack and defence then there is only one rule which presents itself namely that when we wish to defer the solution we must act defensively when we seek it offensively two hundred and eighty one we shall see this principle come into connection presently with another which will make it plainer fire combat and close combat two hundred and eighty two the plan of the combat must further determine the choice of the form of combat in its relation to arms that is fire combat and close combat two hundred and eighty three but these forms are not so much branches of combat as essential elements of it they result from the armament they belong to each other and only by the combination of the two together can the full power of the combat be developed two hundred and eighty four the truth of this view which otherwise is not absolute but only approximative comprehending the majority of cases shows itself by the combination of arms in the hands of one combatant and by the intimate union of different kinds of troops which has become a necessity two hundred and eighty five but a separation of these two elements and the use of the one without the other is not only possible but very frequently happens two hundred and eighty six in respect to the mutual relations of the two and their natural order among themselves the plan of the battle has nothing to determine as these are determined already by conception by the formation tactical organization and the drill ground and therefore like the formation belong to the stereotypic part of the plan two hundred and eighty seven as to the use of these two forms of combat apart from each other there is no general rule unless this can pass for such that such separation must always be regarded as a necessary evil that is as a less effective form of action all cases in which we are obliged to make use of this weaker form belong to the domain of particular circumstances occasions for the use of the bayonet alone such for instance as the execution of a surprise or when there is no time to use firearms or if we are sure of a great superiority of courage on our side are plainly only isolated cases determination of time and place two hundred and eighty eight as to the determination of time and place we have in the first place to observe in reference to these two things that in the total combat the determination of place belongs to the defence alone the determination of time to the attack two hundred and eighty nine but for partial combats the plan either of an offensive or of a defensive combat has to give determinations respecting both time 290 the appointment of time for a partial combat which seems at first sight only to affect the subject at most in a few points takes however a different turn on closer examination 
and is seen to penetrate it through and through with a ruling idea, decisive in the highest degree, that is, the possibility of a successive use of forces. Successive use of forces. 291. Simultaneous action is, in itself, a fundamental condition of the common action of separate forces. This is also the case in war, and particularly in the combat. For as the number of the combatants is a factor in the product of the same, therefore, ceteris paribus, the simultaneous application of all our forces, that is, the greatest assemblage of them in time against an enemy who does not employ all his at once, will give the victory, certainly in the first instance only, over the part of the enemy's force which has been employed. But as this victory over a part of the enemy's force raises the moral force of the conqueror and lowers that of the vanquished, it follows, therefore, that although the loss of physical force may be equal on both sides, still this partial victory has the effect of raising the total forces of the conqueror and diminishing those of the vanquished, and that consequently it may determine the result of the total combat. 292. But the deduction drawn in the preceding number supposes two conditions which do not exist. In the first place, that the number of troops must have no maximum, and secondly, that the use of one and the same force has no limits as long as there is anything left of it. 293. As regards the first of these points, the number of combatants is limited at once by space, for all that cannot be brought into actual use are superfluous. By it, the depth and extent of the formation of all combatants intended to act simultaneously is limited, and consequently the number of combatants. 294. But a much more important limitation of numbers lies in the nature of the fire combat. We have seen, number 89c, that in it, within certain limits, the increase of number has only the effect of raising the strength of the fire combat on both sides, that is, its total effects. Now, this increased effect, when it brings no advantage in itself for one side, ceases then to be of service to that side. It therefore easily reaches a maximum in that case. 295. This maximum determines itself entirely by the individual case, by the ground, the moral relations between the opposing troops, and the more immediate object of the fire combat. Here it is enough to say that there is such a thing. 296. The number of troops to be employed simultaneously has therefore a maximum beyond which a waste takes place. 297. In the same way, the use of one and the same body of troops has its limits. We have seen, in number 123, how troops under fire gradually become unserviceable, but there is likewise a deterioration in close combat. The exhaustion of physical force is less there than in fire combat, but the moral effect produced by an unsuccessful issue is infinitely greater. 298. Through this deterioration, which forces used in action suffer, including as well those not actually engaged, a new principle comes into the combat, which is the inherent superiority of fresh troops opposed to those already used. 299. There is still a second subject for consideration, which consists in a temporary deterioration of forces that have been engaged in the crisis which occurs in every action. 300. The close combat in practice may be said to have no duration. In the moment that the shock takes place between two cavalry regiments, the thing is decided, and the few seconds of actual sword fight are of no consequence as regards time. It is very much the same with infantry and with large masses, but the affair is not then finished on that account. The state of crisis, which is burst out with the decision, is not yet quite over. The victorious regiment pursuing the vanquished at full speed is not the same regiment lately drawn up on the field of battle in perfect order. Its moral force is certainly intensified, but as a rule its physical force, as well as that resulting from military order in its ranks, have suffered. It is only by the loss which his adversary has suffered in moral strength, and by the circumstance that he is just as much disordered, that the conqueror retains his superiority. Therefore, if a new adversary makes his appearance, with his moral force intact and his ranks in perfect order, there can be no question that, supposing the troops equally good, he will beat the conqueror. 301. A similar crisis takes place in the fire combat to such a degree that the side which has just been victorious by its fire and has driven back its enemy still finds itself for the moment in a decidedly weakened condition as respect to order in its ranks and physical and moral force, a condition which lasts until all that that has been thrown into disorder is once more restored to its normal relations. 302. What we have said here of smaller divisions holds good with respect to larger ones as well. 303. 
the crisis is in itself greater in smaller divisions because it has an effect uniformly throughout the whole but it is of shorter duration three hundred and four the weakest is a general crisis especially of a whole army but it lasts the longest in large armies often for several hours three hundred and five as long as the conqueror is in the crisis of the combat the conquered has in that crisis a means of still restoring the combat that is of turning its result if he can bring forward fresh troops in sufficient numbers three hundred and six in this manner therefore the successive employment of troops is introduced in a second way as an efficacious principle three hundred and seven but if the successive employment of troops in a series of combats following one after another is possible and if the simultaneous use is not unlimited then it follows of itself that the forces which cannot be efficacious in simultaneous action may become so in successive three hundred and eight by this series of partial combats one after another the duration of the whole combat is considerably extended three hundred and nine this duration now brings into view a fresh motive for the successive use of forces by introducing a new quantity into the calculation which is the unforeseen event three hundred and ten if in general a successive use of troops is possible then it follows that we can no longer know how the enemy will employ his for only that portion which is brought into action at once comes within the scope of our observation the rest does not and therefore we can only form some general conjectures respecting it 311. By the mere duration of the action, there is brought into our reckoning an increased amount of pure chance, and that element naturally plays a more important part in war than anywhere else. 312. Unforeseen events require a general system of precaution, and this can consist in nothing else than placing in rear a proportionate force, which is the reserve, properly speaking. Depth of the Order of Battle 313. All battles which are fought by bodies of troops in succession require from their very nature that fresh troops should be forthcoming. These may either be quite fresh, that is, troops which have not been engaged at all, or such as have been in action, but by rest have recovered more or less from their exhaustion. It is easy to see that this gives room for many shades of difference. 314. Both the use of quite fresh troops, as well as the use of such as have been refreshed themselves supposes that they have been in rear that is in a position beyond the region of destruction three hundred and fifteen this also has its degrees for the region of destruction does not end at once but decreases gradually until at last it ends entirely three hundred and sixteen the range of small arms and of grape are well-defined gradations three hundred and seventeen the further a body of troops is posted in rear the fresher they will be when brought into action 318. But no body of troops which has been within reach of an effective fire of small arms or of grape can be considered fresh. 319. We have therefore three reasons for keeping a certain number of troops in rear. They serve a. to relieve or reinforce exhausted troops, especially in fire combat, b. to profit by the crisis in which the conqueror is placed directly after his success, c. as a provision against unforeseen events. 320. All troops kept back come under these categories, whatever arm they belong to, whether we call them a second line or reserve, whether they are part of a division or of the whole. End of Appendix 4, Part 3. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Appendix 4, Section 4 of On War, Volumes 2 and 3 by Karl von Clausewitz. Translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Polarity of the simultaneous and successive use of troops. 321. As the simultaneous and successive use of troops are opposed to one another, and each has its advantages, they may be regarded as two poles, each of which attracts the resolution to itself, and, by that means, fixes it at a point where they are in a state of equilibrium, provided that this resolution is founded on a right estimate of the opposing forces. 322. Now, we require to know the laws of this polarity, that is, the advantages and conditions of these two applications of force, and thereby also their relations with one another. 323. The simultaneous employment of forces may be intensified 
capital A, with equal fronts both A, in fire combat, B, in close combat, capital B, with a greater front, that is, enveloping. 324. Only those forces which are brought into efficient activity at the same time can be regarded as applied simultaneously. When the fronts are equal, such application is therefore limited by the possibility of acting effectively. For instance, in fire combat, three ranks might perhaps fire at the same time, but six cannot. 325. We have shown in number 89 that two lines of fire of unequal strength as regards numbers may be a match for each other, and that a diminution of numbers on one side, if it does not exceed certain limits, has only the result of reducing the mutual effect. 326. But the more the destructive effect of the fire combat is diminished, the more time is required to produce the necessary effect. Therefore, that side which desires chiefly to gain time, commonly the defensive side, is interested in modifying as much as possible the total destructive effect of the fire, that is, the sum of the mutual fire. 327. Further, this must also be an object with the side which is much the weaker in point of numbers, because when the losses are equal, his are always relatively greatest. 328. When the conditions are reversed, the interests will be also. 329. When no special interest for hastening the action predominates, it will be in the interest of both sides to do with as few troops as possible, that is, as already said, number 89b, only to employ so many that the enemy will not be induced to come to close quarters at once, owing to the smallness of our numbers. 330. In this manner, therefore, the simultaneous employment of forces in fire combat is limited by the want of any advantage, and both sides have to fall back upon the successive use of the spare forces. 331. In close combat, the superiority in numbers is above all things decisive, and the simultaneous employment of troops is on that account so much to be preferred to the successive that the latter, in theory, is almost completely excluded, and only becomes possible through accessory circumstances. 332. Close combat is in fact a decision, and one which lasts hardly any time. This excludes the successive use of forces. 333. But we have already said that the crisis of the close combat affords favourable scope for the successive use of forces. 334. Further, the decisions in partial close combats, belonging to a greater whole, are no absolute decisions. Therefore, the application of our force to the further combats, which are possible, must also be taken into consideration. 335. This leads then also to not using at one time more troops in close combat than appear to be just necessary to make certain of the result. 336. As regards this point, there is no other general rule except that circumstances which obstruct execution, such as a very courageous enemy, difficult ground, etc., occasion a necessity for a greater number of troops. 337. But for the general theory, it is of consequence to observe that the employment of more troops than is necessary in close combat is never so disadvantageous as in fire combat, because in the first, the troops only become unserviceable at the time of the crisis, not for a continuance. 338. The simultaneous employment of forces in the close combat is therefore subject to this rule, that it must in all cases be sufficient to produce the result, and that the successive use can in no way make up for insufficiency, for the results cannot be added together as in the fire combat. And further, that when once the point of sufficiency is reached, any greater simultaneous application of force becomes a waste of power. 339. Now that we have considered the application of large bodies of troops in fire and close combat by increasing the depth of the same, we come to that which is possible by extending the front, that is, in the enveloping form. 340. There are two ways in which we may conceive a greater number of combatants brought simultaneously into action through a greater width of front, viz. 1. By extending our front so as to cause the enemy to extend his also. This does not give us any superiority over the enemy, but it has the effect of bringing more forces into play on both sides. 2. By outflanking the enemy's front. 341. To bring more forces into action on both sides can in very few cases be of any advantage to one of the two sides. It is also uncertain whether the enemy will respond to this further extension of front. 342. If he does not respond, 
then a part of our front, that is, our forces, will be either unemployed, or we must apply the overlapping part of our front to turn the enemy. 343. It is then only the apprehension of this turning, which moves the enemy to extend as far as we have done. 344. If, however, the enemy is to be turned, it is plainly better to make arrangements for that purpose from the first, and therefore we should consider an extension of front only from that point of view. 345. Now, in the employment of troops, the enveloping form has this particular property, that it not only increases the number of troops simultaneously engaged on the two sides, but it also allows us, the party using it, to bring more of them into activity than the enemy can. 346. If, for instance, a battalion with a front 180 paces in length is surrounded and has to show front on four sides, and if the enemy is at a distance of musketry range, 150 yards, from it, then there would be room for eight battalions to act with effect against that single battalion. 347. The enveloping form, therefore, comes in here on account of this peculiarity, but we must at the same time bring under consideration its other specialities also, that is, its advantages and disadvantages. 348. A second advantage of the enveloping form is the increased effect resulting from the concentration of fire. 349. A third advantage is its effect in the interception of the enemy's retreat. 350. These three advantages of enveloping diminish according as the forces, or rather their fronts, become greater, and they increase the smaller the fronts are. 351. For as regards the first, number 345, the range of arms remains the same, whether the masses of troops be great or small, it being understood that they consist of the same arms of the service. The actual difference, therefore, between the enveloping line and the line enveloped is a quantity which always remains the same, and consequently its relative value is always diminishing in proportion as the front is extended. 352. To surround a battalion at 150 yards, eight battalions are required number 346, but 10 battalions, on the other hand, might be surrounded by only 20 battalions. 353. The enveloping form, however, is seldom, if ever, carried out completely, that is to say, to the complete circle, rarely more than partially, and usually within 180 degrees. Now, if we imagine to ourselves a body of the size of a considerable army, we see plainly how little will remain of the first of the above advantages under such circumstances. 354. It is just the same with the second advantage, as may be seen at a glance. 355. The third advantage also, of course, notably diminishes by the greater extension of the front, although here some other relations also come into consideration. 366. But the enveloping form has also a peculiar disadvantage, which is that the troops being, by that form, spread out over a greater space, their efficient action is diminished in two respects. 357. For instance, the time which is required to go over a certain space cannot at the same time be utilised for fighting. Now, all movements which do not lead perpendicularly on the enemy's line have to be made over a greater space by the enveloping party than by the party enveloped, because the latter moves more or less on the radii of the smaller circle, the former on the circumference of the greater, which makes an important difference. 358. This gives the side enveloped the advantage of a greater facility in the use of his forces at different points. 359. But the unity of the whole is also lessened by the greater space covered, because intelligence and orders must pass over greater distances. 360. Both these disadvantages of enveloping increase with the increase in the width of the front. When there are only a few battalions, they are insignificant. With large armies, on the other hand, they become important for... 361. The difference between the radius and the circumference is constant, therefore the absolute difference becomes always greater, the greater the front becomes, and it is with absolute differences we are now concerned. 362. Besides, with quite small bodies of troops, few or no flank movements occur, whilst they become more frequent as the size of the masses increases. 363. Lastly, as regards interchange of communications, there is no difference as long as the whole space is only such as can be overlooked. 364. Therefore, if the advantages of the enveloping form are very great and the disadvantages are very small when the fronts are short, if the advantages diminish and the disadvantages increase with the extension of front, it follows that there must be a point where there is an equilibrium. 365. Beyond that point, therefore, the extension of front can no longer offer any advantages over the successive use of troops, but on the contrary, 
disadvantages arise. 366. The equilibrium between the advantages of the successive use of forces and those of a greater extent of front, number 341, must therefore be on this side of that point. 367. In order to find out this point of equilibrium, we must bring the advantages of the enveloping form more distinctly into view. The simplest way to do so is as follows. 368. A certain front is necessary in order to exempt ourselves from the effect of the first two disadvantages of being surrounded. 369. As respects the convergent double effect of fire, there is a length of front where that completely ceases, namely, if the distance between the portions of the line bent back, in case we are surrounded by the enemy, exceeds that of the range of firearms. 370. But in rear of every position, a space out of reach of fire is required for the reserves, for those who command, etc., whose place is in the rear of the front. If these were exposed to fire from three sides, then they could no longer fulfil the objects for which they are intended. 371. As these details of themselves form considerable masses in large armies, and consequently require more room, therefore the greater the whole, the greater must be the space out of the reach of fire in the rear of the front. Accordingly, on this ground, the front must increase as the masses increase. 372. But the space out of fire behind a considerable mass of troops must be greater not only because the reserves, etc., occupy more space, but besides that also in order to afford greater security, for in the first place, the effect of stray shots would be more serious amongst large masses of troops and military trains than amongst a few battalions. Secondly, the combats of large masses last much longer, and through that the losses are much greater amongst the troops behind the front who are not actually engaged in the combat. 373. If, therefore, a certain length is fixed for the necessary extent of front, then it must increase with the size of the masses. 374. The other advantage of the enveloping form, the superiority in the number acting simultaneously, leads to no determinate quality for the front of a line. We must, therefore, confine ourselves to saying that it diminishes with the extension of front. 375. Further, we must point out that the simultaneous action of superior numbers here spoken of chiefly relates to musketry fire, for as long as artillery alone is in action, space will never be wanting, even for the enveloped on his smaller curve, to plant as many pieces as the enemy can on the greater curve, because there is never enough artillery with an army to cover the whole front of a continuous line. 376. It cannot be objected that the enemy has still always an advantage in the greater space, because his guns need not stand so close, and therefore are less liable to be struck for batteries cannot be thus evenly distributed by single guns at equal intervals over a great space. 377. In a combat of artillery alone, or in one in which the artillery plays the principal part, the greater extent of the enveloping front gives an advantage, and a great one too, through the great range of artillery, because that makes a great difference in the extent of the two fronts. This case occurs, for example, with single redoubts, but with armies in which the other arms of the service take the most prominent part and artillery only a secondary part there is not this advantage because as already said there is never any want of space even for the side enveloped three hundred and seventy eight it is therefore principally in infantry combats that the advantage which the greater front affords of bringing greater numbers into action simultaneously must show itself the difference of the two fronts in such a case amounts to three times the range of the musket if the envelopment reaches an angle of 180 degrees, that is about 600 paces. Before a front of 600 paces in length, the enveloping line will then be double, which will be sensibly felt, but before a front of 3,000 paces, the additional length would only be one-fifth, which is no advantage of any importance. 379. We may therefore say respecting this point that the length of a front is sufficient as soon as the difference resulting from the range of a musket shot ceases to give the enveloping line any very marked superiority. 380. From what has just been said of the two advantages of enveloping, it follows that small masses have a difficulty in obtaining the requisite development of front. This is so true that we know for a fact that they are, in most cases, obliged to give up their regular order of formation and to extend much more. It rarely happens that a single battalion, if left to depend on itself, will engage in a combat without extending its front beyond the ordinary length, 150 and 200 paces. Instead of keeping to that formation, it will divide into companies with intervals between them, that again will extend into skirmishes, 
and after a part has been placed in reserve it will take up with the rest altogether twice three or four times as much room as it should regularly three hundred and eighty one but the greater the masses the easier it is to attain the necessary extension of front as the front increases with the masses number three hundred and seventy three although not in the same proportion three hundred and eighty two great masses have therefore no necessity to depart from their order of formation on the contrary they are able to place troops in rear three hundred and eighty three the consequence of this is that for large masses a kind of standing formation has been introduced in which portions of the force are drawn up in rear such is the ordinary order of battle in two lines usually there is a third one behind consisting of cavalry and besides that also a reserve of one-eighth to one-sixth etc three hundred and eighty four with very large masses armies of a hundred thousand to a hundred and fifty thousand or two hundred thousand we see the reserve always get greater one quarter to a third a proof that armies have a continual tendency to increase further beyond what is required for the extent of front three hundred and eighty five we only introduce this now to show more plainly the truth of our demonstration by a glance at facts three hundred and eighty six such then is the bearing of the first two advantages of enveloping it is different with the third three hundred and eighty seven the first two influence the certainty of the result by intensifying our forces the third does that also but only with very short fronts three hundred and eighty eight it acts particularly on the courage of those engaged in the front of the enemy's line by creating a fear of losing their line of retreat an idea which has always a great influence on soldiers three hundred eighty nine this is however only the case when the danger of being cut off is so imminent and evident that the impression overpowers all restraints of discipline and of authority and carries away the soldier involuntarily three hundred ninety at greater distances and if the soldier is only led to a sense of danger indirectly by the sound of artillery and musketry in his rear uneasy feelings may arise within him but unless his spirit is already very bad these will not prevent his obeying the orders of his superiors three hundred and ninety one in this case therefore the advantage in cutting off the enemy's retreat which appertains to the enveloping side cannot be regarded as one which makes success more secure that is more probable but only as one which increases the extent of a success already commenced three hundred and ninety two in this respect also the third advantage of enveloping is subject to the counter principle that it is greatest with a short front and decreases with the extension of front as is evident three hundred and ninety three but this does not set aside the principle that great masses should have a greater extent of front than small ones because as a retreat is never made in the whole width of a position but by certain roads so it follows of itself that great masses require more time for a retreat than small ones this longer time therefore imposes the necessity of a larger front that the enemy who envelops this front may not so speedily gain the points through which the line of retreat passes three hundred ninety four if in accordance with number three hundred and ninety one the third advantage of enveloping in the majority of cases that is when the fronts are not too short only influences the extent but not the certainty of success then it follows that it will have a very different value according to the relations and views of the combatants three hundred and ninety five when the probability of result is otherwise small the first consideration must be to increase the probability in such a case therefore an advantage which relates principally to the extent of the result cannot be of much consequence three hundred and ninety six but if this advantage is quite opposed number three hundred and sixty five to the probability of success in such a case it becomes a positive disadvantage three hundred ninety seven in such a case endeavour must be made through the advantage of the successive use of forces to counterbalance those of the greater extent of front three hundred ninety eight we see therefore that the point of indifference or equilibrium between the two poles of the simultaneous and successive application of our forces of extension of front and depth of position is differently situated not only according as the masses are large or small but also according to the relations and intentions of the respective parties three hundred ninety nine the weaker and the more prudent will give the preference to the successive use the stronger and the bold to the simultaneous employment of forces four hundred it is natural that the assailant should be the stronger or the bolder whether from the character of the commander or from necessity four hundred and one the enclosing form of combat or that form which implies the simultaneous use of forces on both sides in the highest degree is therefore natural to the assailant four hundred and two 
the enclosed that is one limited to the successive application of forces and which on that account is in danger of being surrounded is therefore the natural form of the defensive 403 in the first there is the tendency to a quick solution in the latter to gain time and these tendencies are in harmony with the object of each form of combat 404 but in the nature of the defensive there lies still another motive which inclines it to the deeper order of battle 405 one of the most considerable advantages is the assistance of the country and ground and local defence of the same constitutes an important element of this advantage 406 now one would think this should lead to the front being made as wide as possible in order to make the most of this advantage a one-sided view which may be regarded as the chief cause of commanders having been so often led to occupy extensive positions 407 but hitherto we have always supposed the extension of front as either causing the enemy to extend in like manner or as leading to outflanking that is an envelopment of the enemy's front 408 as long as we imagine both sides equally active therefore apart from the point of view of offensive and defensive the application of a more extended front to envelop the enemy presents no difficulty 409 but as soon as we combine more or less local defence with the combat in front as is done in the defensive then that application of the overlapping portions of the front ceases it is either impossible or very difficult to combine local defence without flanking 410 in order rightly to appreciate this difficulty we must always bear in mind the form which the case assumes in reality when our view of the enemy's measures is intercepted by the natural means of cover which the ground affords and therefore troops employed to defend any particular locality may be easily deceived and held in inactivity 411 from this it follows that in the defensive it is to be considered a decided disadvantage to occupy a greater front than that which the enemy necessarily requires for the deployment of his forces 412 the necessary extent of front for the offensive we shall examine hereafter here we have only to observe that if the offensive takes up too narrow a front the defensive does not punish him for it through having made his own front wide at first but by an offensive enveloping counter movement 413 it is therefore certain that the defender in order that he may not in any case incur the disadvantage of too wide a front will always take up the narrowest which circumstances will permit for by that means he can place more troops in reserve at the same time these reserves are never likely to be left inactive like portions of a too extended front 414 as long as the defender is satisfied with the narrowest front and seeks to preserve the greatest depth that is to say as long as he follows the natural tendency of his form of combat in the same degree there will be an opposite tendency on the part of the assailant he will make the extent of his front as great as possible or in other words envelop his enemy as far as possible 415 but this is a tendency and no law for we have seen that the advantages of this envelopment diminish with the lengths of the fronts and therefore at certain points no longer counterbalance the advantage of the successive application of force to this law the assailant is subject as well as the defender 416 now here we have to consider extension of front of two kinds that which the defender fixes by the position which he takes up and that which the assailant is obliged to adopt with a view to outflanking his enemy 417 if the extension in the first case is so great that all the advantages of outflanking vanish or become ineffective then the movement must be given up the assailant must then seek to gain an advantage in another way as we shall presently see 418 but if the defender's front is as small as can possibly be if the assailant at the same time has a right to look for advantages by outflanking and enveloping still again the limits of this envelopment must be fixed 419 this limit is determined by the disadvantages inherent to any enveloping movement which is carried too far numbers 356 and 365 420 these disadvantages arise when the envelopment is attempted against a front exceeding the length which would justify the movement but they are evidently much greater if the fault consists in too wide of an envelopment of a short line 421 when the assailant has these disadvantages against him then the advantages of the enemy in the successive employment of force through his short line must tell with more weight 
422 now it certainly appears that the defender who adopts the narrow front and deep order of battle does not thereby retain all the advantages of the successive use of forces on his side for if the assailant adopts a front as small and therefore does not outflank his enemy then it is possible for both equally to resort to the successive use of their forces but if the assailant envelops his opponent then the latter must oppose a front in every direction in which he is threatened and therefore fight with the same extent of front except the trifling difference between the extent of concentric circles which is not worth noticing with respect to this there are four points which claim our attention four hundred and twenty three in the first place let the assailant contract his front as much as he pleases there is always an advantage for the defender in the combat changing from the form of one in extended order and which will be quickly decided into one which is concentrated and prolonged for the promulgation of the combat is in favour of the defensive 424. Secondly, the defender, even if enveloped by his adversary, is not always obliged to oppose a parallel front to each of the divisions surrounding him. He may attack them in flank or rear, for which the geometrical relations are just as those which afford the best opportunity, but this is at once a successive use of forces, for in that it is not at all a necessary condition that the troops employed later should be employed exactly as the first used, or that the last brought forward should take up the ground occupied by the first as we shall see presently more plainly without placing troops in reserve it would not be possible to envelop the enveloping force in this manner four hundred and twenty five thirdly by the short front with strong reserves in rear there is a possibility of the enemy carrying his enveloping movement too far number four hundred and twenty of which advantage may then be taken just by means of the forces placed in rear in reserve 426. Fourthly, in the last place, there is an advantage to the defender in being secured by this means against the opposite error of a waste of force, through portions of the front not being attacked. 427. These are the advantages of a deep order of battle, that is, of the successive employment of forces. They not only check over extension on the part of the defender, but also stop the assailant from overstepping certain limits in enveloping without, however, stopping the tendency to extend within these limits. 428. But this tendency will be weakened or completely done away with if the defender has extended himself too far. 429. Under these circumstances, certainly the defender, being deficient in masses in reserve, cannot punish the assailant for his too great extension in his attempt to envelop, but the advantages of the envelopment are, as it is, too small in such a case. 430. The assailant will, therefore, now no longer seek the advantages of enveloping if his relations are not such that cutting off is a point of great importance to him. In this way, therefore, the tendency of enveloping is diminished. 431. But it will be entirely done away with if the defender has taken up a front of such extent that the assailant can leave a great part of it inactive, for that is to him a decided gain. 432. In such cases, the assailant ceases to look for advantages in extension and enveloping, and looks for them in the opposite direction, that is, in the concentration of his forces against some one point. It is easy to perceive that this signifies the same as a deep order of battle. 433. How far the assailant may carry the contraction of the front of his position depends on a. the size of the masses, b. the extent of the enemy's front, and c. his state of preparation to assume a counter-offensive. 434. With small forces, it is disadvantageous to leave any part of the enemy's front inactive, for, as the spaces are small, everything can be seen, and such parts can, on the instant, be applied to active purposes elsewhere. 435. From this follows of itself that also with larger masses and fronts, the front attacked must not be too small, because otherwise the disadvantage just noticed would arise, at least partially. 436. But in general it is natural that when the assailant has good reason to seek his advantage in a concentration of his forces, on account of the excessive extension of front or the passivity of the defender, he can go further in contracting the extent of his front than the defender, because the latter, through the too great extension of his front, is not prepared for an offensive counteraction against the enveloping movement. 437. The greater the front of the defender, the greater will be the number of parts which the assailant can leave unassailed. 438. The same will be the case the more the intention of local defensive is strictly pronounced. 439. And lastly, the greater the masses are generally. 440. The assailant will, therefore, find the most advantage in a concentration of his forces if all these favourable circumstances are combined, namely, large masses, too long a front, 
and a great deal of local defence on the part of the enemy. 441. This subject cannot be finished until we examine the relations of space. 442. We have already shown, number 291, the use of the successive employment of forces. We have only here to call the attention of our readers to the point that the motives for it relate not only to the renewal of the same combat with fresh troops, but also to every subsequent or ulterior employment of reserve troops. 443. In this subsequent use, there is supreme advantage, as will be seen in the sequel. 444. From the preceding exposition, we see that the point where the simultaneous and successive use of troops balance each other out is different, according to the mass of troops in reserve, according to the proportion of force, according to situation and object, according to boldness and prudence. 445. That country and ground have likewise a great influence is of course understood, and it only receives this bare mention because all application is here left out of sight. 446. With such manifold connections and complex relations, no absolute numbers can be fixed as normal quantities, but there must still be some unit which serves as a fixed point for these complex, changeable relations. 447. Now there are two such guides, one on each side. First, a certain depth, which allows the simultaneous action of all the forces, may be looked upon as one guide. To reduce this depth for the sake of increasing the extension of the front must therefore be regarded as a necessary evil. This, therefore, determines the necessary depth. The second guide is the security of the reserve, of which we have already spoken. This determines the necessary extension. 448. The necessary depth, just mentioned, lies at the foundation of all standing formations. We shall not be able to prove this until hereafter, when we come to treat especially of the order of the three arms. 449. But before we can bring our general considerations to a final conclusion, in anticipation of the above result, we must inquire into the determination of place, as that has some influence upon it, likewise. End of Appendix 4, Section 4. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Appendix 4, Part 5 of On War, Volumes 2 and 3, by Karl von Clausewitz, translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Determination of Place 450. The determination of place answers the question where the combat is to be, as well for the whole as for the parts. 451. The place of combat for the whole emanates from strategy with which we are not now concerned. We have only here to deal with the construction of the combat. We must, therefore, suppose that both parties have come into contact. The place of the combat will then generally be either where the enemy's army is, in the attack, or where we can wait for it, on the defensive. 452. As regards the determination of place for the members of the whole, it decides the geometrical form which the combatants on both sides should assume in the combat. 453. We leave out of sight at present the forms of detail which are contained in the regular, normal formation, which we shall consider afterwards. 454. The geometrical form of the whole may be reduced to two types, namely to the parallel and to that in concentric segments of circles. Every other form runs into one of these. 455. In fact, whatever parts are supposed to be in actual conflict must be supposed in parallel lines. If, therefore, an army should deploy perpendicularly to the alignment of the other, the latter must either change its front completely and place itself parallel with the other, or it must at least do so with a portion of its line. But in the latter case, the other army must then wheel round that portion of its line against which no part of the enemy's line has wheeled, if it is to be brought into use, and thus arises an order of battle in concentric pieces of circles or polygonal parts. 456. The rectilinear order is plainly to be considered as indifferent, for the relations of the two parties are precisely alike. 457. But we cannot say that the rectilinear form only arises from the direct and parallel attack, as appears at first sight. It may also take place by the defensive placing himself parallel to an oblique attack. In this case, the other circumstances will certainly not always be alike, for often the new position will not be good. 
often it will not be quite carried out etc we now anticipate this only in order to guard against a confusion of ideas the indifference which we see in this case lies only in the form of the order of battle 458 the nature of the form in concentric segments of circles or portions of polygons which is the same has already been sufficiently developed it is the enveloping and the enveloped order 459 the question of the placing of the parts in space would be fully settled by the geometrical form of the normal order of battle if it was necessary that some of our troops should be opposed to those of the enemy in every direction this however is not necessary it is much more a question in each particular case should all parts of the enemy's line be engaged or not and in the latter case which 460 if we can leave a part of the enemy's force unattacked we become by that means stronger for the contest with the rest either by the simultaneous or successive use of our forces and by that means a part of the enemy's force may have to contend with the whole of our army 461 thus we shall either be completely superior to the enemy at the points at which we want our forces or we shall at least have a stronger force than the general relations between the two armies would give 462 but these points may be taken to represent the whole provided that we need not engage the others there is therefore an artificial augmentation of our forces by a greater concentration of the same in space 463 it is evident that this means forms a most important element in any plan of battle it is that which is most generally used 464 the point now is therefore to examine this subject closer in order to determine the parts of an enemy's force which in this sense should be taken to constitute the whole 465 we have stated in number four the motives which determine the retreat of one of the combatants in battle it is plain that the circumstances from which these motives arise affect either the whole of the force or at least such an essential part of it as surpasses all the rest in importance and therefore carries them along with it in its fate 466 that these circumstances affect the whole of the force we can easily conceive if the mass is small but not if it is large in such case certainly the motives given under d f g concern the whole but the others especially the loss affect only certain parts for with large masses it is extremely improbable that all parts have suffered like 467 now those parts whose condition is the cause of a retreat must naturally be considerable in relation to the whole we shall for brevity's sake call them the vanquished 468 these vanquished parts may either be contiguous to each other or they may be more or less interspersed through the whole 469 there is no reason to consider the one case is more decisive than the other if one corps of an army is completely beaten but all the rest intact that may be in one case worse in another better than if the losses had been uniformly distributed over the whole army 470 the second case supposes an equal employment of the opposing forces but we are only occupied at present with the effect of an unequal application of forces one that is concentrated more at a single or at certain points we have therefore only to do with the first case 471 if the vanquished parts are close to each other they may be regarded collectively as a whole and we mean it to be so understood when we speak of the divisions or points attacked or beaten 472 if we can determine the situation and relation of that part which dominates over and will carry the whole along with it in its fate then we have by that means also discovered the part of the whole against which the forces intended to fight the real struggle must be directed 473 if we leave out of sight all circumstances of ground we have only position and magnitude numbers by which to determine the part to be attacked we shall first consider the numbers 474 here there are two cases to be distinguished the first if we unite our forces against a part of the enemies and oppose none of the rest of his army the second if we oppose to the remaining part a small force merely to occupy it each is plainly a concentration of forces in space 475 the first of these questions viz how large a part of the enemy's force we must necessarily engage is evidently the same as how small can we make the width of our front we have already discussed that subject in number 433 and following 476 in order the better to explain the subject in the second case we shall begin by supposing the enemy to be as positive and active as ourselves 
it follows in such case that if we take steps to beat the smaller portion of his army with the larger fraction of our own he will do the same on his side 477 therefore if we would have the total result in our favour we must so arrange that the part of the enemy's army which we mean to defeat shall bear a greater portion to his whole force than the portion of our force which we risk losing bears to the whole of our army 478 if for instance we would employ in the principal action three-fourths of our force and use one-fourth for the enemy's occupation on that part of the enemy's army not attacked then the portion of the enemy's army which we engage seriously should exceed one-fourth should be about one-third in this case if the result is for us on one side and against us on the other still with three-fourths of our force we have beaten one-third of the enemy's whilst he with two-thirds of his has only conquered one-fourth of ours the advantage is therefore manifestly in our favour four hundred and seventy nine if we are so superior to the enemy in numbers that three-fourths of our force is sufficient to ensure us victory over half of his then the total result would be still more to our advantage four hundred and eighty the stronger we are in numbers relatively the greater may be that portion of the enemy's force which we engage seriously and the greater will then be the result the weaker we are the smaller must be the portion seriously attacked which is in accordance with the natural law that the weak should concentrate his forces the most 481 but in all this it is tacitly supposed that the enemy is occupied as long in beating our weak division as we are in completing our victory over the larger portion of his force should this not be so and that there is a considerable difference in time then he might still be able to use a further part of his troops against our principal force 482 but now as a rule a victory is gained quicker in proportion as the inequality between the contending forces is greater hence we cannot make the force which we risk losing as small as we please it must bear a reasonable proportion to the enemy's force which it is to keep occupied concentration has therefore limits on the weaker side 483 the supposition made in number 476 is however very seldom realized usually a part of the defender's force is tied to some locality so that he is not able to use the lex talionis as quickly as is necessary when that is the case the assailant in concentrating his forces may even somewhat exceed the above proportion and if he can beat one-third of the enemy's force with two-thirds of his there is still a probability of success for him in the total result because the remaining one-third of his force will hardly get into difficulty to an equal degree 484 but it would be wrong to go further with this train of reasoning and draw the conclusion that if the defensive took no positive action at all against the weaker portion of the assailant's force a case which very often happens victory would likewise follow in that case also in favour of the assailant for in cases in which the party attack does not seek to indemnify himself on the weaker portion of the enemy's force the chief reason for not doing so is because he has still the means of making the victory of our principal force doubtful by bringing into action against it a portion of that part of his army which has not been attacked 485 the smaller the portion of the enemy's force is which we attack the more possible this becomes partly on account of spaces and distance being less partly and more especially because the moral power of victory over a smaller mass is so very much less if the mass of the enemy's force which is conquered is small he does not so soon lose head and heart to apply his still remaining means to the work of restoration 486 it is only if the enemy is in such a position that he is neither able to do the one nor the other that is neither to indemnify himself by a positive victory over our weaker portion nor to bring forward his spare forces to oppose the principal attack or if irresolution prevents him from doing so that then the assailant can hope to conquer him with even a relatively small force by means of concentration 487 theory must not however leave it to be inferred that it is the defender only who is subject to the disadvantage of not being able to indemnify himself properly for the concentration of forces made by his adversary it has also to point out that either of the two parties either the assailant or the defender may be involved in such a situation 488 the assemblage of forces more than are proportionate at some point in order to be superior in numbers at that point is in point of fact always founded on the hope of surprising the enemy so that he shall neither have time to bring up sufficient forces to the spot nor to set on foot measures of retaliation the hope of the surprise succeeding founds itself essentially on the resolution being the earliest made that is on the initiative 
four hundred eighty nine but this advantage of the initiative has also again its disadvantage of which more will be said hereafter we merely remark here that it is no absolute advantage the effects of which must show themselves in all cases four hundred and ninety but if we even leave out of consideration the grounds for the success of an intended surprise which are contained in the initiative so that no objective motive remains and that success has nothing on its side but luck still even that is not to be rejected in theory for war is a game from which it is impossible to exclude venture it therefore remains allowable in the absence of all other motives to concentrate a part of our forces on a venture in the hope of surprising the enemy with them four hundred ninety one if the surprise succeeds on either side whether it be the offensive or defensive side which succeeds there will follow a certain inability on the part of the force surprised to redress itself by a retaliatory stroke four hundred ninety two as yet we have been engaged in the consideration of the proportions of the part or point to be attacked we now come to its position four hundred ninety three if we leave out every local and other particular circumstance then we can only distinguish the wings flanks rear and centre as points which have peculiarities of their own four hundred ninety four the wings because there we may turn the enemy's force four hundred ninety five the flanks because we may expect to fight there upon a spot on which the enemy is not prepared and to impede his retreat four hundred ninety six the rear just the same as the flanks only that the expectation of obstructing or completely intercepting his retreat is here more predominant four hundred ninety seven but in this action against flanks and rear the supposition is necessarily implied that we can compel the enemy to oppose forces to us there when we are not certain that our appearance there will have this effect the measure becomes dangerous for where there is no enemy to attack we are inactive and if this is the case with the principal body we should undoubtedly miss our object four hundred and ninety eight such a case as that of an enemy uncovering his flanks and rear certainly occurs now very rarely still it does happen and most easily when the enemy indemnifies himself by offensive counter enterprises wagram hohenlinden austerlitz are examples which may be quoted here four hundred ninety nine the attack of the centre by which we understand nothing else than a part of the front which is not a wing has this property that it may lead to a separation of parts which is commonly termed breaking the line five hundred breaking the line is plainly the opposite of envelopment both measures in the event of victory have a very destructive effect on the enemy's forces but each in a different manner that is a envelopment contributes to certainty of the result by its moral effect in lowering the courage of the enemy's troops b breaking the centre contributes to ensure success by enabling us to keep our forces more united together we have already treated of both c the envelopment may lead directly to the destruction of the enemy's army if it is made with very superior numbers and succeeds if it leads to victory the early results are in every case greater by that means than by breaking the enemy's line d breaking the enemy's line can only lead indirectly to the destruction of his army and its effects are hardly shown so much on the first day but rather strategically afterwards five hundred and one breaking through the enemy's army by massing our principal force against one point supposes an excessive length of front on the part of the enemy for in this form of attack the difficulty of occupying the remainder of the enemy's force with few troops is greater because the enemy's forces nearest to the principal attack may easily join in opposing it now in an attack on the centre there are such forces on both sides in an attack on a flank only on one side five hundred and two the consequence of this is that such a central attack may easily end in a very disadvantageous form of combat through a convergent counter-attack five hundred and three the choice therefore between these two points of attack must be made according to existing relations of the moment length of front the nature and direction of the line of retreat the military qualities of the enemy's troops and characteristics of their general lastly the ground must determine the choice we shall consider these subjects more fully in the sequel 504 we have supposed the concentration of forces at one point for the real attack but it may no doubt also take place at several points at two or three without ceasing to be a concentration of forces against a part of the enemy's force at the same time no doubt by every increase in the number of points the strength of the principle is weakened 505 and yet we have only taken into view the objective advantages of such a concentration that is a more favourable relation of force at the capital point but there is also a subjective motive for the commander or general which is that he keeps the principal parts of his force more in hand five hundred and six 
although in a battle the will of the general and his intelligence conduct the whole still this will and this intelligence can only reach the lower ranks much diluted and the further the troops are from the general-in-chief the more will this be the case the importance and independence of subordinates then increase and that at the expense of the supreme will 507 but it is both natural and as long as no anomaly arises also advantageous that the commander-in-chief should retain direct control to the utmost extent which circumstances will allow reciprocal action 528 in respect to the application of forces in combat we have now exhausted everything which can be deduced generally from the nature of those forces 509 we have only one subject still to examine which is the reciprocal action of the plans and acts of the two sides 510 as the plan of combat properly so called can only determine so much of the action as can be foreseen it limits itself usually to three things viz one the general outline two the preparations three the details of the commencement five hundred and eleven nothing but the commencement can in reality be laid down completely by the plan the progress demands new arrangements and orders proceeding from circumstances these are the conduct of the battle five hundred and twelve naturally it is desirable that the principles of the plan should be followed in the conduct for means and end always remain the same therefore if it cannot always be done we can only look upon that as an imperfection which cannot be avoided five hundred and thirteen the conduct of a battle is undeniably a very different thing to making a plan of one the latter is done out of the region of danger and in perfect leisure the former takes place always under the pressure of the moment the plan always decides things from a more elevated standpoint with a wider sphere of vision the conduct is regulated by indeed is often forcibly carried away by that which is the nearest and most individual we shall speak hereafter of the difference in the character of these two functions of the intelligence but here we leave them out of consideration and content ourselves with having drawn a line between them as distinct epochs five hundred and fourteen if we imagine both parties in this situation that neither of them knows anything of the dispositions of his opponent then each of them can only make his own comfortably with the general principles of theory a great part of this lies already in the formation and in the so-called elementary tactics of an army which are naturally founded on what is general five hundred and fifteen but it is evident that a disposition which rests only upon that which is general can never have the same efficacy with that which is built upon individual circumstances five hundred and sixteen consequently it may be a very great advantage to combine our dispositions after the enemy and with reference to those of the enemy it is the advantage of the second hand at cards five hundred and seventeen seldom if ever is a battle arranged without special regard to individual circumstances the first circumstance of which there must always be some knowledge is the ground five hundred and eighteen in knowledge of the ground the defender has the advantage in general in an especial degree for he alone knows exactly and beforehand the spot on which the battle is to take place and therefore has time to examine the locality fully here is the root of the whole theory of positions in as far as it belongs to tactics 519 the assailant certainly also examines the ground before the fight commences but only imperfectly for the defender is in possession of it and does not allow him to make a full examination everywhere whatever he can in some measure ascertain from a distance serves him to lay down his plan 520 if the defender besides the advantage of the mere knowledge of the ground makes another use of it if he makes use of it for local defence the result is more or less definite disposition of his forces in detail by that means his adversary may find out his plans and take them into account in making his own five hundred and twenty one this is therefore the first calculation made on the enemy's actual moves five hundred and twenty two in most cases this is to be regarded as the stage at which the plans of both parties end that which takes place subsequently belongs to the conduct five hundred and twenty three in combats in which neither of the two parties can be considered as really the defender because both advance to the encounter formation order of battle and elementary tactics as regular disposition somewhat modified by ground come in in place of a plan properly so called five hundred and twenty four this happens very frequently with small bodies seldomer with large masses five hundred and twenty five but if action is divided into attack and defence then the assailant as far as respects reciprocal action has evidently the advantage at the stage mentioned at number five hundred and twenty two 
it is true that he has assumed the initiative but his opponent by his defensive dispositions has been obliged to disclose in great part what he means to do 526 this is the ground on which in theory the attack has been hitherto considered as by far the most advantageous form of combat 527 but to regard the attack as the most advantageous or to use a more distinct expression as the strongest form of combat leads to an absurdity as we shall show hereafter this has been overlooked 528 the error in the conclusion arises from overvaluing the advantage mentioned in number 525 that advantage is important in connection with the reciprocal action but that is not everything to be able to make use of the ground as an ally and thereby to a certain extent to increase our forces is in very many cases of greater importance and might be in most cases with proper dispositions 529 but wrong use of ground very extended positions and a full system of defence pure passivity have no doubt given to the advantage which the assailant has of keeping his measures in the background an undue importance and to these errors alone the attack is indebted for the successes which it obtains in practice beyond the natural measure of its efficacy 530 as the influence of the intelligence is not confined to the plan properly so called we must pursue our examination of the reciprocal action through the province of the conduct 531 the course or duration of the battle is the province of the conduct of the battle but this duration is greater in proportion as the successive use of forces is more employed 532 therefore where much depends on the conduct there must be a great depth in the order of battle 533 now arises the question whether it is better to entrust more to the plan or to the conduct 534 it were evidently absurd knowing to leave unexamined any datum which may come to hand or leave it out of account in our deliberations if it has any value as regards the proposed course of action but that is as much to say that the plan should prescribe the course of action as far as there are available data and that the field of the conduct is only to commence when the plan no longer suffices the conduct is therefore only a substitute for a plan and so far is to be regarded as a necessary evil 535 but let it be quite understood we are only speaking of plans for which there are real motives dispositions which have necessarily an individual tendency must not be founded upon arbitrary hypothesis but upon regular data 536 where therefore data are wanting there the fixed dispositions of the plan should cease for it is plainly better that a thing should remain undetermined that is be placed under the care of general principles than that it should be determined in a manner not adapted to circumstances which subsequently arise 537 every plan which enters too much into detail of the course of the combat is therefore faulty and ruinous for detail does not depend merely on general grounds but on other particulars which it is impossible to know beforehand 538 when we reflect how the influence of single circumstances accidental as well as others increases with time and space we may see how it is that very wide and complex movements seldom succeed and that they often lead to disaster 539 here lies the chief cause of the danger of all very complex and elaborate plans of battle they are all founded often without its being known on a mass of insignificant suppositions a great part of which prove inexact 540 in place of unduly extending the plan it is better to leave rather more to the conduct 541 but this supposes according to 532 a deep order of battle that is strong reserves 542 we have seen open bracket 525 close bracket that as respects reciprocal action the attack reaches furthest in his plan 543 on the other hand the defensive through knowledge of the ground has many reasons to determine beforehand the course of his combat that is to enter far into his plan 544 were we to stop at this point of view we should say that the plans of the defensive reach much further into those of the offensive and that therefore the latter leaves much more to the conduct 545 but this advantage of the defensive only exists in appearance not in reality we must be careful not to forget that the dispositions which relate to the ground are only preparatory measures founded upon suppositions not upon any actual measures of the enemy 546 it is only because these suppositions are in general very probable and only when they are so that they as well as the dispositions based on them have any real value 547 
but this condition attaching to the suppositions of the defender and the measures which he therefore adopts naturally limits these very much and compels him to be very circumspect in his plans and dispositions five hundred and forty eight if he has gone too far with them the assailant may slip away and then there is on the spot a dead power that is a waste of power five hundred and forty nine such may be the effect of positions which are too extended and the too frequent use of local defence five hundred and fifty both these very errors have often shown the injury to the defender from an undue extension of his plan and the advantage which the offensive may derive from a rational extension of his. 551. Only very strong positions give the plans of the defensive more scope than the plan of the assailant can have, but they must be positions which are strong in every point of view. 552. On the other hand, in proportion, as the position available is only indifferently good, or that no suitable one is to be found, or that time is wanting to prepare one in the same measure will the defender remain behind the assailant in the determination of his plans and have to trust the more to the conduct five hundred and fifty three this result therefore shows again that it is the defender who must more particularly look to the successive use of forces five hundred and fifty four we have seen before that only large masses can have the advantage of a narrow front and we may now perceive additional motives for the defender to guard himself against the danger of an undue extension of his plan a ruinous scattering of his forces on account of the nature of the ground and further that he should place his security in the aid which lies in the conduct that is in strong reserves five hundred and fifty five from this the evident deduction is that the relation of the defence to the attack improves in proportion as the masses increase five hundred and fifty six duration of the combat that is strong reserves and the successive use of them as much as possible constitute therefore the first condition in the conduct and the advantage of these things must bring with it the superiority in the conduct apart from the talent of him who applies them for the highest talent cannot be brought into full play without means and we may very well imagine that the one who is less skilful but has the most means at command gains the upper hand in the course of the combat five hundred and fifty seven now there is still a second objective condition which confers in general an advantage in the conduct and this is quite on the side of the defensive it is the acquaintance with the country what advantage this must give when resolutions are required which must be made without examination and in the pressure of events is evident in itself five hundred and fifty eight it lies in the nature of things that the determinations of the plan concern more the divisions of higher order and those of the conduct more the inferior ones consequently that each single determination of the latter is of lesser importance but as these latter are naturally much more numerous the difference in importance between the plan and conduct is by that means partly balanced five hundred and fifty nine further it lies in the nature of the thing that reciprocal action has its own special field in the conduct and also that it never ceases there because the two parties are inside of each other and consequently that it either causes or modifies the greatest part of the dispositions five hundred and sixty now if the defender is specially led by his interest to save up forces for the conduct number five hundred and fifty three if he has a general advantage in their use number five hundred and fifty seven it follows that he can by superiority in the conduct not only make good the disadvantage in which he is placed by the reciprocal action out of the plans but also attain a superiority in the reciprocal action generally five hundred and sixty one whatever may be the relation in this respect between the opposing parties in particular cases up to a certain point there will always be an endeavour to be the last to take measures in order to be able when doing so to take those of the enemy into account five hundred and sixty two this endeavour is the real ground of the much stronger reserves which are brought into use in large armies in modern times five hundred and sixty three we have no hesitation in saying that in this means there is next to ground the best principle of defence for all considerable masses. End of Appendix 4, Part 5. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia. Appendix 4, Section 6 of On War, Volumes 2 and 3, by Karl von Clausewitz. Translated by J. J. Graham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Character of Command 564. We have said that there is a difference between the character of the determinations which form the plan and those which form the conduct of a battle. 
the cause of this is that the circumstances under which the intelligence does its work are different five hundred and sixty five this difference of circumstances consists in three things in particular namely in the want of data in the want of time and in danger five hundred and sixty six things which had we a complete view of the situation and of all the great interrelations would be to us of primary importance may not be so if that complete view is wanting other things therefore and as a matter of course circumstances more distinct then become predominant five hundred and sixty seven consequently if the plan of a combat is more a geometrical drawing then the conduct or command is more a perspective one the former is more a ground plan the latter more of a picture how this defect may be repaired we shall see hereafter five hundred and sixty eight the want of time besides limiting our ability to make a general survey of objects has also an influence on the power of reflection it is less a judicial deliberative critical judgment than mere tact that is a readiness of judgment acquired by practice which is then effective this we must also bear in mind five hundred and sixty nine that the immediate feeling of danger to ourselves and others should influence the bare understanding is in human nature five hundred and seventy if then the judgment of the understanding is in that way fettered and weakened where can it fly for support only to courage five hundred and seventy one here plainly courage of a twofold kind is requisite courage not to be overpowered by personal danger and courage to calculate upon the uncertain and upon that to frame a course of action five hundred and seventy two the second is usually called courage of the mind courage de esprit for the first there is no name which satisfies the law of antithesis because the other term just mentioned is not in itself correct five hundred and seventy three if we ask ourselves what is courage in its original sense it is personal sacrifice in danger and from this point we must also start for upon it everything rests at last five hundred and seventy four such a feeling of devotion may proceed from two sources of quite different kinds first from an indifference to danger whether it proceeds from the organism of the individual indifference to life or habituation to danger and secondly from a positive motive love of glory love of country enthusiasm of any kind 575 the first only is to be regarded as true courage which is inborn or has become second nature and it has this characteristic that it is completely identified with the being therefore never fails 576 it is different with the courage which springs from positive feelings these place themselves in opposition to the impressions of danger and therefore all depends naturally on their relation to the same there are cases in which they are far more powerful than indifference to the sense of danger there are others in which it is the most powerful the one indifference to danger leaves the judgment cool and leads to steadfastness the other feeling makes men more enterprising and leads to boldness five hundred and seventy seven if with such positive impulses the indifference to danger is combined there is then the most complete personal courage five hundred and seventy eight the courage we have as yet been considering is something quite subjective it relates merely to personal sacrifice and may on that account be called personal courage five hundred and seventy nine but now it is natural that any one who places no great value on the sacrifice of his own person will not rate very high the offering up of others who in consequence of his position are made subject to his will he looks upon them as property which he can dispose of just like his own person five hundred and eighty in like manner he who through some positive feeling is drawn into danger will either infuse this feeling into others or think himself justified in making them subservient to his feelings 581 in both ways courage gets an objective sphere of action it both stimulates self-sacrifice and influences the use of the forces made subject to it 582 when courage has excluded from the mind all over vivid impressions of danger it acts on the faculties of the understanding these become free because they are no longer under the pressure of anxiety 583 but it will certainly not create powers of understanding where they have no existence still less will it beget discernment 584 therefore where there is a want of understanding and of discernment courage may often lead to very wrong measures 585 of quite another origin is that courage which has been termed courage of the mind it springs from a conviction of the necessity of venturing or even from a superior judgment to which the risk appears less 
than it does to others. 586. This conviction may also spring up in men who have no personal courage, but it only becomes courage, that is to say, it only becomes a power which supports the man and keeps up his equanimity under the pressure of the moment and of danger when it reacts on the feelings, awakens and elevates their nobler powers. But on this account the expression courage of the mind is not quite correct, for it never springs from the intelligence itself but that the mind may give rise to feelings, and that these feelings, by the continued influence of the thinking faculties, may be intensified, everyone knows by experience. 587. Whilst, on the one hand, personal courage supports, and by that means heightens the powers of the mind, on the other hand, the conviction of the mind awakens and animates the emotional powers. The two approach each other, and may combine, that is, produce one and the same result in command. This, however, seldom happens. The manifestations of courage have generally something of the character of their origin. 588. When great personal courage is united to high intelligence, then the command must naturally be nearest to perfection. 589. The courage proceeding from convictions of the reason is naturally connected chiefly with the incurring of risks in reliance on uncertain things and of good fortune, and has less to do with personal danger, for the latter cannot easily become a cause of much intellectual activity. 590. We see, therefore, that in the conduct of the combat, that is, in the tumult of the moment and of danger, the feeling powers support the mind, and the latter must awaken the powers of feeling. 591. Such a lofty condition of soul is requisite if the judgment, without a full view, without leisure, under the most violent pressure of passing events, is to make resolutions which shall hit the right point. This may be called military talent. 592. If we consider a combat with its mass of great and small branches, and the actions proceeding from these, it strikes us at once that the courage which proceeds from personal devotion predominates in the inferior region, that is, rules more over the secondary branches, the other more over the higher. 593. The further we descend the order of this distribution, so much the simpler becomes the action, therefore the more nearly common sense becomes all that is required. But so much the greater becomes the personal danger, and consequently personal courage is so much the more required. 594. The higher we ascend in this order, the more important and the more fraught with consequences become the action of individuals, because the subjects decided by individuals are more or less those on which the whole is dependent. From this it follows that the power of taking a general and comprehensive view is the more required. 595. Now, certainly the higher position has always a wider horizon, overlooks the whole much better than a lower one. Still, the most commanding view which can be obtained in a high position in the course of an action is insufficient, and it is therefore also chiefly there where so much must be done by tact of judgment and in reliance on good fortune. 596. This becomes always more the characteristic of the command as the combat advances, for as the combat advances, the condition of things deviates so much the further from the first state with which we were acquainted. 597. The longer the combat has lasted, the more accidents, that is, events not calculated upon, have taken place in it. Therefore, the more everything has loosened itself from the bonds of regularity, the more everything appears disorderly and confused here and there. 598. But the further the combat has advanced, the more the decisions begin to multiply themselves. The faster they follow in succession, the less time remains for consideration. 599. Thus it happens that by degrees, even the higher branches, especially at particular points and moments, are drawn into the vortex, where personal courage is worth more than reflection, and constitutes almost everything. 600. In this way, in every combat, the combinations exhaust themselves gradually, and at last it is almost courage alone which continues to fight and act. 601. We see, therefore, that it is courage and intelligence elevated by it which have to overcome the difficulties that oppose themselves to the execution of command. How far they can do so, or not, is not the question, because the adversary is in the same situation. Our errors and mistakes, therefore, in the majority of cases, will be balanced by his. But that which is an important point is that we should not be inferior to the adversary in courage and intelligence, but above all things, in the first. 602. At the same time, there is still one quality which is here of great importance. It is the tact of judgment, 
this is not purely an inborn talent it is chiefly practice which familiarizes us with facts and appearances and makes the discovery of truth therefore a right judgment almost habitual herein consists the chief value of experience in war as well as the great advantage which it gives an army 603 lastly we have still to observe that if circumstances in the conduct of war always invest what is near with an undue importance of that which is higher or more remote this imperfect view of things can only be compensated for by the commander in the uncertainty as to whether he has done right seeking to make his action at least decisive this will be done if he strives to realize all the possible results which can be derived from it in this manner the whole of the action which should always if possible be conducted from a high standpoint where such a point cannot be attained will at least be carried in some certain direction from a secondary point we shall try to make this plainer by an illustration when in the tempest of a great battle a general of division is thrown out of his connection with the general plan and is uncertain whether he should still risk an attack or not then if he resolves upon making an attack in doing so the only way to feel satisfied both as regards his own action and the whole battle is by striving not merely to make his attack successful but also to obtain such a success as will repair any reverse which may have in the meantime occurred at other points six hundred and four such a course of action is called in a restricted sense resolute the view therefore which we have here given namely that chances can only be governed in this manner leads to resolution which prevents any half measures and is the most brilliant quality in the conduct of a great battle end of appendix four section six recording by timothy ferguson gold coast australia end of on war volumes two and three by carl von clausewitz translated by j j graham